Yeah. All right, so what we're going to do, um, we're going to dig into polarity management that I've mentioned a few times. Uh, so I've got two new things to pass out. One is, and I, I printed this on 11 by 17, that gives us a little bit more room, actually. Uh, but uh, I'll also send you this worksheet, so if you want the worksheet, it also fits fine um, on a, a my own. So this is a polarity management worksheet that I've used as an exercise that will work well as a classroom exercise. And then this just another handout with a few of the just some new slides I'm doing this morning. Uh, again, not every slide, but it kind of captures the key slides. I'll send all my PowerPoints so you have all the slides if you need. So we've talked a lot already. A lot of the work on deliberation, a lot of the work on wicked problems is recognizing that most problems have kind of, again, competing underlying values and paradoxes or tension uh, kind of underneath them. Um, I've been doing that work for a long time. In just the last two years, there's been some nice publications come out about the NIF forum saying they talk about trade-offs as a key part of it, but then when you actually watch transcripts, people aren't doing much with those trade-offs, right? Or there's often just a recognition that it would agree to disagree, but not to what degree if you actually work through it. So I've been spending a lot of time the last year or so trying to kind of find out, okay, how do we actually make sure we do that, right? Uh, and, and it goes back to what I talked about, the deliberate facilitator, me getting my students to be more and more active facilitators, because again, we weren't doing it naturally. Even if you recognize the tension, people tend to just recognize it and then say, we need a balance and kind of end it there versus struggle with what does that balance mean and what kind of thing, right? So this is some new material I've been developing to really try to dig deep into it. And part of, one way to dig deep into it is we've been doing this polarity management stuff I was just explicitly saying, you know what, this meeting's all about this specific polarity, right? Uh, it started with the, the, I mentioned the superintendent cert. That was the first time I did that survey and it was so clear there was this tension between a strong leader and a collaborator that I knew what the meeting had to be about that, right? Well, not the whole meeting, but we had a two hour public forum about a 45-minute 45, 45 session was specifically, let's just engage that one specific tension, right? Um, not long after that, I helped my local church, a First Presbyterian church in Fort Collins, that was dealing with gay ordination issues. Right? It was a pretty conservative church. Its national denomination had kind of liberalized, and we're kind of changing rules, making it uh, you know, more kind of pro-gay friendly in a sense. A lot of local, at least the leadership, was very nervous about that, so they kind of initiated a move to, to leave the denomination Leaving the denomination, the denomination owned the church. So they left the denomination, they would have had to come up with $10 million to buy the church. Right? Half the congregation thought that was completely ridiculous, and half the congregation supported it. So this, this church was blowing up. Right? So we did this process. We actually did a polarity management process between truth and grace, right? in, in terms of kind of a Christian perspective. If I would be a Christian, uh, it worked within that. It's very hard to do deliberation across religious perspectives. Right? Uh, but within one religious perspective, you know, there was this clear tension that some people say, Bible is wrong, says it's wrong, it's wrong. The Bible says we shouldn't judge people, and it's about grace, about loving people wherever they are. Right? So people were coming from different perspectives. Right? Um, we ended up doing this, working with the local food cluster, the organization that was really kind of trying to advance local food and, and urban gardening and those type of things. Right? So it, initially it was this like local group, but then they ended up getting a grant and had to become a 501c3 and things like that. So this was this whole grassroots movement. There's a grassroots movement that now needed some leadership. Right? Uh, but it was very anti-leadership in a way. So this is all these individual things. So we did a polarity management thing about you know what are the advantages of a top-down you know, kind of a leader, strong leader versus a bottom-up kind of collaborator. So we've used this kind of format in lots of different ways, right? Uh, so I'm going to kind of talk through it, how to do it, and then, and then I think we I don't know if as a group or maybe even just as smaller groups, kind of pick at least one tension to kind of play it out a little bit, right? Because things to, to complete this worksheet. Uh, this is a really good class experience. So we start. I talked earlier when we did the five basic American values, you know, there's this tension between freedom and security, right? Uh, and typically, the way conversations go, and my, my life for a long time was analyzing public discourse as it was, and talking about how bad it was. <laughs> and one of the things I often saw was people were picking one value and basing it off that, right? So in this tension between freedom and security, say we're dealing with terrorism or, or things like that, you know, some people said, well, I'm all about freedom, and the other side's anti-freedom, right? If you're against me, it means you hate freedom. Again, no one really hates freedom. Right. Or on the flip side, if you're all about security, then you just assume the other side is anti-security, the other side is for the terrorists or whatever. Right. Uh, so that's a very uh, divided conversation, right? Um, so one simple thing is like by, by recognizing the tension and putting in tension with each other, you, know, you recognize that you know, for some people, you know, freedom and security are in tension with each other, so it's more of a continuum. 
And just by flipping it and putting it on a continuum, you change the conversation, right? Because most people would agree that both freedom and security are good things, right? So very few people would be on the edges, right? There's very few people that say, no, we should have complete freedom and security doesn't matter, right? And every person for themselves, no one's really there, right? And no one's really going to say we have all security but no freedom, right? So by just kind of introducing the tension, you automatically put people in conversation with each other, right? The, the people that are on the freedom side versus the security side, instead of being opposites, right? They are now both somewhere in the middle, right? And if someone's here and someone's here, you can have a conversation, right? The conversation, you gotta have, the conversation becomes, yeah, yeah. Freedom and security are both important. I think freedom is more important than security. You think security is more important than freedom, but there's a basis for conversation there, right? Versus I'm for freedom and I think you hate freedom, right? Uh, and, and which you know, is how our minds don't really work. Right? So this comes up, I mentioned this briefly yesterday. I think I actually have these slides in the original slide packet. Uh, but Aristotle, um, who, 2,000 years ago, figured this out, right? He defined virtue as a mean between two vices, uh, one vice which depends on excess and one depends on defect. Virtue both finds and chooses, which is intermediate, right? So he talked about, the best example is courage. It's very hard to say courage is X. Courage means this. Because courage is situational, right? And, and, and the, 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 the extremes, you know, recklessness we know is bad, and cowardice we know is bad. Courage is kind of the ideal mean between it. And by ideal mean, it doesn't necessarily mean the middle, right? Uh, ideal mean in a certain situation, you know, maybe it, 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 in some cases it's best to run, right? You're completely outnumbered, you know, so it might look like cowardice, but, you know, courage in that case is actually leading, right? And in some cases, even though you know you're going to lose, it's probably best to kind of stand your ground, right? So it's kind of the situation where the conversation becomes, you know, where along this line is the ideal in that situation? So when I'm talking about dealing with tensions, often that's what you're trying to do, okay? And, and, the easy thing is to say, oh, we just need balance, right? Uh, the conversation we need to have is, what does balance mean, right? Is balance middle ground? Is balance, you know, where is it in there? And that becomes a negotiation. And that, like I talked about, you know, strong, a strong democratic community is about a constant conversation. The constant conversation is, where is that ideal mean? Where is the balance between these things, right? Uh, you see what I talked about yesterday, justice. Aristotle talked about justice is actually the ideal mean between getting more than your due or getting less than your due. Justice is a tension in itself. <clears throat> yeah. So, within that context, I ran into this clarity management. And if you're interested in this, I think I put it on your on your uh, your slides. Uh, there's a book from Barry Johnson called Clarity Management. But if you just Google clarity management, you'll find some interesting stuff out there. It's actually a business management concept. Barry Johnson, in particular, and there's another one, Robert Quinn's work on competing values framework. Um, both of them were management people that. Started studying management theories, and all these kind of hot theories would come out. Like, the manager needs to be a collaborator, the manager needs to be a strong leader, and all these kind of things. And they realized, at, uh, over 30 years, there was all these hot concepts that would become bestsellers, but, but then kind of die off. Right? And the reason for that is they say the heart of good management right, is managing tensions. Right? That you don't want to just be a, a really good employee, you know, like love your employees and be nice to your employees, right? Uh, but if you're being a really tough boss, then becoming nice to your employees isn't going to make a difference because you're kind of negotiating that tension. Right? So they put all these, Robert Quinn's work in particular, kind of puts all these management theories in context with each other and say management is all about managing tensions. Short term versus long term, being employee oriented versus being kind of hard headed, um, focusing on doing one thing really well, focusing on being very broad and doing lots of different things, focusing on being innovative versus focusing on you know your core business. Those are all tensions, but none of them are right answer, and the extremes are bad. Right? Uh, so this is one example. This kind of you know you can think about this in terms of teaching or think about it in terms of your boss, right? Uh, so it's you know. To what degree do you like clear directions and clear guidelines? So imagine a situation, uh, I just got a new job. Right? And I come home the first day to my wife and say, oh man, this is such a nice job. My job, my boss just is, I exactly know what I'm supposed to do. Clear directions, I know exactly what I'm doing. Gives me great feedback, ah, oh, it's a wonderful job. Right? Over time, that you know, clear directions and clear guidelines tends to slide down, right? <laughs> and that same boss that seems so wonderful, right, now seems rigid and impractical, right? I come home after work saying, my goodness, they don't let me think of myself, right? I mean, just exactly, I have to do everything in his way all the time, it's just crazy, right? So finally, I quit my job, and I go work for a friend of mine, because a friend of mine is very flexible, this is the reason, right? And, and that seems to solve my problem, right? The, my problem became my boss is rigid, to solve my problem, I go to a flexible boss. I come home the first day of work. Oh, it's so nice. 
my job. Oh, and I just get to you know, think for myself and do my own thing. You know, it gives me some sense of what he wants, but I can do it my own way. It's so wonderful. Over time, <laughs> that flexibility tends to kind of slide down to this. Right? I come home and say, oh my goodness gracious, he has no clue. I have no idea what I'm supposed to do. I don't know how I'm getting evaluated. Right? It's just ridiculous. He never gives me a straight answer to anything. Right? Uh, so that becomes a problem. Right? So I quit my job. Right? And I go back and I find a job. I get, you know, a boss who gives me clear directions. And I come home and I tell my wife, oh, my new boss, she's so wonderful. You know, and vice versa. So this figure eight is a typical way. And, and, and what Barry Johnson talks about is that's when we misdiagnose managing a polarity as a problem. Right? We see rigidity and impracticality as a problem, so we solve it by going to its opposite. Right? But the problem is, you know, you can't have someone who gives you clear directions and clear guidelines without also having someone who's going to be somewhat rigid and impractical. Right? And you can't have someone who's flexible and listens to reason without also having someone who's going to be ambiguous and gives you lack of direction. Uh, so, what we, what we do with these kind of things is, is often we we've, we've, we've pre-identified the tension based on public discourse or a survey or whatever, so that we, you know, we I explain, I do exactly what I just did, kind of using this example, and then we identify the tension, uh, and we have people kind of work through that tension. Right? Uh, so here's an example of one that we actually did with K-12 teachers, with, with secondary school teachers, right? Between uh, they should know kind of between consistency and flexibility. Right? Uh, consistency is, is typically a good term, right? If someone says someone's consistent, that's normally a, a, a compliment, right? Can anyone think of a, an, an insult that basically means consistency? If someone is consistent, they're dogmatic, right? Or they're closed minded. You know, that line between good consistency and bad consistency is, is pretty great. And just like the same thing, the line between good flexibility and bad flexibility, right? Uh, so what we do is, you see in the worksheet, uh, we give them a, a, a worksheet that has the case for blank, the case for blank, and then when blank dominates blank too much, right? So these words were brainstormed during our group, right? And what I normally do, if I'm doing this as a public process, is I hand out these worksheets to every participant. I give them five minutes to brain up on their own. I try to put at least one or two statements in every single one of those boxes, right? Then the table shares their boxes with the full table, so then my students fill it out for the table. And then if we have time, then we record out. So as a whole group of 100, we kind of have one big one. Somewhere. But the simple idea is, you know, make the case for consistency. When, consistency. when we focus on consistency and it goes well, what happens? Right? What are some of the words that connect? What are some of the results that we have? Base, best case scenario. Right? Uh, so, so the group kind of fills this out. And particularly with K-12, consistency is important for measurement. Right? People that like data. We need everyone doing the same thing so that data is, is rigorous and invaluable, right? Um, and, and that makes the case for kind of top down, right? We need every school to do science the same way so we can kind of see what schools are doing it better and those type of things, right? So all these words are, are good. Tradition and fairness and reliability and measures and standards. And then we do the same thing, okay? The flexibility goes well. When we provide people flexibility and it, and it works wonderfully, what happens? Right? They fill out all those words. Then we make them fill out the bottom. What happens when we focus too much on consistency. And, and you know, they fill out all these bad words about that and kind of same thing that. And, and the power of change, I mean, you're essentially changing the polarity, right? As they come into the meeting, if I pick a good tension, there are some people that are all about consistency, right? And this is how they think, right? The consistency people see all the wonderful things about consistency and all the horrible things about flexibility, right? And the flexibility people are the opposite. So they can't talk to each other. They can't understand. How could anyone think testing is a good idea, right? But then when we sit them down and as a group give them the assignment to fill out one of these worksheets, right? Everyone pretty much agrees these are good things. and Everyone pretty much agrees these are bad things. Right? At the beginning of the meeting, it's this side against this side. At the end of the meeting, it's we all want the top and we all want to avoid the bottom. You change the conversation. At the beginning of the meeting, we're oppositional, right? At the end of the meeting, we're side by side saying, okay, this is what we want. We want to avoid this stuff, and we want to get this stuff, right? Um, so then, now, so now, now you've mapped the polarity, you've mapped the tension, right? Uh, and it creates aha moments, it creates understanding, right? Because if I'm the consistency person, now I'm like, oh, this, yeah, I'm against that stuff too. And that's what you're focused on, right? 
Um, and, and, you know, so, so you're, you're creating thinking. People are, and this is, we go back to the responsibility as a facilitator, is to help people understand the kind of drawbacks of their position and the advantages of the opposing position. That's what clarity management does, right? I recognize that, yeah, I'm for consistency, but yeah, I recognize that we focus too much on consistency, we get this bad stuff. Right? Or it goes back to aerosol, there's a long continuum, right? Uh, so down here is when consistency, when we're on the far left end, and we have all consistency, no flexibility, right? This is kind of you know, a fourth way through where we have consistency dominating flexibility, more consistency and flexibility, but not too much. Then in the middle, you know, and then, then here's where flexibility is, is, is revered a little bit more than consistency. And then here's where we're on the far right end where flexibility dominates. Right? And most people, once you kind of lay it out that way, agree that the extremes aren't good. So then the question becomes, where are we here? Um, yeah, so here's kind of what the worksheet that you have in front of you. Uh, you know, sometimes we fill it out if we know what the tension is going going in, and then sometimes it becomes a process. I did a process with a K-12 staff, with a, a staff of teachers at elementary school, and we first at, I gave a lecture about tensions and, and, and polarities, and then I said, so what are some of the polarities in your work? I, I, same thing, I had them work in their groups first. Right? Everyone write down, you know, on, on an index card, write down two or three tensions you see in your work. And they shared it at their table, and then each table reported out kind of the most kind of key tension that they, they talked about. So then I, I had a list on the, I typed them up on the keypads. So we had a list of ten tensions in the room, and then we asked them to prioritize all those tensions, which are the most important, right? And they picked you know, them, and then they prioritized it with the keypads, the top three. I sent it back to the table. I said, okay, you know, do, a, do a worksheet on one of those for the top three, right? And again, you just could. And it, for, for bosses, it's wonderful, right? Uh, because you know when people are kind of polarized in a sense, you automatically kind of have this, this assumption that you're making where they're coming from, and it makes it so much easier when someone's complaining, like, oh, "Okay, that's what you're 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 down here, right?" But it helps you know that you can, you can kind of change the conversation a lot. Right? So here's the step, steps of the exercise. I think I have this on the back, right? Yeah. So it's on the back of your worksheet. And the first, the clarity of our tension is identified our name. Sometimes what I name them beforehand. Sometimes we have a process to name them. Uh, in the groups, you rank for the positives of each one at a time, and then in the best possible case, then you complete the out of balance, the bottom kind of row. Uh, sometimes if we have time, we, we I always like to work. And this goes back to the expert introvert. If possible, I always act, like to ask people individual questions, have them write them down, then share them with the group if you have time. Uh, that you're going to get a lot more ideas and a lot more to work with in a sense. Plus, if you have everyone write them down, you can collect that. Right? So that now I have all the individual uh, responses, so I can see how often things come up. But then I also have the refined responses after they go through a group process. Um, the other thing that we do sometimes, we did this with schools, I think up here next step, is once you kind of identify attention, so you have that continuum from complete flexibility to complete consistency and everything in between. Uh, when we were working with lots of schools, we identified these 10, I'll show you in a second, 10 tensions within kind of secondary education. Uh, and then we asked them, for your school, where are you on this tension, right? Uh, from consistency to flexibility, where do you think the school should be, right? Some people might put it right in the middle, right? Perfect balance. Some might say, you know what, we need to be kind of more on the flexibility side, and some people might, you know. Uh, and then we asked them, where do you think your school lives? So where's your personal preference of how to negotiate that tension, and how do you think that tension is currently being negotiated? Yeah. I'm just curious, when you set this meeting up, what was the purpose of the meeting? Like, Why did people decide to show up? How did you sort of frame what people were going to do? Yeah, so I mean, the work we did, we did some work with a particular elementary school that was uh, dealing with, so they had a new, new principal come in. Uh, the old principal had been there for 20 years and, and was kind of seen as a, as a, a, as a Pro teacher, you know, letting the teachers do what they want, right? Uh, but the, the scores started going down, right? That principal retired. They put in a new principal who was told, kind of by the by the district, to kind of shake things up and change things up and take more control, you know. Uh, so there was kind of a rebellion of the teachers that weren't used to this top-down leadership because they were so used to before, right? So they came. They brought me in in particular to kind of talk about that tension in a way of how do we kind of balance this top-down need to change things. Uh, you know, what's the role of so principal versus the teacher? Uh, Top down versus you know, <laughs> improving uh, relations? No, I mean, I, yeah, I think it was just kind of improving improving communication across staff. Okay. Right? Because a lot of it was just giving them, I mean, it gave them a way of talking, right? So instead of saying, oh, you just, you, you don't want to give teachers any flexibility, it's like, okay, what you're saying is all about consistency, right? 
but then it also opens up for me to say, well, the problem is if you focus so much on consistency, you're losing, you know, so it gave them a way of talking that was, was easier to talk without having to attack each other, right? Um, but, you know, this process, let me kind of get to it here while I'll come back to this. So th this was a bigger meeting that I did with um, the Colorado Association of School Boards. There's about 100 school board members in the room, and I just wanted to kind of give a lecture on clarity management. Uh, the, the focus of that particular conference was on technology, how much should we kind of focus on online teaching and those type of things versus face-to-face. -face. So I think we focus on that tension. Everyone completed a worksheet on this, you know, face-to-face -face teaching versus online teaching. So again, <coughs> online goes well, what happens? What's the best case scenario, right? And then when face-to-face -face goes well, and then when we focus just on face-to-face -face and don't have any online, you know, what are the negatives? And we focus too much on online and forget face-to-face. -face. Right? So they all kind of included that. And then I asked them this, where do you stand on the tension? Right? So this is the answer to that room with a whole bunch of school board members. Right? So a lot of them saying, we kind of need the middle balance, we need a little bit of both. Right? And then we ask them, where do you see your district? Right? Oh, I think that's somebody that normally comes up with me. Right? <laughs> but we did this for different ones. For me, as a delivered practitioner helping this organization improve, right? If the mean score is pretty close, right? You know, if the where they think it should be, where it is, is pretty close, that means, okay, we're doing the job. Right? Where the mean score and where they think they should be is very different, that means we need to talk about this more, right? That's a problem, that people think it's kind of out of balance in a way. So then we start talking a little bit more on how to change that balance. Uh, so this is some mechanisms we do to kind of spark the conversation. So these are 10 kind of tensions within K-12 that I've been working with the last few years, right? Um, and you see consistency versus flexibility. This is measurement, standards, and testing, right? There's such an emphasis on that now, but that relies on consistency, right? But it's that recognition that if we're going to really focus on testing, then we're going to lose some innovation and flexibility. And going back again, we'll get into this a little bit more. Just because I'm saying it's a tension, I don't I'm not implying it's a zero sum, that it's an automatic dichotomy, right? There are ways to transcend the tension. There are ways to kind of do it both, right? Can we have testing and innovation? Yeah, there's some ways to do that, right? But it is also a natural tension that the more we tend to focus on consistency, we're going to inherently lose innovation unless we, we figure out that way. Um, here's the basic or STEM versus whole child and specials that I kind of mentioned yesterday. Right? Strong leadership versus collaboration that I kind of talked about. Right? Uh, so we kind of asked them, you know, which of these are kind of most important to you? Right? And that's kind of how they answer. Right? So that local control versus state and federal that I talked about. Right? Um, and then we had them at their tables, kind of, okay, pick one of these top three and kind of, so everyone completed a worksheet on the, on the technology one, and then people uh, identify one other worksheet. Yeah, this is how I asked where you see your district. So, once you have it mapped out well, I think this is in the back of your worksheet as well, right? That, that, yeah, the potential strategies. Right? So, once you have the map, everyone's going to, so now you've created some mutual understanding, right? We all understand this tension. People might be in very different places on how to best negotiate the tension, right? So, then I offer these as kind of a way, of, okay, let's think now, how do we react to this? Right, because we don't want to just see the tension and say we need balance. So like, what do we do? Uh, so this is the move to action in a way, right? So first is you can recognize the tension, but still prefer one side while accepting the trade-off. What we don't want is people to have blinders on, right? We don't want people to say, "I want flexibility." There is no problem. Flexibility is wonderful, right? So sometimes you might say, "Yeah, I recognize." Well, going back to the superintendent search, I recognize we can't have a strong leader and a collaborator, right? But you know what? With the, with the situation that our district is facing right now, we need a strong leader. Right? We need some changes. We need some changes quick. Right? You know, collaboration is, is wonderful, but it takes too much time. Uh, so with this tension between a strong leader and collaborator, I'm going to lead a strong leader, but I recognize we're losing something with that. Right? So that's the preferral. Once you recognize the tension, sometimes you're saying, because of our situation, that might be temporary. You might say, you know what, for now, we need a strong leader. Right? We need to revisit this right? um, and, and come back kind of a little later on. Right? Or you might recognize the tension and seek balance. This is kind of the Aristotelian. Right? Now we need to find that perfect middle ground between strong leader and, and um, collaborator. Right? Or you might recognize the tension and seek to transcend or integrate. Right? We, we have some of that today, right? That we, we can do science and gardening at the same time, right? We can read about science, right? We don't have to make those choices, right? Um, you know, yeah, we're not making a choice between math and, and music. You know, math is, is critical to music, right? So we can kind of teach math and music at the same time. But, but, we tend not to do that innovation and transcending unless we're talking about that. Right? Often we have the blinders on, we're only seeing one side, you don't have to transcend. Right? 
right? But once you recognize this is the inherent tension, that's when you can spark that creativity, right? How can we have the best of both worlds? And I'm doing another little bit of work trying to do a typology of tensions, right? So some tensions do seem to be natural opponents, right? That transcended its horror. It's kind of one or the other. But there's a lot of other tensions that I'm kind of more calling resource tensions, right? So like the uh, one of the tensions I had on there was between uh, um, dealing with the achievement gap. You know, the United States low income and minority groups can tend to score badly they go to college less than a bad. So there's a lot of focus on achievement gaps and helping kids catch up. And then there's a lot of focus on gifted and talented. Right? When he was talking about her kids are doing gifted and talented testing today, right? Uh, so the, the tension there is the really good parents have gifted and talented kids. They're the vocal parents that show up, and you know. Uh, whereas in some ways, the schools probably need to focus more on the kids falling behind with the role of the schools and kind of you know. But there's an imbalance. So how much now? Those don't automatically go against each other. It's more of a resource. How many teachers do I assign it? How much time do I assign, spend to it? But there is seems to be a tension. Are you focusing on those falling behind? Or are you focusing on the top ten percent to make sure they excel? Right. Yes. Yeah, so there's different kinds of tensions. Some are easier to transcend than others. Having the gifted and talented kids working with those kids is one way, you know, that now you're kind of seeing them more as mentors and teachers, so they're learning that skill while also helping, you know. Uh, so, so those are dynamic, the, the tensions that are really kind of hard to do top down versus bottom up, it's kind of hard to transcend that tension, right? Um, but other tensions are easier to transcend. Uh, you can recognize the tension and focusing on developing nimbleness, right? One thing that came up, um, I think I was facilitating, so I couldn't jump into it and kind of get my opinion. But we did a lot of work with the uh, Northern Colorado Workforce Initiative. Right? And a lot of it became, how can we get the local schools, so CSU, UNC, and a community college, to be more nimble to kind of develop programs that the, the current industries need. Right? The problem is higher ed moves really, really, really slow, and business moves really, really fast. Right? So part of that conversation became, we need to be more nimble. Education needs to kind of figure out how to negotiate that tension better in a way, right? Uh, so this is your recognized attention. You think about how do we kind of bounce back and forth a little bit more, right? Uh, and then last, you recognize attention, but allow different groups to seek alternative needs. So one way schools have done this between the kind of STEM and whole child is have different schools, right? So you said you, you said your kid to a Montessori school, right? I think you said you're working with STEM schools, right? And there's art schools, and there's you know, so then you give those options in a sense. So then if I want my kid to focus on kind of art and whole child, I have an option to do that, right? Or the same thing, if you have an organization that's struggling with you know, short-term versus long-term, you can say, hey, you know what? Here's a special committee that's always going to be focused on the long-term, right? They're going to meet once a week and just talk about long-term trends and big picture stuff, right? But the rest of the organization is going to focus on short-term, right? You know, so there's ways of negotiating the tension and then kind of trying to divide it up in a sense. Let's have some people focus on each. And then maybe meet once a year to kind of you know, see where we are on the balance between that. Right? So, uh, or, or you can disagree with attention. That's one option I always have, is I, I don't want people to say, because again, I always have this part of my head that's saying, you're creating false dichotomies, right? You're creating tension when there isn't there, right? So I always want to leave it open. And this is kind of an important point as we get into issue framing in the afternoon. All the stuff that I create for my, for my uh, meetings, for people to react to, it's always kind of a living document. It's always something to react to. I never, I, I specifically, I explicitly say I got things wrong. Going back to the reaching for every tool ideal, I didn't frame this perfectly, right? I, I, I framed it to react, I framed it to spark, spark a good conversation, but I know I got things wrong. And I always incorporate in the process chances for them to correct things. I always tell them, write, you know, write some ideas down and come and hand it to me if you think I got it wrong. But I'm also trying to, I, I often have like a ground rule or explain, it's like, Work with it for the day, right? Especially with academics, right? Academics can tear any document apart, right? So if you open it up to criticize the document, they'll spend two hours criticizing the document and never actually talk about the issue, right? So I'm saying for the next two hours, just try to make it work as well as possible, right? If you've got problems with it, feel free to write up or email me, you know, and we're constantly adapting, constantly changing. I normally have a survey question on the survey that says, what's wrong with the background? What needs to change, you know? And that's kind of creating, uh, somewhere where they can complain, right? So they don't necessarily complain at the table that they're actually doing the process, right? So that's why I always gonna have these safety valves, or a little safety valve, that if you think, you know, this is false, you know, like you're creating tension when it isn't there, then we give them that option to do that. Uh, so I don't know if we want to, we do have food down, so 
why don't we take a break now and grab the food, and then we come back. I don't know if we want to pick attention as a group and kind of fill it out, or if we want to talk about tensions and kind of issues that you're dealing with, or. Really, again, structured conversation in some way to get people to think about different issues, right? Uh, so these bullet points are just kind of this is almost like my cheat sheet as I'm finishing a process and thinking through it. So what are all the things I need to think about uh, to incorporate into that process before people kind of come together, right? Um, so I don't know if uh, again I'm not, I'm not going to walk all the way through this. We don't have too much time to spend on this because we want to spend a lot of time on issue framing before we're done today. Um, but I don't know if, it, if any of those bullet points jump out at you. Um, if you want to, you can spend a little time kind of talking to it. Does anyone else need one of those? We got, we got extras here. What does conflict management procedure mean? How do we deal with conflict when it comes up? Mm -hmm. right. So, you know, and part of that is I'll kind of talk about this is we're analyzing issues beforehand. If we know that there's people that really disagree that being in the same room is going to be a problem, then how do we think about it? One example of this where I'm really trying to develop that one of the first things that we did was that great configuration I mentioned. Uh, to give a little bit of background, is our local schools, you know, it's, it's kindergarten to 12th grade. It used to be uh, elementary schools were K to 6, then junior highs were 7, 8, 9, and high schools were 10, 11, 12. Right? The norm is a four year high school. You know, the norm is K to 5, and then three year junior high, and a four year high school. But we were K to 6, and then a three year to four year, right? or a three to three year. Uh, so the school district was looking at changing it. Right? And essentially, by moving the ninth graders up to high school and moving the sixth graders up to junior high, right? it was very much a wicked problem. Because everyone wanted sixth graders to stay in elementary school. They were actually saw it as a, a, another year of childhood. Right? If you send sixth graders to junior high, they're growing up too fast. You're throwing them to the wolves. Right? So everyone wanted sixth graders to stay in elementary school, but everyone wanted ninth graders to be in high school. Right? Ninth graders need to be in high school. This counts towards college now. Right? High school had a much varied curriculum, and there are bigger schools. And, you know, so everyone wanted ninth graders in high school, everyone wanted sixth graders in elementary school. No one wanted to your junior highs. Right? Uh, so at first, it was this very kind of Conflict, right? You know, everyone blamed the superintendent, the new superintendent, so blame the, you know, blame the, the devil figure, right? It's all his fault, whatever. Uh, it was almost textbook. It was our first real event, right? Um, <laughs> I still remember I was at, we had like four rooms going. Um, well, first of all, we had four rooms going, and then I walked away for a second to call my wife and say, "Yeah, there's about 100 people here." Things that you know, like first event, and all of a sudden someone goes. Who the heck's in charge here? I'm like, well, God, I, don't know. I run back. This guy, like, why the heck am I in there talking to a CSU student? So I kind of explain, well, you know, I'm, uh, it's a new organization. We're the Center for Public Relations. We train the students to be facilitators. They're in each room, kind of, we're here as an impartial resource. So we're collecting all the data. Everything we write down is going to go to the school district. Well, where the heck is the superintendent? I'm like, I'm pretty sure, sure the superintendent's in this room. We have an assistant superintendent in this room. I think they're going to rotate and listen, right? But we're running it. He's like, oh, that's pretty cool. And he went back in. Okay. Uh, so that happened. Um, and then later on, the superintendent came out and was chatting with me. And then the assistant superintendent walked out of the room and said, I've never seen that before. And it's like, what? It's like, there's this woman. She was so angry at the ridiculous notion of moving sixth graders up. But then a woman on the other side of the table who had a ninth grader kind of explained why she needed her ninth grader in high school. And the first woman like, understood her and made sense, you know. <laughs> and they had never seen interaction, right? Because all their processes been one at a time in a microphone. So they let each person rant, but they never had a process. You know? So it was this perfect, our first event ever, it was like this textbook case of you have a round table and a process, and people listen to each other, and they realize, oh, that makes sense. I never thought about that, you know. And it's really hard to demonize the other parent. It's easy to demonize the superintendent, you know. Uh, but anyway, in that process, I remember, um, again, this is our first night. I learned so many lessons our first night. Um, afterwards, uh, uh, someone came in and said, you know, those participants, and said, you know what, I'm a, I'm a conflict negotiation person, but I'm also a parent. I was here. I was like, your, your students did great, except one thing, right? There was two people that really disagreed in our room, and then let them go too long. And part of it was the conflict management kind of paradigm right? so that the, the students were thinking we need to resolve that conflict, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but within deliberation, I don't need to come to consensus, right? Our groups are trying to explore the issue, to understand the issue, to get us good data about how people talk about the issue. We don't have to come to, we don't, we're not coming to agreement, you know, in like most cases of our thing, right? So now we teach our students, it's like, okay, you want to mind that conflict, you want to understand that conflict, you want to make sure both sides are actually you know, we don't want them to talk past each other, right? We don't want them to exaggerate the conflict. 
But once we understand the conflict, once the two of you, you know what she means and she knows what you mean, y'all still might very much disagree, but at least you understand each other. And if we're done, we can move on. Right? So that's the conflict management thing. Like, if conflict comes up, do we need to resolve it? Like, if, like if we were working for Matthew's house at a retreat and they had to make a decision, we have to resolve the conflict, right? We have to agree to disagree or whatever, right? But if we're doing a public engagement thing that we have 20 groups going to give feedback on a policy, each individual group's not deciding. So as long as we understand the conflict, give them the notes and move on, right? So we actually tell our students that if there's a conflict between two people, once it plays out, Say, okay, so what I wrote down is that for you, this is very important, where for you, this is really important. Does that get it? Yes, okay, now let's move on, right? So you're cutting off that conflict, because you don't want everyone else to have to listen to this conflict between us, right? So that's what we say, conflict, we, we have to think through and teach our students. If someone really disagrees, to what degree do we need to spend time resolving that, and then to what degree can you, we have this perfect, for the river stuff, some very passionate people. So we had the, a mayor of a small town close to us that really needed this reservoir, and then the, the associate director of the Save the Pooter, this interest group that was very pro river, and they were just going at it. Um, and both probably 40 years old, and, and my facilitator, a 17 year old female, we have this on tape, right? They went back and forth, and said, okay, stop. It. Right. I'm going to give you 10 seconds, summarize your opinion, we're writing it down. I'm going to give you 10 seconds, summarize your opinion, we'll write it down, now we're moving on, right? And that's exactly what she should have done, right? But it was great to see the 17-year-old just kind of stop these two men and say, we're done, right? Uh, so that's a somewhat long answer to your quick question. <laughs> Any others in there we want to make lots of choices, obviously, <laughs> in designing. Kind of. We talked a little bit, the second to last one, closure option. We talked a little bit about that yesterday, right? That you know, when you do small groups, people always feel like, I don't know what's going on. So I, you know, there's lots of ways for us to think about and give them uh, uh, some sort of closure to feel at the end of the meeting that they've accomplished something, um, that their time is used well. Someone asked earlier, the third bullet point, convening the audience development method. You know, sometimes we're much more scientific. We have a random sample um, that takes a lot of money, so I don't tend to do that. But in my field, um, they, they tend to do that sometimes. Sometimes it's, it's it's an invited audience. I have specific people that we're kind of inviting to represent. You know, I did something for the Downtown Business Association on a conflict uh, about uh, the boxes. You know, the little newspaper boxes that they start. There was no rules, so there was just more and more boxes in each a different color, each a different size, and start looking ugly. Right? So the Downtown Business Association said, hey, we'll pay for it, but we're going to have one big thing that has 10 slots, and then people can kind of rent slots out of us, but it's all uniform. But then all the, all the, the, the newspaper companies were like, no, that takes away our freedom of speech and all this kind of stuff, you know, and, and we can't differentiate each other from each other. You know, my box is part of my, my branding, and, you know, so I ran a process where several business owners and several of the, of the different media groups kind of come together. So for that one, it was invited. We wanted specific representatives, and that group was empowered to make a decision in a sense. Right? Whereas most of our events are just public. We, we, know, we get in the newspaper, we send out press releases, but then we also, and you'll see this the state moment now in a second, we identify key groups that be there, and then we try to get them there. Right? That's why we often do the pre-surveys, where we ask their graphics so we can see if there's a group that we need there that's not coming, then we work a little bit harder to get them there. Right? But we also recognize that that's, it's going to be unbalanced. Right? Some people are going to you know, over people can mobilize and show up that are against something and kind of dominate the conversations in some senses. Right. Um, so that, that that's always kind of a tension in there between inviting or how much control you have over the audience in a sense. Um, and it's difficult in particular. The biggest challenge for me in terms of convening an audience is like for most events, the more the merrier, right? Let's get as many people that can come, right? It'd be great. So you just publicize it and get articles written and stuff. I'm trying to do small group discussions, right? Uh, so I might have, say, 20 students available to show up, and, and I need two students at every table, right? So that means I can cover 10 tables. We can, we can fit 80 people. I can cover 80 people, right? So I'm trying to PR this event to get 80 people to show up. And 90 people would be a problem, right? Uh, and really, 70 people is great. 70 people means I just have you know seven people per table versus eight, right? Um, so it's really hard that we start publicizing things, but then at some point I get scared, like too many people are going to show up, right? Um, and I've had the newspaper call me, "Hey, we're going to write an article about your event." No, no, don't do that. Take more people. Right? You know, you so find, there's this tension about. Uh, do you, know? you have find that when you um, register people? 
that about 30% do not show up? Yeah, okay. yeah. so we do RSVPs. We normally say RSVP preferred. Yeah. Uh, or sometimes, if we, if we think it's going to be a pretty tight audience, uh, we'll say that RSVP guarantees you the spot, right? Um, and, and so then when they're walking in, if they RSVP, we give them an aim tag. If we're, if we're close to full, like if we could fit 80, you know, so we RSVP'd in an 80, we said, okay, no more RSVPs. If someone walks up, we say, well, wait, if someone doesn't show up, we'll, you know, we can set them later. Um, but, <laughs> Yeah, we normally find out that the RSVP number is actually pretty good, mm -hmm. but the reason it's good is 100 people are RSVP, 70 of those people will show up, and then 30 random people will show up. Mm -hmm. So it happens to work out that 100 people showed up, but it's not the 100 people that said they're going to show up. Mm -hmm. right? But it gives us a pretty good sense of, of, of how many we'll, we'll have, in a way. But I, I know we don't want to spend too much time on the community side of things, but I just wanted to open that up if any of these jump out at you. But. All right, so let's move on, and we're going to talk about issue framing, uh, which again is a good community, uh, classroom exercise um, and, and a good process to kind of have groups. And, group. and I talked about my class yesterday that it's almost like a semester project, that the final project for the semester after spending all semester on a topic is one of these discussion guides. But this is also something that can be a much shorter project, right? Uh, that you're doing. So we're going to give the basics, uh, a, a true issue framing workshop that teach you how to do this kind of on a public issue out there in the public. It's going to be much longer, right? But in terms of an academic exercise in a class, I think you know we got an hour and a half here, or two hours that we can kind of play with this. Uh, so that's a, that's a, yeah. So I got a few more slides here with this, um, and then we'll, we'll have a little exercise here that I'll do a little bit. So these are the. This is the broader steps. To, if I was doing it as a public process, right? So then doing it in class, you know, you'll you'll recognize that there'll be certain steps that you can kind of skip in a sense um, as we go. But I'll, I'll 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 walk through these really quickly, and then the, the presentation kind of walks through a little more slowly. Uh, so first, you need to identify a public issue right for deliberation. Um, and, and when I mean, and I have a slide here in a second about what you know rightness in a sense is another concept that we're kind of developing. Uh, but some issues, uh, some issues are technical issues, right? I don't have a deliberation about how we should build a bridge, right? That's a pretty scientific kind of technical issue in a sense, right? Uh, so there are certain issues that might be too technical or or, or specific. Uh, so obviously, the easiest way to think about it, an issue right for deliberation is a wicked problem, right? There's each different side is coming from a different perspective, and each side has a pretty good kind of support to it. Um, now, I've struggled with some issues that my students are passionate about. You know, we have a teacher in our department that's really passionate about human trafficking issues, right? Um, you know, and it's not a wicked issue in a traditional sense. You know, I, I don't think that people that are doing human trafficking have good values, right? <laughs> you know? Yeah. But you know, what should we do about human trafficking? There are some tensions about what's the best way to kind of deal with it, right? So we can kind of still engage it as an issue, but it's not quite quite a deliberation. Issue in, in the true sense of a wicked problem, right? Um, so we'll talk more about that in a second. So then, once you get a good issue that kind of fits the model, um, then you identify the underlying values and concerns, right? So I've talked a lot about that, and we've done that. Right? What are the values of these and what are the tensions between them? So the water map I showed you, right? And then after after each of the processes we've done, we talk about what are the key values, what are the values underlying this that we talked about. In this? That's the framework, the, the, the lens that you use. Uh, then you name the issue. So what's the title? What's going to be on your flyer? Or what's going to be on the issue book? Right? We had one of them was shaping our future. I think the, the other example I did is like, what should we do about childhood and obesity? I tend to like the title being a question. That what should we do about X? With X being, you know, a frame broadly that everyone agrees it's a problem, right? Uh, but there's lots of different ways, and I'll show you lots of examples. And I'm going to pass around the other examples that you brought. The other yes. books. Where did they go? Um, um, she just brought some more. They're on your table, right behind you. Oh, okay. Yeah. And y'all are welcome to prep after you look at them. Those are yeah. Nice. She's got a few. It's an old catalog, but it still gives you a sense of how they frame it. They have that online too. Um, All of these are online. Yeah. This is the NIF. At the end, I think one of the slides has a link to, to a lot of these issue books, right? Um, one of them being an AF. So I'll just kind of pass these. You can kind of grab one and look at it. But they're all the same kind of model. Here's a problem, and then here's three approaches. Um, sometimes four approaches on how to solve it, right? So you name the overall issue. You get a good name that everyone's going to agree with. It's not going to turn anyone off. I know that NIF was trying to develop one on global warming, but they realized once they really started engaging the issue, they wanted to kind of get everyone involved in that conversation. Uh, maybe not kind of strict deniers, but at least kind of conservatives. Mm -hmm. And they realized that they called it global warming, it only kind of spoke to some people, right? Mm -hmm. It ended up um, reframing it in a sense of, uh, 
you know, how do we kind of ensure energy security in a way, right? So I talked about energy security kind of opened up the conversation that broadened the audience. Um, that's always going to be a choice. If we're you know, thinking a little bit that we might play as a group with this homelessness issue, but I've done some work with and, and, and uh, getting your name out. Ben. Ben, yeah. Uh, and ben, ben is interested in it, so it might be kind of an issue for us to play with in a sense. But if we're going to design an issue, uh, a homelessness discussion guide, are, are we are we designing it for all audiences? Like for the people that think homeless, you know, are, are just individuals that make bad choices? You know, or is it more for people that care about homelessness and want to do it? You know, is it a tool for them to really think through the issues, right? And that's kind of one of the, how strategic are you designing it? How broad do you want the audience? Um, is a choice, right? Then you develop initial approaches, right? So that's when you develop the three approaches, right? And that's really the big reframing because you're getting away from a pro-con, yes, no framing to at least three, right? Uh, and then once you have the three approaches, then you start filling in blanks. For each approach, you want some specific actions. You saw that kind of the examples we used. You want some arguments for it. Also some arguments against. You want to identify some trade-offs and probably some key discussion questions, right? So you kind of lay it out. Uh, and then you research and refine the approach as I was developing it. It's very rare that I'll develop a book and we use it in the public. I only develop it and I test it, right? I, I, I test it with my students. I test it with some specific groups. I let other groups vet it. Right? With the river stuff, we developed it and then we shared it with a lot of these river groups to let them push back. Because we wanted, once we actually took it in the community, for it to be approved, right? And all the different sides felt this was a fair document. Um, and, then, and then you have a framework, right? Looks like you're going to have a question starting to go with that. Oh, um, when you're framing, do you, do you do you figure out the approaches yourself, or do you use surveys? It depends on time. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, if it's a public process, the more you can make the, the development of the framework a public process, the better. Yeah. Right? So, I'll talk about that. Uh, but then sometimes I don't have enough time. So, sometimes if, I mean, I need to research it. The, the question becomes, well, well, we'll get to it. Yeah. As you kind of go through. Because identifying the underlying values and concerns is, are you doing that? Or are you doing a process to do that? <laughs> is essentially the question, right? Uh, My question, how, how yeah. big is framing group? What's the best? How, what? how big should be the framing group? I, I suppose it's you. Like in terms of a class, or? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, I think like when, when NIF does it, when they develop these national books, they probably have a pretty big group, right? I know we're in the middle of, of one that's developing in for substance abuse. Uh, kind of issues, uh, and it's probably about a group of 15 or so from different, lots of different communities. Uh, in my classes, I do a group of four. It is a group project in a sense because there's a lot of research involved in it. Uh, but I imagine you could also, I mean, I, I've created some just by myself, right? That we have an issue that kind of happens, we want a reaction, I knew enough about the issue, so I'm able to kind of put it together kind of on my own in a sense. So it kind of, I think the more the better, but the more is going to take more time, and you know, it's that collaboration kind of thing, right? Uh, so yeah, I don't know. There's a direct answer to that in a sense. Uh, so I, I don't want to walk through all of this. You have it in there, uh, uh, but that question of what issues fit this, right? Um, uh, I've said no to quite a few projects that people come to me because of some of these red flags. Uh, part of the question is, will getting people in the room to talk about this be productive or unproductive? I've had a lot of people ask me to do fracking that we need to have a meeting about fracking. Um, I spent a summer with some research for, for some graduate students trying to frame fracking, and, and we realized with it that there's just very little information that both sides agree with. Like both sides just have a completely different set of data, uh, and both sides have so little distrust of each other. I'm like, if we need people in the room to talk about fracking, it's like, they'll just yell at I mean, there's no basis, you know, there's just not enough common ground uh, to, to, to change that conversation yet, right? Um, so so um, I kind of said no to that, right? Um, you know, so there's some issues that don't fit this very well, or just not ripe enough. They're not ready yet for deliberation. Uh, but most of the issues that, that we tackle, there's not only an angle that we can do, right? Uh, you know, so the signs of ripeness, green flag, and I'm not saying if you have a red flag, stop. It's just you've got lots of red flags. Uh, so it doesn't primarily involve tensions between positive values, right? You know, so if there's each side has some positive values, then that, that's something you can really work with, right? Um, when, when it's more of a zero sum that, you know, automatically what's good for one side is bad for the other side, that's going to be harder to have a little bit of thing. I was asked by my university, do you have bans smoking on campus yet? Um, yeah, well, they have to They have to go outside and think there's a smoking area, right? Smoking yeah. area, okay, yeah. So about 1,100 campuses have bans smoking altogether. Okay. Like no smoking on campus whatsoever, right? 
So our campus wanted to look at that. Uh, and at first I thought it would be a deliberative, but then I realized this is the majority deliberating about the action of a minority, right? And it is really, it's a oh, bad behavior that the minority are doing that the majority wants to control, you know? So, so there's really, you know, for the people that don't smoke, they're not giving anything up to have this policy, you know? So then I realized once we started getting into it, it's like, this isn't really something to deliberate, right? What do we do with these small groups in a way? Because there's, there's, there's not a reciprocity, there's not a balance in a sense, right? Um, so that's one way. Uh, the second, right, is all major uh, stakeholder groups realize the need for action. That desperation can actually be an asset, right? And liberation works best when everyone realizes the status quo is not working, we need to do something, right? If there's people that particularly prefer the status quo, especially if they're powerful people, deliberation is a little harder, right? If people are, are the, the, just, just the dysfunction, the problem is good for some people, right? Uh, so that's when we're talking about activism and kind of dealing with power relationships, you know, deliberation might not always be the best tool in some sense, right? um, unless you're getting those groups to kind of agree to the deliberation. Um, Need for broad action by many stakeholders, yeah, this kind of is the smoking thing. Right? It's best when whatever results, whatever actions come up, it's a broad range of action. Going back to the, the, you know, the uh, democratic governance, right? There's role for individuals, there's role for nonprofits, for private industry. Yeah, there's some policy change, right? There's lots of potential action, and that gives you a lot to work with. Right? It's very hard to do a deliberation, but by a, a referendum issue, right? If it's a yes or no, pass this law or not, it's very hard to have a very rich deliberation because you're really only coming up with a yes or no answer. Right? Actually, the, so end of life issues, right? Um, you know, there was a big controversy last few months of a little woman that moved to Oregon that had brain cancer. I don't know if y'all saw that issue at all, right? So Oregon has a law, a right to die law, so she can actually get poison from her, her uh, doctor to, to end her life. Uh, she had a form of brain cancer that really changes her personality. Right, so she didn't want to continue living because she didn't want all her family to kind of remember her once it really kind of changes her completely. Right, so she chose to take her own life. So our state legislature in four four Collins uh, brought that same law to Colorado. Right, and then she wanted us to run meetings. This was like literally two weeks ago. Right, uh, and it's like it's hard for me to run a meeting on a specific law. Right. Uh, because people have more vested interests and they don't move their deliberation is all about refining and changing your opinion. And if it's a yes no on a law, that, that, that's you know you're, you're switching from yes to no versus you know being flexible along the continuum. Right. Just today I read in the paper that it didn't make it out of committee. Right. So it's not going to be a law that the legislators vote on. So now I can do a process. Right. Uh, so now let's have a conversation in our community about end of life with the broad ideas of what we could do, right? Now my community will be educated on it. Next year, she can read the law again, right? But the fact that the law didn't make it out of committee or the bill didn't make it out of committee actually helps me, right? Because now we're not constrained to, to frame it as a yes, no question on that specific law. That's a, I think the liberation can be uh, is uh, an element of blockage. Uh, yeah. yeah, I just think it's, it's better earlier in the process, mm -hmm. right? Deliberation is better to kind of think about the problem of potential actions. When we get to the point that we're voting yes or no on a law, mm -hmm. it's framed so narrowly, right? Not only is it framed so narrowly, but the winners and losers are clear, right? It's very, like, we took on this stadium, the stadium issue has been my typical, my most typical issue. Uh, so CSU has a football team, like all American colleges, right? Uh, and our stadium is three miles away, right? Um, on the foothills, so it's but it's old and it's, it's, it needs a lot of work. Uh, but by not having a stadium on campus, right, the, the advantage of having a stadium on campus is every time you have a football game, 30,000 people, a lot of your alumni, come to campus. Right? They walk around the campus and they see their dorm room and they go see their department. You know? So for alumni relationships, having people on campus is huge. right? So the new athletic director and the new president said, we're going to build a new stadium that's going to be on campus. All hell breaks loose, right? We're a very environmentally conscious university in Colorado, right? So to build a second stadium, right? And to use campus space for a stadium, and to spend $200 million on a stadium when, when faculty haven't gotten raises and all that. Now, the $200 million is going to be raised, right? It's not university funds, but still the symbolism. You know, so it's a huge controversy. So the, the president of the university asked me to help run meetings about the stadium. But again, it was a yes, no issue. Right, um, and, and so it was really hard for us to have the comments. The people against the stadium, it's very unlikely, and they're so against the stadium for them to move their opinion. When, when all I'm really asking, are you for it or against it? Right? 
But if we would have done it earlier, right, if we wanted to have a deliberation about the role of athletics at the university, or, you know, then we could have had a conversation. But once we decided it was already kind of put on the table to be a yes no, it makes it really hard to have a really robust deliberation about it. Right. One exception to that, I think about how much this is worth talking about. Uh, so the citizens jury, right, is a process, and we've done we've done this, and it's worked pretty well. Um, Colorado and, and some states have a lot of referendum issues, right? So they put voters, they, they put some vote to the voters, right? So the example of the change in the education funding in Colorado was referendum issue. Go to the voters and they can vote yes or no. Right? Uh, so the, the state of Oregon has what's called a citizens initiative review. Now what they do is every year they take one or two issues that are going up for referendum um, and they, they have a grant to do this. They get, I think, 20 people to serve on a jury for a week only four or five full days to study the issue. And it's like a court case. They're a jury. They bring the advocates for and against it in as witnesses. They bring experts in to kind of answer questions, and then they deliberate. Right? And then they call more experts, just like a jury trial. Like we call people back and ask them questions, and you know, the advocates for and against referendum issues kind of give opening statements and then make their case and they give closing statements. And then they deliberate again with a the facilitator. Then they vote as a group. Who's for the referendum and who's against the referendum? Uh, once they vote, they split, and then each side writes a one-page summary of why are we for this or why are we against this, based on four days of talking through it. Right? And in Oregon, they passed it through the state legislature that those two pages actually go into the voting guide. Right? So the voting guide that gets mailed to every single citizen right, has, here's a two-page summary of a, of a group of random citizens that spent five days studying this, their opinion. Uh, so that's one example. We, we play with that a little bit with the yes no issue in a sense. That you get this group, so then you're having, you know, because most of the information for a friend of these 30 second spot ads or horrible kind of slick mailers, and things like that, that frame the issue, you know, in a very strategic, manipulative way. But this is an example of, you know, a group of citizens spending a lot of time really thinking through the tensions and negotiating all those kind of things and coming up with why they like it. So, helps when there's a broad middle, right? Um, that, that there's lots of people that don't know enough about the issue or, or kind of you know, see the different sides of the issue. Um, it's di more difficult when the, dom the issue is dominated by very kind of entrenched voices. Right? Uh, so, in, in most cases, the entrenched voices are the loudest voices, but there's ways of getting out of their voices, right? But for some issues, the only people that care about it are going to be very strong little people, well, then it's not going to be a very useful process, right? Uh, it's actually a green flag when there's a lot of misunderstandings across the perspective, but there's some trust. Because right? that we can change that with good information, with a good process, we fix those misunderstandings. Right? Uh, so it's okay if there's a lot of mis you know, if there's a big gap between the public and the experts. Okay, that, that's right, we can change that gap if, if they trust the organization in a sense. But if there's this, you know, this is the fracking thing, if there's significant distrust, if people anything that comes out of people's mouths they don't believe is true, that's very hard to change people's minds. Uh, and then significant resources, <laughs> if you actually have, you know, be able to have meetings and have food at the meetings and, um, and have facilitators and those type of things, obviously, kind of helps, right? Uh, now, that's kind of the but that, that also helps in the sense of, uh, you know, if your students are going to do these projects, like pick a topic that's controversial, pick a topic that there's different sides to, right? Like there, there's not a scientific solution, or there's not kind of a clear right, right and wrong kind of in there that you want to pick one that the different sides have, right? Uh, so that's kind of that, that first step to identify right. Then you have to identify the values and concerns. And there's lots of ways of doing this. This goes back to uh, the, the cycle of deliberation that I showed you yesterday. It's on one of your slides, right? So the first step is deliberative issue analysis, like at 12 o'clock. Then you do convening, then you facilitate, then you report, and actions in the middle. Uh, so that deliberative issue analysis, this is, I think these are, these are very useful assignments for students. Because again, you're not telling them Pick a position and then go find evidence of that position, right? Which is which is too easy to do with so much information out there on the internet, right? What you're saying is pick a topic and you're going to learn kind of the different sides of that topic. Your job again as an expert is to lay out the choices that we have. Right? So the deliberative issue analysis is you're not searching for evidence of a preconceived opinion. You're searching for ideas to take on a tough issue. Right? Uh, so it is in deliberative issue analysis. It, it, it combines kind of public research. With, with expert research and scientific research. Right? Uh, coming from a deliberative perspective, you start more with the public. 
your goal is to change the public conversation, so you kind of have to start with the public. You, you start with how is the public understanding this issue? How do they talk about how they care about this issue? What ideas do they have? And then you back it up with expert data to figure out where's the public right and where's the public wrong. Right? And it's one of those issues that the public's thinking about it really bad way. That when you look at the experts, what you know, then that that's something to know, right? That part of the process has to be to educate the public in some senses. But instead of starting with the experts and then going to the public, you're you're starting with the public in some ways to really understand how the public's thinking about that. Right. Uh, now, so sometimes significant examples of public discourse here exist. Sometimes I'm asked to do a project, and I know I can, like I talked about yesterday, I can find a couple articles online that have 150 comments. I'm just starting with my campus on, on campus climate, kind of civility issues on campus, and issues of diversity and inclusion on campus, and there have been so many examples of that that it's pretty easy for me to research it. Right? So if there's data out there, if there's just public comment out there already, uh, or you know, if, if it's been an issue in front of city council, our city council meetings are videotaped, right? So like wound fracking, you know, an example, when they asked me, the city asked me to, uh, if I could help with fracking, the first thing they did is they sent me all the emails that have been sent to city council about fracking. Right? So they sent me like 600 emails. Um, and then they, they had one meeting at, at city council that, that fracking was kind of a focus there. And about 75 people spoke at it. So I can go online and see that. Okay, what's the public? You know, so I can start getting a sense of how the public talking about it. Right? Um, interestingly, out of the 350 emails or something like that, um, about 120 of them with the exact same email, right? So it was a, basically an environmental group that sent an email out, said, hey, cut and paste this email and send it to city council, right? And it was actually the most extreme email, right? And the way it was framed and put the wording in there, you know. Um, but yeah, I was reading through the wall, I'm like, I think I've read this before, right? I've read this one before, and I counted, it was 120 or something, the exact same email. Um, so, yeah, so, so sometimes there's enough public discourse that for a student assignment, they can just research it, right? They just gotta find, and they can go to, to activist websites, right? You know, so you're, you're finding public kind of sentiment on this. Uh, and then sometimes you have to develop yourself. So this is a question you asked earlier for Wendy, right? So sometimes you have, and if a student, sometimes the students can do campus projects, right? Something on a campus issue that they're dealing with, and they can do a survey. So I asked students surveys in my own class of asking people what they want, right? So sometimes I have to do survey data to get an idea of it. Uh, it's typically not scientific. We're not doing a, a full, again, money-wise. I don't have money to kind of pay a survey firm, firm to get a representative sample and things like that, right? Um, in some cases you do, but I'm not, I'm not specifically trying to find out exactly how the opinion is. I, I just want an example. What are the arguments being made? What are the assumptions of public being made? Um, obviously, the, the more scientific you make it, the better in some senses, but that's really expensive. Um, and obviously, our average students do a scientific group uh, So these are the kind of questions we ask if we do a survey. Again, we're just trying to get a sense of how people think about this issue. When, when we do this training, I'm, I'm part of the Kettering Foundations. We have a Center for Public Life and People Starting Centers like mine, and we do this training a year round. We have four meetings over the year face to face. Uh, and we then we issue frame together. We do one big issue book that becomes an official NIF book. We're doing substance abuse this semester. So we, we came up with a survey kind of like this about uh, substance abuse, and then we all went home, and I think each each person had to get 100 different surveys, whether that was handwritten or online or through their classes. And we, we, we did an exercise, we'll just do it a second, of uh, brainstorming stakeholders who cares about this issue. So then we wanted to make sure we got surveys to all the different groups and those type of things. Uh, but all this kind of raw data is used to help build the book, to, like, to get a sense of how people are thinking about it. Uh, and this, so when I talk about the deliberative inquiry, uh, there's four kind of key things that I'm always looking for. Uh, if my goal as a deliberate practitioner is to improve the conversation, these are four kind of data points that specifically I'm looking for to try and improve the conversation. And you start getting a sense of this from analyzing the existing public discourse or analyzing the surveys. So obstacles are what makes it hard to talk about this subject. Right? Uh, one way when I think about obstacles is, is what do I want to deal with before the meeting? Like if, there, if there's personality disputes, if there's a lot of misunderstanding, if each side has completely different factual sets, you know, uh, if there's you know, whatever's kind of going on in a sense, I can take care of beforehand. Right? Sometimes you can you can overcome it before the meeting. You can have data that resolves that conflict. Sometimes you can bracket it. And you say, okay, we're not going to talk about this today. We're doing some school safety forums in, in a school district right after the Sandy Hook, the elementary school, that, 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 that horrible tragedy. Um, 
And a lot of the, what came out of that is people thought, you know, all teachers should have condoms, right? Um, you know, so the, the good guy can shoot the bad guy kind of thing, right? Uh, well, in Colorado, there's a rule that no one can have a gun in the school except a police officer, right? So when we had those, we were having these discussions about how do we improve safety, I was able at the beginning of the meeting saying, we're not going to change state law today, right? So what we're talking about today is what this school district and this police department can do to increase safety in schools, right? Uh, so if you want to talk about, and, and part of the reason is gun control, this is a very polarized issue, you know, it would take it in a completely different direction, right? So I was able to bracket that. That was an issue in the dis discourse that was really people were struggling with making it hard for them to have a useful conversation. I was able in our meeting to bracket and say, we're not going to talk about that, and this is why we're not going to talk about that. I did, once again, have a safety valve. One of the questions of the survey is, if you have suggestions for the state legislature in terms of changing gun control, what are they? Right? So they came to talk about that. You can still write it down. We're not saying you can't have that opinion, but we're saying at the table. Right? So these obstacles are trying to figure out, uh, and this is probably not as relevant for a student activity, right? No, because they're not going to engage the public, right? But if I'm going to engage the public, one thing I'm looking at is I, I want to know before I walk in the room what are the biggest issues, right? So that's where a survey really helps me. I know they're going to be talking about this. Or the example I gave yesterday about the small schools and small class size, I knew walking in um, that, that, that there was that misconception, right? So then I can take care of it. Right. Like we said, we had this presentation about that, so we overcome that obstacle. And, and, and you can think about the obstacle of making hard, we can't have a real discussion because this stuff is distracting us. So how can I, as a practitioner, design the events so those aren't as distracting so we can get to the hard work of the deliberation? The next two I've been talking about all the last two days, so what are the key values? As I'm looking at this, what do people care about? What, what are the underlying values that are relevant to this issue? And then the tensions. What are the tensions between those values? So I don't think I need to talk more about that. And the last, potential actions, particularly from a wide range of stakeholders, right? So as we now take on this issue, what are all the different players and what role might they play? Because right? uh, again, deliberation is great when it's about a broad range of actions, right? So those are four, I call them buckets. As I'm analyzing issues, mm -hmm. and I have worksheets, if you're interested, I can kind of send you to my students. So my students are doing two topics next week. This, this weekend they're filling out worksheets with these four buckets. As you analyze this issue, right, what are the value that you see with this issue? What are the tensions in here? What do you see as the key stakeholders and potential actions from those? So as they're walking in to relieve that conversation, they already have that in their head. And then, with the cycle of deliberation, the purpose of the conversation is to refine our understanding of those. Right. And to develop new actions, and particularly, it's like once we re we overcome the obstacles, so we can have a tough conversation. We recognize the common ground of the values, so so we uh, you know, we, we put our blinders down. We realize that people that we disagree with have some good stuff to do. Then now we recognize the inherent tension with the issues, so we struggle with that. And the way we struggle when we deal with that tension is we come up with some cool actions that work to balance or overcome this tension. Right. And one quick thing to bounce back that during break. Another way of thinking about the polarity management worksheet that kind of works with this, right? Um, typically, when we think about conflict, we think about tension between people or between perspectives, Democrats versus Republicans or whatever, right? But part of the wicked problem framework is that tensions are inherent to the issue, right? You know, so, so if I'm a consistency person and you're a flexibility person, the tension at first seems to be between us, right? I think I'm right, you think you're right. But then once we, we complete that map, right, we recognize that you know, I'm a consistency person, but I see the value of flexibility, right? So now I, I'm in tension within myself, right? Uh, so, so now the tension becomes within the issue, and that, that's part of that idea. So you, you came up during break and say, you know, yeah, I'm recognizing now that with some of these issues, I'm struggling with attention. And that's the point, right? And the point of a wicked problem is you're switching from wicked people to wicked problem, right? The, the, the wickedness is in the problem, and it, we're going to struggle with our own tensions in a sense, right? So when you're, when you're identifying those tensions, it's not just tensions between perspectives, it's tensions within the issue itself that we're going to constantly have to negotiate. So, uh, sources for deliberative inquiry, you know, traditional academic research, you know, they, they're looking at actual real articles, but still you want that public stuff. So you want newspaper articles, advocacy websites, if you have time, you can do surveys and interviews and focus groups. Uh, this is one of the reasons I, I, I rarely, I, I travel a lot to do training, I rarely travel to do projects, right? Because I think to do projects, I have to talk to so many different people. People think I can just walk in and run a meeting in some other community. I'm like, no, right? Unless you're doing lots of different surveys or something like that. Like I have a city just south of me that the city manager called me down and he wants me to run this event. And I'm like, 
okay, I need to go and talk to like 40 other people in your community. I can't trust you, right? Like, I, I got your perspective now, right? You know, uh, so that's part of it is, is you need surveys and, and, you know, to really see the different sides of things so then you can really design something you will get, right? But for a class, they can normally for bigger issues get enough from that, right? Uh, so then one of the activities, there's a lot of activities we do, and, and, and I'm suggesting uh, us to play with homelessness. There's, well, everyone have to know enough about the concept of homelessness is play with this, unless someone else has a different suggestion. And again, I did this on a bigger piece of paper, but we don't have to do it. But this is a little exercise that helps in, in with two of the key products. It helps with identifying the key values, and it helps identify the key players and stakeholders potentially. <laughs> And then inherently, by, by identifying the key values, it will help you identify the tensions between those values. Right? Uh, so what you're doing with this worksheet, and I'll, I'll send this electronically, so if you want to do it in class. Uh, so it kind of looks like this. This is a completed worksheet. Uh, we did this with a big group on the river, right? But, but first, what you want to do, we're going to have you brainstorm as a visiting baby for five minutes, and then we'll get to build what it's a group, right? Uh, but first, you'll just list the stakeholder. What are the groups? When we talk about homelessness, right? Who's relevant to this? Um, and and where, where it gets difficult is how many different subgroups you want to do. Like, is home be homeless themselves a stakeholder group, or do we kind of have categories of homeless? Right? Uh, you know, there's some that are temporarily homeless, there's some that are chronically homeless, there's some that are transient, that they're homeless and they kind of move around in the community. You know, you know so you can kind of sometimes going to brainstorm homeless and then have some subgroups, right? Uh, but just think of it, if we're going to deal with homelessness in our community, who are all the relevant players? <coughs> Uh, so I'll let you kind of brainstorm that in a second. Once you have a pretty decent list, you don't have to complete, you know, you have a pretty decent list there, then you start kind of filling up the top, which is the interest. What do those groups care about? Right? What are the values, the underlying things that's kind of important to them in a sense, right? Uh, so you start, for, and, and, you know, you start kind of putting some, and then you start bouncing back and forth, because you'll write a value, and then you'll realize, oh, there's another group that really cares about that value, and you'll add to your stakeholder group, right? And vice versa. So you're kind of bouncing back and forth, and you're, you're kind of getting a list of what are all the things people care about, about this issue, and who are all the groups. And if you want to, I tend not to do this next step, but you see on the bottom, if you want to, then you can actually complete it. You kind of look at, okay, for this group, which of these do they care about, right? You put a check mark if they really care about that value, right? Uh, but part of the process, so again, you're, for the key products, you're getting a good list of stakeholders that have potential action they can do, you're getting a list of values, and then you'll find out how some of these values don't fit together very well, right? That, gee, if we focus on this value, we're, we're, we're probably not focused on this value in a sense, right? Yeah. So we'll see. Let me give you a couple minutes just to, to try to brain dump in terms of homelessness, see how many stakeholders you can get, see how many values, and then, then we'll talk about who is a group and see if we kind of fill it out. The, the instructions making enough sense? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, yeah, but Ben, do you, how would you kind of categorize different categories of homeless, or do you, do you feel it's better just to kind of... Oh, yeah, there's a uh, homeless and then uh, those who are not getting the mental health needs. Okay. Yeah, so there's, yeah, there's a typical class that, that <coughs> if the cause of, of homelessness is mental health, right? Yeah. That's different than... Physically disabled. Orphan, the C class. Yeah, so orphan or, or children, essentially. Yeah, right? children. Or children. I mean, we're finding that I know a lot. A lot of my students are very passionate about GLBT issues, yeah. right? That there's a big homeless problem off of the GLBT children that were kicked out of their homes, right? right? That they were no longer welcome at home, um, which creates the same issue, right? And the criminal, and then those who are out of work. Yeah, so I mean, that's just one way to categorize them. That, that's probably enough for us to kind of work with now, right? Um, you know, out of work, but but also probably able, right? They're able to work. They might have some skills in a sense, as they just 
don't have that ability right now in a sense, right? Um, yeah, but with the word transient is typically used, right? But for a lot of people, the image of homelessness is they're, they're, they're the aggressive homeless, right? They, they might be paneling pretty aggressively, those type of things. And, and with mental health, too, uh, we know a lot of mental health stuff can be tough, but often mental health and substance abuse kind of go together, right? Uh, oftentimes, the reason they go together is because people don't get treated for their mental health, so then they self treat. Right, but, but then sometimes the, the, the that cause and effect can kind of go, go both ways in some senses, right? So that's the problem because for some people see, oh, this is mental health; it's not their problem; it's a disease. We need to help them. Other people say, hey, this is a substance abuse; this is their choice. We don't need to help them, right? Mm -hmm. And that becomes that deserving and observing poor line, which really kind of changes how people think, right? Okay, beyond the homeless, what are some of the other groups? Yeah. Business owners. Uh, business owners. Business owner, yeah, especially like in a downtown, downtown area, mm -hmm. right? Business owners that uh, are losing customers because people are uncomfortable coming downtown or, or those kind of That's a big issue in Fort Collins, especially during the summer, right? And same thing, we're a little too cold in the winter, right? <laughs> uh, but during the summer, we get a lot of uh, people, especially, you know, some people are saying, well, I don't know the truth about this, that since marijuana now is legal, right? Mm -hmm. So are people kind of coming to Colorado? The problem is, you can't smoke it. Publicly, right? It's legal. You can buy it at a store now, but it's probably more expensive to buy it at the store than buying it illegally, right? Uh, and you still can't smoke it publicly. So the idea that people are coming to Colorado so they can smoke marijuana and be homeless, so like, well, technically it's illegal because you can only <laughs> smoke it in a home, but you're homeless. No, anyway. <laughs> yeah, I'm not that the business owners, what else? Residents. You know, yeah, yeah, residents kind of in that area. Um, and even tourists, in a sense, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and, and certainly, kind of, in Fort Collins, we want to be a tourist destination, right? So, that notion of if, if the homelessness issue becomes more and more of a problem, the Visitors Association is dealing with that, right? We need to bring those dollars in, right? And kind of same thing for downtown. Yeah. You know, we're trying to redevelop, you know, get downtown to be a destination at night. It's starting to get there, but it didn't used to be at all when I lived here, right? Mm -hmm. You know, so to what degree is the homelessness? There's a night you couldn't find parking. Uh, Thursday night we couldn't find parking. Right, yeah. What else? Local so, so like, you know, go ahead. Local government. Local government. Local government. Okay. Yeah. So the kind of policies that they, what policies do we have? To what degree do we criminalize homelessness, like you talked about, right? Social agency, the police, well, yeah. hospital, the yeah. school. Yeah. So social aid. Oh, yeah, we'll go and split those up. So you, you have uh, police. Hospital. Yeah, hospitals in particular because most homelessness put a lot of pressure on emergency rooms, right? And that, that's one of those arguments of the cost of, you know, it's so much cheaper for a community just to give them a home because in terms of how many times they spend in jail, how much police time that they take, and how much emergency room resources they take, they get out. There's one example, it was like the million dollar it basically cost the community a million dollars a year for one homelessness room, right? Whereas they could have housed them for, for 40000 or something like that, right? Um, and they, they probably have a, a you know, social, yeah, government social programs, right? Uh, so like the county, county programs, and then you also have nonprofits. Yeah. And you can clear a little clarification. Uh, uh, government responsibilities, you know, local, to regional, to national, uh, yeah. charge of responsibility versus the social organizations who are motivated out of uh, just quality of life issues. Right. And, and you have it, you know, one of the changes we do with in Fort Collins is most of the programs, the social programs for poverty are county issues, right? The, I mean, just the, with the funding, at least in the United States, between a city and a county, there are certain things that are city responsibility and certain things that are county responsibility. So, like, welfare programs are a county responsibility, right? But the homelessness is really only an issue in Fort Collins, right? You know, so a lot of people are telling the city, you need to do something about this, but the city is saying, this is a county issue. It's about a social program, right? So there's that tension between city, county, state, and then federal in a way of whose jurisdiction is it, whose responsibility is it in a sense, and become part of it, right? If, if we include the, the, the church. Sure, okay, yeah. So religious institutions? Raquel said advocacy groups. Yeah. I think, that you think that's not nonprofit non like storage. And on, on the flip side, if some of them are, are have mental health problems, you have mental health agencies, right? Um, and a lot, the big part of the, the mental health programs is veterans, yes. 
right? So then you have veterans hospital or veterans advocacy program. So we kind of stop there. We could keep yeah. going, right? <laughs> but even just thinking about who are all the players in here, you know, and this this serves a few different purposes for me when I'm doing the community process because part of it is these people all need to be in the room. If we're really having a conversation about how to deal with this, right? So we've actually done this. We did it particularly with early childhood education. We started a project. We did this brainstorming process. Found out all the players. Then we said, okay, who knows somebody who can come to the meeting, right? And we literally, we did this on the board. Some people walked up and wrote, yeah, yeah, I'll invite this person, I'll invite this person. And one of the things with convening is we kind of go with this assumption that if you invite everybody, you're really not inviting anybody, right? So that notion of just having a newspaper article and putting some posters up, you're not going to get an audience, right? That personal invitation, that email saying, you know what, Thomas, I need you there. Can you come here to represent your organization? Then people will come, right? So we did that process. We filled in most of the blanks because the people in the room were pretty connected. We had a few blanks empty, so then we kind of assigned them. Okay, Wendy, you need to figure out, you know, you need to find someone from the faith community to come, right? And you need to figure out that kind of stuff. So then for when we actually had, a, and that was even just for a planning meeting, right? For a planning meeting, we wanted a full room. And then for the meeting itself, we kind of did something similar, right? Mm -hmm. So the stakeholder analysis kind of works on that. But then the stakeholder analysis also works like once we get all those different groups, then we start thinking about, okay, what, what are the values? What are things people care about? These are these are tougher to frame, right? Uh, I'm curious, what kind of things did y'all come up with for, for the top call or top row? Humanity. Humanity. Okay, yeah, so just kind of respect for human, kind of compassion, mm -hmm. kind of in a way, right? Um, well, I, I just wanted to comment because I, uh, I, I think it's, it's a little bit too broad. We, we should split the mind. Okay, well, what do you got? Well, um, I have health safety, okay. uh, low crime rate. Okay. Yeah, so a little bit of kind of compassion. I, I just had this wrong dignity and said that it's too, too, too wide. I have to do this with smaller phone here. Um, yeah, I mean, we certainly public safety, right? A lot of policies about the homeless are just kind of for that. What else do you say? Um, Low crime rate. Okay. So, and, and we do what I try to do with this top one is we want to frame these positively, right? Uh, but we want you know things that people care about in the sense, right? Um, so I guess low crime rate will work. I, think. I don't think that people have yeah. Not quite fitting well here. What else? Services. Serv what kind of? What do you mean by services? Um, what I mean is uh, making sure that they eat that they. This is it. having their basic needs. Okay, so that, that kind of thing. What she was saying about kind of compassion, for some reason I have one S and two minutes there. Uh, <laughs> compassion and kind of, of, of humanity, right, kind of fits into that, right, to make sure people are kind of having their basic needs fed, met, yeah. right? Yeah, right. Okay. yeah. Well, it's like for the business owners, what are they caring about? Early public safety, low crime, commerce, or, uh, commerce yeah. aesthetics. Uh, okay. Yeah, no, no, part of it, I think aesthetics is, yeah, is right, we, we want our downtown to look pretty, right, we want people to kind of feel comfortable in it, right, we want tourists to kind of enjoy it in a sense. So we then cover a city pride? Yeah, yeah, city pride, yeah, that's a nice way to look good. Yeah, and that, that's really one of the things that, you know, Fort Collins calls itself a choice city, right, we're, we're typically ranked in one of the best places to live, right? there's a lot of pride in that, right. So the fact that our homeless population is growing, people are saying we are not a choice city if, if we have people that are suffering like this, right? Well, on both sides, right? Some people are kind of the compassion side, saying we can't brag about how good our city is when we have people suffering like this. And then some people are saying we need to get rid of those people because it doesn't look good, right? <laughs> so kind of uh, on both, both sides in some way, right? What else? Um, cost. Oh, sorry. Job opportunities. Job opportunities for these homeless people. Okay. So the potential for job opportunities and, and kind of self-sufficiency, right? So, yes. so for some people, the goal, you know, for some people, the goal is just temporarily kind of safety. For some people, it's, it's long-term work. I know a lot of stuff that we've been getting into when we get into actions that it says we don't even really have. We didn't, we didn't list uh, 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 training programs, right? Uh, we didn't list a lot of the kind of solution to, to homelessness and substances. In Fort Collins, our cost of living is just shooting up like crazy. Vacancy rates are very low. Uh, very little affordable housing, right? So part of the homelessness thing is there's an imbalance between wages and cost of living in Fort Collins, right? In some ways that we're forcing kind of the people, the jobs are in Fort Collins, but there's no housing in Fort Collins, 
Um, so, so you know that job opportunities and, and, and wage fairness or equity, you know, cost inequality becomes kind of a thing. You're saying cost of living because it's shooting up in downtown Houston. Yes, yeah, so our goal, the interest is, is kind of a low cost of living, right? Yeah. And uh, kind of the concept of uh, someone being a protective citizen. This is that that there's a certain quality of. Uh, Fairness and that, that uh, the idea that, that what does it take to get someone to be productive? Is there assistance justified, unjustified? Well, it's uh, that's yeah, a good justice and fairness. And, and, and part of it that comes up to too is this notion that I probably need to put up there for, for some people, you know, we uh, of the importance of individual responsibility, right? The importance of self sufficiency, the importance of, you know, kind of the conservative side of it in a sense, right? That people need to make better, better choices in a way. Um, you know, obviously, in the United States individual responsibilities have a powerful kind of uh, assumption or value. So I mean, we can keep on going, kind of played out. But it's just it's useful to do the stakeholder analysis to really think about who all the players are, because then also not only kind of who you might want to have in the room, but if you're doing it for an assignment, who do you need to research, right? Who do I might need to talk to, right? Uh, it's, it's interesting how often major groups are never talked to. I do a lot of stuff with K twelve, obviously. How how rarely school districts actually talk to students. <coughs> so I had a student group I'm working with, and they wanted to do a project on bullying, right? So I started researching bullying, and then we contacted the district saying, "Hey, we want to do some forums on bullying. You know, would you help us kind of get some teachers that will give us a class period so we can do these forums?" Um, and then the school district said, "Well, oh, actually, we haven't committed to studying bullying for two years." I'm like, oh, great. So I get it. Can you give me contact with them? So I got contact with them and I went to meet with them. So, yeah, we're about to finish. We're writing a white paper. We're almost done. But we'll give it to you when you're done. Right? Uh, so I said, who's on the committee? She said, oh, that was a great committee. We had some teachers and we had some counselors and we had lots of parents and we had some psychologists. I'm like, did you have any students? She goes, oh, no. So like, did you talk to any students in your class? Oh, no. <laughs> Two years studying bullying, they never actually talked to a child. Right? <laughs> Um, and it's because they didn't do the stickler, you know. And, and they think tr children are transient. You know, like, oh, they're gone, but you know. Uh, but it's just amazing. Same thing when we did the school safety forums. In the school, it was a different school district south of us. They wanted us to be, you know, so we did three nights of parents and all this kind of stuff. And I said, we need to talk to the kids. I said, oh, no, don't worry about that. We know. We need to talk. So then we finally, I pushed them enough that we had a night that we talked to 30 kids from all the different schools, heard completely different things than the parents, right? And the, the teachers, right? The teachers were saying, Oh, you know, we have all these new policies, and the students believe in them, and all. And the students were saying, like, oh, we don't do follow that. And we open all those doors all the time, you know. And, you know, so sometimes when you leave out a big stakeholder group, you're missing a huge perspective, in the way, right? You know, so for for a student group, you do this kind of thing. It's okay. Let's make sure we get these perspectives. You know, sometimes you can find them out through research. Sometimes you have to give a call. You know, I know for me as an undergraduate student. The first time I ran into a professor that required me to actually talk to real people for research, to pick up the phone and talk to people, it completely changed my life. Right? I was just one of those, like, I'll find it on the internet somewhere, or whatever. You know, but actually calling real people and talking to them and asking them questions, I was like, wow, that was kind of cool. Right? You know, so that's a, it's a pretty good assignment to have people do, like, call someone, call a police officer and talk about their experience. I know when we did this meeting in, in homelessness a couple weeks ago, I wasn't very involved. I was just kind of observing. Uh, we weren't running it. Uh, but they had the park rangers. Uh, we have the parks and recreation, but a lot of camping, right? The homeless will camp in the parks and those type of things. So they were a critical voice in that conversation because they're the ones that are interacting with them a lot more, right? The police officers interact with them downtown, but the park, uh, the park, uh, I guess they're park rangers in a sense, are the ones, they're the ones camping on the river and those type of things, right? So you start realizing some of those kind of new voices that you kind of need to hear. So with this, so this helps to identify values and also help starts not only the stakeholders but then the actions. What are all the different things these groups can do, right? Um, and then you also start, you know, we can talk a little bit about some of the tensions here, right? So the, the tensions in homelessness, um, of, you know, we, we you know, that help versus hinder kind of tension, right? That, that we want them to be self sufficient, we want them to be be responsible, you know. So, but, but we also want to help them out, right? Uh, we want, some people want to kind of blame them for the poverty. Some people kind of blame the structure of society for the poverty. Well, there is a tension there, right? Uh, we, we want to have programs that help them, but we don't want those programs to be taken advantage of, right? There's a tension within the poverty research that you know, we all, the, 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 the innocent child, the poor child is clearly a sympathetic figure, right? Um, but then the parent that's making really bad choices. 
right, is, is unsympathetic. Like how do we help the child without helping the baby? You know, so there's all these interesting tensions about what programs that we do. That, that churches do wonderful work, right? But then you know we have a separation of church and state, right? And, and do we want you know, government programs that are funded through churches are very effective sometimes, but then they're through the church. And to what degree is part of the process of what the church is doing? It is it tied to religion that's inappropriate for the government to be fighting? You know? So as you start thinking through the roles of all those, you start coming up with some, some interesting vision there. And obviously the business owners want it clean. Um, you know, in some ways they want to criminalize homelessness, right, to get rid of homelessness. Uh, but it, it's not getting rid of it, right? It's just forcing it somewhere else. I know we've all seen those pictures of the, uh, how in, the, in downtown areas where, where you know, nooks and crannies where homeless tend to sleep, they're putting spikes now. Have you seen those examples? Mm -hmm. right, they're actually installing spikes on the ground just mm -hmm. so people wouldn't sleep there, right? Which your first image of that is like, horrible, right? Yeah. Um, you know, but the idea is not that they want to cause pain, right? That they're saying that's that's harming my business and how you know. Mm -hmm. So they're coming from somewhere, but that's a good example of they're probably coming from a good place, right? You know, it's easy to demonize them. They have a good, you know, but when we actually weigh that, we probably would, most people would say that that's not a good idea, <laughs> right? So if we can acknowledge that they're coming from a good place and we see what they're trying to do, but in balance, uh, yeah, we, well, we still think you're wrong, right? But I'm talking about a good place where they, they basically uh, struck the law with a solution that didn't really kind of serve only one. Right. One master, which is their own interest. Right. Yeah. 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 And actual, you know, so we have a park just north of our downtown area uh, that, that tends to be a, a major hangout for homeless. Uh, so one of the plans right now is to pay for the park and we're going to park more. Right. Um, and I guess some people magically think, well, because then the homeless will disappear. I'm like, no, they'll probably find somewhere else, yes. right? So, um, and, and there's that tension of always kind of short term kind of dealing with symptoms versus long term true solutions in a way. Oh, and actually, one of the biggest tensions with homelessness um, is if your city becomes known as having really good policies to help help the homeless, to what degree do you become a magnet for homelessness? Now, research shows that that's that's that tends not to happen nearly as much as you think. Right? Um, in Fort Collins, it's happened somewhat. I mean, they, they do these they, they call them point in time studies that they actually try to do a survey of all homeless and they have volunteers go out there and ask. One of the questions they're asking are, are you from this community or did you come here? How long did you come here? Our percentage of people coming coming to Fort Collins is pretty high, right? Normally, the, most of your homeless is homegrown homeless, right? And part of the reason is because when you're in poverty, relationships are huge, right? Um, so for you to leave your community to go to another community because you perceive that other community to have better resources for you is a hard move, right? Because you're leaving your whole social network, right? So that's where it doesn't happen nearly as much, right? But there is that assumption. And what happens in Fort Collins is we get them from all the small towns, right? We'll come to Fort Collins because there's going to be resources and there's going to be other kind of thing, right? Uh, but there is that perception that hey, if we if we need to have a very generous community to help homeless, does that attract homelessness? Um, which is kind of a tough issue to kind of think about. It, right? uh, so you start kind of seeing some of those tensions as you. Kind of so, so what would you insert? Uh, what's happening on national policies versus practices, you know, uh, because, you know... Like national policies in terms of laws. Well, the housing, uh, the housing first, like the whole idea about that community, just in a particular... Okay. Yeah. Uh, drill down on that one about that idea. Uh, again, as if you were facilitating or sorting this out at the, this beginning, because there is a national program that uh, housing, housing first model, uh, per supportive housing, is actually going to kind of level the playing field so you won't have that charge about a community because it will be because uh, that's a national that all of anyone who's participating is getting money to target the, the homeless uh, homeless veterans is but it was a national campaign they actually had a drop in homelessness across the nation because they targeted the homeless veterans <clears throat> yeah so I mean, we've been talking about it. we didn't put out there but you know national state and county governments so what kind of national programs are coming up uh, and then I also from that talk about the housing of the Right, so we actually we have a Fort Collins Housing Authority, which is a kind of pseudo governmental kind of organization that's really focused on affordable housing. So we're actually just building kind of a new supportive housing kind of program. It's going to house about forty people. It's going to be open in about a month. Um, that was an interesting controversy. Where to place that? Kind of the not in my backyard kind of thing, right? Um, and but then you also have the Board of Realtors. The Board of Realtors is actually a pretty big player in Fort Collins. Um, interestingly. Uh, for really kind of focus on developing more affordable housing and kind of 
you know, sounding the alarm of, of how little affordable housing that we have in some senses. Right? So again, you, you see additional players that are kind of voice of it. Uh, you know, the, the notion of what national programs so we did a big healthcare thing probably our second year, and this was before Obamacare, um, and uh, and I think Obamacare has become just the word for it. It's not really that an important habitat for it, right? So hopefully you're not thinking if I'm saying Obamacare, I'm attacking it. Uh, it's just the easier way to refer to it. But uh, so before that, states were kind of given some leeway to kind of come up with their own kind of healthcare changes, right? So our state came up with kind of, they did a call for proposals for, for any organization can come up with a new healthcare plan, and then they had a Blue Ribbon Commission to look at it, and they came up with five that they really liked. So then we made an event with League of Women Voters to really kind of walk through those five, right? But constantly with the healthcare, and this happened with poverty a lot, there was that assumption that if Fort Collins or Colorado or Fort Collins, um, that this is a national issue, this is a fundamental flaw of society, that and so if, if we do cool things in Fort Collins to deal with poverty, uh, we're actually being counterproductive because what we need is a national change, right? And if, if we make things work, if we make a bad system work okay, it's going to be harder to make the argument to change the bigger system, right? So that becomes a tension in kind of itself. And that's kind of the same thing for homelessness. It's like, you know, instead of us as a city figuring out how do we deal with our homeless problem, you know what, we need to, you know, I remember at one conference dealing with poverty, the speaker before me was an anthropology professor who was a Marxist and anti-capitalist, right? So he gave like an hour-long lecture about how we just need to overthrow capitalism. Um, and all this kind of, and it was my turn to talk, and I'm like, uh, <laughs> it's like, I'm not sure how to follow that, right? It's like, okay, so while we're working on representative capitalism, like, I am kind of working on trying to make capitalism work as well as it can, you know? Um, so yeah, there's always that tension in the sense of what's the scope of the project, right? Uh, are you talking local? Are you talking county? Are you talking region? Are you talking state? Are you talking nation? Are you talking global, right? Uh, and, and you have to put some kind of boundaries on that conversation. But what those boundaries are are always going to kind of be tough. We, we struggle a lot with city versus county, right? Because the United Way that I work with a lot is United Way of Larimer County, right? So Fort Collins is a big city. Loveland is kind of a medium city. Estes Park is a smaller city. And then there's about another 10 tiny communities. And then there's a lot of rural community, right? So when we're talking about an issue, we get in trouble a lot if it's too Fort Collins-centric. Right? That if we just, or if we even have a meeting in Fort Collins, right? So we often have to have meetings in Loveland and Estes Park just to spread it around. And you know, it'd be a lot easier for me to say, "Hey, we're talking about Fort Collins," right? But some of my partners are very county focused, or they're young. Uh, so, so that 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 scope always becomes a kind of a tough challenge in a way. Um, and it's a different way. Okay, I need I need to move on, but hopefully uh, you, you see kind of this tool. Um, I need some back on PowerPoint. Get on to framing. There are steps here. Yeah, you need to go to that. I don't think we're going to have done the frame before we leave, so if you need to go to that, then go ahead. That's just making it up. All right, so now we've identified the issue. We've kind of talked about homelessness. We've identified some of the underlying values and the key kind of players and those type of things. So then you want to name the issue. You want to come up with a name. And this is the idea of what's going to be on your flyer. What's going to be you know, on, on the front of your booklet, right? You see, you see lots of examples. Uh, that's not my stuff. <laughs> yeah, here we go. Yeah. What, what's going to be here is too many children left behind. How can we close the achievement gap? Pretend you are right. What goes on the internet? What is the 21st century mission of our school? You know, what's the label on the top? Right? And, and you're framing it, you're hopefully framing it to have a pretty broad tent, to bring people from different perspectives that are going to want that, right? <coughs> so you want a broad frame that includes a lot of key stakeholders' concerns, right? And so when, when we're doing homelessness, are we framing it just on the kind of compassion frame? Is it just about what can we do to help these poor people? Or are we including the businessmen? Right. Are we including the police and saying, you know, this is also about public safety. It's also about the beautification of the downtown. Right? So how do we both kind of care about compassion, but also kind of care about the quality of that kind of stuff? Right? And you're making some choices there. If you're making a choice of that, you know what? 
I don't care about the, the business person's perspective. We're just going to vote. But that might still be a useful tool to kind of rally the, the true believers in the choir, but you're not changing the conversation, right? If, if the business person who's dealing with homelessness every day looks at your topic and says, I don't see me in here, right? They're not, they don't care about my opinion, right? Then, then you're not going to transform the conversation in a way. Uh, so that becomes a question of who is your audience in a sense. Uh, uh, we struggle with that, particularly with climate change. Okay, if we're going to deal with climate change, are we open to the deniers? Or are we going to say to people that think climate change is a complete hoax? Are they part of the conversation or not? And that's a tough decision because, in some senses, yeah, we need to take them on and they need to be part of the solution. But in some senses, if, if we do take them on, then we're going to be spinning our wheels for a while. Do we just say, hey, you know what, we're going to work with the 80% of the people that, that already kind of assume it's happening and, and want to figure out what to do? I, there's not a right answer to that, but that your, your naming process is always going to be that of how many of those different values are incorporating that, right? To, to what degree are you taking the different perspectives on? And it's very hard to say, we're going to take all perspectives, right? Again, for immigration, I'm not going to include the white supremacists, right? <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't feel that they, they should see themselves and feel comfortable coming. I'm perfectly fine if they stay home, right? <laughs> um, but I do want to have certain conservative and progressive perspectives and stuff. Right? I, want, I want some people to think that color doesn't matter whatsoever, and some people to say, no, we need to celebrate different, you know, uh, I want lots of different kind of perspectives. Uh, so if I avoid inflammatory terms, right, and carefully think about word choice and imagery, the example one of my friends always gives is, is NIF developed an issue book on alcohol. I don't think you have it here. Uh, but the, 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 the image was like a broken, you know, it was a very negative image on the cover, right? Or they did another one about schools, and they ended up like, how do we fix our broken schools, right? But it implied from the very beginning that the schools were broke, you know. So a teacher looking at that, they go, show me that we Right? And they say, well, you're telling us it's cool you're working. You know, so what, what words are you using? How are you framing it? Um, so it's really kind of welcoming in some ways. Overall, typically uh, focus on a common problem. That's why I, I tend to rely on the frames of what should we do about X, right? You know, so it's just kind of open in a sense and just frame X in a way that most people are agree X is something we need to do something about, right? Um, yeah, so what should we do about X? How can we achieve X? How can we optimize safety in our schools and things like that? So yeah, here's some examples um, of user NIF. Well, here we go. Alcohol controlling the toxic spill. Oh, yeah. and you can't see the whole thing, but the bottom of that is like a skull and cross. You know, it's like this alcohol is so horrible. Right? <laughs> so someone who enjoys alcohol or that kind of stuff, you know, that doesn't abuse it in a sense, like this is not a place for me. This is they're going to be demonized alcohol, right? Uh, so that's one that NIF framed that I think they really realized that they they framed it wrong, right? Coping for the cost, and, and you can also control the scope. Healthcare is such a huge issue, right? So with this issue, they try to narrow it. Let's talk a little bit about cost, right? Instead of fixing the healthcare system, how do we kind of figure out how we can deal with healthcare costs? Right? So there's ways sometimes within naming of it uh, that you kind of. I mean, so these are some specific ones that we've done, you know. And again, you, you see, I like the questions: How should we improve? What should we do about? How should we, how should we meet our future water needs? I can like ask questions at the top label. So once you have a name, now you develop potential approaches, and we'll try to kind of play with this a little bit uh, with homelessness or maybe another issue. I know you. I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about your idea, and we can kind of brainstorm that a little bit too. Well, mine is so different, okay. but really, I mean, it, it it's taking this but using it in literature for a literature class. Yeah. So it really doesn't. I mean. You don't go through this whole process, right? Because it's more. Academic. But I think in terms of, of, of here, you can kind of almost pick up, right? I mean, if, you, if there's a situation, if there's a tension within the story of the literature that you're wanting students to really think through, right? Yeah, well, I mean, I did come up with three approaches to oh. the short story. So, well, um, well, let me talk about this a little bit, and then we'll jump back to sure. it, right? Uh, so, the NIF model, it's at least three. Uh, I know when I did water, I did four. Uh, other things I've done five. Uh, another, I think I gave you the link to this in the back, but everyday democracy um, used to be called study circles. If everyone heard the term study circles, but they, they they were people that used to work for NIF and then started another company. Partly is that they saw that NIF was too short; just two hours wasn't enough. So the study circles program is essentially the same model. Here's the common ground. Here's lots of idea. You know, and let's think through it. It has more of a connection to action. Uh, but it's like a meeting, two-hour meeting every week for six weeks, right? And they have booklets. They have one on diversity. They have one on immigration. They have one on kind of community sprawl and those type of things. It totally uh, works for action. Yeah, really useful kind of thing to say that, that 
Um, and, but I'll have like here, here's like multiple. Sometimes they have like 14 different viewpoints, right? Here's yeah, 14 different viewpoints on this issue that, that people talk through, right? So other examples you can find online, right? So develop potential approaches, but it, the the idea again of the approaches is to think broadly about the issue, to see different sides, to get away from a typical pro con, the United States to get away from a typical Democrat versus Republican kind of framing, right? Um, and, and also have something for people to react to. So when they have, they're coming to this meeting, I'm not having to react to your ideas, we're all reacting to these ideas. It gives us like a surrogate in a sense that, that makes it a lot easier for us to talk through some of the tough issues, right? Uh, so this is, you know, the approach, each approach has some specific actions that we've been looking at with both the one on higher ed and one on, on obesity. And then, so each one inherently has things that people like and don't like about it, and there's a here all the underlying values, right? And some values support some of the approaches and some of them support others. But every single one of the approaches has key values that support it, and every single one of the approaches has some trade-offs. Because again, there's not a magic rule. Right? Uh, so you have this page actually from the packet from my workbook, right? Um, it's page, probably like the fourth or fifth page that you have. Yeah, it's page 47. Uh, so what we do in my class is, again, they, they pick a debate issue, they're debating a yes-no issue, and then they have to transition their debate to a de deliberation. So they're going from two sides, yes-no, and they have to go to at least three. So this is one of the handouts that I show, it's like, this is one way to think about it, right? Uh, dividing up those approaches. You can divide it up as, you know, what, what are the different primary actors? That's what we do with the obesity framing, right? The obesity framing is families need to solve this problem, schools need to solve this problem, no government has to solve this problem. Right. So that's one way to split it out for the conversation. Uh, you could just have basic different policy ideas. So I know like the energy one, I think I gave you that example on the next page. Um, it, you know, it kind of has, well, what we need to do is kind of focus on security and kind of you know, drill, drill baby drill, like you know, develop domestic resources so we don't have to rely on, on other countries. Right. The second one is we need to develop renewable energy here in the United States and really kind of push for wind and solar and, and those type of things. And the third is we really need to reduce our energy use Right, we need to be much more efficient with our email. So each kind of approach is a different idea. Right? What you want to do with these approaches, you don't want one approach to be the opposite of another. Right? You don't want one approach to be you know, drill more here and the second one say drill less here. Right? Yeah. Because when you're talking about drill more here, you're inherently talking about we should do this or we shouldn't do it. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. So if your, first approach, if your second approach is the opposite of the first approach, by the time you get there, you've already talked about it. Because all the criticism of the first approach is the advantage of the first thing. You know, mm -hmm. Uh, so, so in a way, you're doing six approaches. You have three approaches, but you're arguing for and against it within each conversation. Right? So that's why you don't want you know any any approach to be the mirror image of another. Uh, different views of the source, the cause of the problem. Right. So you kind of think through. Okay, let's assume first that the cause and for homelessness, maybe we can make this work with that. Right. The cause is individual are making bad choices. The cause is. is Low wages is kind of the cause, or the cause is is lack of resources for mental health, right? So then maybe that's the frame to kind of start each to really think. Okay, if we assume that's the cause, then what do we need to do? Right? Uh, so that's one way to kind of split it up. Uh, different degrees of response. We did this for the medical marijuana before we passed marijuana. Marijuana. Uh, we were struggling in Colorado to allow medical marijuana, so we came up with an approach. We actually ran this in the city. We got some we got some awards for the city, but the first approach was. We just need to really regulate marijuana, close it all down, not allow it at all. The second approach was like free market, let them do whatever, you know, like, let's open it up. And the third approach is let's try to figure, let's make sure the people that need it for health reasons, legitimate health reasons, get it, but no one else does. Right? Uh, but of course, legitimate health reasons is a hard line to draw. Right? Um, so that conversation, that one is that's kind of a default that the other ones don't work. Because that was an, uh, pretty obvious that the first two are bad, the third one is better, mm -hmm. right? But it's also the recognition that drawing those lines are tough, right? But it's still, like, by spending dedicated time, what happens if we regulate this like crazy? What happens if we barely regulate it at all? And what happens if we try to kind of draw those lines as a society? Uh, this last one's interesting. This is really useful for any kind of bad behavior. Um, like we, we want people to eat better, or we want people to stop smoking, or stop doing drugs, or, 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 or stop driving drunk, or whatever. Uh, so the Forest Service came up with these, the three E's, education, engineering, or enforcement. Right? So education is, let's just teach people to make better decisions. Right? Uh, so we're not going to punish them for making a bad decision, we just want to teach them to make a better decision. Engineering is, how do we design society so they don't make those decisions? Right? Uh, the example for a while, 
Uh, remember, I don't know if y'all heard, yeah, y'all are all as old as me, I think. Uh, when, when, uh, uh, it didn't work, but I did it with my, my college students. That's why I stopped for a second. Uh, where seat belts used to be automatic. Like, for just like for a few years, like you would get into your Honda Civic and close the door and the seat belt would and automatically close, right? That was engineering, right? Instead of trying to teach people to wear your seat belts, we're just going to design cars that your seat belts are automatic, right? Uh, instead of teaching people to turn off lights, what do we have now? Right? We have motion detectors, right? In my office, I always walk in, I hang my coat, my coat's right by the motion detector. So like five minutes into my office, my lights turn off and I have to go there, so trying to get past the coat, like I'm still here, you know? Uh, but instead of you know, teaching people to turn off lights, we do everything automatic now, right? In Colorado, we have lots of bears when you go camping. Right, so now all the trash cans are these super heavy trash cans. You have to do all these levers because they close automatically. Right? So there's a lot of engineering things that you can do. Um, DWI, right? So uh, we just had a horrible accident in Fort Collins where someone had 15 DWIs uh, just killed a family. Right? Uh, so we're saying, okay, what do we do? You know, so there's some cars that you have to blow into the car before you can start. Right? You've had so many DWIs that you're going to have you know an alcohol test before you start the car every single time. So there's ways of how do we kind of engineer society so we don't have to make you know make those good choices. Uh, and then last enforcement is how do we use government or incentives just to kind of force those good choices, to punish the bad choices or to incentivize with taxes or so you gotta think of childhood obesity, right? Are we teaching people nutrition? Are we engineering things so so they don't have any choices? <laughs> you know, we're, we're you know, you see some examples of this, so infusing junk food with vitamins and minerals, <laughs> you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, or are you kind of regulating junk food? Um, and in different ideal futures, there is kind of, so we did one for the city of Longmont where they did a process of imagining futures. What kind of Longmont do you want? Right? So it's more of here's, here's three different futures, and then the actions were different paths to those futures. So we talked about each one at a time. So those are just some of the ways of thinking about once you have your issue, kind of well, how do we want to frame it? How do we kind of create these kind of three? You do want them. Uh, here's just a few more examples. Um, well, let me jump past these for a second and kind of get to some of the more. And we'll, then we'll try to kind of frame it. Uh, so, some key issues to think about. I probably touched on these a few already. Uh, avoid directly opposing approaches. I already talked about that already. Uh, usually, avoid status quo as an option. We, we tend not to say one approach is, let's just keep it the way it is. Because right? um, normally, you want to pick an issue that people agree status quo is not working. we got to do something about this, right? So, so you don't you don't want status quo to be an option, but there has been some situations that it makes sense. Uh, popular framing versus reframing. This is one of the I think sometimes the NIF tries too hard to change the conversation, right? Uh, so in some ways you want to reframe it, you want to kind of change it, you don't want to have the, the same typical conversation, but then if you change it too much, it's too foreign to people, and, and they're not they don't engage it. It's like the healthcare book. I don't know if you that last healthcare book was mm -hmm. it was hard for people to engage in. And I think they focus too much on changing the conversation, right? So, so there's a delicate balance there that you have to play. That you want to kind of get it, get it away from the typical things that everyone talks about that we get stuck on, but not too far away that, that they struggle engaging. We've got another one this year. Uh, they've got their issue this year is healthcare. Uh, how to deal with popular opinions that aren't realistic or supported by data? This is so with the water thing. In Fort Collins, we have, you know, I talked about water that we. we Growing population, we don't have enough water, how do we deal with that, right? So for some people, the way they want to deal with it is don't let anybody else in. We just no more growth. Right? The problem is in our society you can't do that, right? We can't just close it down. We can't tell people not to move there anymore. Right? Um, we can basically let the cost of living get so high that people don't move here, but that also means service industry people can't live here and the society doesn't function in a way. Uh, but if we had this conversation about water and we didn't talk about growth, we would have people there saying we're not talking about growth, right? So I ended up putting an approach on that, that our, our goal was to you know, slow down growth and, and, and stop growing as a community in a way. And I think Kelly and people would disagree with me on here. They, they always feel every approach has to be kind of viable and, and kind of equal and those type of things. But for me and my community to spark that conversation, I knew we needed to talk about growth. But I knew, or I was very confident, I guess I can say that was you. I was pretty confident. <laughs> That if we had that conversation, people would realize that that approach wouldn't work. Right? So I purposely put it first. I framed it well. I didn't try to frame it to. I didn't design it to fail. Right? But it was that red. It was in a way. It was an obstacle. Right? It was an obstacle that people were thinking that that was a magic bullet. Right? But 
but most experts that I talk to you know, realize that there's no way you can stop growth. Like, you don't have that much control in a sense, in a way, right? Um, so by putting it as a first approach, people that have a top chance to talk about it, by the end of talking about it for 15 minutes, realize that that's not really a viable approach, then they took the rest of them more seriously. Right? Same thing when we used to do the energy problem book, my, my students are mainly progressive, you know, in, in Colorado, right? Especially with energy issues and environmental issues. The first approach of the NIF book was the conservative approach that we needed to drill locally, and they would just dump on it. And partly because renewable energy it is a magic bullet for them. They think we should just switch over to wind power, right? But then when they actually have the real conversation about renewable energy, they realize it's a lot harder than we think, right? The percentage of our power that's coming from renewable is pretty, you know. Uh, so then we ended up flipping it. We would do the second or the third, and we would end with the first approach. And once they would do the second and third approach and realize that those weren't as easy as they thought, they would take the first approach a lot more seriously. So the order of the approach has become pretty important. I've struggled with the childhood obesity one, that I never know if I should do the family approach first or last, right? Because uh, in some ways, I want people to probably realize that we can't have families. Families can't take all the responsibility. It's beyond them. So then hopefully they take the last two seriously. Right? They're saying, okay, we, we, we established that we can't just expect families to, to start being much better families and much better parents. So then, you know, do we rely on school? Or, but there is a purpose in a way of how you organize them. No, I will say some people would disagree with me on that. They know each one has to stand alone. The, ma the order shouldn't matter. They all, I'm like, no, sometimes you have to kind of you know, frame them in a certain way so you help that conversation in a sense. <coughs> I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. I agree. Um, the, the link level of detail, yeah. so sometimes you know, for the water stuff, we had one page, 11 by 17 page, which was a placement that they react to. Right? The old NIF books were about 30 pages long. Right? The newer books were about 12 pages long. Right? Uh, a lot of times I do one that's four pages. That's a, a, a front page, and then each page is a different approach. Right? You know, so there's lots of ways of doing it. My students' assignment in class, it normally ends up being about 18 pages. It's like each approach is two or three pages, but I tell them you'll have lots of charts and graphs in there, you know, so it's not 18 pages of text, it might be really only 14 pages, and then you have, I want a few pictures, and I want a few graphs, and you know, those type of things. But that, that length of the, of the book, the reality is, if you're running it for a public event, they're not going to read a 30 page book. <laughs> you know, so I try to make it that it's, it's something they can react to on the fly, right, but then you also don't want to simplify the issues that much, right, so you're kind of having that balance. The really nice thing about the, the old NIF books, or even the 12 pagers, is you can assign them to students and then they get a lot more detail to prep for it. Like, so my student facilitators will read the full book, but then we run in the community. So all the old books for NIF, you know, so it's a 30 page book, but again, then the last two pages is a summary. Comparing approaches, it has one column for each. So we photocopy this, this is what people have in front of them to talk about it. Right, but my facilitators can read the whole book, so they know a little bit more detail, right? So then they feel that they're a little bit more of an expert than they can, you know. So, so do this as a class assignment that you know you bring these books, the students pick the book, they have to get the home read it, and then they just they run the discussion in their community and, and their class just using this for everybody else. So it's a nice little class assignment. But, yeah, the order of the books I was just talking about sometimes that matters, right? Um, so especially if there's, there's a public assumption that, that's really popular, but it's not supported by data, there's, a, there's this gap between the public and experts. But sometimes you can talk it away. Sometimes you say, you know, we're not going to talk about growth because, right? But I, I just knew with that group that they, they were going to cause a problem. And I thought, you know what, we need kind of, we need to talk about that, even though I'm pretty sure that if we really to talk about that. You know, and they actually came and thanked me. I had people from that area that are always the ones talking about city council about growth said, I appreciate that you actually had our voice in there. That we're like, you know, so, so I think it worked in some way. And then minimize making the document the focus. This is what I talked about a little bit earlier, and since I always tell people it, it's an in process document, right? That I want them to react to it. The, the goal of the process is always to improve the document, right? So I want them to scratch it and write on it, but also at the same time not make it the focus. Okay, work with it now. Try to make the best of the document. If you see flaws, if you think you see missing, you know, let us know. Um, but try to use it for what we're trying to use it for. Just like this conversation. Um, yeah, so these are just some, some more examples pulled from it. I got through all available online. But I don't know if we want to, I don't know, about 20 minutes or so here. I've just, well, well, maybe talk a little about your idea now in terms of how you're thinking about the approaches for literature. Okay, well, 
I'm part of the teacher circle, which is what we're doing this semester is trying to use deliberation in the classroom, right? But the challenge is that my class is a literature class. So I took a story that we're going to read called um, Sin of Omission. And what I did was to see if I could, I want to use this approach, you know, the, the deliberation approach to see if students will do better in discussion of the, of the issues in the story. So just, you know, this, I think the approach is kind of summarize the story, but basically it's, um, it's a story that is set in a town. So then um, what I was going to do is tell the students, you're part of the town, you're part of that community, you're pretending that you're part of that community, so I guess it would be role playing, right? Uh, and then the, since the title of the story is Sin of Mission, I was going to focus on who committed the sin. Okay, because the story is open-ended enough that it, it could be a variety of, of players in the story, right, that committed the sin, which was the sin. So um, it's not technically a factual question. There, there's not someone who committed the sin. It's an open question. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> is, there a right, is there a right answer? Yeah. <laughs> uh, here. Uh, uh, it might help to, to read it. Um, it's a very short story. <laughs> it's, it's three pages. Oh. oh. So, what happens in in approach one is where there's some characters, there's Lope, who is uh, the, one of the main characters who grows up in the story. There's Emeterio, who is his uncle. Uh, and then there is the daughter. And then there is, and that's, that's basically it. Uh, so, for approach one, you could say Lope has committed the sin. We could say that, right? Because he kills Emeterio in cold blood. Okay, he just lifts up a rock and he throws it on top of his head and kills him. And Emeterio doesn't know what's coming, so he doesn't even make any kind of reaction to being killed. Uh, Emeterio took him in when he had no one else and gave him a job and food and shelter. So Lope owes his life to Emeterio. Okay? So technically, Lope has committed the sin of murder. Right? Um, however, the second approach, you could also say that Emeterio has committed the sin. Because he took Lope in, but instead of giving him an education and treating him as a member of his family, which he is because he's Emeterio is Lope's uncle, he sent Lope to work for him as a shepherd on the mountain, where he only had Roque for company, who was a man who couldn't speak. He was much older than, Roque, than Lope. He was like 50 years old. And the shepherds never came down from the mountain. So in five years, Lope never came back to the town uh, until he was asked to come in to see a doctor just to certify that he was still alive. So where they only gave him bacon, grease, and bread to eat, wine or water to drink. So Emeterio was actually the mayor of the town. He was rich. He only had one daughter. So he could have given Lope, you know, a university education. He could he could have made him like a, a member, treated him like the nephew, like a son, right? And instead he got treated uh, like a servant. Or you could say in approach three that society has committed the sin because someone from the town should have made Emeterio send Lope to school. The school teacher tells Emeterio, you know, he's a bright boy, you should send him to school. And Emeterio's like, no, he has to earn a living. He has to go learn how to be a shepherd because he has to, you know, put food on the table, not, I mean, earn his living, right? So he was only 13 years old, though, when Emeterio put him to work. So you could also say it's kind of like a child abuse to go make him work in the, uh, in the, on the mountain. So it is society's responsibility to make sure that all children go to school and are well fed. Okay, so, I mean, it, that's what makes the story hard is, yes, Lope committed the murder, right? So you could say that that's his sin. That's the sin. But then there, the sin is sin of omission. So I, I, mean, I, think it, I mean, it has a wicked problem nailed to it, right? But there's not it has a wicked problem. problem. Thank, Thank you. I was like, literature has wicked problem. Yeah, yeah. No, that's interesting. So no, I think that would, that would spark a really interesting discussion. You really know, the same thing of spending some time. Yeah. Let's spend time on approach one. Assuming, you know, that's the perspective. How do you respond to that? Mm -hmm. I think that would be interesting. See, and I'm hoping yeah. that they also realize, I think that we are testing our, our students so much. They get tested in elementary school and co uh, high school and then college, and then their teachers in college were teaching to another test. So they're just teaching them little pieces of information that when they get to a class like literature, they think there's one answer. And they're looking for that little piece of answer. And I'm just like, there is none. There are better interpretations and there are worse interpretations. 
And yes, I can say it's wrong if you tell me this is about space aliens, right? I'm like, yeah, no. <laughs> no. But other, within that, though, you can say a lot of interpretations. And hopefully, if you see three different approaches, you can see how you can see it differently. And it will make them think that, okay, so there's no right answer. They're just different answers. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's about judgment, right? Yeah, it's about, about wisdom. Judgment, yeah. And then would you frame that as a, and again, I'm not an expert on literature, but does that fall under like a, a tragedy? Or is this a, like a, I don't know. Um, well, it is a tragedy on, on various levels, right? I mean, he kills a material, so that's a tragedy. He is lacking in human contact. Lope is lacking, right? Because right. his uncle wouldn't give him that. An education, his uncle refused to give him that. So that's another tragedy. And at the end of the story, the people from the town are murmuring, and they are against. It ends like this. That all the old women in the town are saying, oh, how dare he kill his uncle. Oh, my gosh, he, he who took him in, mm -hmm. and he gave him food, and he made him a man. And then Lope is just you know, going towards the prison saying, Yes, 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 yes. Mm. And we don't know what that yes means. We don't know what yet. <laughs> so we don't know what the yes means. But is he admitting guilt? I mean, he's admitting his guilt. Everybody's going to kill him. But is he also saying, or is there something else in there? So, so it's about the definition of sin, or you know, it's like a Stasis model in a sense, right? Yeah. Stasis model is, is, is a stock issue model with an argumentation in a legal term. Right? I mean, so what we know is he killed him, right? Mm -hmm. What we don't know was it murder. Yes. Right? Was it justified? Was it, you know, all this kind of stuff? So that those become more open questions to interpretation mm -hmm. and discussion in a sense. So we have about 15 minutes, and then we do have to end on time. <laughs> yeah, we have an air, a plane airport. to catch. Um, <laughs> so the, let me jump ahead really briefly, and then we can go back and kind of talk more about the approaches, but just to kind of make sure I get to this. So so the last part, once you do the, 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 the Developing potential approaches is kind of really the hardest step and kind of a key step, right? Because once you have that, everything else is kind of filled in the blank in some way, right? Uh, so I can send these to you. I think I, I don't know if I gave them to you when you were in the PowerPoint, right? Uh, so with my students, I have two different worksheets that they do. This is like an internal worksheet. It's an approach development worksheet. It's very similar to one of the ones that's in the packet that I gave you that we had, you know, the elements of choices, this example for the healthcare. Right? So this is more of an internal thing for, for students to kind of work through the issue. Uh, and then the placemat, uh, which is the assignment when they're writing out, the, so there's a public version that other people will use to make sense of it. This is kind of the internal version for, for the person developing to make sense of it, right? Uh, so you see this one has categories for, so once you have the three approaches, you can write them up there. And okay, so how, from that approach, how do they define the problem, right? What's the broad remedy? What are they saying needs to change? Right. What are some specific policy options? What are some specific actions uh, from a broad range of stakeholders? Right. So who's doing what, in a sense? Um, what are some facts that support the approach? So where's some actual really hard data, in a sense, that would support this? What are the key values? So for that approach, what are the values that are kind of on the top of the hierarchy? Uh, and then what are the cons? What are the kind of push back and the trade-offs? Right? Uh, so they kind of work on that to kind of, you know, and sometimes as you start putting on the details, you have to make changes to the approaches. Right, maybe two of the approaches was really easy to do that. The third approach you're really struggling, so then you might need to kind of back up and kind of play with the approaches again to make sure that they're, they're, they're kind of divided up equally. Right, and this becomes the place map, which is the public thing. Right, um, and you could do an assignment that all they have to do is come up with a place map. I literally, for the water stuff, I went into a water conflict class, a graduate class, at once a week for an hour. Right, so they did a lot of conflict with the water law, and I came in for an hour, it's kind of what I did today, to train them about framing. And then the next week, they had to bring a placemat for water in northern Colorado, right? So we got 20 of those from the community, from the, from this class. And then me and the person I taught the class went through all the 20. We picked the one that we liked the most. And then we incorporated some aspects of the other one. And that was the first draft for our one for the community. And then we sent it to the, to the advocacy group for the river. And we sent it to the power company. And, we, uh, and then they kind of made some suggestions for finding it. But then that's what we did for the public. You know, so this is an assignment that in, in an hour you kind of explain it and then say, hey, you go home and complete one of these, right, for an issue that you've been studying already in some sense, right? Uh, so then this becomes a placemat. Uh, I do this on the legal side of the paper. So they have a little bit of room here to explain the problem, explain, you know, what should we do about X? So first you have to establish X is a problem we should all care about, child obesity or whatever. Then you have the three approaches. So you have the title of the approach, a brief explanation, so normally like two or three sentences here that say what that approach is. 
and what should be done. So a bullet list of some specific actions, the key advantages, the arguments for this position, and then the trade-offs on the bottom. Right? Um, and then the book itself just becomes this thing, but each each bullet point instead of a bullet point is a paragraph, right? And it's saying we should do this, we should we should tax junk food, right? And then you have a little paragraph and they, uh, and the degree to which you want to make it a bigger assignment, they have to have sources and you know have to cite their sources and footnotes and all that kind of stuff depends on how much time you want to spend on it, right? So part of it could be just a brainstorming process to kind of come up with an issue they already understand, or it could be very much a research project that they have to. You know, in my class is a semester project, so you know they have to have twenty different sources. You know, they have to have government sources and you know academic sources, public, all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, so they have a form. You might just have that one page placemat. The four pager is you have one page for approach, so you have an introduction and four page for A lot of times we'll do the, uh, uh, the 11 by 17, so it folds, right? So they have a title page, and then you open up, and then you might have the three approaches across these pages, and then on, on the back you have some kind of discussion questions or reflection questions, right? So that's kind of one easy way for the students to kind of work it. But that's if they have access to 11 by 17 paper. Or something. So, um, the eight pager is you, get, oh, you have the intro, and then once you open it up, you have two pages per approach, right? Uh, and a lot of times when we do this in the public, we want this to be a workbook for them, right? So you might have some data of some open space for people to kind of write comments and those type of things. You know? But the idea, the placement is they have it in front of them, they see everything. So while we're doing approach one, they see all the arguments of approach one, right? And they can turn the page or approach three, and, um, or the full book with a, with a summary. Of the uh, so I gave you these links if you want to go to them, but these are three uh, organizations that basically use the NIF model. Uh, here's a common problem. Uh, uh, public agenda calls them discussion starters, right? Um, uh, Everyday Democracy actually has an issue by exchange, a place where people have developed these can kind of send theirs in and share and things like that. Uh, I, by the way, some of the NIF ones um, you have to pay for. Uh, I have PDFs of almost all of them. Right? So if you see something online that looks interesting, you can, Wendy does this all the time, right? Hey, do you have the alcohol one? And then I'll send you the PDF back, right? Uh, so if you have an issue you're interested in, feel free to email me, and if I know there's an issue book somewhere, I'll, I'll give it to you. Uh, there's also, I did put the link here, if you Google reframing framing, Public Agenda has a nice little article for students. It's probably like 10, 12 pages long, that talks about the, the need to you know, frame for deliberation versus framing for, for strategy. Mm -hmm. There you go. Um, so that's it. So let me bounce back now to the, the, let's try here in the last 10 minutes. If we were to try to come up with a framing on homelessness, right, we'll name it the easy way. What should we do about homelessness in downtown Houston? Right? Uh, what, what are some possible approaches? And, and one thing, not always, this one I actually have it. Um, I tend to like the approaches to be action statements. Notice for a lot of these, the first word is a, is a verb, create and implement, right? Um, this one, not quite, improve, right? Make it easier, stop the bleeding, break the cycle, right? Um, you know, so a lot of times it seems like each one kind of being a broad action step, right? Um, but, but not always, right? You know, the, the ones, you know, this one in particular is, is more taking that framing of each approach is a different key actor in a way. But I don't know if anyone's kind of thinking through um, if, if you were to say, here's, here's three broad approaches to take on homelessness, what, what might one be? Well, one that I was, as you were describing things, you had a significance of ultimately um, <clears throat> uh, creating a possibility for everyone to be uh, productive. Uh, one conversation I had about disability, and the reality is, is just enough support to be able to. Just enough, so it's not so much framing someone that's having to say, but disability. But they need support to be able to take care of themselves, or to be able to be more productive, hold down that job, and, you know, hold down their health care costs by having a way of managing it better. And so, and the extreme is letting things as they are, and the other extreme is manage care, you know, and just completely treat it as you know a social health problem versus a personal personal responsibility, you know. So, so our approach might be something like strive for. Strive to help everyone to be, become a productive member of society yeah. or something like that. In a way. Yeah, well, when right. to, when you take a chance or, you know, yeah. what is a reasonable thing if someone's been proven they've never gotten sufficient health care or you're the mental and having a hard time keeping on their meds and their families are not able to help them. Yeah. yeah. That's almost like that could also be the name of the book, right? Like, how do we. Yeah. How do we. Well, I don't know. 
Yeah, and, and that's sometimes the way I might start with a very broad frame, but then one approach will be like, oh, this is such a rich approach. Yeah. And sometimes it's happened that the approach becomes the whole topic. Yeah. And then we think about three ways of really kind of doing that approach. Mm -hmm. right? and, and again, it goes back to what's your audience. Are you yeah. trying to get to the broadest possible audience, or are you saying, that, that line between activism and, and deliberation, right? Um, sometimes you're saying, hey, let's, let's, sometimes I work with individual groups that already care about the issue, right? And they're just trying to figure out how do we act together, right? So this model can still be very useful for a group of, you know, to, to, to work with just the choir, right? But for the choir to kind of help identify their actions. Arm the choir, I know. Uh, arm the choir. Yeah, arm in the choir, yeah, kind so of, kind of helping those cast teams and those yeah. type of things. Right? Well, so we have natural policy <laughs> moving toward Ending homelessness by providing homes and support yeah. services. Yeah. Then you have communities who are criminalizing it, you know, including right. Houston. Right. Yeah. 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 An and so, you know, if we continue, you know, so there are actually policies that are going against each other. Yeah. Criminalizing yeah. is, you know, more people get their mental health care in the county jail than they do in the free world clinics. Yeah. So that tells you about something about the population, you know, because they're overcrowding. There's people getting their needs sufficiently is the best, most efficient way. You know, moral reasons, financial line. Yeah. Other people yeah. think of, I mean, I know like housing first, we talked about it yesterday, yeah. right? That might be an approach. One approach is like, hey, just put them in house, you know, that idea of just giving them some sort of place to live, uh, even if you're giving it to them, right? It tends to be cheaper in the long run, right? So housing first has always been an option. Uh, with, with issues like this, a lot of times you might have an approach that really focuses on prevention, right? We're really, we're, we really need to put our energy in kind of, you know, those people that are almost homeless. Right, or those type of things, right? Put our energy there, uh, kind of more of a long term strategy. Uh, part of the approach might be more of like really look at the root causes, right? So you might say, you know what, mental health is really the cause of, of a lot of this chronic homelessness, right? So, you know, focus on mental health kind of resources in some senses, right? Uh, or, you know, maybe you're saying the underlying cause is really about, about low wages, right? So say, you know what, to really fix homelessness, if we really deal with homelessness, we're dealing with a symptom. The true cause of all this is just kind of the inequality in society and kind of the balance between the cost of living and, and the cost of housing and the cost of housing and waging, wages. So that, that's what we need to figure out. So you start kind of figuring out, <clears throat> in some ways, like, to what do, do we agree? Do we, do we incorporate the business person's kind of perspective or the kind of the, the criminalizing thing? Yeah, I think it'd be hard to make that an approach because people would just dump on that, right? Mm -hmm. So well, that would probably be something that as I'm designing it, that's a perspective that I think about how does that perspective respond to each approach? Yeah, to right. what degree does this approach kind of uh, work with those concerns in a way? To what degree does this approach get the homeless off the streets and kind of help beautify our county like that? So instead of making an approach saying, get rid of them so we can be pretty, you know, um, which uh, wouldn't be very rich, right? But I know, hey, if we want to engage those audiences, that their opinion has to be in there, right? So, so some of that, so how do you kind of weave that? So some, some concerns you weave across the approaches, right? And then some concerns become the approach itself. Right? You're trying to get into it. Oh, um, just the, uh, that before 1980, uh, government practices and business practices, something uh, there were some changes there. So a lot of the people that we see in the homeless the last 30 years, they managed, they were pretty invisible or they, you know, so there's something about the business practices and oh. that, Trigger, you know, uh, this population. And, uh, I'm looking at the courts, the legal is kind yeah. of considered part of that as well. The healthcare you know, access to yeah, both the visual, visual. Like I know in Fort Collins, we don't have a detox, right? right? Uh, you know, so that so we we don't have much treatment programs for substance abuse, and that kind of goes with that mental health kind of stuff, right? To what so what policy changes happened? A lot of stuff happened during Ronald Reagan, right? Mm -hmm. that, that, that a lot of the funding for mental health kind of ended, so that's that will kind of trigger that initial homelessness. So you start kind of, you know, is it organized by those core causes in the background? Is it organized by, you know, we could probably kind of play with framing it in terms of key players, right? But like really kind of, uh, I know our, our, our religious, you know, our churches are involved somewhat, but, but there's a really big push in, in Denver, actually, internationally now. Um, there's this notion that there, there's more churches in the world than there is homeless people. So if every church took in one homeless person, there would be no homelessness. Right? So that's been a powerful statistic, uh, especially in the, in the United States. So Denver's been pushing that particularly. Like if every single church just did what it take to got, got, get one homeless person off the, fan, uh, off the streets, there would be no homeless, right? And that was kind of been a big charge that a lot of the churches have taken seriously in a way, right? You know, so you could have an approach of really just kind of, you know, nonprofits really have to step up here. And the second approach of local government needs to kind of, you know, change policies in a way. And then, I don't know what, what a third one kind of might be in that, right? 
uh, kind of absorbing, you know, just anticipating that, you know, when people fall, the disease could get back up. Yeah. One thing that is really important in this is like uh, doing the homework and finding out, like for me, homeless, the first thing that comes to mind, who are they? Because I know there are families, but I don't know how many families. I know some, they say veterans, well, how many are out there? Because I don't know. Uh, mentally ill people who, you know, that I, I think that without doing the research to really build the background is really impossible yes. to do. And, and that's where you're back, bouncing back and forth, right? So that's what I was saying. You kind of start with the public to kind of see how they're talking about it, but then you're checking with the experts. So like one thing we're, actually I think it was happening this weekend is Fort Collins is doing their, their count, right? This point in time study that they have about 40 volunteers that are going all over the community to try to talk to every single homeless person to see well, you know, they have a questionnaire with about 20 questions now. To what degree they're going to answer them truthfully or not, I'm not sure. It's obviously self-reported data, but it's exactly that, right? Uh, and that's what that's part of that cycle in a sense, right? <clears throat> so we want to balance, and we want to find the right balance. And that's not, not necessarily you have to have, but balance the expert data and the public data, because um, both can kind of inform each other in some ways, right? So once we're developing these, a lot of times, that's why if I develop a framework kind of from the public concerns and the public ideas, I might take it to the experts, right? So we take it to the Water Institute of, of CSU and say, hey, are we getting this right? Or often I'm working with the expert. Right? Uh, but it, it, oftentimes things are framed so much from the expert perspective that the public can't engage with, right? So a lot of the work I do, I, I tend to start with the public and then I have the expert help me refine it. And if I'm getting something wrong or the public gets something wrong, we deal with it then in some ways. Uh, but yeah, I agree with you. We do need to know those numbers, right? Okay. We do need to know. I mean, how many poor, you know, I remember the meeting last week, the park ranger got up, and everyone was talking about how horrible there's there's families and these young children that are sleeping at night. That's just ridiculous. And the park ranger got up and said, I'm dealing with homeless every day. It's like, I haven't seen a child. Like, all, all, all the homeless I'm dealing with are, are older men. I, I've, I've never seen a family and I've never seen a child that's camping what I've seen. You know, there, there's homeless families, but they're the ones that tend to use the shelters and they tend to, you know, find some place to stay. But there's very, at least in Fort Collins, there's very few families that are actually going to be on the street, right? And that was, you know, the conversation for a while kind of started focusing on children and there was this uproar of like, oh my goodness, there's, a, there's an eight-year-old sleep on the streets. And then finally the experts kind of said, no, actually that didn't happen, right? We, we do have emergency you know, shelters that, you know, so you do need that clarity to kind of think about it. Yeah. And one of the approaches might be, and a lot of property stuff that I've done, is like, you know, let's make sure those that need help the most get the help, right? Whether that's disabled, whether that's children, whether that's family, right? Uh, but then part of that approach might be kind of a distinction of, you know, the, the, the ones that aren't asking for help, right? Maybe we don't spend our time on there, right? Um, that to what degree should you have an approach that really kind of tries to make that distinction between who's really deserving and, and who might not be as but yeah, no, I completely agree that the, the data has to come into it, right? So this deliberative. Now, for a student assignment, again, it depends on how long you want the assignment to be, right? If it's a whole semester assignment, you're going to require a lot of research, right? But if it's more of a, of a philosophical kind of assignment to kind of think through how you change the conversation, you know, it, it might not be as much expert kind of stuff. But a lot of my work, it goes back to that Venn diagram I had. We have decision makers, uh, the public, and experts, right? And we're in the middle. And I'm trying to design frameings that do all three. That incorporate the public values and the public assumptions and the public beliefs, incorporates the good data, and also incorporates the realities of, you know, if something's completely unfeasible, I don't want it to be part of it anyway, right? Um, and and, and you're, you're constantly back, bouncing back and forth between those three. We're, we're about done. Let me click. Do you want to do the evaluation? Have you passed it out yet? Or? I have not, but yeah. We well, passed it out so they can do that. Yeah. I know that we need to have yeah. it pretty soon here. Yeah. Sorry. No, I was saying also that access to services also has to be known if they are accessing services or they are not. At what time? Yeah, what, what services work? You know, a lot of this work becomes best practice analysis, right? What's working in other communities and how do we learn about those things, right? Um, yeah, so, so it really is kind of a Again, a yang and a yang going back and forth, right? <laughs> that we want creativity, we want to kind of break up, but then we want to fill that in with actual research and down back and forth.
how to pay for it later. But that doesn't work with state legislative law, right? right? We can't have more of something we want without also having less of something that we like, right? Um, so more economic equality without uh, less economic freedom, so we lose something that we like in some senses, right? Uh, we can't have less of something we don't want without also having more of something we don't want. Right? This is a big one I do a lot with the poverty kind of stuff, right? People always talk about we need less fraud and abuse and accountability and things like that. The problem is accountability takes time, right? We, we had so a bill for try to overhaul education in K-12 in, in Colorado, right? Um, so right now, you see how the tensions didn't come out and that the advertising was horrible. Yeah. K-12? K-12, uh, kindergarten and 12, so, so education. Yeah. yeah. Um, secondary, and yeah, elementary and secondary education. Uh, so the bill was a, was a whole bunch more money for, for K-12 schools, right? Um, but it was, it was a state, it was tied to the state income tax, right? So increase the state income tax a little bit to be able to fund schools. But then all the money was going to go to local districts based on how many students they had, and they were going to let the local districts send it their way, right? Because there's a lot of tension in the, at least in the United States, right? That we want local schools to have control of the money. We don't want the state or the federal government to tell them how to send the money, right? Uh, but the fact that it was the state coming, getting the money, right? A lot of the advertisements against it was, oh, this is a state takeover of education, right? So they attacked the bill as a state takeover of education, taking away from local institutions, right? Because that's who raised money, even though the bill was actually giving them the money, not telling them how to use it, right? They were also attacked by lack of accountability, of saying, it's all this money, but they're not telling us how they're going to spend it. Right? So you notice how they hit, they hit them from both sides, right? Because if the bill said, here's the money, but you have to spend it like this, they would get attacked as state takeover, right? But they just said, we're going to give them the money, let them decide. But by not specifying how, it was getting attacked for accountability, right? So accountability is a great word, a very powerful word in politics right now, right? But you can't have accountability without having direct rules for how to use the money, right? So you can't have accountability and flexibility, right? Uh, but, you know, so all these tensions, you know, trying to figure out ways to struggle through that tension. The problem is that the broader public discourse, they're trying to find the best ways to either support the bill or attack the bill. So they take advantage of those tensions, right? Uh, so no matter what they did, they were going to be on one side of that tension, and then that, that, that's used to attack it in a sense, right? Um, or the kind of same thing, that they, they wanted... They want all the money to go to classrooms, right? So it's an attack of like, there's no guarantee that's all going to classroom. It might go to administrators, right? But then it also got attacked for not being accountable, and, and there's no way to show that this money will make a difference, right? Well, to be able to show money makes a difference, you need administrators to evaluate things, right? But if you're just giving all the money to the teachers, but no money to bureaucracy, you know, bureaucracy is a negative term, at least in the United States, right? But you need bureaucracy to have accountability and to have measurement, right? Mm -hmm. But you see that when, you, when, when you're letting everyone frame it strategically, you can make everything sound bad, when in reality is, okay, we, you want accountability, you want measurement, but you want all the money to go to teachers, and you want the local schools to make all the money, but you want the state to, you know, so it's, a, it's an interesting conversation when you just struggle with it, but we're having that conversation instead of in a circle working through the tensions of identifying, we're having them with 30-second spot ads right, that are designed to get people to hate the bill or, or love the bill, right? Uh, but it's all like, but when you switch around, so we actually did a process, it ended up being very difficult because with referendum issues, right, so this is, you know, it goes to the voters whether we pass this amendment to raise taxes to fund schools. Uh, but both sides kind of waited to the last second to do their ads. We were going to analyze all the ads, make sense of it, and then have these sit-down conversations to talk through the tensions. Um, but you know, the, the elections in November, and it wasn't until like late October that everyone just threw all their money and have all these ads, you know. And most of them were very manipulative and, and wrong. We had a fact check law, so it was very hard for us to help because it was just too late, right, for us to make sense of everything. But, <coughs> which is a great, great example of you know that the heart of that issue was all these tensions, but. All the public discourse, all the letters to the editor, all the advertisements not, didn't touch all those. They just took advantage of those tensions to frame it to pick one side and, and not see the downside. Uh, and then last, we can't have less of something we don't want without also having less of something we like. Right? Uh, here, here's an example I was just talking about. You know, we, we hate bureaucracy and government costs. But if we get rid of bureaucracy and government costs, then we don't have oversight, assessment, and information. Right? There's just an assumption that's all wasted money. If it's not going to a teacher, it's wasted money. Yeah, I'm not really pro-administration right? as a teacher, right? Uh, but there is some value there. We do need some people kind of, um, in a, there, there are some positives to bureaucracy in a way. Uh, so I'll just have a, a quick review. Uh, then in your packets, I think you have 
to get to the facilitator stuff, uh, turn to page 56. Two quick little facilitation things I'll do, and then we'll go back into the facilitation kind of little practice here. So 56 is the primary facilitating style, right? That's the packet of handouts from my workbook, not the, okay. not the PowerPoint. Yeah. Uh, so I, I came up with these four facilitator styles only about two or three years ago with that program. And it was from observation, right, from inductive reasoning of watching my students and, and seeing that they tended to kind of fit into one of these four. And when I developed it, I thought, oh, like, here's the initial four, and I thought over time I'd keep on adding different styles, like we have these 10 facilitator styles, but it's kind of stuck with these four, right? Uh, each time I kind of, in, in, in each time I, normally towards the end of the semester, I kind of go back to this and ask the new students, you know, which ones do you think you fit in, or, or do you have another one that doesn't? And, and new ones don't seem to come up, so this might be kind of a good set in a way. Um, so the referee is kind of the facilitator that, that tends not to do that much. I mentioned this briefly yesterday, right? So like a referee in a, in a sporting match, you know, you, you keep time, and if someone breaks the rules, you blow a whistle, right? So you kind of keep the ground rules or people being mean to each other. But other than that, you just kind of let them play the game. Right. Um, the interviewer, some people are really good at asking questions. Right. Um, I always kind of go back to, to my, my sister-in-law who works for human resources at, at a corporation. So she interviews people all day long for jobs, right? And then she comes home and, and whenever I have a conversation with her, she's interviewing. Right? You know, she's just asking questions. It's called occupational psychosis, right? You can't, you can't leave work at work, right? You come home, just like me, I watch TV, I analyze everything, right? And it drives my wife crazy, right? We can't watch commercials, but I'll talk about it. These, are, these are the strategies, you know. Um, but she's just really good at asking questions. So if you're really good at asking questions, that's a key facilitator skill, right? But obviously, even all of these have strengths and weaknesses. I'll talk about it in a second. The devil's advocate is someone that's always kind of really good at thinking what's not being said, right? That really kind of identifies the voices that are not there, figures out ways. We talked about some of those ways of bringing a man with an empty chair, or you know, who else could be, you know, someone else was here, what would I say, or putting, you know, coming up with an argument, you know, they might say this, what do you think? You know, so all these kind of strategies. And then the weaver, which is probably my natural style, the weaver just is good at making connections between things, right? So it's always constantly kind of remembering and saying, you said this and you said this, so what, you know, uh, and that's how I've always been. I've always been head in the clouds of kind of seeing the connections between all these kind of things, right? Now, the question of, of which of these is best, <coughs> as you imagine, depends. Right. Um, each group, if you have a group, kind of like the group that we had yesterday, that's self-deliberating, right? that's having a good conversation and treating each other with respect, but also digging deeper into the issues and seeing the tensions, then you should be a referee, right? Don't do too much. And I often see young facilitators flaw on the side of doing too much versus too little, right? Uh, just let the kind of groups be in a sense and then kind of take some, some chances when you want. Um, obviously, the interviewer is good when you have a quiet group, right? That if you just let them talk, it's going to surface, and then if you're interviewing, you're asking good questions, and you're asking, digging deeper, it's a much more active certain role. Uh, the devil's advocate is critical when you have a group that all thinks alike, right? that aren't seeing different sides of it, so you need the devil's advocate. Uh, and then the weaver is good when people are kind of all individuals and not really kind of reacting to each other, so then the weaver can really kind of make those connections and how people think. Right? Uh, so what I do with my training is, you know, generally students seem to fall naturally into one of those, just how their personality is and how their mind works. <coughs> Um, but as you develop as a facilitator, you want to be able to be all four. So that depending, again, on the purpose of the event and depending on the, the, the hand you've been dealt with the people in your group, you can adjust. Right? Another way I think about that, one of my two favorite facilitator students, they stayed with me for three years, and there are actually a couple. Um, one was just total high energy, and one was always, always very, very calm, right? Uh, and it was the same thing. It's like, and, and advantages and disadvantages to that, right? But you should adjust. If your group is really low energy, you need to be high energy, right? Especially when my students, it's funny, my students are so n nervous about doing this in the community at the beginning, but then we do all these practice forms and classes with other students, and, and students are kind of the worst groups to facilitate yeah. sometimes, right? Yeah. Well, and part of it is they didn't pick the topic. I mean, they didn't leave their house to go talk about that, right? You're just making them talk about a topic. Um, so then by, by the time we finally do it in the community, and it's full of people that leave, left to talk about that topic and are passionate about it, so nice, right? They're so nervous about people kind of 
that being emotional, right? And then by the time we actually get in the community, like, thank God someone's emotional, right? <laughs> that they want. Emotion is good, right? The, the lack of emotion is a much more difficult problem to facilitate with than too much emotion, right? Too much emotion is something you can mold and, and adjust and transform into productive conflict, right? I don't care about the topic. There's not much you can do with that. Right. <laughs> so you have to regulate kind of your, and, and it's literally you regulate your, your, your rate of speech. If your group is really emotional, then as a facilitator, you need to talk a little slower, and kind of go through and call people, you know, and if everyone's really bored, you really need to kind of get up and say, okay, let's talk, you know, and use your energy to kind of fire them up in a way, right? So all these styles is you're adjusting to the, the hand you've been dealt essentially with the group that you have. And we will, when we do the practice form, we'll do it all inside the circle now just to kind of show you a little bit more what, 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 what we would normally do, right? We'd be much more closer to each other um, to kind of talk through. More closer. Yeah. yeah. English is my second language. <laughs> my second language as well. And then the last thing I want to talk about a little bit, and then we'll do this uh, breakout again, uh, is page 59. And this is some of the new theory I'm developing. Um, and I'll probably link this a little bit more as I finish this paper I'm writing of when they intervene with the facilitator responsibilities we covered yesterday. But starting with the bottom a little bit, there's, there's a theory that I really like when I, I teach my persuasion class uh, called Siller's Expected Utility Model. And, and, uh, and it was developed for kind of situations where you're asking for a favor. You're trying to get a friend to loan you money or loan you your car or give you a ride to the airport or something like that, right? So there's this whole literature of communication about kind of uh, asking people for favors. Um, and there's this whole range of strategies. Some of them are very positive strategies. You know, you're such a great friend, you know. Uh, uh, <coughs> And some of them are negative strategies, right? Using a guilt trip or calling in a favor or, you know, those type of things, right? Um, yeah, so the Siller's utility model basically said, what strategy you pick, is you're, you're calculating several different things, right? You're calculating for the factors of, of what strategy you pick. One is how important is it for the favor to, to, you know, is it like I'd really like to go to this party or if I don't get a ride to the airport, I don't get to go home for Christmas or something like that, right? So how important is it, right? How important is the relationship, right? What's the potential impact on that relationship? And then fourth, which I think is very important, is how likely is the strategy to work, right? Because part of it is you don't want to pull out the big guns, right? You don't want to go with a really bad guilt trip if it's not going to work, right? Because then you have the damage to the relationship and you still don't get the favor, right? So you're calculating in your head all these things of, of what am I going to use here, right? Do I get angry? Do I kind of you know, point out the time that they didn't do something or all that kind of stuff, right? Um, and one of the interesting examples here is, is the literature also has, there's examples sometimes when you're asking for a favor that you purposely don't want the favor to be rewarded to you because you'd rather, there's a positive impact on the relationship. An example, I've never done this. Uh, but my, my brother goes to Vegas, Las Vegas, about four times a year. And every time he goes, he calls me and says, hey, I'm going to Vegas next weekend. If you can get out there, you can save my room for free, right? Uh, I'm a very busy person, and you know, work-life balance is a stretch for me, right? I've got three kids. Uh, so me leaving for the weekend to Vegas would normally be a very difficult thing, right? <laughs> like, uh, I work well, so 100 hours a week, I'm going to go play for three days without you. Uh, but I could potentially still ask my wife, oh, Danny's going to Vegas this weekend. Is it all right if I go? And then she'd probably say, oh, but the kids have, and then I'd say, oh, yeah, that's true. No, never mind, I won't go, right? <laughs> but just by the fact of me asking and then being so gracious on giving up on it, right? I get, I get, you know, I get a little proud of it. So the next time I ask to go to Vegas, she might say, well, last time I didn't let him go, so maybe I'll let him go this time. Right? <laughs> but there's all these calculations you're making. Right? So that was a little tangent, but, uh, so I'm developing a similar theory for facilitation, right? When you're deciding to intervene, what goes into that decision of what you're going to say, right? Uh, so you see it on here. What is the importance of the issue, right? How important, what's the teaching moment, right? How important is the opportunity that, so if someone says there's a tension and someone expresses one side of the tension, using the example of the K-12 stuff, someone says, no, that's ridiculous. There's no accountability. And you know, oh, there's an interesting tension between accountability and you know, these other things that we want to talk about, right? And if that seems like a pretty key part of this discussion, and it's clear that this group is only seeing one side of it, I might say, this is so important that I need to intervene here to try to get them to kind of explore this tension, right? So that first thing is how, you know, the importance of the issue, and, and part of, uh, we'll review this with the winter intervene, but with any kind of group communication, there's a whole literature on group communication, uh, there's a task dimension, and then there's a social dimension. Right? So groups form to get something done, right? 
But then there's also a social dimension that the more comfortable the group with each other, the more likely they'll, they'll be able to do the task in some way, right? But the same stuff is the more they're focused on the social, they're not doing the task. Right? Uh, there's this interesting experience I had walking around my events when groups laugh, right? We're taking on a tough issue, but then all this group is laughing, right? And part of me is thinking, okay, that's good. They're getting comfortable. They're having a good time, right? And then part of me is thinking is, okay, they're not in the groan zone if they're laughing, right? And how, how, how much are they actually struggling with this issue if they're having that good of a time, right? But it's that task social dimension, you know, because I mean, most of our groups form for two hours, right? They show up to an event, they sit down, they have a two-hour experience with each other, and then they're gone. It's not an ongoing group. Right, so you know, you've probably seen the literature in, in terms of what norming, storming, you know, that, that kind of group development. So we have two hours for them to develop, right? So normally I see laughter as, hey, they're they're starting to bond as a group, right? And, and hopefully they'll be able to kind of use that bonding to be able to really do the hard work later on. Hopefully they're not laughing for two hours, right? Because then they're probably not doing any tasks. Uh, so that's the same thing. Is the importance of an issue is if you're pushing on a, on a learning moment, if you're pushing on attention, right? You're probably working on tasks, but you might be giving up relationship, right? If, you, if you're identifying the tension between two people and you're highlighting it, you're going to create tension, right? You're going to, you know, it's going to be uncomfortable for people, right? They're, they're probably going to enjoy the experience less, right? But you also feel that they're really going to learn about it, right? So as a facilitator, you're constantly kind of dealing with that tension in a way between tasks. And, and so, you know, if you're not wanting to... I don't want people to come to my events. I want them to enjoy the experience, right? But I want them to enjoy the experience more in a fulfilling kind of way. I did hard work today, right? I, I, we really did, you know, we worked through that issue instead of, oh, that was an enjoyable conversation, right? Um, so that's part of it. So when you're jumping in, how much reward, how much you're going to get out of it in terms of the task, then also how much relationship damage might there be to kind of bring that up, right? Um, I'm going to skip the second one for a second. Availability of, availability of time for the intervention. This is one of the time management, right? You've got 30 seconds left before you move to something else. Don't bring up a huge issue, right? You don't have time to do that. So you always have to have time under it. Do I have time to really explore this? If it's a tension that you want to explore and work through, that takes time, right? Uh, yeah, potential for, uh, I guess we'll go back to the second one. The potential for it to resolve or occur by itself. So ideally, the group does this themselves, right? Uh, ideally, a group's, ah, I disagree with that, you know, when you have attention, you know, you, you don't want to intervene that much, right? Uh, so part of it is to what degree do I have to kind of be the one that kind of makes that, right? If, if the other three people don't want to do it. So there's, uh, I know Jerome self identify that I should make you do it, right? So I will make you do it. So then I think we have the two of you and Maria. So two of the three of you have to. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right, Thomas is, is willing, all right? Yeah, okay. <laughs> I'm not, but I can do it. <laughs> and again, the, the making mistakes is makes it, gives us more learning opportunities, right? So. So we... Yeah, so we're going to come in the middle, and what we'll do, so, so get out that same kind of little one page hand down on the child's obesity. Um, I don't know where mine went. Maybe I'll let you here. here. Yeah, here. I guess, you know. <coughs> and, and we'll come in the in inner circle here, so we have a little bit more of a typical experience for facilitation. <coughs> So maybe we'll do, Jerome, you do approach one, is that right? Uh, Thomas, do approach two, and then we'll figure out between Maria. And uh, maybe we can do half and half on the, the third one. We need to take on those roles, too, right? Yeah, if you want to pick, pick the role, I don't know if y'all want to pick one or... To make sure, um, like, so we don't have to do the same thing in just a way. Yeah.
Or just every once in a while, if you want to look and just kind of pull out that character and kind of make that argument. Okay. Uh, we, don't, we don't necessarily have to kind of specifically select them. Okay. It's a little okay. oblong. I'm going to put someone right over here. This, this yeah. Over there? Well, we got two. We, we're filling oh, okay. them all. Oh, we're going to fill all the spots? Yeah, okay. I think so. Okay, then we, then we'll yeah. so we'll what, shape them in the circle. <laughs> Okay, and no more seeds right here. Uh, no, no, no. That's uh, yeah. 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 No, that's perfect. We want to push back the table a little bit. Okay, so circle. Uh, uh, let me adjust first, <laughs> and then, then we can kind of modify this. Of course. Don't push. Oh, no, no. <laughs> okay. All right. So, <laughs> <laughs> first. <laughs> 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 oh, Jerome is first. So, yeah. Okay, give me a second here to get set up accordingly. So do you need to get a headshot more of the moderator, do you think? Yeah, and the moderator is, who, who are my hands? Jerome to be first, then Thomas. Okay, so if I can get Jerome to take the opposite seat. Jerome, could you sit here? Sure. This won't hurt a bit, or hardly at all. Okay, so what, what facilitator here, and who's the second facilitator? Now, when the music stops, you don't have to No, I can work over your shoulder. This is perfect right That also means you're done for the day. So who's my second facilitator? Uh, Thomas. Thomas? Okay. Um, he needs his in here or there. No. Well, I, uh, I think I may just, if it could just have the two sweet seats. We can pause in between and switch around. Sure. And then who's the third, and who's the third one? Uh, we haven't established that yet. Okay, so if the two of you would, uh, if it would be, I'm gonna, I don't know who wins or who loses or what. <laughs> what I'd like to do is I'm going to drop those two curtains right here, the two uh, gentlemen perfect right here, and then if you would, at the third facilitator, whoever the third person is, uh, we're going to assume over here. Okay. Let me check my uh, status of the camera on the other side. Which one's your own when they get there? Uh, no, no, I'll, I'll can move my camera at that point. Okay. Be yeah. yeah, so like we did yesterday, you know, as soon as this was an actual event, you know, we have lots of circles in the room kind of doing the same thing we're doing here. From the front of the room, we've already talked about kind of deliberation and kind of, you know, the, we've explained the process and how we're collecting information and using the information. Uh, and then we've already established the problem. Right? So we had some statistics about the increase in childhood obesity, those type of things. So in your groups, what you're going to do is you're going to spend about, I've got my phone, you know, about 10 minutes. <laughs> 10 minutes each, kind of talking through each approach. Uh, so then we'll switch facilitators for each approach. That, that facilitator should start out with a quick little summary, right? Maybe knowing that we have this in front of them, so you don't have to read it to us. But just say, no, this is first approach, this is kind of the primary argument, and then open it up. Normally, your first question pretty open ended, uh, but then maybe have some, I kind of think, back to the five basic moves, right? So you'll be kind of controlling who speaks, you'll do some paraphrase potentially, you'll do some probing questions, which is asking that person a follow up question. Some reaction question to get other people to react to that person said, or some transition questions, which is kind of changing the kind of <coughs> shifting the conversation to another <coughs> um, on the guy. Right. Should, should we declare which character we are? I, I think you know, so you don't have to pick that character and be that character the whole time, right? Okay. But just every once in a while to kind of enrich the conversation, and you don't even have to, you know, you can just say, well, you know, as a small business owner, you know, okay. so you kind of look at it um, and kind of pick one that hadn't been done with before, okay. um, and obviously you don't have to read that out loud, but just kind of. Give a quick kind of reference that kind of helps us know who you are. Um, and for some of them, we might not know because maybe you are that, right? Um, you know, like number eight, you're a parent who believes that your child learns to make their own decision mistakes, you know? So that might be kind of your opinion anyway. But this just kind of gives us a little bit more to work with instead of. Yeah. Do you have. Yeah, here. The role play, show you need. So, what we are doing yeah. first. I mean, if you do this exercise in class, you know, I can send you this too. And sometimes you can cut it up and then assign people if you want, right? And, 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 and it gives you a more role play. <coughs> Thank you so much. All right. Are you ready to go? So, we'll start with the first one. All right. So, we are gathered to discuss what exactly to do about childhood obesity. It is um, a growing problem in the United States. And Recently, a large percentage of children are overweight or obese. Uh, it is having ramifications in terms of health. It has public policy implications. It has educational implications. So we're here to kind of discuss what exactly we should do about this and how to approach the problem. Um, first, I want to start by talking about the idea that obesity is really an individual and family responsibility, that you know, the solution to it lies with the child, lies with their parents, lies with their family unit. So who, who wants to get started along that 
along that vein of thought, along that approach, that the solution here is with the individual and with the family. So I'm really, in, in such a hard um, topic, but, you know, and it's, I feel sort of bad about saying this, but, you know, I work, I work very early in the morning, I work two jobs, and then, um, you know, my child stays in the after school program. So, you know, I pick my child up six, seven o'clock at night, and I know I should go buy that grapefruit in the store, but sometimes it's just easier because I'm so tired, um, and we have such, you know, the dollar that I have to spend on the fresh vegetables versus the dollar I can I can buy an entire value meal at McDonald's. It's just, um, it's easier, and so it's, it, I think it's, it's just really hard sometimes for us. Okay, so what I'm hearing is that it's easier uh, as, as a parent to sometimes pick the less healthy option than the healthier option. Is that right? I think so, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Easier and cheaper. And cheaper, yeah. Okay. yeah. You have to choose between one grapefruit versus an entire value meal. Yeah. Okay. Does anyone agree with that? I, I, say, I would say that uh, also parents, uh, the obesity is not only the nutrition stuff, it's also about the physical activity, so um, uh, I think this is good if, uh, if uh, uh, parents sometimes uh, have this um, um, scene of buying some fast food just to make it fast, uh, faster, and then during the weekends they may spend some uh, quality time doing some exercises, some bike rides, or, or something with their children. They need to spend their child with time with children, and so and so. So, so why not making it active time? Okay. So, it almost sounds like you think there could be. Am I right here? This, there's some kind of possible trade-off that maybe sometimes it's okay to do what you think is easier from a nutritional standpoint, but you can also offset that by when you have free time together, That's making it okay. okay. Interesting. Well. Um, I think also that it's the nature of our society to be fast food and we want fast, everything is instant. And then also there is other ways and I think that we need to, you know, um, parents have a different choice because usually the excuse is I live a fast life and don't have time to, to cook, but we have weekends. So over the weekend we could cook some food and store food in the refrigerator and then prepare with a salad and do something that is a little bit different rather than going to McDonald's, for instance, and uh, pick up fast food. I think it also the issue here is related to economics. So a junk food is really cheap and then that's, that's mainly what is the driving force in, in the choices for food, especially for children. So it sounds like, um, if I'm hearing this right, a big part of the problem is the cost disparity between the nutritious food and junk food, basically. What is, and I think that ties to what Wendy was saying, um, correct me if I'm wrong here, but one is just so much more convenient and so much less expensive. If you are a parent on the go, if your child has activities, maybe that just is so much an easier option. Okay, so hearing some good ideas about what might be some of the, the causes here. You know, we're, we're talking about obesity being an individual and family responsibility. So what might be some ideas, we've already heard one about using weekends as food prep time and another about using weekends as uh, available time as activity time. What might be some other ways then that individuals and families on their own time can, can address this issue? aside from doing food prep for a week or doing active time together, what might be some other ideas? I, I think a, a education also would be a major component here because there is no really a connection between, a, an open connection between eating good and, and being healthy. So I think it is family later more about the benefit of having a good a, a meal for everybody, not only just for the children, but for themselves also, a, it would be, a, in a way, we would be able to address this problem. I think education would be important here. Okay. What about 
about maybe some of so we've been focusing on elements of this approach if we say it is an individual's or family's responsibility. What about some of the trade-offs if we make this really the individual or family's responsibility? What are some thoughts on the potential trade-offs if that's where we put the onus on tackling obesity? Well, I think one of the most important um, trade-offs hits uh, upon the, the tenses of this uh, speech. I don't uh, find uh, the problem of obesity as uh, being connected only with individual choices and uh, being uh, alienated from all the other society uh, measures. Uh, we all um, has to have to have to. Uh, Pay our taxes for uh, for uh, for fighting obesity for 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 uh, public health and so on. The money it could be spent on uh, other things which uh, maybe would be more more uh, beneficial, especially uh, when we are talking about uh, simply uh, a change of uh, lifestyle. So, uh, I don't think that that uh, we can say that that uh, it is uh, it is only um, it is only uh, limited uh, limited to, to to the person who makes the choice. It is uh, a problem of the whole society, and I, I, and I think uh, this is uh, what uh, kind of trade off it affects the whole the society as a whole. Okay. Well, I own a. Uh a local fast food restaurant and I'm just not comfortable with these trade-offs because um, sorry, I'm just trying to gather my thoughts. Oh, um, because you know I'm not I'm not trying to market my food as healthy. You know, I'm not lying to people. I'm, I'm a business owner. And so I don't understand if people want to make that choice. So what's the problem? Well, I mean, what we're talking about here is with children, so they're not adults, right? I mean, so a lot of the parents, don't have the opportunity. Parents are making buying. Right, I, mean, I think that's, that, that's what I guess the reason. I mean, I, I support this approach in general that I do think it is a family responsibility, but I also think we're we're seeing that families aren't taking that responsibility seriously enough, right? Mm -hmm. So the question becomes: if parents aren't parenting well, then to what degree do we need to step in? And, and yes, I support people making their own choices, but these children are making their own choices. Their parents are making bad choices. So to what, what is our responsibility as a society to set them? You know, um, I guess that's what I struggle with. Out of curiosity, you said you don't really like these trade-offs because it, the trade-offs seem to take focus away from this big an individual choice and parents saying this is what's right for my family. <laughs> so if we're acknowledging maybe that, say, eating fast food every day is not necessarily healthy for a child or for a family, what might you suggest to kind of I mean, they push need the parents to, they need to make to take decisions? responsibility? At some point, we can't legislate everything. At some point, you know, people need to stand up and maybe see this as an indulgent choice. It's not something they need to do every day. But I don't see why we're going to penalize business owners for some, because people can't make their own. I mean, this is what America is about. It's about personal freedom and and and, and um, you know the right to own a business without being penalized in this way. And so, um, you know. I just, I'm uncomfortable with these trade-offs. Well, on the other hand, the U.S. government subsidizes uh, farming and uh, same as European Union and spends uh, millions uh, of dollars on, on uh, food production. Uh, then uh, what's the problem in uh, adjusting the, the money flow in such a way uh, that the healthy food would be more easily available, for example, in your shop? Uh, and uh, and uh, making the junk food a little bit less attractive, also from the economic point of view. We uh, the, the 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 mechanism is already uh, prepared, but we just maybe have to adjust it in, in a little bit different way. I agree, and I'd be willing to change my business model if the market changed. But this is the market right now. I'm a business oh. person. It's the culture that I live in. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think when the people are addicted to fast food, so you help your customers. <laughs> <laughs> if you start selling only uh, healthy foods, then you will lose them. And it's money, yeah. Yeah, it's not your job to change the culture. It's, no. That's what I'm saying. It's a broader responsibility yeah. in sense. I don't think we're rap you. Thank you. <laughs> I, I respectfully disagree with that because we are talking about uh, um, the food for children. And then we need to, as a community, and homeowners, government, individual people, we are all responsible for teaching what is appropriate, what is not appropriate, especially when it's related to, to children. As a homeowner, a, um, a store, I think it also we need to, to let's say, for instance, uh, Coca-Cola should also uh, be contributing a major one now, uh, rather than having the a, a full drink, having half drink. I think this is a, an acknowledgement that we all are in this together. It's, it's true. I agree that we have to have freedom of choices because we are in a free country. But then we have to find a balance between the total freedom and what is also good for for all of us because eventually we all gonna pay the bill. And that's why I've started offering carrot sticks and, and salads at my, at my French house. You know, <laughs> I agree with you. Yeah, let's, go ahead, let's go ahead and stop there. That's about 12 minutes or so. So how did you feel? Um, good. <laughs> <laughs> you have a good, good tone to you. You, tell, you know, I think you know, most of us are teachers, right? You know, but you felt very comfortable. It seemed very comfortable. Especially uh, the last four or five minutes when I didn't really have to do the whole time. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Again, we fell into actually forgetting we're training and just kind of doing it. Right? Not obviously you were role playing. Um, so, you know, you started off kind of just kind of thinking, trying to jot down some of your interventions. You know, so you, you kind of paraphrase the first two or three, right? And, and did it. You know, so it sounds like I'm getting it right. You know, so, again, doing that paraphrase making it easier for, for people to kind of push back in a sense. Um, and then you did one kind of connection, kind of a, you know, so this kind of connects back to what Wendy, you know, those are always useful because people feel heard, right? Like, wow, maybe that's what I said. Is it? And then that also kind of does, what we're trying to do is, is you're creating interaction, right? So one way to create interaction is get people to talk to each other. Another way to get interaction is, okay, you know, what you said kind of connects with what she says. How do we kind of do, you know? So then you're, you're going to be more explicitly kind of creating interaction or, or bringing them forth, right? Um, and then you kind of had the transition question of, in some ways, we were already uh, pushing back on it, right? Yeah. You know, so then your transition was, what are the trade-offs, right? But we were already kind of there, right? Yeah. You know, so it, it might have been better in terms of the transition to say, you know, so someone that really supports this, what, what do you think, you know, because everyone was kind of like, ah, you know, it's, it's not the parents' fault and that kind of stuff, right? Uh, I mean, it's still a good transition to kind of, you know, point that to it, but in, in, in 10 minutes is too short. But, yeah, I thought he did a, a great job of balancing, but that on that trade-off question, when you moved like she answered and I had one thought and then I was going to respond and then he asked other questions so then I had to stop and like reformulate my thought. That was kind of the experience I had as a participant. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. And one interesting thing you did that, that I need to think through more about how the best way to do this in senses because you, you asked questions in terms of what might be some ideas, what can we do, right? Um, and, and generally with yeah. the NIF form, the, 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 when we're going through the approaches, we, we don't tend to ask that kind of question in terms of action. Action is more at the end, right? So we want to spend the deliberations, like you know, struggling with the tensions and thinking about the different sides and creating understanding of the different multiple. And then on the back end, which we're not kind of doing, right? Is so when we say, okay, now that we've had that conversation, what actions do you support? Because <coughs> then it's likely that those actions are actions that kind of negotiate these different tensions. In and a way, that right? gets done in the reflection, which is what right. we're kind of asking the right. questions. We haven't modeled that. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, you know, so I'm not saying you made a mistake or anything like yeah. that, but just to think about when are you ask when you're asking people to brainstorm specific actions, we, we do that at the end after we've talked about all three, right? And, and, and if we do it well, which is sometimes hard when we have lots of small tables, right? Um, you know, if, I, if I'm facilitating through the approaches, you know, I'm identifying some tensions. So then at the back end, say, okay, so one thing that we, you know, we all really kind of saw that it is a parent responsibility, but also recognize that the parents aren't really doing a good job with that responsibility. So what are some ideas you, you have that can kind of do that? You know, and I think yours was a great example, right? We need to teach parents skills on how to have healthy food, even though when you don't have time and that much money, right? You know, so what are some healthy foods that are cheap, 
right? Uh, or you can go buy in bulk or this kind of thing, right? Or you can make you know, several healthy foods on the weekend and then freeze them. So then all you have to do when you get home is microwave them, right? Which is, you know, so, so that becomes, what, what, what essentially you're doing there is you're trying to you know, transcend that tension between we want parents to, do, make, to act better, but we also recognize that, you know, especially low-income parents don't have the time or money. You know, it makes it hard to act better. Right, so then now we're brainstorming actions that kind of negotiate that tension. Make sense? Um, you know, so so sometimes it's worth it during the approach. You know, especially if there's a clear tension uh, to take advantage of it right then. Right? Okay, so what ideas do you have? What would work that would kind of you know be able to negotiate that? Um, but generally, that that the process is let's talk through it so we see all the tensions, we understand kind of the issue, we we, we drop our blinders essentially. And then that last 45 minutes of the forum is when, okay, now that we've had this conversation, what are you willing to do? What are some ideas you have for nonprofits? What are some ideas, you know, what should businesses kind of do in a setting up? And that's, that, you know, McDonald's has adjusted, right? You can now get apple slices instead of french fries in the Happy Meal. You know, there's all these little things. Now, they're not taking, they didn't take away french fries, right? They're just, as a business, right, giving options now. So as a parent, if I want to have a little bit more healthy options, now I have more healthy options. That's part, you know, part of the response. Of, uh, I think that maybe it's a difference um, between the, the, the problem we discussed when the problem is fairly small, yeah, uh, when we have um, a real uh, power of changing something, like in the situation where you were the shop owner, uh, then I think such attitude, what can we do about it? Uh, during the conversation, it might work. Yep. Uh, the brainstorming, oh, well, the fact, the problem, the um, attempt to, to finding a solution at the end. I think we better work when we are talking about um, problems which need, to, for example, uh, more wider consultations, more yep. wider uh, yep. um, uh, involvement, I think. Yeah, and, 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 and part of, again, the, the NIF models, the, the reason we have the approaches is not the approaches are three choices, mm -hmm. right? The, 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 the approaches are designed to ensure a full conversation. So that's kind of the idea. It's like, let's get through the conversation. Let's see all the different sides and perspectives, right? Now, once we have that, then we can do the hard work of kind of what's next, right? Mm -hmm. And, and um, does that make sense, right? Because that, that, that question of, okay, let's brainstorm some ideas, um, I think is a good one. We need to do that, right? But if we do that in the middle of the deliberation, then we're not talking through something. You know, we didn't talk at all, at all about stigma, right? We didn't talk, you know, that kind of thing, right? But, so that's why I'm thinking about that, that you know, brainstorming actions I agree with you. Sometimes it might be a short thing. Let's kind of do it right then, right? Um, but if you're doing a good job, and, and then you, if you think about the cycle of deliberation, right? So as I get the notes from the 15 tables, right, I start seeing, how do they talk about that first one? You know, me as a deliberate practitioner, I start identifying, okay, here are some things we need to push on, you know? So then the next time we gather, we say, okay, well, last time we talked, you know, here's the, the tough question that we really struggled with, right? So then this time, we're going to focus on how do we take that on, right? Uh, so it kind of, that's why I think it's useful sometimes to kind of split those actions of really understanding the issue and understanding the tensions and then brainstorming the ideas. Right? Sometimes you can kind of flow right into them. And sometimes it's better to kind of split them up right? as we go. Do um, you have this too? We're kind of still using this and then we're, we're giving this to people that are going to split their ideas. I don't know if you have this from yesterday. Yeah, okay. um, all right, nice job. Sure. <laughs> okay, let me see. So we are well, discussing. They, he's going to do two. No, no. no oh, you're asking a question. Okay. <laughs> I, I'm asking a question. Okay, so we are looking at the approach, and then we can take any of these roles. Yeah, just if you, like, you know, that, okay. I mean, that's something, when I do it in my class, sometimes I cut those up and I give students and I tell them this is your role, or I have them cut up and they can flip through and pick one, right? Mm -hmm. uh, for y'all, I was just saying, if you want to look through that and then kind of do what Wendy did, mm -hmm. it's just kind of pick, and that's just to kind of enrich the conversation, you know, we're, we're I think we're all professors, right? So yeah. it's going to, you know, it's a very limited conversation in, in some ways, uh, while we're diverse in others, certainly, uh, but then that can kind of just bring some new dimensions to it that gives us a little bit more to work with as facilitators. Yeah. Okay, so, so let us switch to the second approach. Uh, some people uh, say that uh, schools should take a uh, like stronger role in the dealing with this problem, maybe ban the junk food or, or increase time for the PE or health classes. 
so should be more, schools should be more involved. Uh, so, uh, what do you think about? It? What's your first first impression about, about this approach? Is it right one? Or? Uh, as an elementary school teacher, that I have seen the uh, how the children have been a teacher for twenty years, and I have seen how now we have this epidemic of children uh, being obese or overweight. I think uh, the school has a major role to play in helping the society to address this situation. I believe that all of us has investment in the health of the country and teaching children. We have to start teaching children to be able to make a difference because every time that we address the children, we also need to address the parents. And working together, I think we can make so you are saying that I mean, you agree with this, yeah, with this approach, that schools should be more involved. Correct. And you would like to see like schools more involved also in teaching parents yeah, how to Correct. teach their children. I, mean, I agree with that. I mean, I'm, I'm a mom, and I work really hard to provide healthy, organic food. I work hard to make sure that everything is fresh and that they have a good lunch every day. And then they come home, and I find out. You know, they want to have the pizza that their friend had that's, you know, canned and processed. And they're being offered sugar items and snacks. And it's so frustrating because I'm working so hard to make sure that they eat well. And it's like, it's an uphill battle. Okay, so you, I don't feel supported by the school. Okay, so you are taking your responsibility as a yeah, parent. Yeah, right. But the school are, it's not, in it's your not opinion, not doing yeah. enough. Right. Okay, so what's the, uh, in your opinion, what school should do more? Well, I mean, we need healthy options at school, so this is not an issue. You know? And we shouldn't have sugar options being given as snacks. Okay, so for example, like uh, banning junk food would be an option for you. Then. Yeah. Okay, so do we agree with this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but on the other hand, uh, as a PE teacher, I must say uh, also some parents spoil school's work uh, because. Uh, they uh, get uh, from the doctors the excuse that their children will not attend uh, uh, physical education classes. Um, so I think this is what Maria said. We, school and parents need to collaborate on the subject. Uh, because some parents uh, are not so uh, well aware of the problem as you. And uh, these are them who give uh, sweets uh, for the lunch uh, for their children and they children don't go to the um, don't take lunch offered by the school because they prefer sweets so like you all agree that parents and children uh, parents and schools and teachers should cooperate more yeah, like to, uh, to provide health, healthy options for children Coming at this from an administrator's point of view, already at the school, you know, where's the money coming from? We were stretched thin as is in terms of classroom time. Starting in elementary school, we've got kids prepping for state tests. We don't have additional classroom time to, to devote to teaching nutrition. Uh, and we've tried giving kids healthy foods in the past. They don't eat them. How do we explain to their parents that their kid didn't eat lunch today because we tried to give them food they wouldn't eat? Uh, so I think pinning this really on the schools, it's, it's not really fair to us because this, this should be happening at, the, happening at the home. We don't have the time, we don't have the money here at school. We've got to focus on uh, the resources we have that we're given. And it's just not fair. So you're saying that schools are not having resources, mm -hmm. enough, enough resources to deal with this? Not even close. And try to get something. Like we we'd be open to it, it, but and we've tried giving healthier food, but kids don't <coughs> eat it when we offer it. We offer them salads, we offer them vegetables, and they want pizza. Okay. Yeah. I respectfully disagree with Jerome because we always hear that we kind of do this, we go through this, and I think that, again, a school has to change. A school need to teach children what they need so that they can have a better life and this here there is a problem 
and we all need to be addressed. It has to be addressed in the school because children spend most of their, their time, awaiting time, at the school. So they, again, the, the curriculum could be uh, integrated in a way that the, that particular component of eating has to be there. The school could teach all the, the subjects related to having a garden. Through the garden, there is everything that they need to teach. And also to the cafeteria, because children go and eat food at the cafeteria. They need to know what they are eating to be able to be more uh, aware citizens to make a better choice, because we are preparing them for the future also. And there will be parents in the future. So they need to know if we, uh, how they, uh, is, what is nutrition, and also how this is going to impact not only their life, but also in general, the, the, the country. But um, like taking a kiss, um, uh, this uh, argument into account, could you um, support those health classes, additional garden classes, even if that means less math or less science? Well, there is more science if, because we are teaching growing, we are teaching and we are bringing the parents, especially minority parents, because they have a background in, in growing and, and cultivation and then you can even link that, the curriculum that you are having to teach all the subjects related to having a garden that they can also in turn take it home and then also start cultivating good food. I think there is a there is a choice here that we are not exploring. Some of the schools already are doing that, but not everybody is doing it. And I think that there is a need to change the curriculum in a way that we say, well, like we don't have time because math can be taught everywhere. Math, science, reading, writing, and it's even social studies because it's an issue also as a as a social group. So you're saying that you can like. Both and teach garden and science at the same time or same classes. And, yes. Okay. And uh, to that you are uh, agreeing with uh, Eva and Wendy that it could also uh, foster cooperation between school and parents in the gardening classes, for example. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. So do you see any other trade-offs of this? Well, I'd like to push a little bit on the on the teacher parent collaboration. Um, as a teacher, you know, I've, I've got thirty five different students, um, and the time it takes for me to try to negotiate with thirty five uh, parents, or and, and 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 often the parents are poor, so there's two parents that disagree themselves. You know, so now we're I'm um, trying to collaborate. You know, I've got four different classes of thirty students each, so now I'm trying to kind of work in the opinions of 200 people to develop my curriculum and make my decisions. Um, so, I mean, I like the idea of, of teacher-parent collaboration, and I love working with, with passionate parents, but then sometimes passionate parents can, can also be a, 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 a difficulty. Um, so, <laughs> uh, so I think it's one of those ideas that yeah, teacher-parent collaboration, let's kind of work together, um, sounds a lot easier than it actually is in reality, in a sense. Um, when you have parents that have very different ways of thinking, um, and you know, and we could talk about these wonderful things about nutrition and gardening and things like that, but then there's lots of students that say, "Hey, you know, I need you to teach my kid how to write and how to add, and everything else is my job in a sense." Um, so, so I think that we need to talk through that a little bit more to figure out how that might work. Okay. So, you agree with idea, but uh, you see uh, a lot of drawbacks, drawbacks when it comes to the yeah. fact. Yeah, and, I, and I'm teaching, you know, I'm teaching seven classes a day, so mm -hmm. any teacher faculty, I mean, any, any teacher parent collaboration is, is on my own time, it's on email, it's it's after school and things like that. Um, I, I, I'm basically not paid, you know, you, you don't pay me to, to spend time collaborating uh, with parents, right? So then I, I'm donating my own time uh, to be able to do that kind of work. I'm glad now that the uh, working with parents is one of the component in the rubric that is evaluating teachers because that has been an excuse in the past but now the school districts are moving in including collaboration with the home also 
part of measurement of teacher effectiveness because we know that without the parents, there is not going to be success for, for the child. And again, that is true, it's a lot of more work. There is uh, extra time that the teachers need to put into uh, working and making these things happening, but it's a matter of choices. Not everybody is going to be a teacher, and we are looking for effective teachers who are willing to do the, that work. So. I agree. I mean, last comment. I agree. I mean, I think it's about, it's about again, looking outside the box and figuring out creative solutions. I mean, I'm definitely, you know, I am a passionate parent and sometimes can be too passionate. But, you know, I've had experiences where I'm volunteering in a, in a teacher's class and the, the classroom is welcoming of parents and, and I feel that, that they need me and they understand how to work with parents and it creates a good relationship, I think. And I've also had experience of volunteering in class where I felt very unwelcome. So kind of bringing awareness to teachers of the importance of thinking through different ways of including teachers during during their work day or during times that they would normally be there is really important. Yeah, so we'll stop there for a second. Um, and, and just to, to, to piggyback off this a little bit, this goes, goes back to what I talked about yesterday. Um, you know, collaboration is this powerful word now. It's a buzz term. Everyone loves collaborating. You know, in, in the rhetorical literature, it's called a God term, right? Um, but then in reality, collaboration is hard. I mean, and I'm the collaboration person, right? I'm the one that's trying to provide resources for my community to collaborate. I'm running all these meetings, you know. It takes a lot of work and a lot of effort and, and a lot of resources in a sense. Um, so that's kind of one of those examples of this, yeah. And, and I, I, I volunteer for my for my kids' school, and I'm on the advice, I forget what the name of it is, but <laughs> we meet once a, one, once a month with the principal and all that kind of stuff, with the teacher from each school, and there's five parents. Um, and, and most of the teachers, volunteers are a pain. It's so hard to give the volunteers something to do. It's you know, and, and for all the parents are like, we need more volunteers. You know, we, we recognize the resources and it's tough. It's like, well, we got parent, and, and I'm in an affluent neighborhood, right? So most of the parents, you have stay at home moms that can kind of help. Uh, and the parents, I mean, the teachers are all like, no, they're a pain. Like we don't have enough time. To, it, 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 I have to supervise them. I have to train them what to do, and then I know I have to. You know, it, it was such an eye opening thing for me because it's a, and as part of that notion of these magic bullets, right? We just think, hey, magic, you know, volunteers can fix this. Um, and I'm not saying the teachers are right, right? <laughs> I mean, I think some of them can use volunteers. And my wife volunteers a lot, so some of them use volunteers for great, and some of them don't, right? But it is that example that we collaboration sometimes is this magic bullet. We should just all work together. The problem is working together takes so much time and so much effort. <laughs> um, but you, you also then, once you realize that, once you get the blinders down, that okay, it's not a magic bullet. Collaboration, you know, co I think still so, collaboration is going to work, but we just need to work at it, right? We need to get the administrator, right, to, to provide some time, right? So if it's worked into my evaluation as a teacher, how much I collaborate with you, well, then probably it's worked into my time, right? Maybe I get two or three hours off of my schedule that 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 spent time to collaborate to be able to meet with parents, to be able to eat, you know, those type of things. But we start kind of getting past that magic bullet simple thing, right? The other quick thing I want to kind of throw into was the part of the theory is when you deliberate, you get away from blaming, and the group takes ownership, right? And I don't know if you felt that even with these kind of example things, right? It's easy to blame the fast food owner, right? Or it's easy to blame the administrator, you know. But then when you when you hear things from their perspective, there's like you know, yeah, 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 the fast food owner is part of it, but we can't really blame them, right? Like, if you if you turn your fast food into a health place, you're closed in a month. We recognize that, right? You know, or the administrator, once they're actually, you know, it's really easy to attack the administrator, but when they're there saying, I don't have the money to do this, I'd love to do you know, then all these people are okay, we, we can't just assume they're fixing it. That's part of that process of when you have a diverse group and you have good material that kind of represents those things, is we get what we, we, we we push back on the wishful thinking, the magic bullets, right, that fix everything, right, and we push back on the blaming, you know, the, the devil figures, right, that it's all the administrator, the fast food person, or the bad parent, right, and we start as a group saying, okay, wait a second, let's actually take on the tough issue, right, and that goes back to that grown zone stuff, right, when you start, when you get rid of the wishful thinking, oh man, now it's a hard problem, but hopefully if it's a good process, and this is where NIS sometimes is almost too short, right? I think NIS sometimes does a good job of people getting into the grown zone, but maybe not out of it, right? Because <laughs> we, we, we drop our blinders, we get rid of the wishful thinking, but then do we have enough time in a two hour meeting to really work through and feel that we leave, you know? We don't want people leaving thinking, that's impossible, right? We want people leaving going, okay, it's much more complicated than I thought, but man, we came up with some good ideas to take that on, right? Um, 
So it's an aspect, you know, the, the, the front end of the grown zone is, okay, we, we get rid of this wishful thinking, it's much more complicated, but then to what degree can we start that path of coming down to say, okay, now here's some collaborative solutions, here's some, some things we can really do to take on that tension. Yeah. I'm uh, going back to administrators and people in decision-making positions. I think it, when you get somebody who really can think out of the box, everything can happen. I yep. mean, because it's a matter of building trust, and it's a, it's a matter of bringing everybody to, to the table, and then see here, the, here is a problem, and, and truly, uh, the obesity for children is a major problem. So how we could, but then the administrators, the parents, and even I know you don't get very many parents, but if you get the few parents and those parents bring some other parents, eventually we will be effective and we will be addressing the problem. So I think it but has to start from having an administrator who really can them themselves think out of the box because if they say, well, here we have been doing this for last 15 years and our scores are decent, what to change? But everything around is changing. I think it, having that person there that with the power, that will do it. And, and that goes back to some of the changes I was talking about, about local, at least for, for secondary education, right? For K-12, local control versus state control versus state. We're getting so many more now standards, right? Because they feel the system's not working, so we need to kind of have some strong standards and strong expectations from the top. But when we have that, you're forcing schools more and more to do things the same way. So the, the principal that wants to think out of the box has less flexibility, right? Because mm -hmm. so, you're, yeah. You know, but, but standards are great, no one's against standards, but then you recognize, okay, when we have standards from the top, that also means less innovation, less flexibility, right? If I'm having to teach these certain things, now all of a sudden I can't, oh, I'd love to do the garden, but I can't, it doesn't fit into what I'm required to, you know, so then that, you start identifying those tensions and start working through that. Right? This is, I'm, I'm from New York, and this is one of the huge issues going on in public education right now in New York, is New York is a common core state, and the current teacher evaluation system is heavily tied, and the governor is pushing for having it be even more heavily tied to test results. So they're in a position where even if you have the administrator and teachers who want to think outside the box, if they can't do that while teaching exactly what's on that mm -hmm. test, which says that they're effective at their job, then their hands are kind of tied. Yeah. You know, uh, we deal, um, our department here is linked to the state a test that the teachers need to take. So I know exactly what you are talking about. And I'm thinking there has to be, accountability is good. I know in my field if you say this, I think it, accountability is good because you want some measurement. And then if I have invested all this money all this time, the children have been here, and in our case, teachers have been here, I think it, they're supposed to pass those tests because there is minimum requirement in those tests. The thing here, and I, I'm the one that I study all these tests because uh, I'm the coordinator of my department of student success and meeting. I make sure that all our students pass the state test. And I'm thinking, in a way, some accountability has to be there so that to make things happen, but then, one thing cannot take from the other. I wouldn't say, well, I don't want to focus on preparing good, strong teachers because, well, I have to just prep for the test. I think there is a balance. If um, this, the, the tests are measuring what the, the, the effectiveness of teacher in this case, I'm supposed to prepare them to be able to pass those tests. So I think it, they, there is a, the accountability, even though now people doesn't even want to hear that word. I think it is good for us. The only thing is the way we use the results of that accountability. And it's being now used, well, it's, it's measuring minimum skills. I'm going to focus on this, and I'm going to teach this so that I think it can be a teaching what they, for the test, also the skills that are going to be measuring the test in addition to other things that is needed for the good of to to educate people, because now we are not educating people. Well, this is, this is uh, really a, a problem if we are teaching students um, just to, to allow them to make them pass the test, the most, uh, to, 
to get more, more most of the score, the best, the best score uh, possible. Of um, or if we are uh, doing some some real academic uh, teaching, I, I it's it's uh, sometimes even quite uh, funny situation. I got um, my subject uh, environmental law is not is a uh, <coughs> you can choose it. Yeah, it's not obligatory. And students can go through all the education system uh, and become a solicitor in Poland without now, uh, without having an hour of uh, environmental uh, law. And then the big law companies have problems because they don't have uh, people who would be able to uh, deal with those problems. And uh, for example, I got a lady who. Um, is finishing her, her preparation for a solicitor, and she is making some voluntary um, assistantship uh, at my office in order to pick up some uh, some of this knowledge because it is needed. The local administration, to, them, to whom they serve, because they, they they provide services to local administration, uh, expect them to know uh, environmental law, and it's not something that you can uh, fully learn from the books. Uh, so, uh, I think uh, the minimum uh, can can uh, sometimes really play play a uh, extremely uh, devastating role to to even on the on the uh, job market. We we uh, we cannot expect that we will find uh, good jobs for uh, 300 students each year for 300 students with exactly the same. Uh, Knowledge and exactly the same capabilities. Uh, let's jump back. <laughs> we're, we're still deliberating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Sorry, that's what I want to do. But um, so we'll back, back to the facilitation. The, the deliberation was an example to kind of think about facilitation. Right? So how did you feel? I think you did well. Uh, I kind of stressed <laughs> first, mostly because of my English, not because of uh, yep. the group. So. Uh, but. Was fun. So yeah. I yeah, you had some. You, you felt in control. You felt. You, you seemed comfortable to me, right? Yeah, you had some good. Right. I really like one of your right. interventions. Right. You asked <laughs> even if intervention, right? <laughs> you know, so it's kind of a back and forth here. Um, so then you kind of pushed back on her and said, "Well, you know, are you willing to support that even if?" Kind of thinking about his thing, and then and then she kind of transcended the even if, right? Of saying, "Oh, well, we can teach science and, and we can kind of do the gardening kind of at the same time." That's kind of we incorporated together in a way, right? That's kind of a good example of, a, of identifying tension between people and then hopefully framing it kind of in a more positive way instead of a conflict of like, "Oh, well, how, how do you struggle with this?" Right? So that was really nicely done. Uh, one thing you, I, I think you did okay, but it, but it, it reminded me of of, of of a problem that sometimes comes up. But at one point you said, so we all, well, and I kind of pushed back on it, uh, although the, the teacher-parent collaboration, right? So you said, so we all agree that teacher collaboration is a good thing, right? Well, actually, only just two people said that, right? And that's a typical, my, my young facilitators always kind of do that. Okay, so we all agree this. I'm like, no. So be very careful kind of announcing consensus, right, when there's eight people, because clearly, you know, and I did push back on that generally, uh, but... You know, if I'm someone who was against that, and then two people agree with it, and then you say, "So we all agree," I'm like, "Wait, what?" You know, so all of a sudden I feel like my voice isn't being heard, kind of thing, right? So uh, you, know, you, you kind of say it. it you, you can qualify it sometimes. So it sounds like that, that there's a lot of positive energy towards this, or a lot of us agree about that. You know, but saying we all agree, and that's one of the reasons I don't like the summaries, right? Because normally the summary is like, "Oh yeah, so we talk about this, and we all like this idea." Well, do we all like it? You know. And one quick thing that you can sometimes do too is I do little quick polls a lot. Right? I was talking about this earlier. It's a, with, with student, a lot of young students, it's kind of uncool to talk sometimes, right? <laughs> you know, so if you ask an open question, you know, everyone's kind of saying there. So I, I do a little like from one to five. You know, five being you really like this idea to one, you're not too sure. Where are y'all? It's like a quick little pulse, right? And sometimes it's very useful for the notes. Right? But then it's also useful to, to get voices out, right? So if everyone agrees and one person disagrees, you can say, so what are we missing? What, you know, what, why, why don't you like it in a way? Right? That's the same thing with a keypad. It's interesting that some people feel the keypads um, will support the majority too much. Right? Um, but I actually use the keypads a lot to give voice to the minority. Right? So if we ask a question and almost everyone likes it, but then there's two people that disagree, I could say, can we, what are we missing? What can we hear from the people that disagree? Yeah, right. right. So you're actually opening up space for the person with a minority opinion versus. Yeah. The, so those the quick other, blue polls can work. Yeah. On the other hand, you're putting 
giving the defense. Right. What are we missing? Right. Uh, yeah, and, and, and normally, at least with the keypads, it's anonymous, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm not making them speak, right? Okay. Uh, so I can say, like, if you're willing to kind of, you know, so I'm, I'm kind of yielding the floor to the minority opinion, uh, but yeah, how you phrase it, right? So I'm saying, well, one person's wrong. Can you tell us, you know? Yeah. <laughs> no, we're, I, I'm more phrasing it in a sense of clearly it's a valuable opinion here that, that we want to hear you speak in a sense, right? But the other thing is when I do the quick little polls, especially with the quiet group, right? Because um, if I would say, so what do you think about this idea of going? Right? But if I say, okay, five to one, do you like this idea or not? If someone, particularly if someone's a five or someone's a one, I can say, you give it a five, why? Right? And now they, they, I've tripped them into expressing an opinion, right? So now that I'm asking them for the backup, right? So a quick little poll is good. Uh, but it also can be useful when it seems there's consensus to say, you know, where are you on this? And hey, if everyone's five, then I can say, we all agree with this, right? Um, but then it also, and for the notes, it's very useful. Like, we, Quick poll here, and people will really like this or didn't like it or whatever. Right? So it's another little facilitation cut tool that you need. All right, let's switch to. So yeah, who, can, yeah. can you say like um, two people here seems to agree, and and how the rest of you feel about that? Yeah, sure. Oh, yeah. Okay. So so both of y'all really like this. What other people think, right? Oh, okay. um, or but, but again, also these instead of expressing consensus, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's better to almost push off consensus. So it seems like we really like this idea, but can anyone make an argument against it? Oh. Right? Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and that not only opens up space for the person that was against it to feel comfortable speaking, but even if no one is against it, to be able to think of, okay, people that are against this whole thing say, well, well, I mean, clearly teacher-parent collaboration probably takes a lot of time, you know? I know teachers are already kind of pressed for time. When do they do that? <coughs> uh, so so uh, rather than kind of express, hey, we all agree, I'd rather say, it seems like we all agree. What are we missing? Right? What, what, uh, uh, Alberto, who I really like, one of the, one of the trainers from Kettering, um, one of his favorite questions is when, when people all like something, it's like, if it's so obvious this is the right thing to do, why aren't we doing it? What's keeping us from doing it? You know, And again, people f realize, well, I can see people are against it because of this, or you know, that kind of stuff, right? So I, I'd always rather, my, my impulse of facilitator is to push back on consensus versus announce consensus. Mm -hmm. okay. All right, so who wants to do the third approach? <laughs> All right. So we need, a, we need a switch, right? Yes. Or do you want yes. the facilitator? Yeah, no, no, that's, that's perfectly fine. Like, just give me a moment here. They're okay where they are? I have to move. So oh. they're fine. I'm just moving. Okay. That problem would be for the government. Uh, to take a stronger stand uh, on childhood obesity, tax junk food, you know, make it much higher, much more expensive than it is now. Uh, just like cigarettes, you know, tax it the same way. Um, regulate fast food restaurants so that they have to offer healthy options. Uh, publicly fund sports programs and public parks. And increase funding for, you know, other things like sports so that people can actually go and exercise. So what do you think about should the government take over and say, okay, we need to tax this, you know? Hershey bar needs to cost three dollars. And, you know, maybe people will eat it. I, I don't really like taxes. I don't think the government should tax anything. So, it's a very <laughs> bad idea uh, because, like, people should choose, can choose uh, cheap food if, if they want. Not government should decide what people should eat. So I'm hearing that people should have choices. Yes. Okay. Do you have any other ideas? I mean, I, I agree with him. This, this is America. If I want to balloon up to 700 pounds and die of a heart attack at 45, that's my right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want the government saying, well, you have to eat this stuff, or it's now going to be prohibitive for you to make this choice. That's, that's direct government intervention that infringes on my freedom. All right, but then you, it's true that you have you should have the freedom to you know to die of heart attack if you want. But then, but the, should the government then have to give you Medicare and Medicaid? Should the government then deal with your health issues? Maybe you should. That's my. I have health insurance. That's that's their problem, not the government's. Keep the government out of my business. So that's my point of view. I really think the as an adult you can make the choices, but here we are talking about child obesity. So I'm thinking that uh, the yeah the other I, I don't like to see a hundred percent regulations by the government, but I think the government uh, is 
has to have a voice also in this situation because it's a national epidemic. Like any other scene or any other disease, then we are expected to receive funding. The states need funding from the federal government to be able to address this problem. So the, with the money come some uh, regulations and rules. So I'm thinking that I'm willing to get the money first because we need it in the state to be able to address the problem. I don't want too many regulations because I think that the local government need to <coughs> be the one in charge, and like any other state, they should be able to decide, but also I think the government need to intervene to be able to help and assist it, it, with this epidemic, because it's a national epidemic. Yeah, I think I, I strongly agree with you. Uh, one cannot say everyone has the right to die of Ebola. Uh, and, uh, so <laughs> we are in a free country uh, now, so, so uh, of course some, some intervention uh, surely uh, is uh, needed. The, the question is if we can expect uh, government to uh, simply solve the problem or the uh, government can just administrate or manage some of the uh, options, some of the solutions. Yeah? Uh, I don't think that uh, government is uh, the uh, only, um, only, only only entity who can solve the problem of, of uh, child obesity because, uh, well, in fact, the government is not uh, bringing up children. Um, so, so I think we should we should uh, try to find solutions down there, but with support from the government. Yeah. I Ebola is like an extreme case, so the source <laughs> government should like, take care of people who are like, sick or like, in these extreme cases, but food is like day-to-day -day activity, so, so what? We start with taxing McDonald's more and KFC or nachos, and where we end? Or who decides which, which, where is junk food and where is health? I think, building off that, is it the final product that's the problem? Is it the ingredients? Are we Tax regulating sugar, or are we taxing and regulating candy? It's a small difference between a baguette and a donut. Um, but people are generally more in favor of one than the other. So if the government's going to get involved with regulating foodstuffs, how are we going to go about this? It's an administrative nightmare. Yeah, we'll decide. So let me see if I understand. You're not doing it. You're like, yeah, what's <laughs> If, I, if I'm hearing correctly, um, Maria, you were, you were saying that you don't want regulations, but you want the government to do something, right? But you don't want too many regulations. Okay, okay and you uh, are agreeing with her, right? That not too many regulations, but something. So the government should administer in, in some ways. Uh, and then both of you are against taxes completely, uh, and you are all for free choice, like personal choice. I think taxation has its place, but it as long as it doesn't impinge on my freedom. Okay. Uh, you know, what I would like, I mean, going back to the first approach and talking about parents that are trying to make good choices and it's tough for them, right? So I would be in support of figuring out as a society and government being a key tool for that to, to help people make better choices. I'm a little bit more concerned with punishing people for bad choices, so I'm kind of with you with that, right? Um, but say, for example, I, I think all schools should have apples and for free. Right? That if a kid wants to eat an apple, they can eat an apple at any time for free. You know? So how do we fund that? Now, you know, maybe one way of funding it is, is, is taxing some really bad, you know, taxing ice cream. You know ice cream is kind of bad for you, right? So, hey, if, if we charge an extra quarter for everything of ice cream, and then because of that, we could have free apples at all public school, you know. So I, I would like to focus on how do we kind of provide obvious healthy food for cheaper, right, or for free for kids. Um, I don't want to tax junk food and then the government gets extra money and gets to spend it at whatever they want, right? Yeah, this, <laughs> My goal is more, let's make healthy food cheaper, um, and, but figuring out some way of funding that and maybe taxing some food, junk food would be a way to fund that in a way. Um, but to keep the focus on how to make it easier to make good choices versus necessarily punishing bad choices. But I would say that the, the, uh, we all, uh, you know, we all pay our taxes and uh, we, we um, support with them. 
the producers of uh, organic and junk food uh, together to the system of, of farming subsidies. Uh, so I don't. Uh, I think the money are in the system. We just uh, may choose the way they are being spent. We we simply may um, exclude in some part uh, the producers who produce uh, uh, products for for. Uh, fast food industry, let's say, um, whereas give more support on the cost of, uh, of the first one uh, to those who produce organic. I think it's, uh, it is, uh, it is uh, a role of, of the government to administrate those, those money flows. But you, like you said, the administration is kind of crazy, so I mean, I know there's so much debate about what gets to count as organic. When can you put the label of organic on your food and those kind of things? Well, I don't think that it's, it's about putting a, a label. We we both know that uh, when uh, a small piece of, of uh, snack contains enough calories for the whole day for a healthy uh, child, then uh, we know that it's not healthy uh, to eat it. And, and I think we, we don't have to say that uh, when it's organic it has to it does not have to have anything to do with, with any chemistry or, or, or anything like that I, 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 I don't think that we should uh, try to develop a definition of what is organic yeah. so, so let me throw something out there uh, so we're willing am I hearing that we're, you're willing to pay more for organic food but not more for candy? Because no, I think I, I was uh, saying just the opposite. Yeah, <laughs> you're willing to pay more for candy? Um, I, I, I support subsidies. I, for I, I, well, I, I think that we are all supporting subsidies uh, even at the moment. Um, so so the problem is that uh, we don't have to pay subsidies. Uh, so we should just uh, change the system. Yeah, so we should just change the system. Yeah, that's what we should do. 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 Uh, <laughs> 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 no more taxes, and that's it. Simply more effective, uh, more effective spending. Okay, Maria, you get the last word. Okay, I think there is also other ways the government could help. Like there is a movement through the USDA for urban gardening, where there is, an, and this is going because of the food deserts that we have in the cities, and we know that mainly poor people. They don't have access to grocery stores, and now there is so much space that can be used for cultivating good food, and we are not doing that. And I was really amazed. I have an opportunity to go to Spain, and I just was amazed to see that people go to their garden to get the food that they going to prepare for that day. And here, when I came, I started thinking about my own situation, how I keep grass. I don't eat grass. <laughs> I don't pay for the grass and I keep my grass. And then I'm thinking. We pay to fertilize the grass and we exactly. pay to cut the grass. So, so, you should buy us a goat. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, this is one thing that even now I'm working really strongly for uh, uh, initiatives such as that. Even here at the university, we have an initiative that has to do with. Uh, sustainability and a garden also thinking about solving problems in our community and I, I see the role of the government putting money in initiatives such as this one because it's changing behavior of the community overall and addressing a specific problems that we have because food desert are problems in our community no having access to fresh food we cannot expect that poor people especially poor people will have Will eat healthy food. Yeah, let's go and stop there. So, so let's go. Good. <laughs> yeah, I just couldn't remember. I forgot to change that over there. No, five choices. Yeah. <laughs> I couldn't remember. That's what we do. We do you in last. But I've done. I mean, I've done. We with Paul, we did uh, different forms. Oh. They were not exactly. Paul doesn't. So then we changed that a little bit, but we still did, at least for two of them, we did this type of the three approaches. Okay. So then it was a while ago, but I you know, still kind of bring it back. Yeah, you did, a, I mean, I really like the summaries that you were doing, right? Mm -hmm. And I mean, even kind of thinking about you know, 
of, does that become another the, the basic move, right? Do I go to six in a sense of just that internal summary, right? Okay, so what we're hearing so far, you know, but just kind of going through because there's really a lot of power. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's a lot of power to, to, to not only you know people yeah. feeling heard, right, but then also with that you're identifying some tensions and, and you're able to frame things in more succinct ways that that can often. Only, I mean, essentially, it's a paraphrase, right? I mean, you just group paraphrased. But it right? was necessary you, you because covered I was several. losing yeah. track. Yeah. But that was also from the forums because yeah. I do that in class as well. Um, I just find if too many people talk to me, yeah. then I really, do, I really don't remember. Yeah. So I'm like, yeah. oh my god. Yeah. Uh, so then that when I asked you, I really thought it was the other way. It wasn't like I heard you the way you thought that you said yeah. it. Yeah. yeah, that was a great example of a so, paraphrase, but it was an open-ended paraphrase that made it easy for you to say, no, actually, that was the opposite, yeah. right? <laughs> you know, that's what you want. You want people and, to be able to say it. Yeah, I think right. that's what it is. Right. Taken, yeah. There would be no problem with yeah. 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 yeah, and sometimes you're, I mean, sometimes you're using paraphrases because <coughs> you don't know, right? They're just yeah. kind of talking, and you're like, okay, so what I'm hearing, you know, so you're throwing something out, and they're like, that's not what I meant at all. And that's a very useful paraphrase. Yeah, I think, right? I thought, at know. first, I thought that she's pushing me. <laughs> yeah. Another interesting thing, yeah, so another way to think about the internal summaries in the, the, the Caner book that I mentioned, the, the facilitator's guy, which has a grown zone, a very useful book. So if facilitation seems to be interesting to you, it's pretty cheap. It's like $25. It's a really great book to set up and shelf. Uh, but it, it has several kind of additional kind of facilitator moves, uh, and one of them is tracking, right? So essentially, with tracking, I did tracking the very first one. Remember when you when you said two? This was yesterday, right? When you when you uh, I forgot what it was now, but it, but you had two points, right? So I said, okay, hold on. There's two things there, right? So I acknowledge those two things, but then I said, let's talk about the first one, and then went back, right? So that's what happens often where you do a summary. It's like, okay, we're having three conversations at a time now, right? And you recognize as a facilitator, all three conversations are pretty good. But we can't have all three conversations here. So then you do a summary. Okay, what I'm hearing is this, this, and this. You know, check. Yeah, okay. So let's let's take the first one first, right? But, you know, so you're kind of identifying there's three conversations. Let's take one at a time. One other facilitator move that we do sometimes, and we actually do this as a process because we have a table. Let's say if we're doing this this kind of stuff, um, uh, especially if you have a dominator or that kind of stuff, uh, you have 12 minutes to talk about this response. If you just ask, so what do you all think? You don't know how many you're going to get, right? And whoever talks first. Really, you're going to set the conversation probably for the first six or you know, for, for quite a while. So, a lot of times, what we'll do is we'll say, So, you know, let's get some response to this. Let's go around first. Just a quick hitter off the top of your head, you know, what's one reaction you have, right, to this, right? So, you go through, and then we actually write it. We have like a big piece of paper or an easel paper or often folded or an 11, the tabloid paper, 11 by 17 that sometimes <coughs> copiers have, right? So, we use like a sharpie so you can write big. And then you just write, right? So now I've got eight topics, but I always have a menu, right? Then we can say, okay, we've got 12 minutes. Which of these do we want to talk about, right? But then now you're not just allowing the first person to speak to kind of set the agenda. You have everyone's agenda. As a facilitator, you can kind of say, you know, and so it lets everyone kind of speak and people respond to that. Then what we often do is, is you know, we do this for brainstorm as well. So like the back end, like, what idea? You know, from this whole conversation, let's go around. Like, what's one idea that you heard today that you really like? Right. So we get all ten of them, and then we say, well, let's talk about these. Which, why do you like these? And kind of pros and cons. And then we can give everyone dots, give you three dots at the end, and say, hey, of these eight ideas, which ones kind of you know, you know, you, you support the most? Um, and, and, and again, with the cycle, the reporting is the last part. Right. That's great information for me. Because now from 15 tables, I have a list of eight ideas from all 15 tables with dots to tell me the kind of the, the you know, how much people support it, kind of gives me a priority kind of thing, right? Um, so that's another way of kind of doing you, you start with tracking. Hey, let's just get eight ideas first on the table. And then that is it. You know, you probably don't have time to go through all eight, right? If you have 15 minutes, okay, I can do all eight in two minutes each, right? Or maybe we can do two or three in five minutes each. But then you're you're not just letting the first person to, to talk dictate the agenda. You have a full set of agenda. Yeah. One other thing that you did, I think, is worth talking about. So the, the pushback, I tried to kind of write how you did it, but the uh, so they were both saying tax is bad, right? Yeah. Uh, so the libertarians over here, uh, and you said, well, you know, so should government have to kind of pay for your Medicare? Like that, yeah, right? that's what that was my push. <coughs> yeah. yeah. So it's a good question, and I want that. That's a good example of a paradox splitting, right? They're saying, hey, no taxes whatsoever. And you saw the other side of the tension. Okay, if we don't, if we say people can make their own choices, but then government is having to deal with their choices afterward, right? Um, I don't know if it's a problem, right? So let's just talk about it. But the way she did it, right? I got the impression that that was your opinion, 
I right? did too. So, so it was more you as a participant saying, accuracy. yeah, but if we do that, you know. So I think as a facilitator, you wanted to bring up that tension. You just need to frame it as, you know, something like, well, I imagine some people would argue that, yes, you have your own choices, but then government is eventually going to have to pay those choices. How, how do you respond to that? You know, so that you're doing the same thing yeah. without making it seem like it was your I, opinion. And that's why I was hesitant at the end. <laughs> yeah. I thought that was going to be too strong. Right. Sorry. No, but that's a great example. <laughs> exactly what I'm saying but is we want you to make some mistakes as we talk about it, but right? It so it, was, so, it wasn't so much that that is my opinion. Yeah. It was just that I wanted it. Yeah. To contrast, right? No, I mean, I, I think what you did going. was important. You identified attention and, and, and got us to respond to that tension, right? But yeah. It was more of how you did it. I don't know how y'all felt. Did you feel it was her opinion? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And part of it was the emotion of it and things like that, right? <laughs> but it seemed like you was a facilitator pushing back on them. So if I was them, you know, I imagine y'all were role playing somewhat, right? Um, but if I was them, I'd be like, oh, great, facilitators, you know, and then I'm, I'm probably not going to talk well, the rest of the time, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you phrase it to help the group? Yeah. kind of deal with that thing. You know, and there's some ways of, you know, so one way to do it, which would be even more impartial, right, would be <coughs> reactions to that. What do you, you know, and, and see if someone else gives that other side, right? Because it would be much better for another participant to say, yeah, but, you know, uh, but if someone does it, then the next kind of level is you kind of introducing it, but you want to introduce it so it doesn't seem like it's your opinion. It's you as yeah. a facilitator wanting to kind of introduce it. That's, that's true, but, yeah. but I did feel that, that I role playing Jerome was also being kind of adversarial, you know, kind of very but of course I don't have to highlight that because it's not supposed to be adversarial. But I mean it was very good, but I do feel that that it did include stress for me because I thought, oh my gosh, this person's going to just have a fit and blow up and I mean if it had been a real you know in a group, it would be like the person who could get mad. You know, so no, and you're going to have those people, and that goes back to when I talked about adversarial expert and deliberative, right? I mean, deliberative is designed to bring out the best in adversarial expert, right? So, so you know, having someone feeling very strongly that all taxes are bad is something to work with, right? And you yeah. can, you know, and you can support it in some ways. Okay, I understand where you're coming from. So, if you feel that they're not being heard, you do some facilitator moves to make sure, you know, but then also kind of push back in a sense, right? It would be all right to shoot simply ask Eva or myself. Would you like to pay taxes for the health girl, for people, for example? Yeah, that might be a little too strategic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, so, I mean, I think that, so, and, and part of this goes back to the cycle, right? So a lot of our events, <coughs> we've done them before, right? So that my students, and a lot of our events, we do surveys before, right? So then that always gives an out for the facilitator to say, yeah, yeah, so we've heard that argument before. One of the responses that we get in the survey often, though, is government's going to end up paying for, for their health care costs, right? So how do we respond? Yeah. So then that way, you're kind of, you're sourcing it differently, right? What you don't want is the source to be your opinion, right? Yeah. So sometimes it is your opinion, but just source it elsewhere, right? Because sometimes your opinion does add, you know, uh, it brings the counter and it's an important part of making a better conversation. You just don't want it to make it seem like um, it's your opinion, because then that, that's going to silence people, and that changes the dynamic, changes your role. So, so that, that's where, or, you know, we, the students even sometimes, like, oh, Dr. Carson in class kind of explained that, that one of the tensions comes up is this, right? Um, and so then you're introducing that way. Especially if I've done a good job at the beginning of the, the, beginning of the process of talking about one of the things that we're going to do is we're looking for tension. You know, there are some tough choices here that we need to talk about. So the students might bring those up, right? And so then it's easier for, okay, yeah, we understand that perspective, but it's not the government's job to be ritualistic and tell us how to behave, right? But if those choices are impacting government down the line, to what degree does it make sense for government to, to play more of a preventative role, right? Um, and then all of a sudden you're having a better conversation. I think I also made an mistake, and it's because I forgot I was a facilitator. <laughs> <laughs> for a minute, because when you said, the donor and the baguette. And I was like, oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> I think the money. I think the funniest thing. <laughs> but it, you know, to have been a real facili you know, facilitated group, obviously, I would not, it would not have been for me to laugh. Because you might have been really serious. Like, <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, was she. Uh, Rephrase what and ask the question. The question will go back to them or to the group. Either way. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So she could have, you know, with that tension, she can kind of push back and say, "Well," or or she can open up the group. Um, 
And, and you notice me doing that a few times, right? That I would start asking a question to the person, but then I would kind of back up, oh, or anyone else can answer this, right? Um, and a lot of times, you do have to, um, <coughs> the phrase probing question, probing question, it kind of sounds pretty evasive, right? <laughs> so you, you want to, you know, you got to watch nonverbal. So sometimes someone's saying something, you decide to ask a probing question, but then ask your, as you're asking the probing question, you can tell that they're taking it back or they feel that they're kind of cornered or whatever. And that's why I often kind of then open it up. We go, okay. so, so sometimes you transition a probing question to a reaction question based on uh, how the person's reacting, right? If they feel that they're being attacked or being pushed back, then you just open it up. You just want to explore the tension. You're not trying to get them, you're not trying to tell them they're wrong, right? Um, I mean, you are kind of in some way saying, you're only seeing one side of this, right? But, but you want the group to explore the different sides of it versus kind of attacking that person for having a narrow opinion. Right? Because again, having a narrow opinion is very natural. That's how our brains work, right? You want to have narrow opinions. Um, you know, so you have to be very careful in that sense that you don't want to feel like you're putting people on the spot sometimes. I like all the three ways of facilitating these discussions, but one thing I noticed is that uh, they, uh, Alexander is yeah. uh, not uh, <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> like we you This is what I missed, because yeah. no, no one said, uh, uh, let's uh, hear people yeah. who did not uh, yeah. spoken. Uh, I, I don't know, if it uh, was your uh, yeah, she, was she, was yeah. <laughs> she was more active yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but this is what I missed, that, uh, that uh, not uh, of you uh, noticed that uh, yeah. there, there is a person who, you know, as, and, and, and as, uh, this is funny because as a participant, I also wanted to hear <laughs> her opinion, yeah. Yeah. but I didn't feel this is my task to encourage it. Yeah. And part of that is a function of switching facilitators every time, right? Yeah. You know, and part of it is for, you know, that's your first time you facilitated with that. You know, when, when you have a table and you're the facilitator doing all three approaches, you notice much more often, like, wow, she hasn't spoken. Uh, when you're doing it 10 minutes at a time, or we're switching each time, and you're thinking, okay, now I'm facilitating, and everyone's like looking at how I facilitate, you know. Um, so it, it, part of it's a function of training, in a way, right? Mm -hmm. um, no, but, uh, but I, I mean, I noticed, I just, every, there were so many other opinions, yeah. and they were coming quickly, that I thought, I don't have to call on her. I mean, she yeah. doesn't really, because from you, I get the feeling that if somebody's not speaking, you're not supposed to call on them. Yeah, I mean, they don't want you. I don't. We. I tend to tell my students don't specifically call on people. I'm not saying I'm right, right? I mean, I think it's you know. So we prefer more that maybe we can hear from someone we haven't heard from yet. But I think everyone kind of talking other things. So if we did, maybe everyone would turn to you. Right? Maybe the one we haven't heard from yet. Maybe she's maybe she's like like a butt lady. <laughs> yeah, but if our, if some people are shy, I think this is the task of the facilitator to help, help yeah. them. But, but I like what you're suggesting on asking, how do you feel about yeah. it? Show me, uh, how do you say that? In, like kind of a quick poll kind of uh -huh, thing. Yeah. Exactly. And you can I do thumbs up, thumbs like down, thumbs sideways is a quicker one. I, I like you know, from one to five because it gives you a little bit more variety than thumbs up, thumbs down, right? <laughs> Because um, if someone's a five, then you really kind of, and, and a lot of times I'm asked, I have no idea what they're going to be when I ask that question, right? So that's big, you know, so it's a very useful tool. I use it in the classroom all the time, kind of see where people are in a way. But. And I don't have another scene. So the way we did it yesterday was around the table, mm -hmm. and the way we're doing it here is yeah. in the circle. Yeah. I, I think it's really to do it in the circle? Oh, yeah. Because uh, yesterday Yeah, the only reason we did it yesterday is I'm assuming y'all are taking notes. So as a workshop, I wanted oh, y'all to be able to, you know, this is how we would normally do it. We might actually have a table. We'd have a, you know, a round table. I mean, I've actually, venues become important for my community stuff, right? I've actually rented round tables and brought them to venues oh because gosh. the venues only had square tables, mm -hmm. right? Uh, mm -hmm. Because I think the round table, you know, the round table that fits eight to 10 people is, is a key tool for my job anyway. Um, sometimes we do this, but we, we incorporate writing so much mm -hmm. that we want, again, for the introverts or whatever, we want, you know, so we have worksheets, so then if, if we don't have tables, then I actually have like 70 clipboards. So sometimes we have clipboards. Mm -hmm. If we just can, you know, we, we can't get the round tables, we're just gonna do, do circles of tears. But yeah, I mean, being around the outside is certainly gonna close off conversation in lots of ways. That's why I did it this way, to kind of see, to see. See when only have round tables, you'll have to bring it. In. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but you know when when someone. But then there's parking. When someone doesn't talk, is it that they don't feel comfortable? You know, 
that there's there's good reasons to not talk and there's bad reasons to not. You know, is it that they they really want to talk but they don't they they, they were never got a chance to jump in, right? You know, so at the end of it, they felt like, oh man, I never got to actually talk, right? So then certainly that those those little parody that make room for them, right? Uh, but sometimes you know, some people decide they want to listen, right? <clears throat> but sometimes that I don't want to listen is more of I don't I'm not an expert on this topic, so I don't want to talk. Well, everyone's an expert at, at some level at this topic, right? Right. So <coughs> don't want to, you know. So there's I think we're still trying to figure out the best way to, to do that in the sense of, of making room. Um, and, and there's ways of calling on people without you know, making them feel bad if they don't want to talk, right? But you, you know, we have our opinion. You want to jump in here? But make it really easy for them to say, oh, I'm fine. Right? And then you just kind of move on, right? Um, but I would never want to put someone on the spot and say, why haven't you talked? You know, I need you to talk now. Well, I have been very lucky because the topic that we have chosen, those are really <laughs> <laughs> things that I feel very strong about. And I have done some research and then uh, it's really good for me to talk. <laughs> <laughs> so, were you just doing an experiment to see if anyone would ask you to talk, or were or you more of an introvert so you're waiting and didn't get a chance, or scared? Uh, I think it was lame. Alright, <laughs> 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 right, so let's go ahead and take a break. Uh, um, we'll... Just so you know, I think the food's supposed to be here at 11. Like the next okay. round of food. So we'll have right. like a buffet today. The tough issues we're dealing with have some kind of tension. And the more we kind of recognize that tension, identify that tension, put that tension on the floor, and kind of try to work through that tension together, uh, that the, I, I really believe the quality of conversation kind of goes up. Right. Um, those are just from yesterday. So, oh, this yeah, this is just from yesterday. Okay. It's not yeah. yet. Um, I'm just not sure if, if this one was in your pack or not. Okay. Uh, so people often disagree because they focus on different underlying values, not because they re reject each other's values. People don't tend to have negative values, right? Um, again, our brain's going to work overtime. We want the people that we disagree with to have negative values. That makes it a lot easier, right? We don't have, we're not challenged. We don't have to struggle. Um, so that's automatically when you're in attention and you're thinking of the other person. I mean, this this happens with relationships, right? <laughs> when you when you're getting in a fight with your your, your significant other. Right, you want to think, you know, they're doing this on purpose to make me mad, right? Because that makes it a lot easier for, for you to be the right person in the conflict. But then normally you figure out, oh, actually they weren't. Right? <laughs> they, they, they didn't have negative motives in this, right? There, there was something more important. Yeah. Um, many public problems are wicked because they involve competing aligning values. This is the notion of dominant American values are, 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 are all good individually, but they just don't fit together very well. Right. So again, thinking about the realm of values underneath the issue, and we'll do more work on that. <coughs> uh, there are no perfect solutions, uh, though some are surely better than others, and, and, and both of those points are important, right? Uh, because too often, it goes back to that open-mindedness can be a problem sometimes, that we want to uh, recognize that people are coming from good places, that people have values, you know, uh, supporting kind of their opinions, but we don't want to go so far as say, therefore, everyone's opinion is, is perfectly fine, right? There's still going to be some, you know, value hierarchies that are better than others that work better for broader community that fit better into broader values. Right? Uh, so the actions we take are inherently require require choices or trade offs to balance them, um, or creativity and innovation to transcend them. And the polarity management exercise will really kind of help us think through that, right? Okay, what do we want to do? How do we react? Um, and then uncovering the underlying values, understanding each other's views, and working through these tough choices uh, as a community is the essence of democracy. Again, a, a really kind of fall into that perspective that democracy has to be an ongoing conversation. That's what democracy is, right? Democracy isn't just a voting mechanism. Democracy, you know, the community has to be constantly talking because we're going to be constantly in the process of negotiating and tweaking kind of between these different values and adjusting this, this situation. Uh, uh, so, I don't know if I gave you this. You just probably got this slide. Do you have this slide? Yes. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, so this is another way of thinking about uh, tough choices are typically going to fall into one of these four categories. And this helps you as you start digging into the issue to kind of ferret out those underlying tensions, right? Uh, so attention might be we can't have more of something we want without also having more of something we don't want, right? And the, the basic thing, we can't have more public services without more taxes, right? Uh, um, so no matter what, that's going to be the tension. You know, if we just frame in terms of what services, all these are all great services, but there's always going to be some sort of cost to them. Um, I know in the, in the state of Colorado, it's really interesting that we have a budget. We, we have an amendment to the state constitution that the budget has to be balanced every 
year, right? Which I'm not sure if state of Texas has the same thing. Uh, but they can't they can't pass any bill that has money without dictating where the money comes from, right? Uh, and then on top of that, they can't raise taxes without uh, a referendum, right? So the state legislature can't raise taxes. Um, so no matter what, any conversation about Colorado, about any new spending program, right, wow. has to basically go to the voters or has to take from something else. They have to end something to start something new if they want to do it themselves or they have to take it to a voters. And taking a tax to the voters is always fun, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so that, that tension is very alive. The state legislature can't just say, this is a great program, we should do it, because they always have to say, this is a great program, we should do it. And this is specifically how we have to fund it. And funding it has to say, which means we're ending this program or we're, we're asking you to vote a tax. So, so you need new things to be taxed. Right? Yeah, like, yeah, you can't just, you know, with the US Congress, right? You can just come up with a good program, the program sounds good, and you pass it, right? And then figure out how to, how to pay for it later. But that doesn't work in the state legislature. Right? We can't have more of something we want without also having less of something that we like, right? Um, <laughs> So more economic equality without uh, less economic freedom, so we lose something that we like in some senses. Right? Uh, we can't have less of something we don't want without also having more of something we don't want. Right? This, this is a big one I do a lot with the poverty kind of stuff. Right? People always talk about we need less fraud and abuse and accountability and things like that. The problem is accountability takes time. Right? We, we had so a bill for try to overhaul education in K-12 in, in Colorado. Right? Um, so right now, you see how the tensions didn't come out, and the, the advertising was horrible. Yeah, K twelve, K twelve, uh, kindergarten and twelve. So, okay. so education. Okay. Yeah, um, secondary and yeah, elementary and, and secondary education. Uh, so the bill was a was a whole bunch more money for, for K twelve schools, right? Um, but it was it was a state it was tied to the state income tax, right? So increase the state income tax a little bit, be able to fund schools. But then all the money was going to go to local districts based on how many students they had, and they were going to let the local districts spend it their way, right? Because there's a lot of tension in the, at least in the United States, right, that we want local schools to have control of the money. We don't want the state or the federal government to tell them how to spend the money, right? Uh, but the fact that it was the state coming, getting the money, right, a lot of the advertisements against it was, oh, this is a state takeover of education, right? So they attacked the bill as a state takeover of education taking away from local institutions, right? Because that's who raised the money, even though the bill was actually giving them the money and not telling them how to use it, right? They were also attacked by lack of accountability of saying, it's all this money, but they're not telling us how they're gonna spend it. So you notice how they cut, hit, they hit them from both sides, right? Because if the bill said, here's the money, but you have to spend it like this, they would get attacked as state takeover, right? But they just said, we're gonna give the money, let them decide, but by not specifying how it was getting attacked for accountability, right? So accountability is a great word a very powerful word in politics right now, right? But you can't have accountability without having direct rules for how to use the money, right? So you can't have accountability and flexibility, right? Uh, but, you know, so all these tensions, you know, trying to figure out ways to struggle through that tension. The problem is that the broader public discourse, they're trying to find the best ways to either support the bill or attack the bill. So they take advantage of those tensions, right? Uh, so no matter what they did, they were going to be on one side of that tension, and then that, that, that's used to attack it in a sense, right? Um, or the kind of same thing, they, they, they wanted, they want all the money to go to classrooms, right? So it was an attack of like, there's no guarantee that's all going to classrooms. It might go to administrators, right? But then it also got attacked for not being accountable, and, and there's no way to show that this money will make a difference, right? Well, to be able to show money makes a difference, you need administrators to evaluate things, right? <laughs> if you're just giving all the money to the teachers, but no money to bureaucracy, you know, bureaucracy is a negative term, at least in the United States, right? But you need bureaucracy to have accountability and to have measure, right? Mm -hmm. But you see that when, you, when, when you're letting everyone frame it strategically, you can make everything sound bad, when in the reality is, okay, we, if you want accountability, you want measurement, but you want all the money to go to teachers, and you want the local schools to make all the money, but you want the state to, you know, so right. it's, a, it's an interesting conversation when you just struggle with it, but we're having that conversation instead of in a circle working through the tensions of identifying, we're having them with 30 second spot ads right, that are designed to get people to hate the bill or love the bill, right? Uh, but it's all that, but when you switch around, so we actually did a process, it ended up being very difficult because with referendum issues, right, so this is, you know, it goes to the voters whether we pass this amendment to raise taxes to fund schools. Uh, but both sides kind of waited to the last second to do their ads 
we were going to analyze all the ads, make sense of it, and then have these sit down conversations to talk through the tensions. Um, but you know, the, the elections in November, and it wasn't until like late October that everyone just threw all their money and have all these ads, you know, and most of them were very manipulative and, and wrong. We had a fact check law, so it was very hard for us to help because it was just too late, right, for us to make sense of everything. But, <laughs> which is a great, great example of you know the, the heart of that issue was all these tensions, but all the public discourse, all the letters to the editor, all the advertisements didn't touch all those. They just took advantage of those tensions to frame it to pick one side and, and not see the downside. Uh, and then last, we can't have less of something we don't want without also having less of something we like. Right? Here, here's an example of what I was just talking about. You know, we we hate bureaucracy and government cost. But if we get rid of bureaucracy and government costs, then we don't have oversight assessment and information, right? There's just an assumption that's all wasted money. If it's not going to a teacher, it's wasted money. And I'm not really pro-administration <laughs> as a teacher, right? Uh, but there is some value there. We do need some people who kind of, um, in a, there, there are some positives to bureaucracy in a way. So that was kind of a, a quick review. Uh, the, in your packets, I think you have to do the facilitator stuff, uh, turn to page 56. Two quick little facilitation things we'll do, and then we'll go back into the facilitation and a little practice here. So 56 is the primary facilitating styles, right? That's the packet of handouts from my workbook, not the, not the PowerPoint. Yeah. Uh, so I came up with these four facilitator styles probably about two or three years ago with our program. And it was from observation, right, from inductive reasoning of watching my students and, and seeing that they tended to kind of fit into one of these four. And when I developed it, I thought, oh, right, here's the initial four, and I thought over time I'd keep on adding different styles, like we'd have these 10 facilitator styles, but it, it's kind of stuck with these four, right? Uh, each time I kind of, and, and each time I, normally towards the end of the semester, I kind of go back to this and ask the new students, you know, which ones do you think you fit in, or, or do you have another one that doesn't? And, and new ones don't seem to come up, so this might be kind of a good set in a way. Um, so the referee is kind of the facilitator that, that tends not to do that much. I mentioned this briefly yesterday, right? So like a referee in a, in a sporting match, you know, you, you keep time, and if someone breaks the rules, you blow a whistle, right? So you kind of keep the ground rules or people are being mean to each other. But other than that, you just kind of let them play the game. Um, the interviewer, some people are really good at asking questions. Right? Um, I always kind of go back to, to my, my sister-in-law who works for human resources at, at a corporation. So she interviews people all day long for jobs, right? And then she comes home, and, and whenever I have a conversation with her, she's interviewing, right? You know, she's just asking questions. It's called occupational psychosis, right? You, yeah. can't, you can't leave work at work, right? Just like me, I watch TV, I can't buy something. Right, it drives my wife crazy. Right, we can't watch commercials because I'll talk about these are, these are the strategies, and you know. Um, but she's just really good at asking questions. So if you're really good at asking questions, that's a key facilitator skill, right? But obviously, even all of these have strengths and weaknesses. Yeah, I'll talk about it in a second. The devil's advocate is someone that's always kind of really good at thinking what's not being said, right? That really kind of identifies the voices that are not there and figures out ways. We talked about some of those ways of bringing them in, the empty chair, or you know, who else could be, you know, if someone else was here, what would I say, or putting. Coming I mean, up with an argument, you know, they might say this. What do you think? You know, so all these kind of strategies, and then the weaver, which is probably my natural style, the weaver is is good at making connections between things. Right. So it's always constantly kind of remembering and saying, "You said this, and you said this." So what? You know, uh, and, and that's how I've always been. I've always been head in the clouds of kind of seeing the connections between all these kind of things. Right? Now, the question of, of which of these is best, <coughs> as you imagine, depends. Right? Um, each group, if you have a group, kind of like the group that we had yesterday, that's self-deliberating, right? that's having a good conversation and treating each other with respect, but also digging deeper in the issues and seeing the tensions, then you should be a referee. right? Don't do too much. And, and I often see young facilitators flaw on the side of doing too much versus too little. Right? Um, just let the kind of groups be in a sense and then kind of take some, some chances when you want. Um, obviously, the interviewer is good when you have a quiet group. right? That if you just let them talk, it's going to surface. And then if you're interviewing, you're asking good questions, and you're asking, digging deeper, it's a much more active certain role. Uh, the devil's advocate is critical when you have a group that all thinks alike, right? <laughs> that there aren't seeing different sides of it, so you need the devil's advocate. Uh, and then the weaver is good when people are kind of all individuals and not really kind of reacting to each other. So then the weaver can really kind of make those connections and help people think. Right? Uh, so what I do with my training is you know, generally students seem to fall naturally into one of those, just how their personality is and how their mind works. <laughs> 
Um, but as you develop as a facilitator, you want to be able to be all four. <coughs> so then depending, again, on the purpose of the event and depending on the, the, the hand you've been dealt with the people in your group, you can adjust. Another way I think about that, one of my two favorite facilitator students, they stay with me for three years, there are actually a couple. Um, one was just total high energy and one was always, always very, very calm, right? Um, and it was the same thing. It's like, and, and you know, advantages and disadvantages to that, right? But you should adjust. If your group is really low energy, you need to be high energy, right? Especially when my students, it's funny, my students are so nervous about doing this in the community at the beginning, but then we do all these practice forums and classes with other students, and, and students are kind of the worst groups to facilitate yeah. sometimes, right? Yeah. Well, and, and part of it is they didn't pick the topic. I mean, they didn't yeah. leave their house to go talk about that, right? You're just making them talk about a topic. Um, so then by, by the time we finally do it in the community and it's full of people that we left to talk about that topic and are passionate about it, it's so nice, right? They're so nervous about people kind of being emotional, right? And then by the time we actually get in the community, like, thank God someone's emotional, right? <laughs> like they want emotion is good, right? The lack of emotion is a much more difficult problem to facilitate with than too much emotion, right? Too much emotion is something you can mold and, and adjust and transform into productive conflict, right? I don't care about the topic. There's not much you can do with that. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so you have to regulate kind of your, and, and it's literally you regulate your, your, your rate of speech. If your group is really emotional, then as a facilitator, you need to talk a little slower, kind of go through and calm people, you know. And if everyone's really bored, you really need to kind of get up and say, okay, let's talk, you know, and use your energy to kind of fire them up in a way, right? So all these styles, you're adjusting to the, the hand you've been dealt, essentially, with the group that you have. And we will, when we do the practice form, we'll do it all inside the circle now, just to kind of show you a little bit more what, 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 what we would normally do, right? We'd be much more closer to each other, uh, kind of talk more closer. Yeah. yeah. English is my second language. <laughs> my second language as well. And then the last thing I want to talk about a little bit, and then we'll do this uh, breakout again, uh, is page 59. And, and this is some of the new theory I'm developing. Um, and, and I'll probably link this a little bit more as I finish this paper I'm writing of when they intervene with the facilitator responsibilities we covered yesterday. But starting with the bottom a little bit, there's, there's a theory that I really like when I, I teach my persuasion class um, called Siller's Expected Utility Model. Okay. And, uh, and it was developed for kind of situations where you're asking for a favor. You're trying to get a friend to loan you money or loan you your car, give you a ride to the airport or something like that, right? So there's this whole literature of communication about kind of uh, asking people for favors. Um, and there's this whole range of strategies. Some of them are very positive strategies. You know, you're such a great friend, you know. Uh, <clears throat> And some of them are negative strategies, right? Using a guilt trip or calling in a favor or, you know, those type of things, right? Um, so the Siller's utility model basically said, what strategy you pick, you're, you're calculating several different things, right? You're calculating for you know, the factors of, of what strategy you pick. One is how important is it for the favor to, to, you know, is it like I'd really like to go to this party or if I don't get a ride to the airport, I don't get to go home for Christmas or something like that, right? So how important is it, right? How important is the relationship, right? What's the potential impact on that relationship? And then fourth, which I think is very important, is how likely is the strategy to work? Because right? part of it is you don't want to pull out the big guns, right? You don't want to go with a really bad guilt trip if it's not going to work, right? Because <laughs> then you have to damage the relationship and you still don't get the favor, right? So you're calculating in your head all these things of, of what am I going to use here, right? Do I get angry? Do I kind of you know, point out the time that they didn't do something or all that kind of stuff, right? Um, and one of the interesting examples here is, is the literature also has, there's examples sometimes when you're asking for a favor that you purposely don't want the favor to be rewarded to you because you'd rather, there's a positive impact on the relationship, right? An example, I've never done this, uh, but my, my brother goes to Vegas, Las Vegas, about four times a year. And every time he goes, he calls me and says, hey, I'm going to Vegas next weekend. If you can get out there, you can stay in my room for free, right? Um, I'm a very busy person, and you know, work-life balance is a stretch for me, right? I've got three kids. Um, so me leaving for the weekend to Vegas would normally be a very difficult thing, right? Like, uh, I worked on so 100 hours a week, I'm going to go play for three days without you. Um, but I could potentially still ask my wife, oh, Danny's going to Vegas this weekend. Is it all right if I go? And then she'd probably say, oh, but the kids have. And then I'd say, oh, yeah, that's true. That, never mind. I won't go. Right. <laughs> but just by the fact of me asking and then being so gracious on giving up on it, that's right? I get, I, get, you know, I get a little proud of it. <laughs> so the next time I ask to go to Vegas, she might say, well, last time I didn't let him go, so maybe I let him go this time. <laughs> so there's all these calculations you're making. 
Right, so that was a little tangent, but uh, so I'm developing a similar theory for facilitation, right? When you're deciding to intervene, what goes into that decision of what you're going to say, right? Uh, so you see it ha on here. What is the importance of the issue, right? How important? What's the teaching moment, right? How important is the opportunity that? Uh, so if someone say if there's a tension and someone expresses one side of the tension, I'm using an example of the K-12 stuff, someone says, "No, that's ridiculous. There's no accountability," and you know, oh. There's an interesting tension between accountability and you know these other things that we want to talk about, right? And if that seems like a pretty key part of this discussion, and it's clear that this group is only seeing one side of it, I might say this is so important that I need to intervene here to try to get them to kind of explore this tension, right? So that first thing is how it you know the importance of the issue, and, and part of uh, we'll review this with the winter intervene, but with any kind of group communication, there's a whole literature on group communication. Uh, there's a task dimension, and then there's a social dimension. Right? So groups form to get something done, right? but then there's also a social dimension that the more comfortable the group is with each other, the more likely they'll, they'll be able to do the task in some way. Right? But the same stuff is the more they're focused on the social, they're not doing the task. Uh, there's this interesting experience I had walking around my events when groups laugh. Right? We're taking on a tough issue, but then all this group is laughing. Right? And part of me is thinking, okay, that's good. They're getting comfortable. They're having a good time. Right? And then part of me is thinking is, Okay, they're not in the groan zone if they're laughing, right? And how, how, how much are they actually struggling with this issue if they're having that good of a time, right? But it's that task social dimension, you know, because most of our groups form for two hours, right? They show up to an event, they sit down, they have a two hour experience with each other, and then they're gone. It's not an ongoing group, right? So, you know, you've probably seen the literature in, in terms of what norming, storming, you know, that, that kind of have group development and stuff. We have two hours for them to develop, right? So normally I see laughter as, hey, they're, they're starting to bond as a group, right? And, and hopefully they'll be able to kind of use that bonding to be able to really do the hard work later on. Hopefully they're not laughing for two hours, right? Because then they're probably not doing any tasks. Uh, so that's the same thing as the importance of an issue is if you're pushing on a, on a learning moment, if you're pushing on attention, right? You're probably working on task, but you might be giving up relationship, right? If, you, if you're identifying a tension between two people and you're highlighting it, you're going to create tension, right? You're going to, it's going to be uncomfortable for people, right? They're, they're probably going to enjoy the experience less, right? But you also feel that they're really going to learn about it, right? So as a facilitator, you're constantly kind of dealing with that tension in a way between task and, and so, you know, you're not wanting the, I don't want people to come to my events, I want them to enjoy the experience, right? But I want them to enjoy the experience more in a fulfilling kind of way. I did hard work today. Right? I, I, we really did it, you know, we worked through that issue and said, well, that was an enjoyable conversation, right? Um, so that's part of it, is when you're jumping in, how much reward, how much you're gonna get out of it in terms of the task, then also how much relationship damage might there be to kind of bring that up, right? Um, I'm gonna skip the second one for a second. Availability of, availability of time for the intervention, this is one of the time management. Right, you've got 30 seconds left before you can move to something else. Don't bring up a huge issue. Right, you don't have time to do that. So you always have to have time on your head. Do I have time to really explore this? If it's a tension that you want to explore and work through, that takes time. Right. Um, yeah, potential. For, uh, I guess we'll go back to the second one. The potential for it to resolve or occur by itself. You know, ideally, the group does this themselves. Right. Uh, ideally, a group's, ah, I disagree with that. You know, when you have a tension, you know, you don't want to intervene that much. Right. Uh, so part of it is to what degree do I have to kind of be the one that kind of makes that, right? <clears throat> and then the last one, and this is really kind of where the theory develops in terms of the more experience you have as a facilitator, the more interventions you'll likely do. Because the more experience, you're likely to be able to be, you're, you're more likely to be successful in your intervention, right? You've learned what works and what doesn't work. You learn to take advantage of opportunities and let opportunities go when the, when the group you don't have time and the group's not ready for it, right? Uh, so in some ways, I teach my facilitators. I'm like, you know, when you're new, you know, don't take that many chances, right? It, it's okay to kind of let the group go, just kind of follow the process. And the nice thing about NIF and those type of things is, you know, with the background material, with the process, you know, a lot of it's kind of self facilitating, right? The facilitator doesn't have to do too much, right? Um, and, 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 a, and a young facilitator can easily do too much. And kind of derail things, right? But then when you have an experienced facilitator, especially one that really spends time being self-reflective, they're more and more likely to be able to take advantage of those opportunities that come up, right? So it's going to be a more active facilitator. And I think that's one of the reasons my program, I, I'm now kind of training more active facilitators, because I have a lot of time to train them, right? Um, so if I have really good facilitators, yeah, you're going to intervene a lot more, right? 
right? You're gonna take a lot more advantage. And every opportunity that comes up, you're gonna take advantage of it, right? But that likelihood of success is, am I gonna be able to ask this question well? Am I gonna be, be able to react on the fly to the reactions to it to actually take advantage of it, right? But that, from the slurs expect you to totally evolve, that likelihood of success is important. Uh, I don't wanna ask a question and then it, it, it actually harm the conversation. Um, so then on top, I won't walk all the way through this, but you just kind of see some of the specific reasons to intervene. We've seen that, you know, opportunity for learning. That's the big one for us, right? Here's a chance here. Like I talked about with the definition of deliberation, this is about refining people's opinions. It's not just people having a chance to express their opinion. We want people to learn and react to each other and have those aha moments, right? So facilitators are particularly kind of looking for those chances. Uh, ground rules being violated. This doesn't happen too often, right? When the facilitator has to remind people of the ground rules, right? Uh, that they need to be respectful. Probably the only ground rule that you have to remind people of sometimes is the be brief thing, right? And you might want to say, you know, we want to make sure everyone gets us talk here, We're trying to kind of calm down the dominator. Um, lack of clarity or mutual understanding. So the facilitator needs to kind of try to be the dumb person in the group. When everyone using an acronym or a term, like, so I use K-12, right? And you had to ask K-12, right? Uh, so facilitator, when everyone's using an acronym, uh, I'm sorry, I'm losing it all. I'm sorry about the acronym. I, I should have as a facilitator, you know. Um, but whenever you, even if the facil even if you know the acronym as a facilitator, right? If, if you can assume someone else in the room doesn't, Right? The other people, I mean, it was good that you asked. You didn't know when you asked, right? Most people wouldn't, right? Because they don't want, I don't want people to not know that I don't know that, right? So a facilitator is the one that, or same thing when people use terms, right? When, like justice and, you know, big words that mean different things to different people, right? The facilitator might want to say, well, what does that word mean to you, right? Um, so you're the one in charge of that. You know, part of your job is to make sure there's mutual understanding and comprehension. People understand each other. Uh, so you need to be the one that jumps in and says, well, make sure we're on the same page here. What do you mean by that? Well, what is that after? Hey, you just said ACT. What is ACT here? Okay, you know. Um, so that's part of your job, why you did for being sometimes. Uh, adjusting pace and time management. So a lot of your interventions is how much time you have left, you need to almost move on, and so forth. <clears throat> and then opportunity to improve group dynamics or honor democratic attitudes. This is in some guys when, when you're intervening for the sake of the relationship, right? Uh, if someone's being... <laughs> You know, we don't, the ground rule of being respectful, you know, you don't, you don't re-mention that ground rule that much, right? But you are in charge of making sure people feel comfortable, right? Um, one of the tough ones is that when someone uses a derogatory term or an offensive term, you know, to what degree do you jump in, right? Uh, and, and, and kind of push back on that. Sometimes you might just reframe it, you paraphrase it, you take that term out, right? So it makes it a little bit more, you know, like you, but part of your responsibility is keeping that group safe. But there's a tension with that. You know, I do a lot of free speech stuff, right? Um, that, that it can, can create a chilling effect when you really kind of, uh, especially like talking about issues, the tough issues like race and that kind of stuff, it's so hard to talk about that, right? That if people are scared to, to say any of the wrong words, it really cuts off conversation, right? So we often, when we do something on like race that, or, or really kind of tough issues, we'll add some of the ground rules, like assume best intentions, right? It's like, well, let's not worry too much about the, you know, if people are using words, don't put too much meaning into that. Um, and, and for a while here, let's try. But but that's a tough kind of line to draw in a sense, right? That we don't want people to feel kind of uncomfortable with it. But that's that last kind of intervention is you're, you're really thinking about those group dynamics and making sure people feel comfortable. Yeah. <coughs> All right, let's go. A little tingle in the back of my throat. Um, all right, so let's go. This Well, first of all, we need three new volunteers. <laughs> I think there's only four of us to choose from. Right? <laughs> and Maria wasn't here when we actually walked through the how to facilitate. So I don't know. I told her to kind of look through those pages. I don't know if you'd feel comfortable trying anyway. Or, or maybe she can go third if, if the other three people don't want to do it. So there's, uh, I know Jerome self-identified that I should make you do it, right? So I will make you do it. So then I think we have the two of you and Maria. The two of the three of you have to. Yes. <laughs> All right, Thomas is, is willing, right? Yeah, okay. I'm not, but I can do it. <laughs> <laughs> and again, the, the making mistakes makes it, gives us more learning opportunities, right? So. so we... Yeah, so we're gonna come in the middle, and what we'll do, so, so get out that same kind of little one-page handout on the job of obesity. Um, I don't know where my... You can't my, find it, you've got it here. here. Yeah, here we go. I think it's somewhere. <laughs> and, and we'll come in the inner circle here. 
So we have a little bit more of a typical experience for facilitation. <laughs> we'll do, Jerome, you do approach one, is that right? Uh, Thomas, do approach two, and then we'll figure out between <laughs> Maria and maybe, maybe we could do half and half on the third. And we need to take on those roles, too, right? Yeah, yeah if you want to pick, pick the role, I don't know if y'all want to pick one or... To make it work, like, so we don't have to do the same thing in just yeah. a day. Yeah. Or just every once in a while, if you want to look and just kind of pull out that character and kind of make that argument. Okay. Uh, we, don't, we don't necessarily have to kind of specifically select them. Okay. So I'll sit here and have a look. Ah, yeah. Someone right over here. Yeah. Oh, we got two. We're filling them all. Oh, we're going to all the spots. Yeah, yeah. So what? Why do you want? Okay. Right here. She wants a nice lady. Um, no, no, no. So we want to push back the table. Nice lady. Okay. So I have another nice lady. Let me adjust first. No, we shouldn't. Jerome's first. Oh, Jerome is first. Yeah. So, yeah. Give me a second. Yeah. So, do you need and to get out of touch? More of the moderator, thank you. Uh, is Jerome. Is Jerome to be Now, when the music stops and you don't have a chair, you're out. <laughs> that also means you're done for the day. So, who's my second facilitator? Thomas. Thomas? Okay. Um, he needs to sit here at the end. Well, I think I made this. If it could just have the two. If we want to leave, we can pause it. We can pause it. We can switch around. All right. We haven't established that yet. Okay. So they got to do rock, paper, scissors to see. I don't know who wins or who loses or what. What I'd like to do is I'd like to have those two curtains right here. The two gender purple right here. And then if you would, at the third facilitator, whoever the third person is, we're going to zoom over here. Let me check the status of the camera on the other side. Switch just around. When they get there? Uh, no, 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 I can move my camera at that point. Okay. That be a issue. Yeah, so like we did yesterday, you know, as soon as this was an actual event, you know, we have lots of circles in the room kind of doing the same thing we're doing here. In the front of the room, we've already talked about kind of deliberation and kind of the, the, we've explained the process and how we're collecting information and using the information. Uh, and then we've already established the problem. Right? So we had some statistics about increasing child obesity, those type of things. And so in your groups, what you're going to do is you're going to spend about, you know, about 10 minutes. <laughs> 10 minutes each, kind of talking through each approach. Mm -hmm. uh, so then we'll switch facilitators for each approach. That, that facilitator should start out with a quick little summary, right? Again, knowing that we have some fun of them, so you don't have to read it to us. So just say, you know, first approach, this is kind of the primary argument, and then open it up. Normally your first question pretty open-ended, uh, but then maybe have some, kind of think back to the five basic moves, right? So you'll be kind of controlling who speaks, you'll do some paraphrase potentially, you'll do some probing questions, which is asking that person a follow-up question, some reaction question to get other people to react to that person said, or some transition questions, which is kind of changing the kind of <laughs> shifting the conversation to another uh, on the guy. So right. Should we declare which character we are? I, I think you know, so you don't have to pick that character and be that character the whole time, right? Okay. But just every once in a while to kind of right. enrich the conversation. And you don't even have to, you know, you can just say, well, you know, as a small business owner, you know. Okay. So you kind of look at it um, and, and kind of pick one that hadn't been done with before. Okay. Um, and obviously you don't have to read that out loud, but just kind of Give a quick kind of reference that kind of helps us know who you are, um, and for some of them we might not know that maybe you are that, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, like number eight, you're a parent who believes that your child learns to make their own decisions and mistakes. You know, so that might be kind of your opinion anyway. Mm -hmm. But this just kind of gives us a little bit more to work with. So, yeah. do you have? I don't know. Oh. Yeah, here. The role play. So you need. So what we are doing yeah. for I mean, if you do this exercise in class, you know, I can send you this too. And sometimes you can cut it up and then assign people to people, right? Yeah. 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 All right, so we're ready to go. So we'll start with the one. All right, so we are gathered to discuss what exactly to do about childhood obesity. It is. Um, a growing problem in the United States, an increasingly large percentage of children are overweight or obese. Uh, it is having ramifications in terms of health, 
It has public policy implications. It has educational implications. So we're here to kind of discuss what exactly we should do about this and how to approach the problem. Um, first, I want to start by talking about the idea that obesity is really an individual and family responsibility, that you know, the solution to it lies with the child, lies with their parents, lies with their family unit. So who, who wants to get started along that, along that vein of thought, along that approach, that the solution here is with the individual and with the family? So really, it's such a hard um, topic, but, you know, and it's, I feel sort of bad about saying this, but, you know, I work, I work very early in the morning, I work two jobs, and then, um, you know, my child stays in the after school program. So, you know, I pick my child up six, seven o'clock at night, and I know I should go buy that grapefruit in the store, but sometimes it's just easier because I'm so tired, um, and we have such, you know, the dollar that I have to spend on the fresh vegetables versus the dollar I can I can buy an entire value meal at McDonald's. It's just um, it's easier, and so it's, it's, I think it's, it's just really hard sometimes for us. Okay, so what I'm hearing is that it's easier um, as as a parent to sometimes pick the less healthy option than the healthier option. Is that one? I think so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Easier and cheaper. And cheaper, yeah. Okay. You have to choose between one grapefruit versus an entire value meal. Yeah. Okay. Does anyone agree with that? Yeah. Then I, I, say, I would say that uh, also parents, and the obesity is not only the nutrition stuff, it's also about the physical activity. So um, I think this is good if, uh, if uh, uh, parents sometimes uh, have this um, um, scene of buying some fast food just to make it faster, faster and then during the weekends they may spend some uh, quality time doing some exercises, some bike rides or, or something with their children. They need to spend their child, the time with children, so and so, so so why not making it active time? Okay, so it almost sounds like you think there could be, am I right in hearing this, there's some kind of possible trade-off that Maybe sometimes it's okay to do what you think is easier from a nutritional standpoint, but you can also offset that by when you have free time together. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. So um, I think also that it's the nature of our society to be fast food. Um, we want fast, everything is instant. And then also there is other ways, and I think that we need to help um, parents have a different choice because usually the excuse is I live a fast life and don't have time to, to cook but we have weekends so over the weekend we could cook some food and store food in the refrigerator and then prepare with a salad and do something that is a little bit different rather than going to McDonald's for instance and pick up fast food. I think it also the issue here is related to economics so a junk food is really cheap and then that's that's maybe what is the driving force in in the choices for food especially for children so it sounds like um i mean you're this right a big part of the problem is the cost disparity between the nutritious food and junk food basically one of the, and i think that ties to what Lindy was saying Correct me if I'm wrong here, but one is just so much more convenient and so much less expensive. If you are a parent on the go, if your child has activities, maybe that just is so much an easier option. Okay, so we're hearing some good ideas about what might be some of the the causes here. You know, we're we're talking about obesity being an individual and family responsibility. So what might be some ideas, we've already heard one about using weekends as food prep time and another about using weekends as uh, available time as activity time. What might be some other ways then that individuals and families on their own time can, can address this issue? Aside from doing food prep for a week or doing active time together, what might be some other ideas? I, I think it, it, it Education also would be a major component here because there is not really a connection between 
a, an open connection between eating good and, and being healthy. So I think it, it, his family learned more about the benefit of having a good a, a meal for everybody, not only just for the children, but for themselves also. It, it would be, in a way, we would be able to address this problem. I think the education would be important here. Okay. What about maybe some of this we've been focusing on elements of this approach if we say it is an individual's sort of family's responsibility? What about some of the trade offs if we make this really the individual family's responsibility? What are some thoughts on the potential trade offs if that's where we put the onus on tackling obesity? Well, I think one of the most important um, trade law is uh, upon the, the tenets of this uh, speech. I don't uh, find uh, the problem of obesity as uh, being connected only with individual choices and uh, being uh, alienated from all the other society uh, measures. Uh, we all uh, has to have to have to. Uh, Pay our taxes for for uh, for fighting obesity for for, for public health care and so on. The money which could be spent on uh, other things which uh, maybe would be more more uh, beneficial, especially uh, when we are talking about uh, simply uh, the change of uh, lifestyle. So. Uh, I don't think that that uh, we can say that that uh, it is uh, it is only um, it is only uh, limited, uh, limited to, to to the person who makes the choice. It is uh, a problem of the society, and I, I, and I think uh, this is uh, what I'm trying to say that it attacks the whole society at the moment. Okay. Another question. And I'm just not comfortable with these trade offs because um, I'm just trying to gather my thoughts. Oh, um, because, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to market my food as healthy. And I'm not lying to the people. I'm, I'm a business owner. And so I don't understand if people want to make that choice. So what's the problem? You know, that people should be given personal freedom. Well, I mean, what we're talking about here is with children, so they're not adults, right? I mean, so a lot yeah, of children parents, don't have the opportunity. Parents are making quiet. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, that, that's what, I guess, the reason, I mean, I, I support this approach in general, that I do think it is a family responsibility, but I also think we're, we're seeing that families aren't taking that responsibility seriously enough, right? So the question becomes, if parents aren't parenting well, and to what degree do we need to step in? And, and yes, I support people making their own choices, but these children aren't making their own choices. Their parents are making bad choices. So what, what is our responsibility as a society to step in? You know, um, and I guess that's what I struggle with. I think you you said you don't really like these trade-offs because it, the trade-offs seem to take focus away from the state of individual choice and parents saying this is what's right for my family. <laughs> so if we're acknowledging maybe that, say, eating fast food every day is not necessarily healthy for a child or for a family, what might you suggest to kind of I mean, they push need the to, parents they need to make to take decisions. responsibility. At some point, we can't legislate everything. At some point, you know, people need to stand up and maybe see this as an indulgent choice. It's not something they need to do every day, but I don't see why we're going to criminalize business owners because people can't make their own. I mean, this is what America is about. It's about personal freedom and, 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 and um, you know, the right to own a business without being criminalized in this way. And so, um, you know, I just, I'm uncomfortable with these trade-offs. Well, on the other hand, the U.S. government subsidizes uh, farming, and it's the uh, same as European Union, and spends uh, millions uh, of dollars on, on uh, food production, uh, then uh, what's the problem in uh, adjusting the, the money flow in such a way uh, that the healthy food would be more easily available for example, in your shop, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and uh, making the uh, 
trying to be a little bit less attractive also from the economic point of view. We, uh, the, 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 the mechanism is already uh, prepared, but we just maybe have to adjust it. Change my business model if the market changed. What is the market right now? I'm a business person. It's the culture that I live in. Well, I think a lot of people are addicted to fast food, so you'll have your customers. <laughs> if you start selling only healthy foods, then you will lose them and lose money. Yeah. Yeah, it's not your job to change the culture. That's, no. that's what I'm saying. It's a broader responsibility in a sense. I don't think we're, we're not blaming you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I respectfully disagree with that. Because we are talking about uh, uh, the food for children, and then we need to, as a community, and homeowners, government, individual people, we are all responsible for teaching what is appropriate, what is not appropriate, especially when it's related to, to children. As a homeowner, a, um, a store, I think it also we need to, to Let's say, for instance, uh, Coca-Cola should also uh, be contributing a major one now, uh, rather than having the a, a full drink, having half drink. I think this is an, an acknowledgement that we all are in this together. It's, it's true, I agree that we have to have freedom of choices because we are in a free country. But then we have to find a balance between the total freedom and what is also good for, for all of us because eventually we're all going to pay the bill. Well, and that's why I started off in carrot sticks and salads. <laughs> that's my, that's my Apple you know, <laughs> I agree with you. Let's go ahead and go stop there. That's about 12 minutes or so. So, how did you feel? Um, Good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you have a good, good tone to you. You can tell, you know, that, you know, most of us are teachers, right? You know, but you felt very comfortable. You seemed very comfortable. Especially uh, in the last four or five minutes when I didn't really have to <laughs> right. yeah. 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 Sorry. Like, again, we fell into actually forgetting we're trying to use kind of doing it. Right? I don't know, obviously, you were role playing. But, um, <clears throat> the other thing, so, you know, you started off kind of just kind of big, trying to jot down some of your interventions. You know, so you, you kind of paraphrase the first two or three, right? And, and did it. You know, so it sounds like I'm getting it right. You know, so again, doing that paraphrase make it easier for people to kind of push back in a sense. Um, and then you did one kind of connection, kind of a you know, so this kind of connects back to what we do. Now those are always useful because people feel heard, right? Like wow, baby, the first thing I said is that. And then that also kind of does what we're trying to do is is you're creating interaction, right? So one way to create interaction is get people to talk to each other. Another way to get interaction is get you know what you said kind of connects with what she says. How are we going to do? You know, so then you're you're going to be more explicitly kind of creating interaction or, or bringing people forth, right? Um, and then you kind of had a transition question of, in some ways we were already uh, pushing back on it, right? Yeah. You know, so then your transition was what are the trade offs, right? But we were already kind of there, right? Yeah. You know, so it, it might have been better in terms of the transition to say, you know, so someone that really supports this, what, what do you think? You know, because everyone was kind of like, ah, you know, it's, it's not the parents' fault and that kind of stuff, right? Uh, I mean, it's still a good transition to kind of you know point back to it, but. In, in ten minutes too short. But. Yeah, I thought he did a great job of balancing. But that on that trade-off question, when he moved, like she answered, and I had one thought, and I was going to respond, and then he asked other questions, so then I had to stop and like reformulate my thought. That was kind of the experience I was participating. Yep. So, yeah. Yep. And one interesting thing you did that, that, that I need to think through more about how the best way to do this in senses, because you you ask questions in terms of what might be some ideas, what can we do, right? Um, and generally with the NIF form, the, the, when we're going through the approaches, we, we don't tend to ask that kind of question in terms of action. Action is more at the end, right? So we want to spend the deliberations like, you know, struggling with the tensions and thinking about the different sides and creating understanding of the different logma. And then on the back end, which we're not kind of doing, right? It's when we say, okay, now that we've had that conversation, what actions do you support? Because <clears throat> then it's likely that those actions are actions that kind of Negotiate these different tensions, in and a way, that right? gets done in the reflection, which is what right. I'm asking. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, you know, so I'm not saying you made a mistake or anything like yeah. that, but just to think about when are you ask when you're asking people to brainstorm specific actions, we, we do that at the end after we've talked about all three, right? And, and, and if we do it well, which is sometimes hard, we have lots of small tables, right? 
um, you know, if, I, if I'm facilitating through the approaches, you know, I'm identifying some tensions. And then at the back end, say, okay, so one thing that we, now we all really kind of saw that it is a parent responsibility, but also recognize that the parents aren't really doing a good job with that responsibility. So what are some ideas you, you have that can kind of do that? You know, and I think yours was a great example, right? We need to teach parents skills on how to have healthy food, even though when you don't have time and that much money, right? You know, so what are some healthy foods that are cheap, right? Uh, or you can go buy in bulk or this kind of thing, right? Or you can make, you know, several healthy foods on the weekend and then freeze them. So then all you have to do when you get home is microwave them, right? Which is, you know, so, so that becomes, what, what essentially you're doing there is you're trying to you know, transcend that tension between we want parents to do, make, to act better, but we also recognize that, you know, especially the low-income parents don't have the time or money, you know, it, it makes it hard to act better, right? So then now we're brainstorming actions that kind of negotiate that tension. Make sense, um, you know. So, so sometimes it's worth it during the approach, you know, especially if there's a clear tension uh, to take advantage of it right then, right? Okay. So, what ideas do you have? What would work that would kind of, you know, be able to negotiate that? Um, but generally, that, that the process of let's talk through it, so we see all the tensions, we understand kind of the issue, we, we, we drop our blinders essentially, and then that last 45 minutes of the forum is when, okay, now that we've had this conversation. What are you willing to do? What are some ideas you have for nonprofits? What are some ideas? You know, what should businesses kind of do? And it's like, you know, and that's that. McDonald's has adjusted, right? You can now get apple slices instead of French fries in the Happy Meal. You know, there's all these little things. Now they're not take. They didn't take away French fries, right? They're just as a business, right? Giving options now. So as a parent, if I want to have a little bit more healthy options, now I have more healthy options. And that's part, you know, part of the response. Of, um, maybe a difference um, between the. the Three choices, right? The, 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 the approaches are designed to ensure a full conversation. So that's kind of the idea. So let's get through the conversation. Let's see all the different sides and the perspectives, right? Now, once we have that, then we can do the hard work of kind of what's next, right? And, and um, does that make sense, right? Because that, that, that question of, okay, let's brainstorm some ideas, um, I think is a good one. We need to do that, right? But if we do that in the middle of the deliberation, then we're not talking through something. You know, we didn't talk about, at all about stigma, right? We didn't talk, you know. That kind of thing, right? So that's why I'm thinking about that. That you know, brainstorming actions. I agree with you. Sometimes it might be a short thing. Let's kind of do it right then, right? Um, but if you're doing a good job, and, and then you, if you think about the cycle of deliberation, right? So as I get the notes from the 15 tables, right, I start seeing how do they talk about that first one. You know, me as a deliberate practitioner, I start identifying. Okay, here are some things we need to push on. You know, so then the next time we gather, we say, okay, well, last time we talked, you know, here's the the tough question that we really struggled with. Right. So then this time we're going to focus on how we take that on, right? Uh, so it kind of, that's why I think it's useful sometimes to kind of split those actions. Like really understanding the issue and understanding the tensions and then brainstorming the ideas. Right? Sometimes you can kind of flow right into them and sometimes it's better to kind of split them up. Uh, do you have this too? We're kind of still using this and then we're, we're giving this to people like a brain. I don't know if you have this from yesterday. Yeah, okay. um, nice job. <laughs> okay, let me see. So we are well, discussing. They, he's going to do two. No, no. Oh, you're just asking a question. Okay. I'm asking a question. Okay, so we are looking at the approach, and then we can take any of these rules. Yeah, you just if you feel like you know that. Okay. I mean, that's something. When I do it in my class, sometimes I cut those up and I get students and I tell them this is your role, or I have them cut up and they can flip through and pick one, right? Mm -hmm. uh, for y'all, I was just saying, if you want to look through that and then kind of do what Wendy did, mm -hmm. it's just kind of pick. And that's just to kind of enrich the conversation. You know, we're, we're, I think we're all professors, right? So yeah. it's gonna, you know, it's a very limited conversation in, in some ways, uh, while we're diverse in others, certainly. 
Um, but then that kind of just brings some new dimensions to it that gives us a little bit more to work with as a facilitator. Okay. Okay. So let us switch to the second approach. Uh, some people uh, say that uh, schools should take uh, a stronger role in the dealing with this problem, maybe ban the junk food or, or increase time for the PDP or health classes. Uh, so should be more, schools should be more involved. Uh, so uh, what do you think about what, what's your first first impression about, about this approach? Is it right one or uh, as an elementary school teacher that I have seen the, the how the children have been in the teacher for 20 years and I have seen how now we have this epidemic of children uh, being obese or overweight I think it, it, the school has a major role to play in helping the society to address this situation I believe that all of us has investment in the health of the country and teaching children. We have to start teaching children to be able to make a difference because every time that we address the children, we also need to address the parents. Mm -hmm. And working together, I think that we can make a difference. Okay, so you are saying that, I mean, you are agreeing with this, yeah, you agree with this approach, that schools should be more involved? Correct. And you would like to see like schools more involved also in teaching parents you know, how to teach their children. I mean, I agree with that. I mean, I'm, I'm a mom and I work really hard to provide healthy, organic food. I work hard to make sure that everything is fresh and that they have a good lunch every day. And then they come home and I find out, you know, they want to have the pizza that their friend had that's, you know, canned and processed. And they're being offered sugar items and snacks, and it's so frustrating because I'm working so hard mm -hmm. to make sure that they eat well. And it's like it's an uphill battle. Okay, so I don't feel supported by the school. Okay, so you are taking your responsibility as a yeah, parent, right. but the school, are, is that, school in is your that opinion, not doing yeah. enough. Right. Okay, so what's the, uh, in your opinion, what school should do more? Well, I mean, we need healthy options at school, so this is not an issue. And we shouldn't have sugar options being given at snack. Okay, so for example, like uh, banning the junk food would be an option for you. Right? Yeah. Okay, so do you agree with this? Yeah, but on the other hand, uh, as a PE teacher, I must say uh, also some parents spoil schools' work uh, because uh, they uh, get uh, from the doctors the excuse that they children who will not attend uh, um, physical education classes. Um, so I think this is what Maria said, really school and parents need to collaborate on this subject. Uh, because some parents uh, are not so uh, well aware of the problem as you. And, uh, these are them who give uh, sweets uh, for the lunch. Uh, for their children, and then children don't go to the, um, don't take lunch offered by the school because they prefer sweets. Mm -hmm. So, like, you all agree that parents and children, uh, parents and schools and teachers should cooperate more yeah, like to, uh, to provide health, healthy options for our children. Um, coming at this from an administrator's point of view, I'm already at the school. But where's the money coming from? We were stretched thin as is in terms of classroom time. Starting in elementary school, we've got kids prepping for state tests. We don't have additional classroom time to, to devote to teaching nutrition. Uh, we've tried giving kids healthy foods in the past. They don't eat them. And how do we explain to their parents that their kid didn't eat lunch today because we tried to give them food they wouldn't eat? Uh, so I think pinning this really on the schools, it's, it's not really fair to us because this this should be happening at the happening in the home. We don't have the time. We don't have the money here at school. We've got to focus on the, um, the resources we have that we're given, and it's just not there. Mm -hmm. So you're saying that schools are not having resources <laughs> enough enough resources to deal with this? Not even close. And not try it. 
That's something we we be open to it, but and we've tried giving healthier food, but kids don't <laughs> eat it. And we offer it. We offer them salads, we offer them vegetables, and they want pizza. Okay. Yeah. I respect him recently with Jerome because we always hear that we cannot do this, we also do this. And I think, it, again, a school has to change. A school needs to teach uh, children what they need so that they can have a better life. And this here, there is a problem and we all need to be addressed. It has to be addressed in the school because children spend most of their, their time, a waking time, at the school. So they, again, the, the curriculum could be uh, integrated in a way that the, that particular component of eating has to be there. The school could teach all the, the subjects related to having a garden. Through the garden, there is everything that they need to teach. And also to the cafeteria, because children go and eat food at the cafeteria. They need to know what they are eating to be able to be more uh, aware citizens to make a better choice, because we are preparing them for the future also. And there will be parents in the future. So they need to know if we, if how they, uh, is, what is nutrition, and also how this is going to impact not only their life, but also in general, the, the, the country. Mm -hmm. But um, like taking uh, his, um, uh, his argument into account, could you um, support those health classes, additional garden classes, even if that means less math or less science? Well, there is more science if, because we are teaching through going, we are teaching and we are bringing the parents, especially minority parents, because they have a background in, in growing and, and, and cultivation, and then you can even link that, the curriculum that you are having to teach all the food subjects related to having a garden that they can also in turn take it home and then also start cultivating good food. I think there is a there is a choice here that we are not exploring. Some of the schools already are doing that, but not everybody is doing it. And I think that there is a need to change the curriculum in a way that we say, well, we don't have time because math can be taught everywhere. Math, science, reading, writing, and it's even social studies because it's an issue also as a as a social group. So you're saying that you can like. Do both, then teach garden and science at the same time, or same classes. And, yes. Okay. And uh, to like you are uh, agreeing with uh, Eva and Wendy that it could also uh, foster cooperation between school and parents. Yeah, the gardening classes, for example. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, do you see any other trade-offs of this? Well, I'd like to push a little bit on the on the teacher parent collaboration. Um, as a teacher, you know, I've, I've got thirty five different students, um, and the time it takes for me to try to negotiate with thirty five uh, parents, or and, and and often the parents are poor, so there's two parents that disagree with themselves. You know, so now we're uh, I'm trying to collaborate. You know, I've, I've got four different classes of thirty students each, so now I'm trying to kind of work in the opinions of 200 people to develop my curriculum and make my decisions. Um, so, I mean, I like the idea of, of teacher-parent collaboration, and I love working with, with passionate parents, but then sometimes passionate parents can, can also be a, 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 a difficulty. Um, <laughs> right? um, so I think it's one of those ideas that yeah, teacher-parent collaboration, let's kind of work together, um, sounds a lot easier than it actually is in reality, in a sense. Um, when you have parents that have very different ways of thinking, um, and you know, we can talk about these wonderful things about nutrition and gardening and things like that, but then there's lots of students that say, "Hey, you know, I, I need you to teach my kid how to write and how to add, and everything else is my job in a sense." Um, so, so I think that we need to talk through that a little bit more to figure out how that might work. Are okay. you agreeing with idea, but uh, you see uh, a lot of drawback, drawbacks when it comes to the. You know, yeah, and, I, and I'm teaching, you know, I'm teaching seven classes a day, mm -hmm. so any teacher 
faculty, I mean, any, any teacher parent collaboration is, is on my own time, it's on email, it's, it's after school, and things like that. Um, I, I, I'm basically not paid, you know, you, you don't pay me to, to spend time collaborating uh, with parents, right? So then I, I'm donating my own time um, to be able to do that kind of work. I'm glad now that the uh, working with parents is one of the components in the rubric that is evaluating teachers because that has been an excuse in the past, but now the school districts are moving and including collaboration with the home, also as part of measurement of teacher effectiveness because we know that without the parents, there is not going to be success for, for the child. And again, that is true, it's a lot of more work. There is uh, extra time that the teachers need to put into uh, working and making these things happening, but it's a matter of choices. Not everybody is going to be a teacher, and we are looking for effective teachers who are willing to do the, that work. So, I agree. I mean, last question. I agree. I mean, I think it's about, it's about, again, looking outside the box and figuring out creative solutions. I mean, I've definitely, you know, I am a passionate parent. Sometimes can be too passionate. But, you know, I've had experiences where I'm volunteering in a, in a teacher's class and the classroom is welcoming of parents. And, and I feel that, that they need me and they understand how to work with parents. And it creates a good relationship, I think. And I've also had experiences of volunteering in class where I felt very unwelcome. So kind of bringing awareness to teachers of the importance of thinking in different ways of including teachers during during their work day or during times that they would normally be there is really important. Yeah, so we'll stop there for a second. Um, and, and just to, to, to piggyback off this a little bit, this goes, goes back to what I talked about yesterday. Uh, you know, collaboration is this powerful word now. It's a buzz term. Everyone loves collaborating. You know, in the rhetorical literature, it's called a God term, right? Um, but then in reality, collaboration is hard. I mean, and I'm the collaboration person, right? I'm the one that's trying to provide resources for my community to collaborate. I'm running all these meetings, you know, it takes a lot of work, a lot of effort, and, and a lot of resources in a sense. Um, so that's kind of one of those examples of a scale. And, and I, I, I volunteer for my for my kids' school, and I'm on the, the I forget what the name of it is, but we meet once a, one, once a month with the principal and that kind of stuff, with the teacher from each school, and there's five parents. Um, and, and most of the teachers, volunteers are it's so hard to give the volunteers something to do. It's, you know, and, and for all the parents are like, we need more volunteers. You know, we, we recognize the resources and it's tough. It's like, well, we got parent, and, and I'm in an affluent neighborhood, right? So most of the parents, you have stay-at-home moms that need our help. Uh, and the parents, I mean, the teachers were all like, no, they were paying me. Like, we don't have enough time. It, 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 I have to supervise them. I have to train them what to do. And then I don't like to, you know, it, it was such an eye-opening thing for me because it's a, and it has part of that notion of these magic bullets, right? We just think, hey, magic, you know, volunteers can fix this. Um, and, and I'm not saying the teachers are right, right? <laughs> I mean, I think some of them use volunteers. My wife volunteers lots, so some of them use volunteers for great, and some of them don't, right? But it is that example that we, collaboration sometimes is this magic bullet. We should just all work together. The problem is working together takes so much time. So much effort, <laughs> um, but you, you also then once you realize that once you get the blinders down that okay it's not a magic bullet collaboration you know I think still so, collaboration is going to work but we just need to work at it right we need to get the administrator right to, to provide some time right so if it's worked into a, my evaluation as a teacher how much I collaborate with it well then probably it's worked into my time right maybe I get two or three hours off of my schedule that that then spent time to collaborate to be able to meet with parents to be able to eat you know those type of things. But we start kind of getting past that magic bullet simple thing. Right? Another quick thing I want to kind of throw into was the part of the theory is when you deliberate, you get away from blaming and the group takes ownership, right? And I don't know if you felt that even with these kind of example things, right? It's easy to blame the fast food owner, right? Mm -hmm. Or it's easy to blame the administrator, you know. But then when you when you hear things from their perspective, there's like, yeah, you know, yeah, 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 the fast food owner is part of it, but we can't really blame them, right? Like if you if you turn your fast food into a health place, you're closing them on. We recognize that, right? You know, or the administrator, once they're actually, you know, it's really easy to attack the administrator, but when they're there saying, I don't have the money to do this, I'd love to do, you know, then all these start people, okay, wait, we can't just assume they're fixing. That's part of that process of when you have a diverse group and you have good material that kind of represents those things, is we get what we, we, we push back on the wishful thinking, the magic bullets, right, to fix everything, right? And we push back on the blaming, you know, the, the, the devil figures. Right? That's all the administrator or the fast food person or the bad parent, right? And we start as a group saying, okay, wait a second, let's actually take on the tough issue. Right? 
And that goes back to that grown zone stuff, right? When you start, when you get rid of the wishful thinking, oh man, now it's a hard problem. But hopefully it was a good process. And this is where NIS sometimes is almost too short, right? Mm -hmm. I think NIS sometimes does a good job of people getting into the grown zone, but maybe not out of it, right? <laughs> because we, we, we drop our blinders, we get rid of the wishful thinking, but then do we have enough time in a two hour meeting to really work through and feel that we leave, you know, we don't want people leaving thinking that's impossible, right? We want people leaving going, okay, it's much more complicated than I thought, but man, we came up with some good ideas to take that on, right? Um, so it's an asset, you know, the, the, the front end of the growth zone is, okay, we, we get rid of this wishful thinking, it's much more complicated, but then to what degree can we start that path of coming down and say, okay, now here's some collaborative solutions, here's some, some things we can really do to take on that tension. Yeah. I, I'm going back to administrators and people in decision making positions. I think it, when you get somebody who really can think out of the box, everything can happen. I yep. mean, because it's a matter of building trust and it's a, it's a matter of bringing everybody to, to the table and then see here, here is a problem and, and truly uh, the obesity for children is a major problem. So how we could, but then the administrators, the parents, and even I know you don't get very many parents, but if you get the few parents and those parents bring some other parents, eventually we will be effective and we will be addressing the problem. Yeah. So I think it, that has to start from having an administrator who really can then themselves think out of the box because if they say well here we have been doing this for last 15 years and our scores are decent what to change but everything around is changing i think it, having that person there that with the power that will do it and, and that goes back to some of the changes i was talking about about local at least for, for secondary education right for K-12, local control versus state control versus state. We're getting so many more now standards, right? Because they feel the system's not working, so we need to kind of have some strong standards and strong expectations from the top. So when we have that, they're forcing schools more and more to do things the same way. So the, the principal that wants to think out of the box has less flexibility, mm -hmm. right? So because you're, you know, but, but standards are great. No one's against standards, but then you recognize, okay, when we have standards from the top, it also means less innovation, less flexibility, Right. If I'm having to teach these certain things, now all of a sudden I can't, oh, I'd love to do the garden, but I can't, it doesn't fit into what I'm required to do. So then that, you start identifying those tensions and start working through that. Right? This is, I'm, I'm from New York, and this is one of the huge issues going on in public education right now in New York, is New York is a common core state, and the current teacher evaluation system is heavily tied, and the governor is pushing for having it be even more heavily tied test results so they're in a position where even if you have the administrator and teachers who want to think outside the box if they can't do that while teaching exactly what's on that test which says that they're effective at their job then their hands are kind of tied yeah. you know uh, we deal uh, our department here is linked to the state a test that the teachers need to take so i know exactly what you are talking about and I'm thinking there has to be accountability is good. I know in my field, if you say this, I think it accountability is good because you want some measurement at the end. If I have invested all this money all this time and children have been here, and in our case, teachers have been here, I think it they're supposed to pass those tests because there is minimum requirement in those tests. The thing here, and I. I'm the one that I study all these days because uh, I'm the coordinator in my department of student success and meeting. I make sure that all our students pass this day test. And I'm thinking, in a way, some accountability has to be there so that to make things happen. But then one thing cannot take from the other. I wouldn't say, well, I don't want to focus on preparing good, strong teachers because well I have to just prep for the test. I think there is a balance. If um, this, the, the tests are measuring what the, the, the effectiveness of teacher in this case, I'm supposed to prepare them to be able to pass those tests. So I think it, the, there is a, the accountability even though now people doesn't even want to hear that word. I think it is good for us. The only thing is the way we use the results of that accountability. And it's being now used, well, it's, it's measuring 
minimum skills, I'm going to focus on this and I'm not going to teach this so that I think it can be the teaching for the, for the test, also the skills that are going to be major in the test, in addition to other things that is needed for the good of to, to educate people, because now we are not educating people. Well, this is, this is uh, really a, a problem. We are teaching students um, uh, just to, to allow them to make them pass the test the most. Uh, to, to get more, more, most of the score, the best, the best score uh, possible, of, um, or if we are uh, doing some, some real academic uh, teaching. I, I it's, it's uh, sometimes even quite a funny situation. I get um, my subject uh, environmental law is not is a, uh, <coughs> you can choose it. Yeah, it's not obligatory. And students can go through all the education system uh, and become a solicitor in Poland without a grant, uh, without having an hour uh, environmental uh, law. And then the big law companies have problems because they don't have uh, people who would be able to uh, deal with those problems. And so, for example, I got a lady who uh, is finishing her, her preparation for a solicitor. And she is making some voluntary uh, assistantship uh, at my office in order to pick up some uh, some of this knowledge because it is needed to the local administration to the to whom they serve because they they, they provide services to local administration uh, expect them to know uh, environmental law and it's not something that we can uh, fully learn from the uh, so uh, I think. Uh, the minimum um, can can sometimes really play play a extremely um, devastating role to, to even on the on the uh, job market. We we uh, we cannot expect that we will find uh, good jobs for uh, three hundred students each year for three hundred students with exactly the same uh, knowledge and exactly the same capability. Jump back. <laughs> so, we're still deliberating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, that's what I want to do. But uh, so back, back to the facilitation. The, the deliberation was an example of kind of thing about facilitation. Right? So how did you feel? I think you knew what? Uh, I'm kind of stressful <laughs> first, mostly because of my English, not because of uh, no. the group. So. <laughs> Uh, but it's, it was fun. Yes. I, I you, very, some, you, you felt in control. You felt you, you seemed comfortable to me, right? Yeah, you had some yeah. vision. I really like one of your right. intervention. Right. You asked <laughs> even if intervention, right? <laughs> you know, so it's kind of a back and forth here. Um, so then you kind of pushed back on her and said, "Well, you know, are you willing to support that even if?" Kind of thinking about it. And then, you know, then she kind of transcended the even if, right? And saying, "Oh, well, we can teach science and, and we can kind of do the gardening kind of at the same time." That's kind of incorporated together. That's kind of a good example of, of identifying tension between people and then hopefully you know, framing it kind of in a more positive way instead of a conflict of like, oh, well, how, how do you struggle with this? Right? That was really nicely done. Um, one thing you, I think you did okay, but it, but it, it reminded me of, of, of a problem that sometimes comes up. But at one point you said, so we all, well, and I kind of pushed back on it, uh, the, the teacher parent collaboration, right? So you said, so we all agree that teacher collaboration is a good thing, right? Well, actually, only there's two people said that, right? And that's a typical, my, my young facilitators always kind of do that. Okay, so we all agree this. I'm like, no, so be very careful kind of announcing consensus, right, when there's eight people, because clearly, you know, and I didn't push back on that generally, but, you know, if I'm someone who was against that, and then two people agree with it, and then you say, so we all agree, I'm like, what? You know, so all of a sudden I feel like my voice isn't being heard, really, mm -hmm. right? So, uh, you, yeah. you can kind of say, it, it, you, you can qualify it sometimes, so it sounds like the, the, there's a lot of positive energy towards this, or a lot of us agree about that, you know, but the same, we all agree, and, and that's one of the reasons I don't like the summaries, right? Yeah. Because normally the summary is like, oh yeah, so we talked about this, and we all like this idea, well, do we all like it? You know, and one quick thing that you can sometimes do, too, is I do little quick polls a lot, right? I was talking about this earlier. It's a, with, with student, a lot of young students, it's kind of uncool to talk sometimes, right? <laughs> you know, so if you ask an open question, you know, everyone's kind of sitting there. So I, I do a little like from one to five, you know, five being you really like this idea to one, you're not too sure. Where are y'all? It's like a quick little pulse, right? And sometimes it's very useful for the notes, 
right? But then it's also useful to, to get voices out, right? So if, if everyone agrees and one person disagrees, you can say, so what are we missing? What, you know, what, why, what would you like it in a way, right? That's the same thing with a keypad. It's interesting that some people feel the keypads um, will support the majority too much, right? Um, but I actually use the keypads a lot to give voice to the minority, right? So if we ask a question and almost everyone likes it, but then there's two people that disagree, I can say, wait, what are we missing? What, can we hear from the people that disagree? Yeah, right. Right. So you're actually opening up space for the person with a minority opinion versus, yeah, that, so those quick other, little polls can work. Yeah. On the other hand, we are put in the defensive. Right. What are we missing? Right. Uh, yeah, and, and, and normally, at least with the keypads, it's anonymous, right? So I'm not making them speak, right? Okay. Uh, so I can say, like, if you're willing to kind of, you know, so I'm, I'm kind of yielding the floor to the minority opinion, uh, it, but yeah, how you phrase it, right? So I'm not saying, well, one person's wrong. Can you tell us? You know? yeah. <laughs> no, we're, I, I'm more phrasing it in a sense of clearly it's a valuable opinion here that, that we want to hear you speak in a sense, right? But the other thing is when I do the quick little polls, especially with the quiet group, right? Because um, if I just say, so what do you think about this idea going? Right? But if I say, okay, let's find the one. Do you like this idea or not? If someone, particularly if someone's a five or someone's a one, I can say, you get the five, why? Right? And now they, they, I've tricked them into expressing an opinion. Right? So now that I'm asking them for the backup, right? So the quick little polls can, uh, but it also can be useful when it seems there's consensus to say, well, where are y'all on this? And hey, if everyone's five, then I can say, we all agree with this, right? Um, but that it also, for the notes, it's very useful. Like, quick poll here, and, and people will really like this or didn't like it or what. Right? So, so that little facilitation kind of tool that you need. All right, let's switch to, so can, can, yeah. Can you say, like, um, two people here seems to agree, and, and how the rest of you feel about that? Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, so both of y'all really like this. What other people think, right? Oh, okay. uh, or, but, but again, also, use, instead of expressing consensus, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's better to almost push off consensus. So it seems like we really like this idea, but can anyone make an argument against it? Right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and that not only opens up space for the person that was against it to feel comfortable speaking, but even if no one is against it, to be able to think of, okay, people that are against this, what they say, well, well, I mean, clearly a teacher, parent collaboration probably takes a lot of time, you know? I know teachers are already kind of pressed for time. When do they do that? <laughs> uh, so so uh, rather than kind of express, hey, we all agree, I'd rather say, it seems like we all agree. What are we missing? Right? What, what uh, uh, Alberto, I really like, one of, the, one of the trainers from Kettering, um, one of his favorite questions is, when, when people all like something, it's like, if, if it's so obvious this is the right thing to do, why don't we do it? <laughs> What's keeping us from doing it? You know, and again, people realize. Well, I can see people are against it because of this, or you know that kind of stuff, right? So I, I'd always rather my, my impulse of facilitator is to push back on consensus versus announce consensus. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Okay. So who wants to do the third? <laughs> all right. So we need a we need a switch, right? Or do you want the facilitator? They're okay where they are? I have to do it. Oh, they're fine. I'm just fine. Then after this, we can take a break and eat donuts. Clutches, clutches. And the tangerines are from my. Moms, three, so they are. Oh, thank you. Okay. Uh, actually, I said the ladies could take uh, their turn. Okay. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, she wasn't here when I talked about the five basic photos, right? So, yeah, you showed up. Can you have a soda? I guess. Yeah, yeah. So you didn't push it. <laughs> she wasn't agreeing to do that. <laughs> she was assigning someone else to do that. Lost in translation. Very nice for you. I'm agreeing that you. The funny thing is that sorry, is English your second language or? Yes. And English was your second language, right? And English was technically my second language, right? <laughs> so we got two. Uh, Spanish. Uh, I was born in Argentina, so. But I came here when I was pretty young, but I, I did learn Spanish first. Okay. So, we've been hearing about the childhood obesity epid epidemic, um, and now another approach to that problem would be for the government. 
uh, to take a stronger stand uh, on childhood obesity. Tax junk food will make it much higher, much more expensive than it is now. Uh, just like cigarettes, you know, tax it the same way. Um, regulate fast food restaurants so that they have to offer healthy options. Um, publicly fund sports programs and public parks. And increase funding for, you know, other things like sports so that people can actually go and exercise. So what do you think about this? Should the government take over and say, okay, we need to tax this, you know? Hershey bar needs to cost $3. And, you know, maybe people will eat. Like I don't really like taxes. I don't think the government should tax anything. So it's a very <laughs> bad idea uh, because like people should choose can choose uh, cheap food if if they want, and it's not government should decide what people should eat. Okay. So I'm hearing that people should have choices. Yes. Do you have any other ideas? I I agree with him. This this is America. If I want to balloon up to 700 pounds and die of a heart attack at 45, that's my right. <laughs> I don't want the government saying, well, you have to eat this stuff, or it's now going to be prohibitive for you to make this choice. That's that's direct government intervention that infringes on my freedom. All right, but then it's true that you, have, you should have the freedom to, you know, to die of a heart attack if you want. But then if the, should the government then have to give you Medicare and Medicaid? Should the government then deal with your health issues? Maybe you should. That's mine. I have health insurance. That's that's their problem, not the government's. Keep the government out of my business. That's my point of view. I think it, uh, as an adult, you can make your choices, but here we are talking about child obesity. So I'm thinking that uh, the yeah, the I think that it, I don't like to see a hundred percent regulations by the government, but I think the government uh, is has to have a voice also in this situation because it's a national epidemic. Like any other scene or any other disease, then we are expecting to receive funding. The states need funding from the federal government to be able to address this problem. So the, with the money come some uh, regulations and rules. So I'm thinking that I'm willing to get the money first because we need it in the state to be able to address the problem. I don't want too many regulations because I think that the local government need to be the one in charge and like any other state they should be able to decide but also I think that the government need to intervene to be able to help and assist with this epidemic because it's a national epidemic. Yeah I think I, I strongly agree with you. Uh, one cannot say everyone has the right to die of Ebola. We are in free country uh, now, so, so uh, of course some some intervention uh, surely uh, is uh, needed. The, the question is if we can expect uh, government to uh, simply solve the problem, or the uh, government can just administrate or manage some of the options, some of the solutions. Yeah? Uh, I don't think that uh, government is uh, the uh, only, um, only, only entity who, who can solve the problem of, of uh, child obesity because, um, in fact, the government is not uh, bringing up children. Um, so, so I think we should, we should uh, try to find solutions down there, but with support from the government. Yeah, I, Ebola is like extreme case, so of course <laughs> government should like, take care of people who are like sick or like, in this extreme cases. But food is like day to day activity, so so what? We start with taxi McDonald's more and KFC or nachos, and where we end? Well, who decides which, which, where is junk food and where is health? I think building off that. Is it the final product that's the problem? Is it the ingredients? Are we taxing and regulating sugar? Or are we taxing and regulating candy? It's a small difference between a baguette and a donut. Um, but people are generally more in favor of one than the other. So if the government's going to get involved with regulating foodstuffs, how are we going to go about this? It's an administrative nightmare. Yeah, who decides? 
So let me see if I understand correctly. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me see if, I, if I'm hearing correctly. Um, Marianne, you were, you were saying that you don't want regulations, but you want the government to do something, right? But you don't want too many regulations. Okay, and you uh, agree with her? Right, that not too many regulations, but something. So the government should administer in, in some ways. Uh, and then both of you are against taxes completely, uh, and you are all for free choice, personal choice. Right? I think taxation has its place, but it also doesn't mean on freedom. Okay. I mean, you know, what, what I would like, I mean, going back to the first approach and talking about parents that are trying to make good choices in this country, though, right? So I would be in support of figuring out as a society and government being a key tool for that. To, to help people make better choices. I'm a little bit more concerned with punishing people for bad choices, so I'm kind of with you with that, right? Um, but say, for example, I, I think all schools should have apples and for free, right? That if a kid wants to eat an apple, they can eat an apple at any time for free, you know? So how do we fund that? Now, you know, maybe one way of funding it is, is, is taxing some really bad, you know, taxing ice cream. You know ice cream's kind of bad for you, right? So, hey, if, if we charge an extra quarter for everything of ice cream, and then because of that, we can have free apples at all public schools, you know. So I would like to focus on how do we kind of provide obvious healthy food for cheaper, right, or for free for kids. Um, but I don't want to tax junk food and then the government gets extra money and gets to spend it at whatever they want, right? Yeah. <laughs> My goal is more let's make healthy food cheaper um, and by figuring out some way of funding that and maybe taxing some food, junk food would be a way to fund that. But to keep the focus on how to make it easier to make good choices versus necessarily punishing bad choices. But I would say that the, uh, we all, uh, in our, we all pay our taxes and uh, we, we um, support with them uh, the producers of uh, organic good taxes uh, together to the system of, of public subsidies. Uh, so I don't, uh, I think the money are in the system, we just uh, make to the way they are being spent. We, we simply may um, exclude in some part uh, the food producers who will produce uh, uh, products for, for, uh, for fast food industry, let's say, um, whereas give more support on the cost of, uh, of the first one uh, to those who produce organic. It is, uh, it is uh, a role of, of the government to administrate those kinds of But you know, like you said, the administration is kind of crazy. So I mean, I know there, there's so much debate about what gets to count as organic. You know, when can you put the label of organic on your food and those type of things? Oh, yeah. I don't think so. that it's, it's about putting a, a label. We, we both know that uh, when uh, a small piece of, of uh, snack contains enough calories for the whole day for a uh, child, then uh, we know that it's not healthy uh, to eat it. And, and I think we, we don't have to say that uh, when it's organic, it, has to, it doesn't have to have anything to do with, with any chemistry or, or, or anything like that. I, 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 I don't think that we should uh, try to develop a definition of what is organic. So, so let me throw something. Let me throw something out there. Uh, so we're willing, am I hearing that we're, you're willing to pay more for organic food, but not more for candy? Because no, I think I, I was saying that's the opposite. You're willing to pay more for candy? Um, I, I, I support subsidies for I, I Well, I think we are all supporting subsidies uh, even at the moment. Um, so, so the problem is that uh, we should just uh, change uh, the way in which the money which uh, the government already takes from us uh, is being spent. So, no more taxes. Simply more effective, uh, more effective spending. Okay, Maria, you get the last word. Okay, I think there is also other ways the government can help. Like there is a movement through the USDA for urban gardening, where there is and and this is going because of the food deserts that we have in the cities, and we know that mainly poor people 
they don't have access to grocery stores and now there is so much space that can be used for cultivating good food and we are not doing that and I was really amazed I have an opportunity to go to Spain and I just was amazed to see that people go to the garden to get the food that they going to prepare for that day and here when I came I started thinking about my own situation how I keep grass I don't eat grass <laughs> I pay for the grass and I keep my grass and then I'm thinking we pay to fertilize the grass and then we exactly. get to cut the grass so, <laughs> you should buy a little goat yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, this is one thing that even now I'm working really strongly for um, uh, initiatives such as that. Even here at the university, we have an initiative that has to do with uh, sustainability and a garden, also thinking about solving problems in our community. And I, I see the role of the government putting money in initiatives such as this one because it's changing behavior of the community overall and addressing specific problems that we have because food desert are problems in our community. No having access to fresh food, we cannot expect that poor people, especially poor people, will have, will eat healthy food. Okay, let's stop there. Yeah. Oh, that's good. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just couldn't remember. I forgot the pitch that I had on the different things. Yeah. <laughs> so I couldn't remember. That's the right. Me too. You But I've done. I mean, I've done. We with Paul, we did um, fifteen films, and they were not exactly all oh, basic anthropologists, the exact model, right? Mm -hmm. So then we changed that a little bit, but we still did at least for two and a half. We did this type of the three approaches. Okay. So then it was a while ago, but. Yeah, you did. A, I mean, I really like the summaries that you were doing, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I mean, even kind of thinking about you know, does that become another the, the basic moves, right? Do I go to six in a sense of just that internal summary, right? Okay, so what we're hearing so far, you know, but just kind of going through yeah, because there's really a lot of power. Yeah, 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 there's a lot of power to, yeah. to, to, to not only you know people yeah. feeling heard, right, but then also with that you're identifying some tensions and, and you're able to frame things in more succinct ways that that can often only. I mean, essentially, it's a paraphrase, right? I mean, you just group paraphrase. But right? it was necessary because I was losing. Yeah. yeah, but that was also from the forums because yeah. I do that in class as well. Um, I just find if too many people talk to me, yeah. then I really do. I really don't remember. So yeah. I'm like, yeah. oh my god. Yeah. Uh, so then that when I asked to, I really thought it was the other way. It wasn't like I heard you the way you thought that you said it. Yeah. I actually yeah, that was a great that. example of a so, paraphrase, but it was an open-ended paraphrase that made it easy for you to say, no, actually, that was the opposite, yeah. right? <laughs> you know, that's what you want. You want people but to be able to say, no, yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's not what it is. Right? Yeah. 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 And sometimes you're, I mean, sometimes you're using paraphrases because you don't know, right? They're just yeah. kind of talking, and you're like, okay, so what I'm hearing, you know, <laughs> so you're throwing something out. They're like, that's not what I meant at all, and that's a very useful paraphrase. Yeah, I thought, right? I thought, you know? first I thought that she was pushing me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Another interesting thing, yeah, so another way to think about the internal summaries, and the, the, the Caner book that I mentioned, the, the facilitator's guy, which has a grown zone, and a very useful book. So if facilitation seems to be interesting to you, it's pretty cheap. It's like $25. It's a really great book to step on your shelf. Uh, but it, it has several kind of additional kind of facilitator moves, uh, and one of them is tracking, right? So essentially, with tracking, I did tracking the very first one. Remember when you when you said two? This was yesterday, right? When you when you uh, I forgot what it was now, but it, but you had two points, right? So I said, okay, hold on, there's two things there, right? So I acknowledged those two things, but then I said, let's talk about the first one, and then went back, right? So that's what happens often where you do a summary. It's like, okay, we're having three conversations at a time now, right? And you recognize as a facilitator, all three conversations are pretty good. But we can't have all three conversations. Together. So then you do a summary. Okay, what I'm hearing is this, this, and this. You're going to check it out. Okay, so let's, let's take the first one first, right? But, you know, so you're kind of identifying there's three conversations. Let's take one at a time. One of the facilitator moves that we do sometimes, and we actually do this as a process because we have a table. Let's say if we're doing this, this kind of stuff, um, uh, especially if you have a dominator and that kind of stuff, uh, you have 12 minutes to talk about this response. If you just ask, so what do you all think? You don't know how many you're going to get, right? And whoever talks first, really is going to set the conversation probably for the first six or seven, you know, for, for quite a while. So a lot of times what we'll do is we'll say, all right, so you know, let's get some responses to this. Let's go around first. 
just a quick hitter off the top of your head. You know, what's one reaction you have, right, to this, right? So you go through, and then we actually write it. We have like a big piece of paper or easel paper or often folded or an 11, the tabloid paper, 11 by 17 that sometimes copiers have, right? So we use like a Sharpie so that you can write big and then you just write, right? So now I've got eight topics that I always have a menu, right? Then we can say, okay, we got 12 minutes. Which of these do we want to talk about, right? But then now you're not just allowing the first person to speak to kind of set the agenda. You have everyone's agenda. As a facilitator, you can kind of say, you know, and so it lets everyone kind of speak and people respond to that. Then what we often do is, is you know, we do this for a brainstorm as well. So like the back end, like what idea, you know, from this whole conversation, let's go around, like well, what's one idea that you heard today that you really like, right? So we get all 10 of them and then we say, let's talk about these, which, why do you like these and kind of pros and cons? And then we can give everyone dots, give you three dots at the end and say, hey, of these eight ideas, which ones kind of, you know, you, know, you, you support the most? Um, and and it, again, with the cycle, the reporting is the last part, right? That's great information for me. Because now from 15 tables, I have a list of eight ideas from all 15 tables with dots to tell me the kind of the, the, the how much people support it, kind of using a priority. Um, so that's another way of kind of doing, you, you start with tracking. Hey, let, let's get eight ideas first on the table. And then that is, you know, you probably don't have time to go through all eight. Right? If you have 15 minutes, okay, I can do all eight in two minutes each, right? Or maybe we can do two or three in five minutes each. But then you're, you're not just letting the first person to, to talk dictate the agenda. You have a full set of agenda. Yeah. One other thing that you did, I think it's worth talking about. So the, the pushback, I try to kind of write how you did it. But the uh, So they were both saying tax is bad, right? Yeah. Uh, so the libertarians over here. Uh, and you said, well, you know, so should government have to kind of pay for your Medicare? Contact, yeah, right? that's what, that was my question. <laughs> yeah, so it's a good question. And I want that. That's a good example of a paradox splitting, right? They're saying, hey, no taxes whatsoever. And you saw the other side of the tension. Okay, if we don't, if we say people can make their own choices, but then government is having to deal with those choices afterward, right? Um, I don't know if it's a problem, right? So let's just talk about it. But the way she did it, right, I got the impression that that was your opinion. Right? So, so it was more you as a participant saying, yeah, but if we do that, you know. So I think as a facilitator, you wanted to bring up that tension. You just need to frame it as, you know, something like, well, I imagine some people would argue that. Yes, you have your own choices, but then government is eventually going to have to pay those choices. So how do you respond to that? You know, so that you're doing the same thing yeah. without making it seem like it was I, your opinion. And that's why I was hesitant at the end. <laughs> yeah. I thought that was going too strong. Right. No, but that's a great example of exactly what I'm saying <laughs> is we want you to make some mistakes as we talk about but it. Right? It, wasn't so it, was, so, it wasn't so much that that is my opinion. Yeah. It was just that I wanted it. Yeah. To contrast, right? No, I mean, I, I think what you did point. was important. You identified attention and, and, and got us to respond to that attention, right? But yeah. It was more of how you did it. I don't know how y'all felt. Did you feel it was her opinion? You know, yeah. yeah. And part of it was the emotion of it and things like that, right? <laughs> but it seemed like he was a facilitator pushing back on them. So if I was them, you know, I imagine y'all were role playing somewhat, right? Um, but if I was them, I'd be like, oh, great, facilitators get, you know, and then I'm, I'm probably not going to talk about it. Facilitator just got mad. Right. right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So how do you phrase it to help the group? Yeah. kind of deal with that tent. You know, and there's some ways of, you know, so one way to do it, which would be even more impartial, right, would be <coughs> reactions to that. What do y'all, you know, and, and see if someone else gives that other side, right? Because it'd be much better for another participant to say, yeah, but, you know, uh, but if someone does it, then the next kind of level is you kind of introducing it, but you want to introduce it so it doesn't seem like it's your opinion. It's you yeah. as a facilitator wanting to kind of... That's, that's true, but, yeah. but I did feel that, that I role playing, you know, was also being kind of adversarial, you know, kind of very, but of course I don't have to highlight that because it's not supposed to be adversarial. But, I mean, it was very good, but I do feel that that it did include stress for me because I thought, oh my gosh, this person's going to just have a fit and blow up. And I mean, if it had been a real, you know, in a group, it would be like the person who could get mad. Yeah. You know, so, but no, that's good. No, and you're going to have those people. And that goes back to when I talked about adversarial expert and deliberative, right? I mean, deliberative is designed to bring out the best in adversarial experts, right? So, so you know, having someone feeling very strongly that all taxes are bad is something to work with, right? And you can, you know, and you can support it in some ways. Okay, I understand where you're coming from. Okay, so, if you feel that they're not being heard, you do some facilitator moves to make sure you know, but then also kind of push back in a sense, right? Would it be all right to simply ask Eva or myself? Would you like to pay taxes for the health care of those people, for example? Yeah, that might be a little too strategic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
uh, you know, so, I mean, I think that's, and, and part of this goes back to the cycle, right? So a lot of our events, <laughs> we've done them before, right? So that my students, in a lot of our events, we do surveys beforehand. Right? So then that always gives an out for the facilitator to say, yeah, yeah, so we've heard that argument before. One of the responses that we get in the survey often, though, is government's going to end up paying for, for their health care costs, right? So how do we respond? Yeah. So then that way, you're kind of, you're sourcing it differently, right? What you don't want is the source to be your opinion, right? Yeah. So sometimes it is your opinion, but just source it elsewhere, right? Because sometimes your opinion does add, you know, a, a Brings the counter, and it's an important part to making a better conversation. Right? You just don't want it to make it seem like um, it's your opinion, because then that that's going to silence people, and that changes the dynamic, changes your role. Sure. So that, that's where you know the students even sometimes like Dr. Carson in class kind of explained that that one of the tensions comes up is this, right? Um, and so then you're introducing that way, especially if I've done a good job at the beginning of the, the beginning of the process to talk about one of the things that we're going to do is we're looking for tension. You know, there's some tough choices here that we need to talk about. So the students might bring those up, right? So then it's easier for, okay, yeah, we understand that perspective, but it's not the government's job to be ritualistic and tell us how to behave, right? But if those choices are impacting government down the line, to what degree does it make sense for government to play more of a limited role, right? Um, and then all of a sudden you're having a better conversation. I think I also made another mistake, and it's because I forgot I was a facilitator. <laughs> <laughs> for a minute, because when you said, a donut and a baguette, and I was like, oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> the funniest thing. Yeah. But it, you know, if it had been a real facility, you know, facilitated group, obviously I would not, it would not have been for me to die. <laughs> okay, so, then, because you might have been really serious, like this. <laughs> so. Yeah, but then, okay. as she, it, rephrase what and ask the question the question will go back to them or to the group either way oh, okay. yeah okay. yeah so she could have you know with that tension she kind of pushed back and say well and, or or she can open to the group mm -hmm. uh, and you notice me doing that a few times right that i would start asking a question to the person but then i would kind of back up or anyone else can answer this right um and a lot of times you do have to um <coughs> The phrase probing question, probing question, it kind of sounds pretty evasive, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you, you want to, you know, you got to watch not verbal. So sometimes someone's saying something and you decide to ask a probing question, but then ask her, as you're asking the probing question, you can tell that they're taking it back or they feel that they're kind of cornered or whatever. And that's what I often kind of you know, open it up, you know. So, so sometimes you transition a probing question to a reaction question based on uh, how the person's reacting, right? If they feel that they're being attacked or being pushed back. Then you just open it up because you just wanted to explore the tension. You're not trying to get them. You're not trying to tell them they're wrong, right? Um, I mean, you are kind of in some ways saying you're only seeing one side of this, right? But but you want the group to explore the different sides of it versus kind of attacking that person for having a narrow opinion. Right? So, you know, having a narrow opinion is very natural. That's how our brains work, right? We want to have narrow opinions. Um, you know, so you have to be very careful in that sense that you don't want to feel like you're putting people on the spot. Sometimes. And I like all the. Three ways of facilitating these discussions, but one thing I noticed is that uh, <laughs> Alexander yep. is uh, not. Uh, <laughs> yeah, which way? The way you did it. That's what I missed because yeah. no, no one said, uh, let's uh, hear people yeah. who did not uh, mm -hmm. spoke. And, uh, I, I don't know if it, it, it was your first uh, yeah. scientist. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Yeah, but this is what I missed. That that uh, not uh, um, one of you uh, noticed that yeah. there there is a person who. Yeah. And, 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 as, uh, and this is funny the... because as a participant, I also wanted to hear her <laughs> opinion, yeah. but I didn't feel this is my task to encourage her. Yeah. And part of that is a function of switching facilitators every time, right? Yeah. You know, and part of it is for you know. That's when your first time you facilitated with that. You know, when, when you have a table and you're the facilitator doing all three approaches, you notice much more often, like, wow, she hasn't spoken yet, right? But when you're doing it 10 minutes at a time where we're switching each time and you're thinking, okay, now I'm facilitating and everyone's like looking at how I facilitate, you know. Um, so a, a part of it's a function of training in a way, right? Um, but I, but I, know, I mean, I noticed, I just, every, there were so many other opinions yeah. and they were coming quickly. That I thought I don't have to comment her, and if she doesn't win, because from you I get the feeling that if somebody's not speaking, you're not supposed to comment them. Yeah, I mean, because it, they don't want you to comment. But it, 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 I mean, I, I don't. I, we, I tend to tell my students don't specifically call people. I'm not saying I'm right, right? I mean, yeah, I think yeah. it's 
you know, I, so we prefer more than maybe we can hear from someone we haven't heard from yet. But I think everyone kind of talked to the other thing. So if we did, maybe we could, everyone would turn to you. <laughs> like, so what we haven't heard from yet. <laughs> so, maybe she's like, like the bar lady. <laughs> but if our, if some people are shy. I think this is the task of the facilitator to help yeah. them. May, may I like one? Your suggestion on asking, how do you feel about yeah. it? Show me uh, how do you say that in like, uh, kind of a quick poll kind of uh -huh, thing? Yeah. Exactly. And you can I do think, thumbs up, thumbs uh -huh. down, thumbs sideways is a quicker one. I, I like you know, from one to five because it gives one you a little bit more variety than thumbs up, thumbs down, right? <laughs> Because um, if someone's a five, then you really kind of, and, and, and a lot of times I've asked, I have no idea what the answer's going to be when I ask that question, right? So I've got to think, so it's a very useful tool. I use it in the classroom all the time. I see where people are. Right? But. And I have another scene. So the way we did it yesterday was around the table, mm -hmm. and the way we're doing it here is no. in the circle. No. I, I think it's really better to do it in the circle oh, yeah. because uh, the, yesterday yeah, the only reason we did it yesterday because i'm assuming you are taking notes so as a workshop i want to go oh, to be able to you know see. this is how we would normally do it we might actually have a table we'd have one there a round table i mean i've actually <clears throat> venues become important for my community stuff right i've actually rented round tables and brought them to venues oh because gosh. the venues only had square tables mm -hmm. right um, <laughs> because i think the round table you know the round table that fits eight to ten people is, is a key tool for my job anyway. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes we do this, but we, we incorporate writing so much mm -hmm. that we want, again, for the introverts or whatever we want, you know, so we have worksheets, and then if, if we don't have tables, then I actually have like 70 clipboards. So sometimes we have clipboards. Mm -hmm. If we just can, you know, if we can't get the round tables, we're just gonna do new circle of chairs. But yeah, I mean, being around the outside is certainly gonna close off conversation lots of ways. Mm -hmm. That's why I did it this way, depends so you can actually see how See when only have round tables. You don't have to bring it in. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but you know, when, when someone But then there's parking. When someone doesn't talk, is it that they don't feel comfortable you know there's there's good reasons to not talk and there's bad reasons to not you know. Is it that they, they really want to talk but they don't they they, they would never got a chance to jump in, right? You know, so at the end of it they felt like, Oh man, I never got to actually talk, right? So then certainly that feels facilitary to make room for them. Uh, but sometimes, you know, some people decide to want to listen, right? <laughs> but sometimes that I don't want to listen is more of I don't I'm not an expert on this topic, so I don't want to talk. Well, everyone's an expert at, at some level at this topic, right? <laughs> right. So I don't want to, you know. So there's, I think we're still trying to figure out the best way to, to do that in the sense of, of making room. Um, and, and there's ways of calling on people without, you know, making them feel bad if they don't want to talk, right? It's like, do you, you know, we have another thing. Do you want to jump in here? But make it really easy for them to do. Oh, fine. Right? And then you just kind of move on. Right? Um, but I would never want to put someone on the spot and say, why haven't you talked? You know, I need you to talk now. Right? Well, I have been very lucky because the, the topic that we have chosen, those are really things <laughs> <laughs> that I feel very strong about. And I have done some research. And then uh, it's really good for me to talk. <laughs> so, were you just doing an experiment to see if anyone would ask you to talk, or, or are you more of an introvert, so you're waiting to get a chance, or scared? Uh, I think it was lazy. Alright, <laughs> 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 so let's go ahead and take a break. Uh, um, then we'll... Just so you know, I think the food's supposed to be here at 11, like the next right. round of food. So we'll have right. like a buffet today. Like lots of choices. Okay. Yeah. Right. Uh, yes, yeah. at least a little. So little how, oh, how long is this? Um, break? Well, it's, it's fine. Fine. I'll, I'll say yeah. 10 because let the, mm -hmm. yesterday the break's been a little longer. But we'll, we'll get started again at 10.15. So what, a 13 minute break? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry, 11 minutes. 11 minutes. Yeah, so 13 minutes. So this is not a lunch break. Um, well, but we've had lunch scheduled at 11.30, which is, okay. so I don't know when they'll get here, but last time they yeah. got here a half an hour early okay. from what I told them. So okay. I think I've got the coffee. So that's a few times. So I've got two new things to pass out. One is, and I, I printed this on 11 by 17, that gives us a little bit more room, actually. Uh, but uh, I'll also send you this worksheet, so if you want the worksheet, it also fits fine um, on an 8 by 11. So this is a polarity management worksheet that I've used as an exercise that, that will work well as a classroom exercise. And then this is just another handout with a few of the just, some new slides I'm doing this morning. 
Uh, again, not every slide, but it kind of captures the key slides. And I'll send all my PowerPoints so you have all the slides you need. So we've talked a lot already. A lot of the work on deliberation, a lot of the work on wicked problems is recognizing that most problems have kind of, again, competing underlying values and paradoxes or tension uh, kind of underneath them. Um, I've been doing that work for a long time. In just the last two years, there's been some nice publications come out about NIF forums saying, they talk about trade-offs as a key part of it, but then when you actually watch transcripts, people aren't doing much with those trade-offs, right? Or there's often just a recognition that it would agree to disagree, but not to what degree if you actually work through it. So I've been spending a lot of time the last year or so trying to kind of find out, okay, how do we actually make sure we do that, right? Uh, and it goes back to what I talked about, the delivery facilitator me getting my students to be more and more active facilitators, because again, we weren't doing it naturally. Even if you recognize the tension, People tend to just recognize it and then say we need a balance and kind of end it there versus struggle with what does that balance mean and what type of thing. Right? So this is some new material I've been developing to really try to dig deep into it. And part of one way to dig deep into it is we've been doing this polarity management stuff and just explicitly saying, you know what, this meeting's all about this specific polarity. Right? Uh, it started with the, the I mentioned the superintendent cert. That was the first time. I did that survey, and it was so clear there was this tension between a strong leader and a collaborator that I knew what the meeting had to be about that. Right? Well, not the whole meeting, but we had a two-hour public forum. About a 45-minute 45, 45 session was specifically, let's just engage that one specific tension. Right? Um, not long after that, I helped my local church, First Presbyterian Church in Fort Collins, that was dealing with gay ordination issues. Right? It was a pretty conservative church. Its national denomination had kind of liberalized, and we're kind of changing rules, making it uh, you know, more kind of pro-gay friendly in a sense. A lot of the local, at least the leadership, was very nervous about that. So they kind of initiated a move to, to leave the denomination. Leaving the denomination, the denomination owned the church. So they left the denomination, they would have had to come up with $10 million to buy the church. Right? Half the congregation thought that was completely ridiculous, and half the congregation supported it. So this, this church was blowing up. Right? So we did this process. We actually did a polarity management process between truth and grace, right? In, in terms of kind of a Christian perspective, if you have me Christian. Uh, it worked within that. It's very hard to do deliberation across religious perspectives, right? Uh, but within one religious perspective, you know, it was this clear tension that some people say, Bible is wrong, says it's wrong, it's wrong. The Bible says we shouldn't judge people and it's about grace, about loving people wherever they are, right? So people were coming from different perspectives, right? Um, we end up doing this, working with the local food clusters, an organization that really kind of trying to advance local food and, and urban gardening and those type of things, right? So initially it was this like local group, but then they ended up getting a grant and had to become a 501c3 and things like that. So this was this whole grassroots movement. There's a grassroots movement that now needed some leadership, right? Uh, but it was very anti-leadership in a way because it's all these individual things. So we did a polarity management thing about, you know, what are the advantages of a top-down you know, kind of a leader, strong leader versus a bottom-up kind of collaborator. So we've used this kind of format in lots of different ways, right? Uh, so I'm going to kind of talk through it, how to do it, and then, and then I think we, I don't know if as a group or maybe even just as smaller groups, kind of pick at least one tension to kind of play it out a little bit, right, to think through, to, to complete this worksheet. Uh, but this is a really good class experience. So we start... I talked earlier when we did the five basic American values, you know, there's this tension between freedom and security, right? Uh, and typically, the way conversations go, again, my, my life for a long time was analyzing public discourse as it was and talking about how bad it was. Right? And one of the things I often saw was people were picking one value and basing it off that, right? So this tension between freedom and security, say we're dealing with terrorism or, or things like that. You know, some people said, ooh, I'm all about freedom, and the other side's anti-freedom. Right? If you're against me, it means you hate freedom. Again, no one really hates freedom. Right? Or on the flip side, if you're all about security, then you just assume the other side is anti-security. The other side is for the terrorists or whatever. Right? Uh, so that's a very uh, divided conversation. Right? Um, so one simple thing is like by, by recognizing the tension and putting in tension with each other, you, know, you recognize that you know, for some people, you know, freedom and security are in tension with each other, so it's more of a continuum. And just by flipping it and putting it on a continuum, you change the conversation, right? Because most people will agree that both freedom and security are good things, right? So very few people would be on the edges, right? There's very few people that say, no, we should have complete freedom and security doesn't matter, right? Every person for themselves. No one's really there, right? And no one's really going to say we're going to have all security but no freedom, right? So by just kind of introducing the tension, you automatically put people in conversation with each other, right? The, the people that are on the freedom side or the security side, instead of being opposites, right, they are now both somewhere in the middle, right? And if someone's here and someone's here, you can have a conversation. 
right? The conversation, beca uh, the conversation becomes, yeah, yeah. Freedom and security are both important. I think freedom is more important than security. You think security is more important than freedom, but there's a basis for conversation there, right? Versus I'm for freedom and I think you hate freedom, right? Uh, and, and which, again, is how our minds normally work. So this comes out, I mentioned this briefly yesterday. I think I actually have these slides in the original slide package. Uh, but Aristotle, um, who, you know, 2,000 years ago figured this out, right? He defined virtue as a mean between two vices, uh, one vice which depends on excess and one depends on defect. Virtue both finds and chooses, which is intermediate, right? So he talked about, the best example is courage. It's very hard to say courage is X. Courage means this. Because courage is situational, right? And, and, and the, the, uh, the extremes, you know, recklessness we know is bad, and cowardice we know is bad. And courage is kind of the ideal mean between it. And by ideal mean, it doesn't necessarily mean the middle, right? Uh, ideal mean in a certain situation, you know, maybe it, it, in some cases it's best to run, right? You're completely outnumbered, you know, so it might look like cowardice, but, you know, courage in that case is actually leaving, right? And in some cases, even though you know you're going to lose, it's probably best to kind of stand your ground, right? So it's kind of a situation where the conversation becomes, you know, where along this line is the ideal in that situation? You know? So when I'm talking about dealing with tensions, often that's what you're trying to do, okay? And, and, the easy thing is to say, oh, we just need balance, right? Uh, the conversation we need to have is, what does balance mean, right? Is balance middle ground? Is balance, you know, where is it in there? And that becomes a negotiation. And that, like I talked about, you know, strong, a strong democratic community is about a constant conversation. The constant conversation is, where is that ideal meaning? Where is the balance between these things, right? Uh, and you see what I talked about yesterday, justice. Aristotle talked about justice is actually the ideal mean between getting more than your view or getting less than your view, right? Justice is a tension in itself. Yeah. So within that context, I ran into this polarity management. And if you're interested in this, I think I put it on your on your uh, your slides. There's a book from Barry Johnson called Polarity Management. But if you just Google polarity management, you'll find some interesting stuff out there. It's actually a business management concept. Barry Johnson in particular, and there's another one, Robert Quinn's work on competing values framework. Um, both of them were management people that started studying management theories and all these kind of hot theories would come out that the manager needs to be a collaborator, the manager needs a strong leader, you know, all these kind of things. And they realized at, over 30 years, there was all these hot concepts that would become bestsellers, but, but then kind of die off, right? And the reason for that is they say the heart of good management, right, is managing tensions, right? That you don't want to just be a, a really good employee, you know, like love your employees and be nice to your employees, right? Uh, but if you're being a really tough boss, then becoming nice to your employees is going to make a difference because you're kind of negotiating that tension. Mm -hmm. So they put all these, Robert Quinn's work in particular, part of it, puts all these management theories in context with each other and say management is all about managing tensions, short-term versus long-term, being employee-oriented versus being kind of hard-headed, uh, focusing on doing one thing really well, focusing on being very broad and doing lots of different things, focusing on being innovative versus focusing on you know, your core business. Those are all tensions. But none of them are a right answer, and the extremes are bad. Right? Uh, so this is one example. This kind of, you know, you can think about this in terms of teaching or think about it in terms of your boss, right? Uh, so it's, you know, to what degree do you like clear directions and clear guidelines? So imagine a situation, uh, I just got a new job, right? and I come home the first day to my wife and say, oh man, this is such a nice job. My job, my boss just is, I exactly know what I'm supposed to do. Clear directions, I know exactly what I'm doing, gives me great feedback, oh, it's a wonderful job. Right? Over time, that you know, clear directions and clear guidelines tends to slide down, right? <laughs> and that same boss that seems so wonderful, right, now seems rigid and impractical, right? I come home after work say, my goodness, they don't let me think for myself, right? I mean, just exactly, I have to do everything in his way all the time, it's just crazy, right? So finally I quit my job, and I go work for a friend of mine, because a friend of mine is very flexible, listens to reason, right? And, and that seems to solve my problem, right? The, my problem became my boss is rigid, to solve my problem, I go to a flexible boss. I come home the first day of work. Oh, it's so nice. My job. Oh, I just get to you know, think for myself and do my own thing. You know, it gives me some sense of what he wants, but I can do it my own way. It's so wonderful. Over time, <laughs> that flexibility tends to kind of slide down to this. Right? I come home and say, oh, my goodness gracious. He has no clue. I have no idea what I'm supposed to do. I don't know how I'm getting evaluated. Right? It's just ridiculous. He never gives me a straight answer to anything. Right? 
And so that becomes a problem, right? So I quit my job, right? And I go back and I find a job who give you know a boss who gives me clear direction. And I come home and I tell my wife, oh, my new boss, she's so wonderful, you know, and vice versa. So this figure eight is a typical way. And, and, and what Barry Johnson talks about is that's when we misdiagnose managing a polarity as a problem, right? We see rigidity and impracticality as a problem, so we solve it by going to its opposite, right? But the problem is, you know, you can't have someone who gives you clear directions and clear guidelines without also having someone who's going to be somewhat rigid and impractical, right? And you can't have someone who's flexible and listens to reason without also having someone who's going to be ambiguous and gives you lack of direction, right? Uh, so what we, what we do with these kind of things is, is often we, we've, we've pre-identified the tension based on public discourse or a survey or whatever, so then we, you know, we, I explain, I do exactly what I just did, kind of using this example, and then we identify the tension, uh, and we have people kind of work through that tension, right? Uh, so here's an example of one that we actually did with K-12 teachers, with, with secondary school teachers, right? Between, I've mentioned it a couple times, between consistency and flexibility, right? Um, consistency is, is typically a good term, right? If someone says someone's consistent, that's normally a, a, a compliment, right? Can anyone think of an, an, an insult that basically means consistency? That someone is consistent? They're dogmatic, right? Or they're close-minded. You know? That line between good consistency and bad consistency it is, is pretty great. And just like the same thing, the line between good flexibility and bad flexibility, right? Uh, so what we do, and you see in the worksheet, uh, we give them a, a, a a worksheet that has the case for blank, the case for blank, and then when blank dominates blank too much, right? So these words were brainstormed during our group, right? And what I normally do, if I'm doing this as a public process, is I hand out these worksheets to every participant. I give them five minutes to brain up on their own. I try to put at least one or two statements in every single one of those boxes, right? Then the table shares their boxes with the whole table, so then my students filling it out for the table. And then if we have time, then we report out, so as a whole group of 100, we kind of have one big one, right? But the simple idea is, you know, make the case for consistency. When consistency, when we focus on consistency and it goes well, what happens? Right? What are some of the words that connect? What are some of the results that we have? Base, best case scenario, right? Uh, so, so the group kind of fills this out. And particularly with K-12, consistency is important for measurement, right? People that like data, we need everyone doing the same thing so that data is, is rigorous and, and valuable, right? Um, and, and that makes the case for kind of top down, right? We need every school to do science the same way so we can kind of see what schools are doing it better and those type of things, right? So all these words are, are good, tradition and fairness and reliability and measures and standards. And then we do the same thing, okay, when flexibility goes well, when we provide people flexibility and it, and it works wonderful, what happens, right? And they fill out all those words. Then we make them fill out the bottom. What happens when we focus too much on consistency? Right? And, and, you know, they fill out all these bad words about that and kind of same thing there. And, and the power of change, I mean, you're essentially changing the polarity, right? As they come into the meeting, if I pick a good tension, there are some people that are all about consistency, right? And this is how they think, right? The consistency people see all the wonderful things about consistency and all the horrible things about flexibility, right? And the flexibility people are the opposite. So they can't talk to each other. They can't understand. How could anyone think testing is a good idea? Right? But then when we sit them down and as a group give them the assignment to fill out one of these worksheets, right? everyone pretty much agrees these are good things and everyone pretty much agrees these are bad things. Right? At the beginning of the meeting, it's this side against this side. At the end of the meeting, it's we all want the top and we all want to avoid the bottom. You've changed the conversation. At the beginning of the meeting, we're oppositional. right? At the end of the meeting, we're side by side saying, okay, this is what we want. We want to avoid this stuff, and we want to get this stuff, right? Um, so then, now, so now, now you've mapped the polarity, you've mapped the tension, right? Uh, and it creates aha moments, it creates understanding, right? Because if I'm the consistency person, now I'm like, oh, this, yeah, I'm against that stuff too. Then that's what you're focused on, right? Um, and, and, you know, so, so you're, you're creating thinking, people are, and this is, we go back to the responsibility as a facilitator, is to help people understand the kind of drawbacks of their position and the advantages of the opposing position. That's what polarity management does, right? I recognize that, yeah, I'm for consistency, but, yeah, I recognize that we focus too much on consistency, we get this bad stuff. Right? Or it goes back to Aristotle, there's a long continuum, right? Uh, 
So down here is when consistency, when well, we're on the far left end, and can, we have all consistency, no flexibility, right? This is kind of you know a fourth way through where we have consistency dominating flexibility, getting more consistent in flexibility, but not too much. Then in the middle, you know, and then, then here's where flexibility is, is, is revered a little bit more than consistency. And then here's where we're on the far right end where flexibility dominates. Right? And most people, once you kind of lay it out that way, agree that the extremes aren't good. So then the question becomes, where are we here? Right? Uh, yeah, so here's kind of what the worksheet that you have in front of you. Uh, you know, sometimes we fill it out if we know what the tension is going going in, and then sometimes it becomes a process. I did a process with a K-12 staff, with a, a staff of teachers at elementary school, and we first at, I gave a lecture about tensions and, and, and polarities, and then I said, so what are some of the polarities in your work? Uh, same thing, I had them work in their groups first. Right. Everyone write down, you know, on, on an index card, write down two or three tensions you see in your work, and they share it at their table, and then each table reported out kind of the most kind of key tension that they, they talked about. So then I, I had a list on the, I typed them up on the keypads, so we had a list of ten tensions in the room, and then we asked them to prioritize all those tensions, which are the most important, right? And they picked, you know, and they, they prioritized it with the keypads, the top three, I sent it back to the table, I said, okay, you know, do, a, do a worksheet on one of those from the top three. And again, you just could, you know, for, for bosses, it's wonderful, right? Uh, because, you know, when people are kind of polarized in a sense, you automatically kind of have this, this assumptions that you're making of where they're coming from. And it makes it so much easier when someone's complaining, like, oh, okay, that's what you're, you're, you're down here, right? But then it helps, you know, it, you, can, you can kind of change the conversation a lot, right? So here's the, step, the steps in the exercise. I think I have this on the back, right? Yeah. So it's on the back of your worksheet. You know, the first, the clarity of our attention is identified or named. Sometimes I name them beforehand. Sometimes we have a process to name them. Uh, in the groups, you rank some of the positives of each one at a time, and then make it the best possible case. Then you complete the out of balance, the bottom kind of row. Um, so sometimes if we have time, we, we, I always like to work, and this goes back to the extrovert introvert. If possible, I always like to ask people individual questions, have them write them down, then share them with the group if you have time. Uh, that you're going to get a lot more ideas and a lot more to work with in a sense. Plus, if you have everyone writing down, you can collect that, right? So then now I have all the individual uh, responses so I can see how often things come up. But then I also have the refined responses after they go through the group process. Um, the other thing that we do sometimes, we did this with schools, I think it's up here next step, is w once you kind of identify attention, so you have that continuum from complete flexibility to complete consistency and everything in between, uh, when we're working with lots of schools, we identify these 10, I'll show you in a second, 10 tensions within kind of secondary education. Uh, and then we ask them, for your school, where are you on this tension, right? Uh, from consistency to flexibility, where do you think the school should be, right? Some people might put it right in the middle, right? Perfect balance. Some might say, you know what, we need to be kind of more on the flexibility side. And some people might, you know. Uh, and then we ask them, where do you think your school is, right? So where's your personal preference of how to negotiate that tension, and how do you think that tension is currently being negotiated? Yeah. I'm just curious, when you set this meeting up, what was the purpose of the meeting? Like, why did people decide to show up? How did you sort of frame what people were going to do? That yeah, way? so I mean, the work we did, we did some work with a particular elementary school that was uh, dealing with, so they had a new, new principal come in. Uh, the old principal had been there for 20 years and, and was kind of seen as a, as a, a, as a Pro teacher, you know, letting the teachers do what they want, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but the, the score started going down, mm -hmm. right? That principal retired. They put in a new principal who was told, kind of by the by the district, to kind of shape things up and change things up and take more control, you know. Um, so there was kind of a rebellion of the teachers that weren't used to this top down leadership because mm -hmm. they were so used to before, right? Mm -hmm. So they came. They brought me in in particular to kind of talk about that tension in a way of how do we kind of balance this top down need to change things. Uh, you know, it, what's the role of you know, so principal versus the teacher? Huh? Like, top down versus you know, <laughs> improving relations. No, I mean, I, yeah, I think it was just kind of improving, improving communication across staff, okay. right? Because a lot of it was just giving them. I mean, it gave them a way of talking, right? So instead of saying, "Oh, you just you, you don't want to give teachers any flexibility," it's like, "Okay, what you're saying is all about consistency, right?" Mm -hmm. But then that also opens up for me to say, "Well, the problem is if you focus so much on consistency, you're losing." You know, so it gave them a way of talking that was was easier to talk without having to attack each other, mm -hmm. right? Um, but you know, this process. Let me kind of get to it here, and I'll, I'll pop back to this. So this, this was a bigger meeting that I did with. Um, 
the Colorado Association of School Boards. There's about 100 school board members in the room, and I just wanted to kind of give a lecture on clarity management. Uh, the, the focus of that particular conference was on technology, how much should we kind of focus on online teaching and those type of things versus face-to-face. -face. So I think we focused on that tension. Everyone completed a worksheet on this you know, face-to-face -face teaching versus online teaching. So again, when <laughs> online goes well, what happens? What's the best case scenario, right? And then when face-to-face -face goes well, and then when we focus just on face-to-face -face and don't have any online, you know, what are the negatives? And we focus too much on online and forget face-to-face, -face, right? So they all kind of completed that. And then I asked them this, where do you see it on the tension, right? So this is the answer to that room of a whole bunch of school board members, right? So a lot of them saying, we kind of need the middle balance. We need a little bit of both, right? And then we ask them, where do you see your district, right? Oh, it doesn't have a, for some reason, it normally comes up with a mean, right? <laughs> but we did this from different ones. For me, as a delivery practitioner helping this organization improve, right, if the mean score is pretty close, right, you know, if the where they think it should be where it is is pretty close, that means, okay, we're doing a good job, right? Where the mean score and where they think they should be is very different, that means we need to talk about this more, right? And it's a problem that people think it's kind of out of balance in a way. So then we start talking a little bit more on how to change that balance. Uh, so this is some mechanisms we do to kind of spark the conversation. But these are ten kind of tensions within K-12 that I've been working with the last few years, right? Uh, you see consistency versus flexibility. This is measurement standards and testing. Right? There's such an emphasis on that now, but that relies on consistency. Right? But it's that recognition that if we're going to really focus on testing, then we're going to lose some innovation and flexibility. And going back again, we'll get into this a little bit more. Just because I'm saying it's a tension, I don't I'm not implying it's a zero sum, that it's an automatic dichotomy, right? There are ways to transcend the tension. There are ways to kind of do it both, right? Can we have testing and innovation? Yeah, there's some ways to do that, right? But it is also a natural tension that the more we tend to focus on consistency, we're gonna inherently lose innovation unless we, we figure out better ways to do it, right? Uh, here's the basic for STEM versus whole child and specials that I kind of mentioned yesterday. Right. Strong leadership versus collaboration, I kind of talked about. Uh, so we kind of asked them, you know, which of these are kind of most important to you? Right. And that's kind of how they answered. Right. So that local control versus state and federal that I talked about. Right. Um, and then we had them at their tables, kind of, okay, pick one of these top three and kind of, so everyone completed a worksheet on the, on the technology one, and then people uh, identified one of their worksheets. Right. Um, yeah, and this is kind of, I asked, where do you see your district? So, Once you have it mapped out well, I think this is in the back of your worksheet as well, right? That, that yeah, the potential strategies. Right? So once you have the map, everyone's, you know, so now you've created some mutual understanding, right? We all understand this tension. People might be in very different places on how to best negotiate the tension, right? So then I offer these as kind of a way, of, okay, let's think now, how do we react to this? Right, because we don't want to just see the tension and say, we need balance, so like, what do we do? Uh, so this is the move to action in a way. So first is, you can recognize the tension, but still prefer one side while accepting the trade-off. What we don't want is people to have blinders on, right? We don't want people to say, I want flexibility, and there's no problem, flexibility is wonderful, right? So sometimes you might say, yeah, I recognize, well, going back to the superintendent search, I recognize we can't have a strong leader and a collaborator, right? But you know what, with the, with the situation that our district is facing right now, we need a strong leader, right? We need some changes, we need some changes quick, right? You know, collaboration is, is wonderful, but it takes too much time. Uh, so with this tension between strong leader and collaborator, I'm going to lead a strong leader, but I recognize we're losing something with that, right? So that's the prefer. Once you recognize the tension, sometimes you're saying, because of our situation, that might be temporary. You might say, you know what, for now, we need a strong leader, right? We need to revisit this, right, um, and, and come back kind of a little later on, right? Or you might recognize the tension and seek balance. This is kind of the Aristotelian, right? Yeah, we need to find that perfect middle ground between strong leader and, and um, collaborator. Or you might recognize the tension and seek to transcend or integrate. Right? We, we have some of that today, right? That we, we can do science and gardening at the same time, right? We can read about science, right? We don't have to make those choices, right? Um, you know, yeah, we're not making a choice between math and, and music. You no, know, math is, is critical to music, right? So we can kind of teach math and music at the same time. But, but we tend not to do that innovation and transcending unless we're talking about that, right? Often we have the blinders on, we're only seeing one side, you don't have to transcend. Right? But once you recognize this is the inherent tension, that's when you can spark that creativity. Right? How can we have the best of both worlds? Right? And I'm doing another little bit of work trying to do a typology of tensions. Right? So some tensions do seem to be natural opponents. Right? That transcendent is hard. It's kind of one or the other. But there's a lot of other tensions that I'm kind of more calling resource tensions. 
right? So like the uh, one of the tensions I had on there was between uh, um, dealing with the achievement gap. You know, in the United States, low income and minority groups kind of tend to score badly and go to college less than their dads. So there's a lot of focus on achievement gaps and helping kids catch up. And then there's a lot of focus on gifted and talented, right? Wendy was talking about her kids are doing gifted and talented testing today, right? Uh, so the, the tension there is the really good parents have gifted and talented kids. They're the vocal parents that show up. And, you know, uh, whereas in some ways the schools probably need to focus more on the kids falling behind with the role of the schools and kind of, you know, but there's an imbalance. So how much, now those don't automatically go against each other. It's more of a resource. How many teachers do I sign in? How much time do I sign, spend to it? But there is, seems to be a tension. Are you focusing on those falling behind? Or are you focusing on the top 10% to make sure they excel, right? Yeah, so there's different kinds of tensions. Some are easier to transcend than others. Having the gifted and talented kids working with those kids is one way. You know, that then now you're kind of seeing them more as mentors and teachers. So they're learning that skill while also helping, you know. Uh, so those the, 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 the tensions that are really kind of hard to do top down versus bottom up, it's kind of hard to transcend that tension. Right? Um, but other tensions are easier to transcend. Uh, you can recognize the tension and focusing on developing nimbleness, right? <coughs> One thing that came up, um, I think I was facilitating, so I couldn't jump into it and kind of get my opinion, but we did a lot of work with the uh, Northern Colorado Workforce Initiative. Right? And a lot of it became, how can we get the local schools, so CSU, UNC, and a community college, to be more nimble to kind of develop programs that the, the current industries need, right? The problem is higher ed moves really, really, really slow, and business moves really, really fast, right? So part of that conversation became, we need to be more nimble. Education needs to kind of figure out how to negotiate that tension better in a way, right? Uh, so this is you recognize the tension. You think about how do we kind of bounce back and forth a little bit more, right? Uh, and then last, you can recognize the tension but allow different groups to seek alternative needs. So one way schools have done this between the kind of STEM and whole child is have different schools, right? So you said you, you send your kid to a Montessori school, right? I think you said you're working with STEM schools, right? And there's art schools. And there's, you know, so then you give those options in a sense, right? So then if I want my kid to focus on kind of art and whole child, I have an option to do that, right? Mm -hmm. Or the same thing, if you have an organization that's struggling with you know, short-term versus long-term, you can say, hey, you know what? Here's a special committee that's always going to be focused on the long-term, right? They're going to meet once a week and just talk about long-term trends and big picture stuff, right? But the rest of the organization is going to focus on short-term, right? You know, so there's ways of negotiating the tension and then kind of trying to divide it up in a sense. Let's have some people focus on each and then maybe meet once a year to kind of you know, see where we are on the balance between that, right? So, uh, or, or you can disagree with attention. That's one option I always have, is I, I don't want people to say, because again, I always have this part of my head that's saying, you're creating false dichotomies, right? You're creating tension when there isn't there, right? So I always want to leave it open. And it's kind of an important point as we get into issue framing in the afternoon. All the stuff that I create for my, for my uh, meetings, for people to react to, it's always kind of a living document. It's always something to react to, right? I never, I, I specifically, I explicitly say, I got things wrong. Going back to the reaching for every tool ideal, I didn't frame this perfectly, right? I, I, I framed it to react, I framed it to spark, spark a good conversation, but I know I got some things wrong. And I always incorporate in the process chances for them to correct things. I always tell them, write, you know, write some ideas down and, and come and hand it to me if you think I got it wrong. But I'm also trying to, I, I often have like a ground rule or explain, it's like, Work with it for the day, right? especially with academics, right? Academics can tear any document apart, right? So if you open it up to criticize the document, they'll spend two hours criticizing the document and never actually talk about the issue, right? So I'm saying for the next two hours, just try to make it work as well as possible, right? If you've got problems with it, feel free to write them or email me, you know, and we're constantly adapting, constantly changing. I normally have a survey question on the survey that says, what's wrong in the background or what needs to change, you know, and that's kind of creating... Uh, somewhere where they can complain, right? So they don't necessarily complain at the table that they're actually doing the process, right? So that's why I always kind of have these safety valves, sort of, or a little safety valve, that if you think, you yeah, know, this is false, you know, like you're creating tension when it isn't there, then we give them that option to do that. Right? Uh, so I don't know if we want to, we do have food now, so why don't we take a break now and wrap the food, and then we come back. I don't know if you want to pick a tension as a group and kind of fill it out, or if we want to talk about tensions and kind of issues that you're dealing with, is or like, like when we identify the tensions, is it a specific case we have, like an example we have, or an issue we have in mind, or are we just like randomly coming up with a tension? Either way, you know, so I, I popped in somewhere in here. 
more capacity. <coughs> that really was. I put it at the very end. Okay. Uh, you know, so this was a slide from yesterday after I talked about the five American values. <coughs> Those are some tensions between American values. These are some other key tensions that I use. You know, unity versus diversity is an interesting one that I've done with several classes. But diversity is, again, such a god term in universities, right? Um, but is diversity a trump of all things, right? Is there some, some value to, to unity, right? Is there some value to, you know, uh, yeah, so we, we've done that one before. Cooperation, competition, I've talked about. We've already kind of done flexibility and consistency, um, you know, but, but then we could also just start talking through some of the issues you care about, or even with homeless, you know, and identify attention uh, that's worth doing. And one I've done really interesting with students is, and it might be harder for, for, for our Polish friends, uh, of just doing Democrat versus Republican. Because <laughs> so many people see, if you're a Democrat, you see the advantages of Democrats and the, and the worst of Republicans and vice versa. So just doing the math, hey, if we follow Republican perspectives and, and, and values and it goes well, what happens? Right? And it's amazing. I mean, you get some students that really haven't thought about that stuff before, right? Because they've been trained from the very beginning just to see the advantages of their position and the disadvantages of the other. So let's get through it and we can kind of talk about how to cover this one. Speaking of consistency, we have the same lunch, right? Yeah. <laughs> hey, you know exactly what to expect. Uh, <laughs> Didn't want to be too risky. We <laughs> can be innovative and like put the donut inside it too. Like, uh, like turkey or something. Oh. Should have let that through. And it's a good lunch, so it's got that going for it. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's too, too. I tried. <laughs> A cookie yesterday was chocolate. This one is not. <laughs> so, when the, in the what are the, the issues with the our center? Where are we? Is how many years with the center here at the university? Center for Public Immigration. Um, since 2007. Oh, okay, quite a few years. Before Flores. Um, okay. So what are the, because I never hear about this dinner now, I think when we went through a recession, and they would find um, my direct teacher more into the program, and they don't either, they don't they still don't need now. I mean, I can get outside funding, but they wouldn't recognize your value. The work. So I had to run the program I'm leaning towards flexibility. I want them to kind of teach it their way as long as they have these basic parameters. And sometimes they take advantage of it. So I had a new person teach it that one of my students was in the class, that was in my class and that class. And at some point, I'm like, well, you did that class, did you? And she's like, no. It's like, well, it's in the workbook. I'm like, yeah, he's not using the workbook. Like, I created a 125 page, their textbook, I created it. And he told the students, ah, you don't need me. Yeah, that's too much flexibility. <laughs> like, no, you, you need the workbook. Like, you need, you can't skip everything. Right. But he was teaching it like an old scholar debate class. And he wasn't teaching any of the deliberation stuff. Right. So that flexibility, the downside of flexibility is people can take advantage of it. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, we had, we still had attention, not so much in Spanish because our upper levels are having so many problems making um, that we only teach one section of those, right? But for lower levels. Uh, for for Kino One and Intermediate, we did go, finally, um, we just made it all standard because it was just too, and for 3301, which we may not need anymore, but 3301, which is one of our biggest classes, the gateway class for our, our upper levels, um, there were like seven people teaching it at one point. I was teaching it. I was requiring four essays, and everybody else is requiring three essays, and somebody was requiring two essays, and my students complained. Yeah. 
they went to the dean, they went to the chair, they complained that I was giving them too much work. Um, and so, of course, after that, we had to standardize it so that if you take my section or you take the other section, they're all the same, right? Um, so 1401 and 1402 that we have coordinated for that. Intermediate, since we only teach one section per semester of intermediate because it barely makes, um, we have the same syllabus, but we each kind of tweak it a little bit. But we all know, you know, more or less how we're going, we're going to use this semester. So it works, I mean, it, it has worked for us in, in a better way, in a sense, because then it really does create problems with students complaining. Right. So if you, if you make one suffer, they will all suffer, right? And of course, you saw it as rigor and higher standards and high expectations. Of course, they saw it as the bottom, uh, just you know. Yeah. Why are we? Why busy is she, work? And, why she became picking on us? Why? why? Why do we have to do four and the other people do two? I'm like, because right. I'm a better teacher. Why? But then <laughs> my experience is different. So. So. <laughs> We're on video. There we, go. we need a, a power outage here. So, you know, we were expected to have a syllabus that has the exact same textbook, the exact same, I mean, the exact, I mean, it wasn't just teaching to the objectives, which I actually agree with, you know. Um, and the problem was is that there was no way, no way to change when things weren't working because there was no, there was, it, it was implemented and then there was no communication process put in place for anyone managing that process for constant feedback or they were with, you know. And so, you know, so then, right, I have to use the syllabus. I have, like in my online classes, I have a 3% withdrawal rate. That is extremely low by any standard. 40% 40, 40 is the national average. I did this class at a 60% drop rate because it was so ridiculous. It didn't work in an online format, but I couldn't do anything about it. And then I was penalized on my evaluation for it not working. So, you know, that's the, that's the flip side. I mean, I don't want to comment on calm, but <laughs> I don't have to, you know, because we're in the same department, but. I have to say, Spanish met. We meet. I mean, our style of doing things is to all meet. We're five, so then we all meet and we all talk about it, and then we all decide, right? And so, yes, we weren't all happy about it. We do use the same textbooks in lower levels. We use the same textbook in intermediate um, and in 3301. But we all agreed, right? So we're kind of doing deliberation, but not really. It's just to us, it just seems like okay. I'm I'm saying my opinion, and he's we're all giving an opinion. Then we then we do something. But well, as long as you're, you're collectively deciding right. that, and, 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 and that's part of it, right? So there, there's a tension between consistency, yeah. consistency, and flexibility, right? Um, once we recognize that tension and engage that tension, it takes time to negotiate it, right? You're saying we meet, right? Yeah. We have, you know, that's that constant communication. That, that's that the quality of our communication is going to dictate the quality of our decisions in our community. That the only way we can negotiate attention is to keep talking about it, right? You can't meet once and say, boom, we're going to do it this way, right? Because then it's going to, it's not going to work for very long and it's going to be too rigid and those type of things. But you also can't say, hey, let everyone do it their own way, right? Because then you're going to lose quality and it's going to be unfair and things like that. So, you know, as a department, to deal with that tension of consistency and innovation is we have to constantly meet and talk about it and agree um, and, and, and negotiate that, right? I mean, and part of that's self-serving because I'm a communication major and I'm saying communication is critical, but, you know, and we're, I'm right. So. We don't like meeting and we have a meeting next Friday, right? But, but it's kind of like, okay, nobody likes meeting. We're all kind of annoyed about it, but we're all going to go. Yep. So, but I think for calm, calm, it's just like, <laughs> but, but I think this is going to change because now we are moving to mark classes that are high impact classes. Oh, those classes are high impact. Well, but I'm officially because now it's going to be a denomination at the university where you have to apply for having that a class marked as a high impact. So the student know in advance that this class will have more work than if they take it the same class, but it's not a high impact class. But then again, we'll see how we're going to go with that because I know a student will pick what? The high impact with more work or the, the, the 
regular class that is no high impact. So the student's gonna have a choice on, on this. And then I can see it in my department too. We I totally agree with what you she say objective has to be the same. The way how you go about the student learning in those objectives, it might be different. But I see my numbers, they are lower than the other class. But in a way, it favored me because the students who choose to come to my class, they are at the top. So in a way, I end up having better students because they know the class is very demanding and it, they self-select themselves. So it's working for me, but I, of course I don't have the same number that everybody else. But that's not really, I mean, at least that's not what I was talking about. I mean, I was talking about having different sections but everybody's teaching it differently, but it's not has nothing to do with high impact, right? It was just we had to do essays, and I did. I chose four, and somebody else chose two. We had an adjunct who gave once like a ten-page test, and he didn't tell anybody until my student came in. I saw him in the lab, and it's like, why did he give us this test? And I'm like, what is this? So that's the kind of thing that we yeah. had to deal with. Um, so we have and it's, to, and, and part of the culture, because certainly part of the culture of higher education is individualism. Right. I mean, most professors, in a sense, you, know, you were really good at books and studying, and you know, most PhD programs are very individualistic thing. Obviously, your dissertation, you know, some discipline, science is a little often more collaborative and that kind of stuff. That's one of the things that you're dealing with is most professors don't like to be told what to do. Right? We want control of our classes, um, and and often, I mean, I know I've been teaching for 12 years at CSU. I have had a fellow professor watch me teach once. I have not been evaluated at all for my teaching other than student evaluation at the end of the year. Right? Because there's such a culture, at least at CSU, uh, for, for, for tenure faculty now, for instructors. Instructors get evaluated every semester and all, you know, all this kind of stuff. So so but there's there's very there's a lot of inconsistency there. Right? In our department. I mean I divide design my class, no one checks my system, I turn in my syllabus, no one checks it, no one looks you know. That's I, have I didn't think that existed anywhere else. You know, we, we have to be evaluated. We're tenured and we have to be evaluated no. once, a year. once a year. No. I mean, I get, an, I get an annual evaluation, but it's about it's mainly about research. No, I turn in on my teaching. teaching is evaluated. No one, yeah. Yeah. I haven't had, I've had one person, my third year review, I had someone come and sit and watch my class. Yeah. That's the only time in 12 years. What wow. about a future research? So and so. Oh, you do? Uh, yes, you're at a research university. Yeah. Or research one, yeah. We don't know what we are. Right, so teaching. should I make you complete the teaching. worksheet or not? We are teaching. We are teaching that one church that wants to be with us. Who doesn't want to make the conversation? So, what is the level of university? Yeah. University of Dines. Oh, I see. So, do you have the tenure? Do you have assistant? How do you have rank? In yes, your university? Yes. You do? It's kind of similar. It's not the same. So, all four of y'all from the same institution? Yeah, different yeah. faculties. Different departments. Right. Different departments. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the greater being given to the faculty, the university, and the whole students. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, I don't know. we all are also researchers, so uh, where our work is evaluated, uh, more uh, higher impact is uh, put into our papers. Yeah. And so didactics no. is not so very important. Well, it's reduced. Well, no, it's a stick with which they can snag you if they want. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we are paying attention to your students, but when they when they want something from you, you have very very bad marks from student evaluation. <laughs> it doesn't help you, but it can hurt you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's the same thing for early research ones in a way, right? Mm -hmm. That if you're a big researcher, they care less what, what you teach, but if they want to get rid of you, you know, we're, that's, that's a problem, right? We're not, we're, at least for, again, probably different at U of H, at, at different universities, but for me, there's there's very little incentive for me to spend time teaching. Yeah. I mean, actually, well, Marty Benner, you know, when I was in PhD, oh, yeah, I, I, I got criticized by my teachers saying, yeah. you're spending too much time teaching. Because yeah. I, I hate multiple yeah. choice tests. I don't think multiple choice tests really test intelligence. Mm -hmm. So I'd be teaching a class of 90, but I would do like short answer tests and short essays and things like that, and it would take me three days to grade them. Where everyone else would take them forty five seconds. <laughs> it's graded, um, but I just didn't believe in the. In the but see, I think we have a crisis of like personality at UHD because we don't know what we are. So we're not no longer in a teaching university. 
we we'll, I think now everybody has to do research, but the thing is that we're not really a research university, but I think some people want it to be a research university. I, I like research, I just don't have time to do what I want to do. Um, do you teach four classes a semester? Uh, I teach, we teach three, four, so right now it's my four. I teach four right now. So, but I mean, yeah, okay, so if we're going to be a research university, give us the time. Give us the, the time to do the actual research and to publish. Give us some funding to go someplace, yeah, right? Give us a sabbatical for a year. We don't have sabbaticals at all. Mm -hmm. How many right. classes do you teach a year when you're back home? I think we have a similar number of hours because I, if we go in another system, a bit, but I think because I, we can't pay to one of the electrons here. Yearly, so. Yeah, it looks like we have the same number of hours, but we have the same time to do more science. Yeah. I, what I found, actually, was yeah, we have Because I, te I teach two sure. classes a semester, so I went on a 2-2. Two -two. And technically, 50% of my job is teaching, and then normally it's 35% research and 15% service. I don't know if y'all y'all do kind of a... 15, 25, 25. So 50 no. teaching, 25 research, 25 service. No, yeah. Mine is actually 25 is, service, 25 research, but that's just because of CBD, they changed mine. Yeah. But, but all, most faculty is 35, 15. But it doesn't work that way. I mean, in reality, it does not work that way it used to. Yeah. Especially if you're a, a senior professor now, and. Junior professors are being allowed to, they are being given less loads, they have to do less service, they have to, so, but somebody has to do the service, right? So, who does yeah, the we service? Don't have very good stuff. We do it, right? Because yes. we don't have enough staff at UHD, we don't have enough secretaries. Don't, so, who does that and service? Plus, if they're saying 50% of your job is teaching, but you're teaching four classes, that means you only spend 20 hours a week on four classes, right? <laughs> So that's five hours a week per class. You're actually in class for three hours, right? So you're only spending two hours outside of class prepping and grading and Oh, oh we wish. Yeah. Hey, we wish. <laughs> it doesn't add up very well. Oh, right? it doesn't. <laughs> yeah. okay. All right, we'll probably get anyway. a little tension here. No one, no one <laughs> tell <laughs> anybody. That's a thing. I feel better. <laughs> <laughs> so then we eat chocolate. <laughs> So you do have to be careful of, sense of, of using the word tension in public because people just see that tension as oh, okay. like interpersonal tension, like right? Tension. Yeah. Because <laughs> my students get used to me talking about it and then they say, so what do you see as the tensions here? Everyone was like, there's no tension. We're okay. <laughs> no. So I, I have to find better ways of saying I thought I'd like pull this up. So this is the Matthews House's uh, mission statement. Um, and I like, I mean, basically their mission statement incorporates kind of tensions, right? So the Matthews House is an organization that empowers young adults and families in transition to navigate difficulties on the road to self-sufficiency. So the goal is self-sufficiency. The goal is them to kind of do it their own, right? But the purpose of the organization is to help empower them. So it's this constant negotiation between that self-help versus outside help, right? Many of it is a little program I've been part of. Um, Oh yeah, here. So the, the mission on the bottom. Our mission is to empower young adults and families transition through lack significant support systems by providing resources and relationships necessary for them to take control of their lives and shape futures for themselves while becoming successful. You know, so it's it's incorporated in that in that, that story that the director kind of told me in the sense of they specifically talk about that notion that if I'm working harder than you, right, I'm gonna stop. Right. This is all about so it's that constant negotiation. And I know my dissertation really looked at this. You know, this, this line bef between the deserving and the undeserving poor, and this line of, of whether programs are, are actually helping people or hindering people or attracting people. Um, and, and so often the conversation on one side was focusing on one and one side the other. And the whole reason I shifted my work from criticism to practitioners is like, we need to talk about the tension between those two, and we never do. Each, each side just has their own narrative that they follow, right? Um, so that's why I get so focused on all this tension. Can we, can we Hey, take one minute break. Yeah. Because we have to arrange some stuff. Okay, yeah, go ahead. Good. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, we'll take, we'll take a little yeah. break here. Um, yeah. And yeah. Then, yeah. then we'll do the issue framing stuff. They wouldn't make the little cards. Yeah. They're going to turn it into a carpet. Uh, 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 unless we're close to 4 o'clock. Oh, yeah, yeah. Let me check. Like I was able to get out of the internet. Yeah, 
Sideways, meaning to you, but then it changes vertical. It's like, wait a second, even though I'm focused on consistency, I might call this a good sense of flexibility, too. So, yeah, it's a tension. And there's work in there about kind of talking about, Aristotle talking about this a little bit, about our need to self deliberate. I mean, we're making a decision, we're deliberating, right? We're negotiating those tensions. The problem is our mind works overtime. That, that like whenever we make a tough decision, our mind works overtime to convince ourselves of the decision, right? We rationalize all this stuff because that's kind of how our brain is working to, to overcome that tension and ignore it. Um, but we make really bad decisions when we ignore it too quickly. So, yeah. We're gonna try to get out of or. Okay. How long ago? How long ago? So what was your discipline again? It was like I said, I was the same thing that you were going to accept. One of my former students works for her, it's called the Marine Institute, it was in Colorado. Uh, but then they do a lot of ocean governance work. So I remember she started working there after master's, and then a week later she emails me and says, I'm in Paris, and uh, helping with this ocean uh, governance kind of conference, in a sense, of how we do it. But like I said, my girls are all the same. Yeah, but this is a good one. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, Governance is the same thing is that there's all our laws are national, right? And these issues don't care about borders, right? You know, but there's not, you know, the international governance is pretty weak, right? The UN or those type of things, you know, so you're negotiating that tension between sovereignty, right? That you, that you want to, you don't want to force countries into decisions, but then you know, I, I did a paper on the whole uh, the Kyoto treatment, that kind of stuff. And, it was so interesting looking at politics of it because everyone attacked Bush for not saying it. It was like they try to make it a political issue. It's like, but it's a soft the tension between sovereignty and international issues. We need international decisions, but we don't have a government structure. Economics running everything is not very dangerous. Take 
One thing I teach from an argument based perspective is we talk about how, how, how argument works, right? And, and then I can send you this and this and interesting enough. But then um, Nicholas Lewis in his work. But he talks about, if I remember this, there's, there's a politics frame, there's the economy frame, there's science, there's morality, uh, and there's law. And they basically argue that each of these uh, five um, have different rules of evidence. Right? Uh, they have different uh, assumptions about who's the expert. They have different assumptions about how conflict resolve. Right? Um, and a lot of the conflict that we have in society is that some groups are using one model or others use their own. Right? So their rules don't work in a sense. Right? So with politics, right? With politics, public opinion is very important. Right? Um, you know, what the public, what, what an opinion poll, what the majority wants something is huge. Whereas with science, right? Right. Yeah. Like right. You know, so science is all about data and rigor, you know, and, and statistics and things like that. For the economy, it's all about money, right? It's all about who's paying for it. Morality, it's all about, you know, who cares what people want to? Is it right or wrong, right? And obviously, morality gets gets into religion sometimes, right? And then law, it's it's not really right or wrong. It's like, it's, it's, what was the law say, right? Uh, one of the things that they really talk about is the science. Science can only conflict is assumed. If there's conflict, there's no substance. Is there a chance So conflict is only one study. I mean, it's studied to find out who's wrong, right? Whereas with a lot of the other ones, finding yourself with much different ways. So that's one of the arguments about global warming that just, you know, even if only 2% of scientists don't think it's happening, there's not consensus, right? Science is kind of made. Some people see it as law and the rights of the woman, and other people see it as a morality issue. So they're just coming from a different ground of what counts as evidence, what counts as the arguments. Um, and, and the arguments made here don't make sense here, and vice versa. And so that we as an outside person have to kind of explain that law, kind of see and change the conversation. So far, I don't know if that's interesting to you, but I can send you that. I think it was on the first page of the, uh, it's a, of the slide that came yesterday. I think I put it. Where everyone is out for themselves. I don't know if it's totally getting off the first two minutes. I thought it was going to be hard to get down that long. Yeah, but I'll, I'll send you all the links. I'll send you all the, you know, all the PowerPoints and some other articles if you want to screen. And the other one is the t It's Nicholas Bloom and LUH or the ENL. I think it's called Blood Water, but we're actually going to the wrong code. Maybe because you said your apologies. So we're going to choose the house, the dance aside, the board is 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 aside, the board that's all right. Thank you. German social Excuse me. Thank you. Okay. Especially if you can. If you can return. Yeah. The 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 no, no, I think we are just with the uh, that's why we're doing it with the TV and uh, 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 just to make sure that we can see that. Okay, well, I think we have a 
you're, you're coming from a scientific perspective. Well, you have to discuss with the first one, I have to do the first one. Both of you have to do it. 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 I like some of his stuff. I think he goes too far. So I'm going to have a little bit of negotiating. We're throwing experts out a little too much. And I said, why did I be a few really kind of reads and stuff that he's saying? Um, and it's, yeah, what you would think about it. And I think that's a, that's a pretty active topic for the other questions. Too many people in our field. Two optimistic questions, I'll look at two pessimistic questions. Um, they're criticizing that we're too focused, you know, too optimistic about extra optimism. And yeah, I agree with that, but I think they've, they've gone too far on the other way, right? We need to kind of recalibrate and really think through what's the problem with that. And part of it is the problem with, with you know, the expertise is now one. Especially in this country, I don't know if it's the same era, right? Um, we have conservative think tanks and progressive think tanks. And, you know, so now when we get even what we think is expert data, and then that, that starts kind of the problem sense as to what degree do we have experts that we really feel. You know, and part of that is climate change. So then people attack climate change science as being an agenda, right? So then science itself is now down for people. Right? It's kind of what I was talking about. So we need to change the conversation so that new data can be seen as good data versus data being seen as good all data doesn't mean that they didn't do a lot of this work. Okay. The question is, if you want to see in there, after, you have to measure the circle. So, um, like, we can only have four of these questions I just started bringing up. But at some point, I might get your feedback on this. We can decide this for this. We have some things to do. That might produce a few more questions. Yeah, 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 so that was the 
they have a great what we do with the face-to-face online. Uh, uh, we are connected. Mm -hmm. I'm doing like that. My classes are mainly uh, high yeah, the same thing. So they take basically with tech talk. Yeah, they try to tech talk. The rest of the classes are hybrid. I haven't started a fully online classroom. Yeah, what is it called? Yeah, I was uh, teaching up the I don't see how I can train the teacher. Yeah, changing very much. Yeah, practicing. Yeah, it's true. It's true. It's true. The higher you go, the more problematic it is. And changing. The same idea. Yeah, it's the same thing. It's the same company, RSA. Yeah, some classes can yesterday the key process distinctions I don't want to spend too much time on this because it seemed like the room is much more interested in kind of classroom application this is kind of more broad community application um, yeah feel free to take it. I don't but the, the, a lot of people have to frame the issue for their class right but no no we're gonna do okay. issue framing after this okay. yeah okay. The, 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 I'm just saying I wanted to spend a little bit of time did you get one of those I don't, know. I don't think so <laughs> so I don't know if you got a chance to kind of look through it if you didn't get a chance to look through it you can just look at the, the bullet points at the top of the first page uh, if you have any kind of questions about them, uh, if you didn't get a chance to do it, it might be just be like at some other point. <laughs> but I wanted to at least open up space if y'all wanted to ask some questions about this. But this is kind of the what I've developed is I think through designing process. I design a lot of processes: these two-hour meetings, these three-hour meetings, these all-day summits, and those type of things uh, to, to really again structured conversation in some way to get people to think about different issues. Right. Uh, so these bullet points are just kind of this is almost like my cheat sheet. As I'm finishing a process and thinking through it, what are all the things I need to think about uh, to incorporate into that process before people kind of come together? Right? Um, so I don't know if uh, I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to walk all the way through this. We don't have too much time to spend on this because we want to spend a lot of time on issue framing before we're done today. Um, but I don't know if, it, if any of those bullet points jump out at you. Um, if you want to, need to spend a little time kind of talking through it. Does anyone else need one of those? We got, we got extras here. What does conflict management procedure mean? How do we deal with conflict when it comes up? Mm -hmm. right. So, you know, and, and part of that is I'll kind of talk about this is we're analyzing issues beforehand. If we know that there's people that really disagree that being in the same room is going to be a problem, 
and how do we think about it? One example of this where I really could develop that, one of the first things that we did was that great configuration I've mentioned. Uh, to give a little bit of background is our local schools, you know, it's, it's kindergarten to 12th grade. They used to be uh, elementary schools were K to 6, and then junior highs were 7, 8, 9, and high schools were 10, 11, 12. Right? The norm is a four-year high school. You know, the norm is K to 5, and then three-year junior high and a four-year high school. But we were K to 6, and then a three-year and a four-year, right? or a three and a three-year. Um, so the school district was looking at changing it, right? And essentially by moving the ninth graders up to high school and moving the sixth graders up to junior high. Right. It was very much a wicked problem because everyone wanted sixth graders to stay in elementary school. They were actually saw it as a, a, another year of childhood. Right? If you send sixth graders to junior high, they're growing up too fast. You're throwing them to the wolves. Right? So everyone wanted sixth graders to stay in elementary school, but everyone wanted ninth graders to be in high school. Right? Ninth graders need to be in high school. This counts towards college now. Right? High school had a much varied curriculum, and they're bigger schools. And, you know, so everyone wanted ninth graders in high school. Everyone wanted sixth graders in elementary school. No one wanted to your junior highs. Right? Uh, so at first, it was this very kind of conflict. Right? You know, everyone blamed the superintendents. The new superintendents so blamed the you know blamed the, the devil figure. Right? It's all his fault. Whatever. Uh, it was almost textbook. It was our first real event. Right? Um, and I still remember I was at, we had like four rooms going. Um, well, first of all, we had four rooms going, and then I walked away for a second to call my wife and say, "Yeah, it's about 100 people here." It's you know my first event, and all of a sudden someone goes, "Who the heck's in charge here?" I'm like, well, you know, I run back. This guy, like, why the heck am I in there talking to a CSU student? So I kind of explained, well, you know, I'm, uh, it's a new organization. We're the Center for Punctuation. We train the students. We have facilitators. They're in each room kind of, we're here as an impartial resource. So we're collecting all the data. Everything we write down is going to go to the school district. But where the hell is the superintendent? I'm like, I'm pretty sure, sure the superintendent's in this room. We have an assistant superintendent. This I think they're going to rotate and listen, right? But we're running it. He's like, oh, that's pretty cool. He went back in. Okay. Uh, so that happened. Um, and then later on, the superintendent came out and was chatting with me. And then the assistant superintendent walked out of the room and said, I've never seen that before. And it's like, what? It's like, there's this woman, she was so angry at the ridiculous notion of moving sixth graders up, but then a woman on the other side of the table who had a ninth grader kind of explained why she needed her ninth grader in high school, and the first woman like understood her and made sense, you know, <laughs> and, and, and they'd never seen interaction, right? Because all their processes have been one at a time on a microphone, so they let each person rant, but they never had a process, you know. So it was this perfect, our first event ever was like this textbook case of you have a round table and a process and people listen to each other and they realize, oh, that makes sense. I never thought about that, you know. And it's really hard to demonize the other parent. It's easy to demonize the superintendent, you know. Uh, but anyway, in that process, I remember, um, again, this is our first night. I learned so many lessons our first night. Um, afterwards, uh, someone came in and said, you know, there was a participant. and said, you know what, I'm a, I'm a conflict negotiation person. But I'm also a parent. I was here. I was like, your, your students did great, except one thing, right? There was two people that really disagreed in, in our room, and they let them go too long, right? And part of it was the conflict management kind of parent, right? Said that the students were thinking we need to resolve that conflict, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but within deliberation, I don't need to come to consensus, right? Our groups are trying to explore the issue, to understand the issue, to get us good data about how people talk about the issue. But we don't have to come. To, we don't. We're not coming to agreement, you know, in most cases of our thing, right? So now we teach our students, it's like, hey, you want to mind that conflict. You want to understand the conflict. You want to make sure both sides are actually, you know, we don't want them to talk past each other, right? We don't want them to exaggerate the conflict. Right? But once we understand the conflict, once you know, the two of you, you know what she means and she knows what you mean. Y'all still might very much disagree, but at least you understand each other. And then we're done, we can move on, right? So that's the conflict management thing. It's like, if conflict comes up, do we need to resolve it? Right? Like if we were working for Matthew's house at a retreat and they had to make a decision, we have to resolve the conflict, right? We have to agree to disagree or whatever, right? But if we're doing a public engagement thing that we have 20 groups going to give feedback on a policy, each individual group's not deciding. So as long as we understand the conflict, get it in the notes and move on, right? So we actually tell our students that if there's a conflict between two people, once it plays out, say, okay, so what I wrote down is that for you, this is very important, where for you, this is really important. Is that going to, yes, okay, now let's move on. Right? So you're cutting off that conflict because you don't want everyone else to have to listen to this conflict between us. Right? So that's what we say, conflict, we, we have to think through and teach our students. If someone really disagrees, to what degree do we need to spend time resolving that and, and to what degree can you... We had this perfect, for the river stuff, some very passionate people. So we had the, a mayor of a small town close to us that really needed this reservoir and then the, the associate director of the Save the Pooter, this interest group that was very pro-river and they were just going at it. Um, and both probably 40, 50 year old men, and my facilitator, 
17 year old female, we have this on tape, right? They went back and forth and finally said, okay, stop. <laughs> right? I'm gonna give you 10 seconds, summarize your opinion, we're writing it down. I'm gonna give you 10 seconds, summarize your opinion, we'll write it down, and we're moving on, right? And that's exactly what you should have done, right? But it was great to see the 17 year old just kind of stop these two men and say, we're done, right? Um, so that's a somewhat long answer to your question. <laughs> Any others in there we want to make lots of choices, obviously, <laughs> in designing. Kind of. We talked a little bit, the second to last one, closure option. We talked a little bit about that yesterday, right? That you know, when you do small groups, people always feel like, I don't know what's going on. So I, you know, there's lots of ways for us to think about and give them uh, uh, some sort of closure to feel at the end of the meeting that they've accomplished something, uh, that their time was used well. Someone asked earlier, the third bullet point, convening an audience development method. You know, sometimes we're much more scientific. We have a random sample. Um, that takes a lot of money, so I don't tend to do that. But in my field, um, they, they tend to do that sometimes. Sometimes it's, it's, it's an invited audience. I have specific people that we're kind of inviting to represent. You know, I did something for the Downtown Business Association on a conflict uh, about uh, <coughs> the boxes, you know, the little newspaper boxes that started. There was no rules. So there's just more and more boxes in each a different color, each a different size, and it started looking ugly, right? So the Downtown Business Association said, hey, we'll pay for it, but we're going to have one big thing that has 10 slots, and then people can kind of rent slots out of us, but it's all uniform. But then all the, all the, the, the newspaper companies were like, no, that takes away our freedom of speech and all this kind of stuff, and, you know, and, and we can't differentiate each other from each other. You know, my box is part of my, my branding, and, you know, so I ran a process where several business owners and several of the of the different media groups kind of come together. So for that one, it was invited. We wanted specific representatives, and that group was empowered to make a decision in a sense, right? Whereas most of our events are just public. We you know we get in the newspaper, we send out press releases, but then we also, and you'll see this with the stakeholder announced in a second, we identify key groups that be there, and then we try to get them there. And that's why we often do the pre-surveys where we ask demographics so we can see if there's a group that we need there that's not coming, then we work a little bit harder to get them there. But we, we also recognize that that's, it's going to be unbalanced. Right? Some people are going to you know, over people can mobilize and show up that are against something and kind of dominate the conversations in some senses. Right? Um, so that, that, that's always kind of a tension in there between invited or how much control we have over the audience in a sense. Um, and it's difficult in particular. The biggest challenge for me in terms of convening an audience is for most events, the more the merrier, right? Let's get as many people that can come, right? It'd be great. So you just publicize it and get articles written and stuff. I'm trying to do small group discussions, right? Uh, so I might have, say, 20 students available to show up, and, and I need two students at every table, right? So that means I can cover 10 tables. We can, we can fit eight people. I can cover 80 people, right? So I'm trying to PR this event to get 80 people to show up. Okay? And 90 people would be a problem, right? Uh, and really, 70 people is great. 70 people means I just have you know seven people per table versus eight, right? Um, so it's really hard that we start publicizing things, but then at some point I get scared, like, too many people are going to show up, right? Um, and I've had the newspaper call me, hey, we're going to write an article about your event. No, 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 don't do that. <laughs> I can take more people, right? You know, you so find, there's this tension about, Ugh. Do you yeah. have a find that when you... Um, Register people that about thirty percent do not show up. Yeah, yeah. So we do RSVPs. We normally say RSVP preferred. Yeah. Uh, or sometimes if we if we think it's going to be a pretty tight audience, uh, we'll say that RSVP guarantees in a spot, right? Um, and, and so then when they're walking in at the RSVP, we give them an aim tag. If we're if we're close to full, like if we can fit eighty. And so we RSVP'd in an 80, we said, okay, no more RSVPs. If someone walks up, we say, well, wait, if someone doesn't show up, well, you know, we can set them later. Um, but, yeah, we normally find out that the RSVP number is actually pretty good, mm -hmm. but the reason it's good is 100 people were RSVP, 70 of those people will show up, and then 30 random people will show up. Mm -hmm. So it happens to work out that 100 people showed up, but it's not the 100 people that said they're going to show up. Mm -hmm. right? But it gives us a pretty good sense of... Of, of how many we'll, we'll have in a way. But I, I know we don't want to spend too much time on the community side of things, but I just wanted to open that up if any of these jump out at you. But. All right, so let's move on, and we're going to talk about issue framing, uh, which again is a good community uh, classroom exercise um, and a good process to kind of have groups and group. And I talked about my class yesterday that it's almost like a semester project, that their final project for the semester after spending all semester on a topic is one of these discussion guides. But this is also something that can be a much shorter project, right? Uh, 
that you're doing. So we're going to give the basics, uh, a, a true issue framing workshop to teach you how to do this kind of from a, on a public issue out there in the public. It's going to be much longer, right? But in terms of an academic exercise in a class, I think you, you know we got an hour and a half here or two hours that we can kind of play with this. Uh, so yeah, so I got a few more slides here with this. Um, and we'll we'll have a little exercise here that I'll do in a little bit. So these are the this is the broader steps to, if I was doing it as a public process, right? So then doing it in class, you know, you'll you'll recognize that there'll be certain steps that you can kind of skip in a sense um, as we go. But I'll I'll, I'll I'll walk through these really quickly, and then the, the presentation that I talk to is a little more slowly. Um, so first, you need to identify a public issue for writing for deliberation. Um, and, and when I meet, and I have a slide here in a second about what you know, rightness in a sense, it's another concept that we're kind of developing. Uh, but some issues, uh, some issues are technical issues, right? I, I'm not going to have a deliberation about how we should build a bridge, right? That's a pretty scientific kind of technical issue in a sense, right? Uh, so there's certain issues that might be too technical or or, or specific. Uh, so obviously, the easiest way to think about it, an issue right for deliberation is a wicked problem, right? If there's each different side is coming from a different perspective, and each side has a pretty good kind of support to it. Um, I've struggled with some issues that my students are passionate about. Like, you know, we have a teacher in our department that's really passionate about human trafficking issues, right? Um, you know, and it's not a wicked issue in a traditional sense. You know, that, that I don't think that people that are doing human trafficking have good values, right? <laughs> you know? But you know, what should we do about human trafficking? There are some tensions about what's the best way to kind of deal with it, right? So we can kind of still engage it as an issue, but it's not quite quite a deliberation issue in, in the true sense of a wicked problem, right? Um, so we'll talk more about that in a second. So then once you get a good issue that kind of fits the model, um, then you identify the underlying values and concerns, right? So I've talked a lot about that, and we've done that. Right? What are the values underneath these, and what are the tensions between them? So the water map I showed you, right? And then after after each of the processes we've done, we've talked about it. What are the key values? What are the values underlying this that we talked about? This? That's the framework, the, the, the lens that you use. Uh, then you name the issue. So what's the title? What's going to be on your flyer? Or what's going to be on the issue book, right? We had one of them was shaping our future. I think the, the other example I did is like, what should we do about childhood obesity? I tend to like the title being a question that what should we do about X, with X being you know, a frame broadly that everyone agrees it's a problem, right? Uh, but there's lots of different ways, and I'll show you lots of examples. I'm going to pass around the other examples that you brought, the other right. books. Where did they go? Um, uh, she just brought some more. They're on your table right behind you. Oh, okay. Yeah. And the yellow up to after you look at them, those are Yeah, things. she's got a few, it's an old catalog, but it still gives you a sense of how they frame different issues. They have that online, too. Um, All of these are online. Yeah, this is the NIF. At the end, I think one of the slides has a link to, to a lot of these issue books, right? Um, one of them being an AF. So I'll just kind of pass these. You can kind of grab one and look at it. But they're all the same kind of model. Here's a problem, and then here's three approaches, um, sometimes four approaches on how to solve it, right? So you name the overall issue. You get a good name that everyone's going to agree with. It's not going to turn anyone off. I know that NIF was starting to develop one on global warming. But they realized once they really started engaging the issue, they wanted to kind of get everyone involved in that conversation. Uh, maybe not kind of strict deniers, but at least kind of conservatives. Mm -hmm. And they realized that they called it global warming. It only kind of spoke to some people, right? Mm -hmm. It ended up um, reframing it in a sense of, um, you know, how do we kind of ensure energy security in a way, right? So when I talk about energy security, it kind of opened up the conversation that broadened the audience. Um, that's always going to be a choice. If we're you know, thinking a little bit that we might play as a group with this homelessness issue, right? That I've done some work with, and and, and uh, get your name out, Ben. Ben, yeah, uh, Ben. Ben is interested in it, so it might be kind of a good issue for us to play with in a sense. But if we're going to design an issue, uh, a homelessness discussion guide, are are we are we designing it for all audiences, like so the people that think homeless, you know, are, are just individuals that make bad choices, uh, or is it more for people that care about homelessness and want to do it? Is it a tool for them to really think through the issues, right? And that's kind of one of the how strategic are you designing it, how broad do you want the audience um, is a choice, right? Then you develop the potential approaches, right? So that's when you develop the three approaches, right? And that's really the big reframing because you're getting away from a pro con yes no framing to at least three, right? Uh, and then once you have the three approaches, then you start filling in blanks. For each approach, you want some specific actions. You saw that kind of in the examples we used. You want some arguments for it, also some arguments against. You want to identify some trade-offs and probably some key discussion questions, right? So you kind of lay it out. Um, and then you research and refine the approaches. If I was developing it, 
It's very rare that I'll develop a book and we use it in the public. I normally develop it and I test it. Right? I, I, I test it with my students. I test it with some specific groups. I let other groups vet it. Right? With the river stuff, we developed it and then we shared it with a lot of these river groups to let them push back. Because we wanted, once we actually took it in the community, for it to be approved. Right? And all the different sides felt this was a fair document. Um, and, then, and then you have a frame. I think you would have a question a second ago when you get that. Oh, um, when you're framing, do you, do, you, do you figure out the approaches yourself or do you use surveys? <laughs> it depends on time. Okay. Yeah, so I mean, if it's a public process, the more you can make the, the development of the framework a public process, the better. Yeah. Right, so I'll talk about that. Uh, but then sometimes I don't have enough time. So sometimes it's, I mean, I need to research it. The, the question becomes, well, well, we'll get to it yeah. as we kind of go through. Because identifying the underlying values and concerns is, are you doing that? Or are you doing a process to do that? That's essentially the question, right? Uh, My question, how, how yeah. big is framing group? What's the best? How is what? How big should be the framing group? I suppose it's you. Like in terms of a class, or? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, I think like when, when NIF does it, when they develop these national books, they probably have a pretty big group, right? I know we're in the middle of, of one that's developing it for substance abuse um, kind of issues. Uh, and it's probably about a group of 15 or so from different, well, lots of different communities. Uh, in my classes, I do a group of four. It is a group project in a sense because there's a lot of research involved in it. Um, but I imagine you can also, I mean, I, I've created some just by myself, right? That we have a, an issue that kind of happens. We want a reaction. I knew enough about the issue, so I'm able to kind of put it together kind of on my own in a sense. So it kind of, I think the more the better, but the more is going to take more time and, you know, it's that collaboration kind of thing, right? Uh, so yeah, I don't know if there's a direct answer to that in a sense. Uh, so I, I want to walk through all of this. You have it in there. Uh, uh, but that question of what issues fit this, right? Um, uh, I've said no to quite a few projects that people come to me because of some of these red flags. Uh, part of the question is, will getting people in the room to talk about this be productive or unproductive? I've had a lot of people ask me to do fracking that we need to have a meeting about fracking. Um, I spent a summer with some research for, for some graduate students trying to frame fracking, and, and we realized with it that there's just very little information that both sides agree with. That like both sides just have a completely different set of data, uh, and both sides have so little distrust of each other. I'm like, if we get people in the room to talk about fracking, it's like, they'll just yell at I mean, there's no basis, you know. There's just not enough common ground uh, to, to, to change that conversation yet, right? Um, so so um, I kind of said no to that, right? Um, you know, so there's some issues that don't fit this very well or just not ripe enough. They're not ready yet for deliberation. Uh, but most of the issues that, that we've tackled, there's normally a name that we can do, right? Uh, you know, so the signs of ripeness, green flag, and I'm not saying if you have a red flag, stop. It's just you've got lots of red flags. Uh, so it doesn't primarily involve tensions between positive values, right? You know, so if there's, each side has some positive values, then that, that's something you can really work with, right? Um, when, when it's more of a zero sum that, you know, automatically what's good for one side is bad for the other side, and it's going to be harder to have a deliberative thing. I was asked my, my university, do you, have y'all banned smoking on campus yet? Um, yeah, well, they have to they have to go outside, I think. There's a smoking area, right? Smoking yeah. area, okay, yeah. So about 1,100 campuses have banned smoking altogether. Okay. Like no smoking on campus whatsoever, right? So our campus wanted to look at that. Uh, and at first I thought it would be a deliberative, but then I realized this is the majority deliberating about the action of a minority, right? And it's really it's a, a bad behavior that the minority are doing that the majority wants to control, you know? So, so there's really, you know, for the people that don't smoke, they're not giving anything up to have this policy, you know? So then I realized once we started getting into it, it's like, this isn't really something to deliberate. Right? What do we do in these small groups, in a way? Because there's, there's, there's not a reciprocity, there's not a balance in the sense. Um, so that's what uh, The second right is all major uh, stakeholder groups realize the need for action. That desperation can actually be an asset, right? Liberation works best when everyone realizes status quo is not working. We need to do something, right? If there's people that particularly prefer the status quo, especially if they're powerful people, deliberation is a little harder, right? If people are, are the, the, just, just the dysfunction, the problem is good for some people, right? Uh, so that's where when we're talking about activism and kind of dealing with power relationships, you know, deliberation might not always be the best tool in some sense, um, unless you're getting those groups to kind of agree to the deliberation. Um, need for broad action by many stakeholders, yeah, this kind of is the smoking thing. Right? It's best when whatever results, whatever actions come up, it's broad range of action. Going back to the, the, you know, the uh, 
democratic governance, right? That there's role for individuals, there's role for nonprofits, for private industry. Yeah, there's some policy change, right? There's lots of potential action, and that gives you a lot to work with. Right? It's very hard to do a deliberation uh, by a, a referendum issue, right? If it's a yes or no, pass this law or not. It's very hard to have a very rich deliberation because you're really only coming up with a yes or no answer. Right? Actually, the so end of life issues. Um, you know, it was a big controversy the last few months of a little woman that moved to Oregon that had brain cancer. I don't know if y'all saw that issue at all, right? So Oregon has a law, a right to die law, so she can actually get poison from her, her uh, doctor to, to end her life. Uh, she had a form of brain cancer that really changes her personality, right? So she didn't want to continue living because she didn't want all her family to kind of remember her once it really kind of changes her completely. Right, so she chose to take her own life. So our state legislature in for Fort Collins uh, brought that same law to Colorado, right? And then she wanted us to run meetings. This was like literally two weeks ago, right? Uh, and it's like it's hard for me to run a meeting on a specific law, right? Uh, because people have more vested interests and they don't move their deliberation is all about refining and changing your opinion. And if it's a yes no on a law, that, that, that's you know you're, you're switching from yes to no versus you know being flexible along a continuum. Just today, I read in the paper that it didn't make it out of committee, right? So it's not going to be a law that the legislators vote on. So now I can do a process, right? Uh, so now let's have a conversation in our community about end of life with the broad ideas of what we can do, right? Now my community will be educated on it. Next year, she can read the law again, right? But the fact that the law didn't make it out of committee or the bill didn't make it out of committee actually helps me, right? Because now we're not constrained to, to frame it as a yes/no question on that specific law. But uh, I think the innovation can be uh, is uh, an element of law preparing. Yeah, uh, yeah. I just think it's it's better earlier in the process, mm -hmm. right? Deliberation is better to kind of think about the problem and potential actions. When we get to the point that we're voting yes or no on a law, mm -hmm. it's framed so narrowly, right? Not only is it framed so narrowly, but the winners and losers are clear. Right, it's very. Like, we took on this stadium. The stadium issue has been my, tough, my most difficult issue. Uh, so CSU has a football team, like all American colleges, right? Um, and our stadium is three miles away, right? Um, on the foothills, so it's kind of, but it's old and it's, it's it needs a lot of work. Uh, but by not having a stadium on campus, right? The, the advantage of having a stadium on campus is every time you have a football game. 30,000 people, a lot of your alumni, come to campus, right? They walk around their campus and they see their dorm room and they can go see their department on the campus. So for alumni relationships, having people on campus is huge, right? So the new athletic director and the new president said, we're gonna build a new stadium that's gonna be on campus. All hell breaks loose, right? <laughs> we're a very environmentally conscious university in Colorado, right? So to build a second stadium, right? And to use campus space for a stadium and to spend $200 million on a stadium when, when faculty haven't gotten raises and all that. Now, the $200 million is going to be raised, right? It's not university funds, but still the symbolism. And, you know, so it's a huge controversy. <coughs> so then the president of the university asked me to help run meetings about the stadium. But again, it was a yes no issue, right? Um, and, and so it was really hard for us to have a good conversation. Now, people against the stadium, it's very unlikely they're so against the stadium for them to move their opinion when, when all I'm really asking are you for it or against it. Right? But if we would have done it earlier, right, if we wanted to have a deliberation about the role of athletics at a university, or, you know, then we could have had a conversation. But once we decided and it was already kind of put on the table to be a yes, no, it makes it really hard to have a really robust deliberation about it. Right? One exception to that. I think about how much this is worth talking about. Um, so the citizens' jury, right, is a process, and we've done we've done this, and it's worked pretty well. Um, Colorado and in some states have a lot of referendum issues, right? So they put voters, they, they put some vote to the voters, right? So an example of the change in the education funding in Colorado was referendum issue. Go to the voters, and they have to vote yes or no, right? Uh, so the the state of Oregon has what's called a citizens' initiative review. And what they do is every year they take one or two issues that are going up for referendum, um, and they, they have a grant to do this. They get, I think, 20 people to serve on a jury for a week, for only four or five full days, to study the issue. And it's like a court case. They're a jury. They bring the advocates for and against it in as witnesses. They bring experts in to kind of answer questions, and then they deliberate, right? And then they can call more experts, just like a jury trial. Like we can call people back and ask them questions, and you know the advocates forward against referendum issues, kind of give opening statements and then make their case and then give closing statements. And then they deliberate again with the facilitator, 
Then they vote as a group who's for the referendum and who's against the referendum. Uh, once they vote, they split, and then each side writes a one-page summary of why are we for this or why are we against this, based on four days of talking through it. Right? And in Oregon, they passed it through the state legislature that those two pages actually go into the voting guide. Right? So the voting guide that gets mailed to every single citizen right, has, here's a two-page summary of a, of a group of random citizens that spent five days studying this, their opinion. Uh, so that's one example, and we, we play with that a little bit with the yes-no issue in a sense, that you get this groups, and then you're having, you know, because most of the information for a friend of is these 30-second spot ads or horrible kind of slick mailers, things like that, that frame the issue, you know, in a very strategic, manipulative way. But this is an example of, you know, a group of citizens spending a lot of time really thinking through the tensions and negotiating all those kind of things and coming up with why they like it. So it helps when there's a broad middle, right? Um, that, that there's lots of people that don't know enough about the issue or, or kind of you know, see the different sides of the issue. Um, it's di more difficult when the, the issue is dominated by very kind of entrenched voices. Uh, so in most cases, the entrenched voices are the loudest voices, but there's ways of getting out other voices, right? But for some issues, the only people that care about it are going to be very strong little people. Well, then it's not going to be a very useful problem. Right? Uh, it's actually a green flag when there's a lot of misunderstandings across the perspective, but there's some trust. Right? Because that we can change that with good information, with a good process, we fix those misunderstandings. Right? Uh, so it's okay if there's a lot of mis you know, if there's a big gap between the public and the experts. Okay, that, that's rightness. We can change that gap if, if they trust the organization in a sense. But if there's this, you know, this is the fracking thing, if there's significant distrust, if people anything that comes out of people's mouths they don't believe is true, mm -hmm. then it's very hard to change people's minds. Um, and then significant resources, <laughs> if you actually have, you know, be able to have meetings and have food at the meetings and, um, and have facilitators and those type of things, obviously, kind of helps, right? Uh, now, that's kind of public, but that, that also helps in the sense of, uh, you know, if your students are going to do these projects, like pick a topic that's controversial, pick a topic that there's different sides to, right? That there, there's not a scientific solution, or there's not kind of a clear right, right and wrong kind of in there. That you want to pick one that has different sides that have, right? Um, so that's kind of that, that first step to identify right. Then you have to identify the values and concerns. And there's lots of ways of doing this. This goes back to uh, the, the cycle of deliberation that I showed you yesterday. It's on one of your slides, right? So the first step is deliberative issue analysis at the 12 o'clock. Then you do convening, then you facilitate, then you report and actions in the middle. Uh, so that deliberative issue analysis, this is, I think these are, these are very useful assignments for students. Because again, you're not telling them, pick a position and then go find evidence of that position. Right, which is which is too easy to do with so much information out there on the internet. Right, what you're saying is pick a topic and you're going to learn kind of the different sides of that topic. Your job again as an expert is to lay out the choices that we have. Right? So the deliberative issue analysis is you're not searching for evidence of a preconceived opinion. You're searching for ideas to take on the tough issue. Right? Uh, so it is in deliberative issue analysis. It, it combines kind of public research with with expert research and scientific research. Right? Uh, coming from a deliberative perspective, you start more with the public. Your goal is to change the public conversation, so you kind of have to start with the public. You, you start with how is the public understanding this issue? How do they talk about how they care about this issue? What ideas do they have? And then you back it up with expert data to figure out where's the public right and where's the public wrong. Right? And it's one of those issues that the public's thinking about it really bad way. That when you look at the experts, what you know, then that that's something to know, right? That part of the process has to be to educate the public in some senses. But instead of starting with the experts and then going to the public, you're, you're starting with the public in some ways to really understand how the public's thinking about that. Right. Um, yeah, so sometimes significant examples of public discourse exist. Sometimes I'm asked to do a project and I know I can, like I talked about yesterday, I can find a couple articles online that have 150 comments. I'm just starting with my campus on, on campus climate, kind of civility issues on campus and issues of diversity and inclusion on campus. And there have been so many examples of that that it's pretty easy for me to research it. So if there's data out there, if there's just public comment out there already, uh, or you know if, if it's been an issue in front of city council, our city council meetings are videotaped, right? So like when fracking, you know, an example, when they asked me, the city asked me to, uh, if I could help with fracking, the first thing they did is they sent me all the emails that had been sent to city council about fracking. Right? So they sent me like 600 emails. Um, and then they, they had one meeting at, at city council that fracking was kind of a focus area, and about 75 people spoke at it. 
So I can go online and see that. Okay, what's the public, you know, so I can start getting a sense of how the public's talking about that. Right? Um, interestingly, out of the 350 emails or something like that, um, about 120 of them with the exact same email. Right? So it was a, basically an environmental group that sent an email out, said, hey, cut and paste this email and send it to city council. Right? And it was actually the most extreme email. Right? <laughs> the way it was framed and the wording and the, you know, um, but yeah, I was reading through them all, I'm like, I think I've read this before. I know, like, I've read this one before. And I counted, it was 120 years ago, the exact same thing. Um, yeah, so, so sometimes there's enough public discourse, like for a student assignment, they can just research it, right? They just gotta find, and they can go to, to activist websites, right? You know, so you're, you're finding public kind of sentiment on this. Uh, and then sometimes you have to develop yourself. So this is a question you asked earlier. Right, so sometimes you have, and if the students, sometimes the students can do campus projects, right? Something on a campus issue that they're dealing with, and they can do a survey. So I've had students do surveys in my own class of asking people what they want, right? So sometimes I have to do survey data to get an idea of it. Uh, it's typically not scientific. We're not doing a kind of full, again, money-wise. I don't have money to kind of pay a survey firm to get a representative sample and things like that, right? Um, in some cases you do, but I'm not, I'm not specifically trying to find out exactly how the opinion is, I, I just want an example. What are the arguments being made? What are the assumptions of what's being made? Right. Um, obviously, the, the more scientific you make it, the better in some senses, but that's really expensive. Um, and, and obviously, you're going to have your students do a scientific example. <laughs> so these are the kind of questions we ask if we do a survey. Maybe we're just trying to get a sense of how people think about this issue. When, when we do this training, I'm, I'm part of the Kettering Foundations. We have a center for public life of people starting centers like mine, and we do this training a year round. We have four meetings over the year face-to-face, -face, uh, and, we, and we issue frame together. We do one big issue book that becomes an official NIF book. We're doing substance abuse this semester. So we, we came up with a survey kind of like this about uh, substance abuse, and then we all went home, and I think each, each person had to get 100 different surveys, whether that was handwritten or online or through their classes. We, we, we did an exercise, we'll just do it in a second, uh, brainstorming stakeholders, who cares about this issue? So then we wanted to make sure we got surveys to all the different groups and those type of things. Uh, but all this kind of raw data is used to help build the book, just like to get a sense of how people are thinking about it. Um, and this, so when I talk about the deliberative inquiry, uh, there's four kind of key things that I'm always looking for. Uh, if my goal as a deliberate practitioner is to improve the conversation, these are four kind of data points that specifically I'm looking for to try to improve the conversation. And, and you start getting a sense of this from analyzing the existing public discourse or analyzing the surveys. So obstacles are what makes it hard to talk about this subject. Uh, one way when I think about obstacles is, is what do I want to deal with before the meeting? Right? If, there, if there's personality disputes, if there's a lot of misunderstanding, if each side has completely different factual sets, you know, uh, if there's you know, whatever's kind of going on in a sense, I can take care of it beforehand. Right? Sometimes you can you can overcome it before the meeting. You can have data that resolves that conflict. Sometimes you can bracket it. And you say, okay, we're not going to talk about this today. We're doing some school safety forums in, in a school district right after the Sandy Hook, the elementary school, that, 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 the horrible tragedy. Um, and a lot of the, what came out of that is people thought, you know, all teachers should have guns, right? Um, you know, so the, the good guy can shoot the bad guy kind of thing, right? Uh, well, in Colorado, there's a rule that no one could have a gun in the school except a police officer, right? So when we had those, we were having these discussions about how do we improve safety, I was able at the beginning of the meeting saying, we're not going to change state law today, right? So what we're talking about today is what this school district and this police department can do to increase safety in schools, right? Uh, so if you want to talk about, and part of the reason is gun control is, is a very polarized issue. You know, it would take it in a completely different direction, right? So I was able to bracket that. That was an issue in the dis discourse that was really people were struggling with making it hard for them to have a useful conversation. I was able at our meeting to bracket it and say, we're not going to talk about that. And this is why we're not going to talk about that. I did, once again, have a safety valve. One of the questions on the survey is, if you have suggestions for the state legislature in terms of changing gun control, what are they? Right? So they came to talk about that. You can still write it down. We're not saying you can't have that opinion. But we're saying at the table, right? So these obstacles are trying to figure out, uh, and this is probably not as relevant for a student activity, right? Um, because they're not going to engage the public, right? But if I'm going to engage the public, one thing I'm looking at is I, I want to know before I walk in the room what are the biggest issues, right? So that's where a survey really helps me. I know oh, they're going to be talking about this. Or the example I gave yesterday about the small schools and small class size, I knew walking in um, that, that, that there was that misconception, right? So then I could take care of it. 
specifically said that we had this presentation about that. So we overcome that obstacle. And, and you can think about the obstacle of making it hard. We can't have a little discussion because this stuff's distracting us. So how can I, as a practitioner, design the events so those aren't as distracting so we can get to the hard work of the deliberation? The next two I've been talking about all the last two days. So what are the key values? As I'm looking at this, what do people care about? What, what are the underlining values that are relevant to this issue? And then the tensions. What are the tensions between those values? So I don't think anybody's talking more about that. And the last, potential actions, particularly from a wide range of stakeholders. Right? So as we now take on this issue, what are all the different players and what, what, what role might they play? Because right? uh, again, deliberation is great when it's about a broad range of actions. Right? So those are four, I call them buckets. As I'm analyzing issues, right? and I have worksheets, if you're interested, I can kind of send you that my students. So my students are doing two topics next week. This, this weekend, they're filling out worksheets with these four buckets. As you analyze this issue, right, what are the values that you see with this issue? What are the tensions in here? What do you see as the key stakeholders and potential actions from those? So as they're walking in to read that conversation, they already have that in their head. And then, with the cycle of deliberation, the purpose of the conversation is to refine an understanding of those. Right? And to develop new actions. And particularly, it's like, once we, re we overcome the obstacles, so we have a tough conversation, we recognize the common ground of the values, so, so we... Uh, you know, we, we put our blinders down, we realize that people that we disagree with have some good stuff to do. Then now we recognize the inherent tension with the issues, so we struggle with that. And the way we struggle and we deal with that tension is we come up with some cool actions that work to balance or overcome those tension. Right? And one quick thing to bounce back, uh, during break, another way of thinking about the polarity management worksheet that kind of works with this, right? Um, typically when we think about conflict, we think about tension between people or between perspectives, Democrats versus Republicans or whatever, right? But part of the wicked problem framework is that tensions are inherent to the issue, right? You know, so, so if I'm a consistency person and you're a flexibility person, the tension at first seems to be between us, right? I think I'm right, you think you're right. But then once we, we complete that map, right, we recognize that oh, I'm the consistency person, but I see the value of flexibility, right? So now I'm, I'm in tension within myself, right? Uh, so, so now the tension becomes within the issue, and that, that's part of that idea. So he, you came up during break and say, you know, yeah, I'm recognizing now that with some of these issues, I'm struggling with the tension. And that's the point, right? And the point of a wicked problem is you're switching from wicked people to wicked problem, right? The, the, the wickedness is in the problem, and, and we're going to struggle with our own tensions in a sense, right? So when you're, when you're identifying those tensions, it's not just tensions between perspectives, it's tensions within the issue itself that we're going to constantly have to do with so, uh, sources for deliberative inquiry, you know, traditional academic research, you know, they, they're looking at actual articles, but still you want that public stuff. So you want newspaper articles, advocacy websites. If you have time, you can do surveys and interviews and focus groups. Uh, this is one of the reasons I, I, I rarely, I, I travel a lot to do training. I rarely travel to do projects, right? Because I think to do projects, I have to talk to so many different people. People think I can just walk in and run a meeting than some other community. I'm like, no, right? Unless you're doing lots of different surveys or something like that. Like I have a city just south of me that the city manager called me down and he wants me to run this event. And I'm like, okay, I need to go and talk to like 40 other people in your community. I can't trust you, right? Like I got your perspective now, right? You know, uh, so that's part of it is, is you need surveys and, and, you know, to really see the different sides of things so then you can really design something. People are gonna get, right? But for a class, they can normally for bigger issues good enough for that, right? Uh, so then, one of the activities, there's a little activity we can do, and, and, and I'm suggesting uh, us to play with homelessness. Everyone know enough about the concept of homelessness is play with this, unless someone else has a different suggestion. And again, I did this on a bigger piece of paper, but we don't have to do it. But this is a little exercise that helps in, in with two of the key products. It helps with identifying the key values, and it helps to identify the key players and stakeholders and potential actors. <laughs> Right? And then inherently, by, by identifying the key values, it will help you identify the tensions between those values. Right? Uh, so what you're doing with this worksheet, and I'll, I'll send this electronically, so if you want to do it in class. Uh, so it kind of looks like this. This is a completed worksheet. Uh, we did this with a big group on the river, right? Uh, but first, what you want to do, and we're going to have you brainstorm individually, maybe for five minutes, and then we'll kind of build one as a group. Right? Uh, but first, you'll just list the stakeholder. What are the groups? When we talk about homelessness, right? Who's relevant to this? Um, and and where, where it gets difficult is how many different subgroups you want to do. Like, is home, the homeless themselves a stakeholder group, or do we kind of have categories of homeless? Right? 
Uh, you know, there's some that are temporarily homeless. There's some that are chronically homeless. There's some that are transient, that they're homeless, and they kind of move around in the community. You know, you know, so you can kind of sometimes kind of brainstorm homeless and then have some subgroups, right? Uh, but just think of it. If we're going to deal with homelessness in our community, who are all the relevant players? Uh, so I'll let you kind of brainstorm that in a second. Once you have a pretty decent list, you don't have to complete. You know, you have a pretty decent list there. Then you start kind of filling up the top, which is the interest. What do those groups care about? Right. What are the values, the underlying things that's kind of important to them in a sense, right? Uh, so you start for, and, and, you know, you start kind of putting stuff, and then you start bouncing back and forth because you'll write a value, and then you'll realize, oh, there's another group that really cares about that value, and you'll add to your stakeholder group, right, and vice versa. So you're kind of bouncing back and forth, and you're, you're kind of getting a list of what are all the things people care about about this issue, and who are all the groups. Then if you want to, I tend not to do this next step, but you see on the bottom, if you want to, then you can actually complete it, you kind of look at, okay, for this group, which of these do they care about, right? You put a check mark if they really care about that value, right? Uh, but part of the process, so again, you're, for the key products, you're getting a good list of stakeholders that have potential actions they can do, you're getting a list of values, and then you'll find out how some of these values don't fit together very well, right? That, gee, if we focus on this value, we're, we're, we're probably not focused on this value in a sense, right? So we'll see. Let me give you a couple minutes just to, to try to brain dump in terms of homelessness. See how many stakeholders you can get. See how many values. And then, then we'll talk about who is a group and see if we can kind of fill it out. The instructions making enough sense? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Are there a lot of homeless in Tolan, or what kind of policies do you have with um, your downtown areas? Or well, uh, I think I think um, now at least the less visible than yeah. here. No, I, think, I, I think it's less because in Europe in general, I guess yeah, the different the social, policies. Yeah, so the social, social welfare is yeah, the stronger, yeah. stronger, stronger social 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 welfare. More yeah, uh, policy, not, not less than usual. I think the weather. The, the climate oh, in Poland awesome. is different. Yeah. <laughs> this is why we don't this see them the on the streets, yeah. because no. they need to hide. The, the, the yeah, of course, the, there are some, some institutions which mm -hmm. uh, help them, uh, but the main problem is that uh, one of part of the, this policy is that you cannot bring down the homes. Yeah. So usually those people who, do, who um, don't have a place to stay uh, are those who do not want to lay the okay. <coughs> That's so there's places for people to stay yeah, as long yeah. as they're following certain rules, yeah. right? So the ones that are outside are making their choice. Okay. Yeah, yeah, we kind of have the same situation. I know we have a big program with with uh, churches in our community that there's a group of about 15 churches um, that kind of rotate amongst them, but they'll keep a, a like I think about four or five homeless families for a week um, and just open up the church every night for them. Um, but they have kind of same thing of a set of rules um, mm -hmm. that you have to follow. We actually, one of my sister, my, one of my daughter's friends was in that program that her family got kicked out because the father would follow the rules. Yeah. Then we were dealing with, are we taking them there? Okay. All right, I said I'll leave on the right side. Uh, yeah, I mean, normally I, I like the process of having first everyone individually kind of okay. brainstorm Sorry. and then we share, right? You just get more ideas that way.
try to switch now if you haven't already to try to think a lot of alternative values. Try to think about some of the values. When we think about what are the things we care about? Again, the template is the, the water one I had. You know, the 90s people care about water or those type of things. Mm -hmm. What are the underlying values of all those things that become relevant? Give you maybe another minute for that and then we'll start kind of sharing. All right, so let's start throwing out some stakeholders. What are some of the things that we put on your list? Don't want to. Would you do it? Well, well obvious for the homeless, however, we can, of course, split them uh, into some categories, as you said. Um, yeah, Ben, do you, how would you kind of categorize different categories of homeless, or do you, do you feel it's better just to kind of. Oh, no, there's a. Homeless and uh, those who are not getting their mental health needs. Okay. Yeah. So there's you know, there's a typical class that, that <clears throat> if the cause of, of homelessness is mental health, right? Yeah. That's different than physically disabled. The orphan. The C class. If orphan or, or children. So yeah, children. children who just, I mean, we're finding that I know a lot. A lot of my students are very passionate about GLBT issues, yeah. right? That there was a big homeless problem with the GLBT children that were kicked out of their homes, right? right? That they were no longer welcome at home, um, which we creates a distinct issue, right? And there's a criminal, and then those who are out of work. Yeah. So I mean, that's just one way to categorize them, but that, that's probably enough for us to kind of work with now, right? Um, you know, out of work, but but also probably able, right? They're, they're able to work. They might have some skills in a sense, as they just don't have that ability right now, in a sense, right? Um, now, but with the word transient is typically used, right? But for a lot of people, the image of homelessness is they're 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 the aggressive homeless, right? That that might be pain laning pretty aggressively and those type of things. And, and with mental health too, um, we've done a lot of mental health stuff. It can be tough, but often mental health and substance abuse kind of go together, right? Um, oftentimes, the reason they go together is because people don't get treatment for their mental health, so then they self-treat, right? Mm -hmm. But then sometimes the, 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 that cause and effect can kind of go both, both ways in some senses, right? <laughs> so that's the problem, because for some people see, oh, this is mental health, it's not their problem, it's a disease, we need to help them. Other people say, hey, this is a substance abuse, this is their choice, we don't need to help them, right? Mm -hmm. And that becomes that deserving, that deserving poor line, which really kind of changes how people think, right? Yeah, beyond the homeless, what are some of the other groups? Um, yeah. Business owners? Huh? Business owners? Business owners, yeah. Especially like in a downtown area, mm -hmm. right? Business owners that um, are losing customers because people are uncomfortable going downtown or, or those types of things. That's a big issue in Fort Collins, especially during the summer, right? Mm -hmm. That's the same thing. We're a little too cold in the winter. <laughs> uh, but during the summer, we get a lot of that people, especially, you know, pe some people are saying, we don't, I don't know the truth about this, that since marijuana now is legal, right? Mm -hmm. So are people kind of coming to Colorado? The problem is you can't smoke it publicly, right? It's legal. You can buy it at a store now, but it's probably more expensive to buy it at the store than buying it illegally, right? Um, and you still can't smoke it publicly. So the idea that people are coming to Colorado so they can smoke marijuana and be homeless, so like, well, technically it's illegal because you can only smoke it in a home and you're homeless. Nobody else. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's almost so funny, but anyway. So business owners, what else? Residents. Yeah, yeah, yeah residents kind of in that area. Um, and even tourists, in a sense, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and, and certainly kind of, in Fort Collins, we want to be a tourist destination, right? So that notion that if, if the homeless, this issue becomes more and more of a problem, the Visitors Association is dealing with that, right? We need to bring those dollars in, right? And it's kind of the same thing for downtown. Yeah. You know, we're trying to, you know, get downtown to be a destination at night, 
it's starting to get there, but it didn't used to be at all when I lived here, right? Mm -hmm. You know, so to what degree is the homeless? Thursday night we couldn't find parking. Uh, Thursday night we couldn't find parking. Right, yeah. What else? Local government. Local government. Local government. Local government, okay. Yeah, so the kind of policies that they, the policies do we have, to what degree do we criminalize homelessness, like you talked about, right? Social agency, the police, yeah. hospital, the yeah. school. Yeah, so social aid, so yeah, we're going to split those up. So you, you have what, police, hospital. Yeah, hospitals in particular, because most homelessness put a lot of pressure on emergency rooms. Right. Yeah, that's and that's one of those arguments that the cost of, you know, it's so much cheaper for a community just to give them a home because in terms of how many times they spend in jail, how much police time that they take, and how much emergency room resources they take, they eat out. There's one example, it was like the million dollar <coughs> it basically cost the community a million dollars a year for one home system, right? Whereas they could have housed them for, for 40000 or something like that, right? Um, Advocacy And then you, they probably have a, a, you know, social, you have government social programs, right? Uh, so like the county county programs, and then you also have nonprofits. Yeah. And you can clear a little clarification. Uh, uh, <coughs> government responsibilities, you know, local to regional to national, a yeah. charge of responsibility versus the social organizations who are motivated out of a, just a quality of life issues. Right. And and you have it. You know, one of the tensions we deal with in Fort Collins is most of the programs. The social programs for poverty are county issues, right? I mean, just the way the funding, at least in the United States, between a city and a county, there are certain things that are city responsibility and certain things that are county responsibility. So, like welfare programs are a county responsibility, right? But the homelessness is really only an issue in Fort Collins, right? You know, so a lot of people are telling the city, you need to do something about this, but the city is saying, this is a county issue. It's about a social program, right? So there's that tension between city, county, state, and then federal in a way of whose jurisdiction is it, whose responsibility is it in a sense, and become part of it, right? Did, did we do the, the, the church? Church, okay, yeah. So religious institutions? It's and often Raquel, a very said, kind of, Raquel said advocacy groups. Yeah, but I think that falls under non, non nonprofits like search, mm -hmm. yeah. Oh. And then on, the, on the flip side, if some of them are, are have mental health problems, you have mental health agencies, right? Um, and a lot, a big part of the, the mental health programs is veterans, yeah. right? So then you have veterans hospital or veterans advocacy program. Yeah. So we kind of stop there. We could keep yeah. going, right? <laughs> but even just thinking about who are all the players in here, you know, and, and this this serves a few different purposes for me when I'm doing a community process, because part of it is these people all need to be in the room. If we're really having a conversation about how to deal with this, right? So we've actually done this. We did it particularly with the early childhood education. We started a project. We did this brainstorming process, found out all the players. Then we said, okay, who knows somebody who can come to the meeting, right? And we literally, we did this on the board. Some people walked up and wrote down, yeah, I'll invite this person. I'll invite this person. And one of the things with convening is we kind of go with this assumption that if you invite everybody, you're really not inviting anybody, right? So that notion of just having a newspaper article and putting some posters up, you're not going to get an audience, right? That personal invitation, that email saying, you know what, Thomas, I need you there. Can you come here to represent your organization? Then people will come, right? So we did that process. We filled in most of the blanks because the people in the room were pretty connected. We had a few blanks empty, so then we kind of assigned them. Okay, Wendy, you need to figure out, you know, you need to find someone from the faith community to come, right? And you need to figure out that kind of stuff. So then for when we actually had our, and that was even just for a planning meeting. Right. For a planning meeting, we wanted a full room. And then for the meeting itself, we kind of did something similar. Right? Mm -hmm. So the stakeholder analysis kind of works on that. But then the stakeholder analysis also works like once we get all those different groups, then we start thinking about, okay, what, what are the values? What are the things people care about? These are these are tougher to frame, right? Uh, but I'm curious, what kind of things did y'all come up with for, for the top column, for top row? Humanity. Humanity, okay, yeah, so just kind of respect for human, kind of compassion, kind of in a way, right? Um, well, I, I just wanted to comment because I, uh, I, I think it's, it's a little bit too broad. Well, we should split humanity. Okay, well, what do you got? Well, what well, well um, I guess health safety, okay. uh, low crime rate. Okay. Yeah, so a little bit kind of compassion. I, I just had to throw dignity and said that it's too, too, too wide. Too, too, too. Uh, and so I have to do this a smaller phone here. But, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, we certainly public safety, right? 
a lot of policies about the homeless are justified kind of for that. What else did you say? Um, low crime rate. Okay. So, and we do what I try to do with this top one is we want to frame these positively, right? Uh, but we want you know things that people care about in the sense, right? Um, so I guess low crime rate will work. I think. I don't think that's stigmatizing. Yeah. Fitting well here. Better what else? Services. Service. What kind of? What do you mean by services? Um, what I mean is uh, making sure that they eat, that they this is it. having their basic needs. Okay, so that, that kind of fits what she was saying about kind of compassion. For some reason, I have one S and two M's there. Um, <laughs> compassion and kind of the, of humanity, right? Kind of fits into that, right? To make sure people are kind of. Having their basic needs fed, met, yeah. right? Yes, last right. mass law, the basic. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's like for the business owners, what are they caring about? It partly public safety, low crime, commerce, or, uh, commerce, yeah. aesthetics. Uh, okay. Yeah, no, no, part of it. I think aesthetics is, yeah, is right. We, we want our downtown to look pretty, right? We want people to kind of feel comfortable in it, right? We want tourists to kind of enjoy it in a sense, right? That cover a city pride is. Yeah, yeah, city pride. Yeah, that's a nice way to think about it. Some yeah, and that, that's really one of the things that you know, Fort Collins calls itself a choice city, right? We're we're typically ranked in one of the best places to live. Like, there's a lot of pride in that, right? So the fact that our homeless population is growing, people are saying we are not a choice city if if we have people that are suffering like this, right? Well, on both sides, right? Some people are kind of the compassion side, saying we can't brag about how good of our city is when we have people suffer like this, and then some people are saying we need to get rid of those people because it doesn't look good, right? You know, so kind of well, on both both sides and stuff like that, right? What else? Oh. Some job, oh, sorry. Some, uh, job opportunities for these homeless people. Okay. So the potential for job opportunities. And, and kind of self-sufficiency, right? So, yes. so for some people the goal, and for some people the goal is just temporarily kind of safety, and for some people is, is long-term work. I know a lot of stuff that we've been getting into, when we get into actions, in a sense, we don't even really have, we didn't, we didn't list a, 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 a training programs, right? <laughs> Uh, we didn't let a lot of the kind of solution to, to homelessness in some senses. In Fort Collins, our cost of living is just shooting up like crazy. Vacancy rates are very low, uh, very little affordable housing, right? So part of the homelessness thing is there's an imbalance between wages and cost of living in Fort Collins, right? In some ways that we're forcing kind of the people, the jobs are in Fort Collins, but there's no housing in Fort Collins. Well, I would put that um, too. So, so, you know, that job opportunities and, and, and wage fairness or equity, mm -hmm. you know, cost the equality living. becomes kind of a you're saying? The cost of living. Because it's shooting up in downtown Houston. Yeah, so our goal, the interest, is, is kind of a low cost of living, right? Yeah. And uh, kind of the concept of uh, someone being a productive citizen, this is that, that there's some equality of uh, fairness and that, that uh, the idea that, that what does it take to get someone to be productive? Is there assistance? Justified, unjustified. Well, it's, uh, that's yeah, it's a kind of justice and fairness, and, you know, and and part of it that comes up to you too is this a notion that we probably need to put up there for for some people. You know, we, of, of the importance of individual responsibility, right? The importance of self sufficiency, the importance of you know, kind of the conservative side of it in a sense, right? That people need to make better, better choices in a way. Um, you know, obviously in the United States, individual responsibility is kind of a powerful kind of uh, assumption or value. So I mean, we can keep on going, kind of play it out, but it's just it's useful to do the stakeholder analysis to really think about who all the players are, because then that also not only kind of who you might want to have in the room, but if you're doing it for an assignment, who do you need to research, right? Who do I might need to talk to, right? Uh, it's, it's interesting how often major groups are never talked to. I do a lot of stuff with K twelve, obviously. How how rarely school districts actually talk to students. <laughs> so I, I had a student group I'm working with, and they wanted to do a project on bullying. Right? So I started researching bullying, and then we contacted the district saying, hey, we want to do some forums on bullying. You know, would you help us kind of get some teachers that will give us a class for so we can do these forums? Um, and then the school district said, well, actually, we have a committee that's been studying bullying for two years. I'm like, oh, great. It's like, you know, can you give me contact with them? So I got in contact with them, and I went to meet with them. They said, yeah, we're about to finish. We're writing a white paper. We're almost done, but we'll give it to you when you're done. Right? And it's like, so who was on the committee? She said, oh, it was a great committee. We had some teachers, and we had some counselors, and we had lots of parents, and we had some psychologists. I'm like, did you have any students? She goes, oh, no. I'm like, did you talk to any students in your process? Oh, no. 
<laughs> Two years studying bullying, they never actually talked to a child. Right? Um, and it's because they didn't do the stickler, you know. And, and they think tr children are transient. You know, like, oh, they're gone by the time, you know. Uh, but it's just amazing. Same thing when we did the school safety forums. I mean, the school is a different school district south of us. They wanted us to, you know, so we did three nights of parents and all this kind of stuff. And I said, we need to talk to the kids. And it's like, oh, no, don't worry about that. I'm like, no. We need to talk. So then we finally uh, pushed them enough that we had a night that we talked to 30 kids from all the different schools, heard completely different things than the parents, right? And the, the teachers, right? The teachers were saying, oh, you know, we have all these new policies and the students believe in them and all. And the students were saying, like, oh, we don't do follow that. No, we open all those doors all the time. You know, you know so sometimes when you leave out a big stakeholder group, you're missing a huge perspective, right? You know, so for, for a student group, you do this kind of thing. It's, okay, let's make sure we get these perspectives you know, sometimes you can find them out through research. Sometimes you have to give a call. You know, it, I know for me as an undergraduate student, the first time I ran into a professor that required me to actually talk to real people for research, to pick up the phone and talk to people, it completely changed my life. Right? I was just one of those, like, I'll find it on the internet somewhere or whatever. You know, but actually calling real people and talking to them and asking them questions, I was like, wow, that was kind of cool. Right? You know, so that's a, it's a pretty good assignment to have people do, like, call someone, call a police officer and talk about their experience. I know when we did this meeting in, in homelessness a couple weeks ago, I wasn't very involved. I was just kind of observing. Uh, we weren't running it. Um, but they had the park rangers. Um, we have the parks and recreation, but a lot of camping, right? The, the homeless will camp in the parks and those type of things. So they were a critical voice in that conversation because they're the ones that interacting with them a lot more, right? The police officers interacting with them downtown, but the park, uh, park uh, I guess they're park rangers in a sense, are the, one, they're the ones camping on the river and those type of things. So you start realizing some of those kind of new voices that you kind of need to hear. Uh, so with this, so this helps to identify the values. It also helps starts not only the stakeholders, but then the actions. What are all the different things these groups can do, right? Um, and then you also start, you know, when you talk a little bit about some of the tensions here, right? So the, the tensions in homelessness, um, um, you know, we, we feel that health versus hinder kind of tension, right? That, that we want them to be self-sufficient, we want them to be, be responsible, you know, so, but well, we also want to help them out, right? Uh, we want, some people want to kind of blame them for the poverty, some people kind of blame the structure of society for the poverty. Well, there is a tension there, right? Uh, we, we want to have programs that help them, but we don't want those programs to be taken advantage of, right? There's a tension within the poverty research that, you know, we all, the, 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 the innocent child, the poor child is clearly a, a sympathetic figure. Right, um, but then the parent that's making really bad choices, right, is, is unsympathetic. But how do we help the child without helping the baby? No. So there's all these interesting tensions of how what programs that we do. That, that churches do wonderful work, right? But then you know we have a separation of church and state, right? And, and do we want you know, government programs that are funded through churches are very effective sometimes, but then they're through the church. And to what degree is part of the process of what the church is doing? Is it tied to religion that's inappropriate for the government to be funding? You know, so as you start thinking through the roles of all those, you start coming up with some, some interesting vision there. And, and obviously, the business owners want it clean. Um, you know, in some ways, they want to criminalize homelessness, right, to get rid of homelessness. Uh, but it, it's not getting rid of it, right? It's just forcing it somewhere else. I know we've all seen those pictures of the uh, how it, uh, in downtown areas where, where you know nooks and crannies where homeless tend to sleep, they're putting spikes now. Have you seen those examples? Right, they're actually installing spikes on the ground just so people wouldn't sleep there, right? Which your first image of that is not horrible, right? Yeah. Um, you know, but the idea is not that they want to cause pain, right? That they're saying that's that's harming my business and you know, so they're coming from somewhere. But that's a good example of they're probably coming from a good place, right? You know, it's easy to demonize them. They have a good, you know, but when we actually weigh that, we probably would most people would say. That's not a good idea, <laughs> yeah. right? So we can acknowledge that they're coming from a good place and we see what they're trying to do, but in balance, uh, yeah, we, well, think, we still think you're wrong, right? Well, it's not even a good place, but they, they basically uh, struck the longest solution that didn't really kind of serve only one right. one master, which is their own interest. Right, the other. yeah. yeah. You know, and, and actually, you know, so we have a park just north of our downtown area uh, that, that tends to be a, a major hangout for homeless. Uh, so one of the plans right now is to pay over the park and make it a parking lot, right? Um, and, and I guess some people magically think, well, because then the homeless will disappear. I'm like, no, they'll probably find somewhere else, right? So, um, and there's that tension of always kind of short-term kind of dealing with symptoms versus long-term true solutions in a way, right? Oh, and actually, one of the biggest tensions with homelessness um, is if your city becomes known as having really good policies to help help the homeless, 
to what degree do you become a magnet for homelessness? Now, research shows that that's that's that tends not to happen nearly as much as you think. Right? Um, in Fort Collins, it's happened somewhat. I mean, they, they do these. They, they call them point in time studies that they actually try to do a survey of all homeless and they have volunteers go out there and ask. One of the questions they're asking are, are you from this community or did you come here? How long did you come here? Our percentage of people coming coming to Fort Collins is pretty high, right? Normally, the, most of your homeless is homegrown homeless, mm -hmm. right? And part of the reason is because when you're in poverty, relationships are huge, right? Um, so for you to leave your community to go to another community because you perceive that other community to have better resources for poor people is a hard move, right? Because you're leaving your whole social network, right? So that's where it doesn't happen nearly as much, right? But there is that assumption. And what happens in Fort Collins is we get them from all the small towns, right? We'll come to Fort Collins because there's going to be resources and there's going to be other kind of thing, right? Uh, but there is that perception that, hey, if we, if we be, have a very generous community to help homeless, does that attract homelessness? Um, which is kind of a tough issue to kind of think about. Right? Uh, so you start kind of seeing some of those things. So, so what would you insert? Uh, what's happening on national policies versus practices? You know, um, because you know, like national policies in terms of laws. So the housing, uh, the housing first. Like the whole oh. idea about that community, just in particular. Okay. Yeah. Uh, drill down on that one about that idea. Uh, again, as if you're facilitating or sorting this out at this beginning. Because there is a national program that uh, housing, housing first model, yeah. first support housing is actually going to kind of level the playing field, so you won't have that charge about a community because it will be because uh, that's a national that all anyone who's participating is getting money to target them. The homeless, uh, the homeless veterans is that was a national campaign that yeah. kind of dropping homelessness across the nation because they targeted the homeless veterans. <clears throat> Yeah, so I mean, we briefly talked about it. We didn't put it out there, but you know, national, state, and county governments. So, what kind of national programs are coming up? Um, and then I also from that talked about the housing authority, right? So we actually we have a Fort Collins Housing Authority, which is a kind of pseudo governmental kind of organization that's really focused on affordable housing. So we're actually just building kind of a new supportive housing kind of program. It's going to house about forty people. It's going to be open in about a month. Um, that was an interesting controversy of where to place that kind of the not in my backyard kind of thing, right? Um, and, but then you also have the Board of Realtors. The Board of Realtors is actually a pretty big player in Fort Collins. Um, interestingly, uh, for really kind of focused on developing more affordable housing and kind of you know, sounding the alarm of, of how little affordable housing that we have in some senses. Right? So again, you, you see additional players that are kind of voice of it. Uh, but, you know, the, the notion of what national programs, so we did a big healthcare thing probably our second year. And this was before Obamacare, um, and uh, and I think that Obamacare has become just the word for it. It's not really that <laughs> important to have a task for it, right? So hopefully you're not thinking if I'm saying Obamacare, I'm attacking it. Um, it's just an easier way to refer to it. But uh, so before that, states were kind of given some leeway to kind of come up with their own kind of healthcare changes, right? So our state came up with kind of the, they did a call for proposals for, for any organization can come up with a new healthcare plan. And then they had a Blue Ribbon Commission to look at it. They came up with five that they really liked. So then we ran an event with the League of Women Voters to really kind of walk through those five, right? But constantly with the healthcare, and this happens with poverty a lot, there was that assumption that if Fort Collins or Colorado or Fort Collins, um, that this is a national issue. This is a fundamental flaw of society. That if, so if, if we do cool things in Fort Collins to deal with poverty, uh, we're actually being counterproductive. Because what we need is a national change, right? And if, if we make things work, if we make a bad system work okay, it's going to be harder to make the argument to change the bigger system, right? Mm -hmm. So that becomes a tension in kind of in itself. And that's kind of the same thing for homelessness. It's like, you know, instead of us as a city figuring out how do we deal with our homeless problem, you know what? We need to, you know, I remember at one conference dealing with poverty, the speaker before me was an anthropology professor who was a Marxist and anti-capitalist, right? So he gave like an hour long lecture about how we just need to overthrow capitalism. Um, and, all this kind of, and it was my turn to talk. And I'm like, uh, <laughs> like I'm not sure how to follow that, right? It's like, okay, so while we're working on overthrowing capitalism, like I'm kind of working on trying to capitalism work as well as I can, you know? Um, so yeah, there's always that tension in a sense of what's the scope of the project? Right? Uh, are you talking local? Are you talking county? Are you talking region? Are you talking state? Are you talking nation? Are you talking 
global, right? Uh, and it, you have to put some kind of boundaries on that conversation. But what those boundaries are, are always going to kind of be tough. We, we struggle a lot with city versus county, right? Because the United Way that I work with a lot is United Way of Larimer County, right? So Fort Collins is a big city. Loveland is kind of a medium city. Estes Park is a smaller city. And then there's about another 10 tiny communities. And then there's a lot of rural community, right? So when we're talking about an issue, we get in trouble a lot if it's too Fort Collins centric, right? That if we just, or if we have a meeting in Fort Collins, right? So we often have to have meetings in Loveland and Estes Park just to spread it around. And, you know, it'd be a lot easier for me to say, hey, we're talking about Fort Collins, right? But some of my partners are very county focused or they're, you know, uh, so, so that 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 scope always becomes a kind of a tough challenge in a way, um, in, in some different ways. Okay, I need I need to move on, but hopefully uh, you, you see kind of this tool. Um, I need to back to the PowerPoint. Get, get it onto framing. Yeah, you need to go down. I don't think we're gonna have another break before the so if you need to go back to go ahead. All right, so now we've identified the issue, we've kind of talked about homelessness, we've identified some of the underlying values and the key kind of players and those type of things. So then you want to name the issue. You want to come up with a name. And this is the idea of what's going to be on your flyer? What's going to be you know, on, on the front of your booklet, right? You, you see lots of examples. Uh, that's not my stuff. <laughs> yeah, here we go. Yeah. What, what's going to, here is too many children left behind. How can we close the achievement gap? Protecting our right, what goes on the internet? What is the 21st century mission of our school? You know, what's the label on the top, right? And, and you're framing it, you're hopefully framing it to have a pretty broad tent. To bring people from different perspectives that are going to want that, right? <coughs> so you want a broad frame that includes a lot of the key stakeholders' concerns, right? And so when, when we're doing homelessness, are we framing it just on the kind of compassion frame? Is it just about what can we do to help these poor people? Or are we including the businessmen, right? Or are we including the police and saying, you know, this is also about public safety. It's also about the beautification of the downtown, right? So how do we both kind of care about compassion, but also kind of care about the quality, you know, that kind of stuff? <coughs> Right? And you're making some choices there. If you're making a choice that, you know what, I don't care about the, the business person's perspective. We're just going to focus. That might still be a useful tool to kind of rally the, the true believers in the choir, but you're not changing the conversation, right? If, if the business person who's dealing with homelessness every day looks at your topic and says, I don't see me in here, right? They're not, they don't care about my opinion, right? Then, then you're not going to transform the conversation in a way. Uh, so that becomes a question of who is your audience in a sense. Uh, uh, we struggle with that, particularly with climate change. Okay, if we're going to deal with climate change, are we open to the deniers? Are, are we going to say the people that think climate change is a complete hoax? Are they part of the conversation or not? And that's a tough decision because in some senses, yeah, we need to take them on and, and they need to be part of the solution. But in some senses, if, if we do take them on, then we're going to be spinning our wheels for a while. Do we just say, hey, you know what? We're going to work with the 80% of the people that, that already kind of assume it's happening and, and, and want to figure out what to do. Right. There's not a right answer to that, but that your, your naming process is always going to be that of how many of those different values are incorporating it, right? To, to what degree are you taking the different perspectives on? And it's very hard to say, we're going to take all perspectives, right? Again, for immigration, I'm not going to include the white supremacists, right? <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't feel that they, they should see themselves and feel comfortable coming. I'm perfectly fine if they stay home, right? Um, but I do want to have certain conservative and progressive perspectives and stuff. Right? I, want, I want some people to think that color doesn't matter whatsoever, and some people that say, no, we need to celebrate different, you know. Uh, I want lots of different kind of perspectives. But, right? uh, so avoid inflammatory terms, right? And carefully think about word choice imagery. The example one of my friends always gives is, is NIF developed an issue book on alcohol. I don't think you have it here. Um, but the, 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 the image was like a broken, you know, it was a very negative image on the cover, right? Or they did another one about schools, and they ended up it's like, how do we fix our broken schools, right? But it implied from the very beginning that the schools were broke, you know. So a teacher looking at that, are they going to show up that meeting? Right? And they say, well, you're telling us it's completely broken. You know, so what, what words are you using? How are you framing it? Um, so it's really kind of welcoming in some ways. Overall, typically uh, focus on a common problem. That's why I, I tend to rely on the frames of what should we do about X, right? You know, so it's just kind of open in a sense, and just frame X in a way that most people agree X is something we need to do something about. Right? 
Um, yeah, so what should we do about X? How can we achieve X? How can we optimize safety in our schools and things like that? Right? Um, so yeah, here's some examples. Um, uh, these are NIF. Well, here we go. Alcohol, controlling the toxic spill. Oh, and that, you can't see the whole thing, but the bottom of that is like a skull and cross, you know, it's like this alcohol is so horrible, right? <laughs> so as someone who enjoys alcohol or that kind of stuff, you know, that doesn't abuse it in a sense, like, this is not a place for me. This is, they're going to be demonized alcohol, right? Uh, so that's one of the NIF frames that I think they really realize that they, they frame it wrong, right? Copying, clipping for the cause. And, and you can also control the scope. Healthcare is such a huge issue. Right, so with this issue, they try to narrow it. Let's talk a little bit about cost. Right? Instead of fixing the healthcare system, how do we kind of figure out how we can deal with healthcare costs? Right, so there's ways sometimes with the naming of it uh, that you kind of. Okay. So these are some specific ones that we've done. You know, and again, you, you see, I like the questions: How should we improve? What should we do about? How should we, uh, how should we meet our future water needs? I tend to like to ask questions at the top right. So once you have a name, now you develop the potential approaches, and we'll try to kind of play with this a little bit uh, with homelessness or maybe another issue. I know you. I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about your idea, and we can kind of brainstorm that a little bit too. Well, mine is so different. Well, it really, I mean, it, it it's taking this but using it in literature for a mm -hmm. literature class. Yeah. So it really doesn't. I mean, it, you don't go through this whole process, right? Because it's more academic. But, but I think in terms of a here, you can kind of almost pick up. Right? Maybe if there's a situation, if there's a tension within the story of the literature that you're yeah. wanting students to really think through, right? Yeah, um, well, I mean, I did come up with three approaches to okay. the short story. So, well, um, well, let me talk about this a little bit and then we'll go back sure. to it, right? Uh, so, the NIF model, it's at least three. Uh, I know when I did water, I did four. Uh, other things, I've done five. Uh, another, I think I gave you the link to this in the back, but everyday democracy. Um, it used to be called study circles, if everyone heard the term study circles, but they, they, they were people that used to work for NIF and then started another company. Partly is that they saw that NIF was too short, this two hours wasn't enough. So the study circles program is essentially the same model. Here's the common ground, here's lots of idea, you know, and let's think through it. It has more of a connection to action. Uh, but it's like a meeting, two hour meeting every week for six weeks, right? And they have booklets. They have one on diversity, they have one on immigration, they have one on kind of community sprawl and those type of things. It totally uh, works for action. Though. Yeah, really useful kind of thing to say that, that um, and, but all have like, here, here's like multiple, sometimes they have like 14 different viewpoints, right? Here's yeah, 14 different viewpoints research. on this issue that uh, people talk through, right? So other examples you can find online, right? So develop potential approaches. But the, the idea again you know, of the approach is, is to think broadly about the issue, to see it different sides, to get away from a typical pro-con, the United States to get away from a typical Democrat versus Republican kind of framing, right? Um, and, and also have something for people to react to. So when they have, they're coming to this meeting, I'm not having to react to your ideas, we're all reacting to these ideas. It gives us a, a surrogate in a sense that, that makes it a lot easier for us to talk through some tough issues, right? Uh, so this is, you know, the, the approach, each approach, has some specific actions that we've been looking at with both the one on higher ed and the one on, on obesity. And it, so each one inherently has things that people like and don't like about it. And there's a, here are all the underlying values, right? And some values support some of the approaches and some of them support others. But every single one of the approaches has key values that it's supporting and every single one of the approaches has some trade-offs. Because again, there's not a magic rule. Right? Uh, so you have this page actually from the packet from my workbook, right? Um, it's page, probably like the fourth or fifth page that you have. Yeah, it's page 47. Uh, so what we do in my class is, again, they, they pick a debate issue, they're debating a yes-no issue, and then they have to transition their debate to a de deliberation. So they're going from two sides, a yes-no, and they have to go to at least three. So this is one of the handouts that I show. It's like, this is one way to think about it, right? Uh, dividing up those approaches. You can divide it up as, you know, what, what are the different primary actors? That's what we did with the obesity framing, right? The obesity framing is families need to solve this problem, schools need to solve this problem, no government has to solve this problem, right? So that's one way to split it up for the conversation. Uh, you can just have basic different policy ideas. So I know the, the energy one, 
I think I gave you that example on the next page. Um, it you know, they kind of has, well, what we need to do is kind of focus on security and kind of you know, drill, drill, baby, drill, like, you know, develop domestic resources so we don't have to rely on, on other countries. Right? The second one is we need to develop renewable energy here in the United States and really kind of push for wind and solar and, and those type of things. And the third is we really need to reduce our energy use. Right? We need to be much more efficient with our, you know, so each kind of approach is a different idea. Right? What, what you want to do with these approaches, you don't want one approach to be the opposite of another. Right? You don't want one approach to be, you know, drill more here, and the second one say drill less here, right? Yeah. Because when you're talking about drill more here, you're inherently talking about we should do this or we shouldn't do it, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So if your first approach, if your second approach is the opposite of the first approach, by the time you get there, you've already talked about it because all the criticism of the first approach is the advantage of the first thing. You know? mm -hmm. uh, so, so in a way, you're doing six approaches. You have three approaches, but you're arguing for and against it within each conversation. So that's why you don't want you know any any approach to be the mirror image of another. Uh, different views of the source of the cause of the problem, right? So you kind of think through. Okay, let's assume first that the cause and for homelessness, maybe we can make this work with that, right? The cause is individual are making bad choices. The cause is, is low wages is kind of the cause, or the cause is is lack of resources for mental health, right? So then maybe that's the frame to kind of start each to really think. Okay, if we assume that's the cause, then what do we need to do? Uh, so that's one way to kind of split it up. Uh, different degrees of response. We did this for the medical marijuana before we passed marijuana, all marijuana. Uh, we were struggling in Colorado to allow medical marijuana. So we came up with an approach. We actually ran this in a city. We got some, got some awards for the city. But the first approach was we just need to really regulate marijuana and close it all down and not allow it at all. The second approach was like free market. Let them do whatever. <laughs> let's open it up. And the third approach is let's try to figure. Let's make sure the people that need it for health reasons, legitimate health reasons, get it, but no one else does, right? Uh, but of course, legitimate health reasons is a hard line to draw, right? Um, so that conversation, <laughs> that that one isn't. That's kind of a default that the other ones don't work because that was an, uh, pretty obvious that the first two are bad and the third one is better, mm -hmm. right? But it's also the recognition that drawing those lines are tough. But it's still, by, by spending dedicated time, what happens if we regulate this like crazy? What happens if we regu barely regulate it at all? And what happens if we try to kind of draw those lines as a society? Uh, this last one's interesting. This is really useful for any kind of bad behavior. Um, like we, we want people to eat better, or we want people to stop smoking, or stop doing drugs, or, 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 or stop driving drunk, or whatever. Uh, so the Forest Service came up with these uh, three E's, education, engineering, or enforcement. So education is, let's just teach people to make better decisions, right? Uh, so we're not going to punish them for making a bad decision. We just want to teach them to make better decisions. Engineering is, how do we design society so they don't make those decisions, right? Uh, the example for a while, uh, remember, I don't know if y'all heard, yeah, you know, all that's older than me, I think. Uh, when, when, uh, uh, it didn't work when I did it with my, my college students. That's why I stopped for a second. Uh, where seatbelts used to be automatic. Right, for just like for a few years, like you would get into your Honda Civic and close the door and see, oh, it automatically closed, right? That was engineering, right? Instead of trying to teach people to wear your seatbelts, we're just going to design cars that your seatbelts are automatic, right? Um, instead of teaching people to turn off lights, what do we have now? Right? We have motion detectors, right? In my office, I always walk in, I hang my coat, my coat's right by the motion detector. So like five minutes into my office, my lights turn off, and I have to go like this, like, <laughs> trying to get past the coat, like I'm still here, you know? Uh, but instead of you know, teaching people to turn off lights, we do everything automatic now, right? In Colorado, we have lots of bears when you go camping, right? So now all the trash cans are these super heavy trash cans. You have to do all these levers because they close automatically, right? So there's a lot of engineering things that you can do. Um, DWI, right? So uh, we just had a horrible accident in Fort Collins where someone had 15 DWIs uh, just killed a family of three, right? Uh, so we're saying, okay, what do we do? You know, so there's some cars that you have to blow into the car before you can start, right? You've had so many DWIs that you're going to have, you know, an alcohol test before you start the car every single time, right? So there's ways of how do we kind of engineer society so we don't have to make, you know, make those good choices. Uh, and then last, enforcement is how do we use government or incentives just to kind of force those good choices, to punish the bad choices or to incentivize with taxes. Or, so you kind of think of childhood obesity, right? Are we teaching people nutrition? Are we engineering things so, so they don't have any choices? <laughs> you know, we're, we're, you know, you see some examples of this, of infusing junk food with vitamins and minerals, <laughs> you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, or are you kind of regulating junk food? Um, and in different ideal futures, there is kind of, so we did one for the city of Longmont where they did a process of imagining 
futures. What kind of long run do you want? Right? So it's more of here's, here's three different futures, and then the actions were different paths to those futures. So then we talk about each one at a time. So those are just some of the ways of thinking about once you have your issue, kind of well, how do we want to frame it? How do we kind of create these kind of three? If you do want them, uh, here's just a few more examples. Um, well, I think we can jump past these for a second. Uh, get to some of the more. We'll, then we'll try to kind of frame it. Uh, so some key issues to think about. I probably touched on these with you already. Uh, avoid directly opposing approaches. I already talked about that already. Uh, usually avoid status quo as an option. We, we tend not to say one approach is, let's just keep it the way it is. right? Because um, normally you want to pick an issue that people agree status quo is not working. We've got to do something about this. right? So, so you, don't, you don't want status quo to be an option. But there has been some situations that it makes sense. Um, popular framing versus reframing. This is one of the, I think sometimes NIF tries too hard to change the conversation, right? Uh, so in some ways you want to reframe it, you want to kind of change it, you don't want to have the, the same typical conversation, but then if you change it too much, it's too foreign to people, and, and they're not, they don't engage it very, it's like the healthcare book, I don't know if you, that last healthcare book was, it was hard for people to engage it, and I think they focus too much on changing the conversation, right? So, so there's a delicate balance there that you have to play that you want to kind of get it, get it away from the typical things that everyone talks about that we get stuck on, but not too far away that, that they struggle engaging. I've got another one this year. Huh? They've got a very issue this year is healthcare. Oh, is it? Yeah. Um, how to deal with popular opinions that aren't realistic or supported by data. This is, so with the water thing, in Four Collins we have, you know, I already talked about water, that we, we growing population, we don't have enough water, how do we deal with that, right? So for some people, the way they want to deal with it is don't let anybody else in. We just, no more growth, right? The problem is in our society, you can't do that, right? We can't just close it down. We can't tell people not to move there anymore, right? Um, and we can basically let the cost of living get so high that people don't move here, but that also means service industry people can't live here and the society doesn't function in a way. Right? Uh, but if we had this conversation about water and we didn't talk about growth, we would have people there saying, we're not talking about growth. So I ended up putting an approach on that, that our, our goal was to you know, slow down growth and, and, and stop growing as a community in a way. And I think countering people would disagree with me on here. They, they always feel every approach has to be kind of viable and, and kind of equal and those type of things. But for me and my community to spark that conversation, I knew we needed to talk about growth. But I knew, or I was very confident, I guess I could say I was new, I was pretty confident that if we had that conversation, people would realize that that approach wouldn't work. Right? So I purposely put it first. I framed it well. I didn't try to frame it to, I didn't design it to fail, right? But it was that recognition, it was, in a way, it was an obstacle, right? It was an obstacle that people were thinking that that was a magic bullet, right? But most experts that I talked to, you know, realized that there's no way you can stop growth. Like, you don't have that much control in a sense, in a way. Right? Um, so by putting it as a first approach, people got a top chance to talk about it. By the end of talking about it for 15 minutes, realized that that's not really a viable approach. Then they took the rest of them more seriously. Right? Same thing, when we used to do the energy problem book, my, my students were mainly progressive you know, in, in Colorado, right? especially with energy issues and environmental issues. The first approach in the NIF book was the conservative approach that we needed to drill locally, and they would just dump on it. Blah, blah, blah. And partly because renewable energy is a magic bullet for them. They think we should just switch over to wind power, right? But then when they actually have the real conversation about renewable energy, they realize it's a lot harder than we think, right? The percentage of our power that's coming from renewable is pretty, you know. Uh, so then we ended up flipping it. We would do the second and the third, and we would end with the first approach. And once they would do the second and third approach and realize that those weren't as easy as they thought, they would take the first approach a lot more seriously. So the order of the approach has become pretty important. I've struggled with the childhood obesity one that I never know if I should do the family approach first or last, right? Because um, in some ways, I want people to probably realize that we can't have families. Families can't take all the responsibility. It's beyond them. So then hopefully they take the, the last two seriously. Right? They're saying, okay, we, we, we've established that we can't just expect families to, to start being much better families and much better parents. So then, you know, do we rely on school? But, but there is a purpose in a way of how you organize them. Though I will say, some people would disagree with me on that. They okay, know each one has to stand alone. The, ma the order shouldn't matter. They all, I'm like, no, sometimes you have to kind of you know, frame them in a certain way so you help that conversation make sense. <laughs> I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. I agree. Um, the, the length level of detail, you know, so sometimes you know, for the water stuff, we had one page, 11 by 17 page, which is a placemat. 
that they react to. Right? The old NIF books were about 30 pages long. Right? The newer books were about 12 pages long. Right? Uh, a lot of times I do one that's four pages, that's a, a, a front page, and then each page is a different approach. Right? You know, so there's lots of ways of doing it. My students' assignment in class, it normally ends out being about 18 pages. It's like each approach is two or three pages, but I tell them you'll have lots of charts and graphs in there. You know, so it's not 18 pages of text. It might be really only 14 pages, and then you have no, I want you a few pictures, and I want a few graphs, and you know those type of things. But that, that length of the, of the book, the reality is, if you're running it for a public event, they're not going to read a 30-page book. Right? You know, so I try to make it that it's, it's something they can react to on the fly. Right, but then you're also don't want to simplify the issues that much. Right, so you're kind of having that balance. The really nice thing about the, the old NIF books, or even the 12 pages, is you can assign them to students and then they get a lot more detail to prep for it. Like, so my student facilitators will read the full book, but then we run it in the community. So all the old books for NIF, you know, so it's a 30 page book, but again, then the last two pages is a summary. Comparing approaches, it has one column for each. So we photocopy this. This is what people have in front of them to talk about it. Right? But my facilitators can read the whole book. So they know a little bit more detail. right? So then they feel that they're a little bit more of an expert that they can run the thing. You know, so, so do this as a class assignment that you, know, you bring these books, the students pick the book, they have to at home read it, and then they just they run the discussion in their, in, in their class just using this for everybody else. So it's a nice little class assignment. <laughs> yeah, the order of your questions I was just talking about, sometimes that matters. Right. Um, so especially if there's there's a public assumption that, that's really popular, but it's not supported by data. There's, a, there's this gap between the public and experts. But sometimes you can talk it away. Sometimes you say, you know, we're not going to talk about growth because, right? But I, I just knew with that group that they, they were going to cause a problem, and I thought, you know what, we need kind of we need to talk about that, even though I'm pretty sure that if we to talk about that, so, and they actually came and, and thanked me. I had people from that area that are always the ones talking about city council about growth said, I appreciate that you actually had our voice in there. That went you know. So, so I think it worked in some way. Um, and then minimize making the document the focus. This is what I talked about a little bit earlier in the sense I always tell people it, it's an in-process document, right? That I want them to react to it. The, the goal of the process is always to improve the document, right? So I want them to scratch it and write on it, but also at the same time not make it the focus. Okay, work with it now. Try to make the best of the document. If you see flaws, if you think you see missing, you know, let us know. Um, but try to use it for what we're trying to use it for to start this conversation. Um, yeah, so these are just some, some more examples pulled from NIF. They're all available online. But I don't know if we want to, uh, we've got about 20 minutes or so here of just, well, well, maybe talk a little bit about your idea now in terms of how you're thinking about the approaches for literature. Okay, well. I'm part of the teaching circle, which is what we're doing this semester is trying to use deliberation in the classroom, right? But the challenge is that my class is a literature class, so I took a story that we're going to read called um, Sin of Omission. And what I did was to see if I could, I want to use this approach, you know, the, the deliberate, uh, deliberation approach to see if students will do better in discussion of the, of the issues in the story. So just you know, this, I think the approach is kind of summarize the story, but basically it's, um, it's a story that is set in a town. So then um, what I was going to do is tell the students, you're part of the town, you're part of that community, you're pretending that you're part of that community, so I guess that would be role playing, right? Uh, and then the, since the title of the story is Sin of Mission, I was going to focus on who committed the sin. Okay, because the story is open-ended enough that it, it could be a variety of players in the story, right, that committed the sin, which was the sin. So um, it's not technically a factual question. There, there's not someone who committed the sin. It's an open question. Well, right well. <laughs> is, there right, is there a right answer? Well, uh, here, I don't know. Uh, it might help to, to read it. Uh, it's a very short story. It's, it's three pages. Oh. Oh. Okay, so, what happens in in approach one is where there's some characters, Lope, who is uh, the, one of the main characters who grows up in the story. There's Emeterio, who is his uncle, uh, and then there is the daughter, and then there is, and that's that's basically it. 
Uh, so for approach one, you could say, Lope has committed the sin. We could say that, right? Because he kills him at in cold blood. Okay, he just lifts up a rock and he throws it on top of his head and kills him. And Emeterio doesn't know what's coming, so he doesn't even make any kind of reaction to being killed. Uh, Emeterio took him in when he had no one else and gave him a job and food and shelter. So Lope owes his life to Emeterio. Okay? So technically, Lope has committed the sin of murder. Right? Um, however, the second approach, you could also say that Emeterio has committed the sin. Because he took Lope in, but instead of giving him an education and treating him as a member of his family, which he is because he's, Emeterio is Lope's uncle, he sent Lope to work for him as a shepherd on the mountain, where he only had Roque for company, who was a man who couldn't speak. He was much older than, Roque, than Lope. He was like 50 years old. And the shepherds never came down from the mountain. So in five years, Lope never came back to the town. Uh, until he was asked to come in to see a doctor, just to certify that he was still alive. So where they only gave him bacon, grease, and bread to eat, wine or water to drink. So Emeterio was actually the mayor of the town. He was rich. He only had one daughter. So he could have given Lope, you know, a university education. He could he could have made him like a, a member, treated him like the nephew, like a son, right? And instead he got treated uh, like a servant. Or you could say in approach three that society has committed the sin because someone from the town should have made Emeterio send Lope to school. The school teacher tells Emeterio, you know, he's a bright boy, you should send him to school. And Emeterio's like, no, he has to earn a living. He has to go learn how to be a shepherd because he has to, you know, put food on the table, not, I mean, earn his living, right? So he was only 13 years old, though, when Emeterio put him to work. So you could also say it's kind of like a child abuse to go make him work in the, uh, in the, on the mountain. So it is society's responsibility to make sure that all children go to school and are well fed. Okay, so, I mean, in, that's what makes the story hard is, yes, Lope committed the murder, right? So you could say that that's his sin, that's the sin. But then the sin is sin of omission. So hey, I mean, I think I mean it has a wicked problems angle to it, right? That there's not. It has a wicked right problem. Answer. Thank you. I was like, literature has wicked yeah. problem. Yeah. yeah, no, that's interesting. So no, I think that would that would spark a really interesting stuff. And kind of the same thing of spending some time. <laughs> let's spend time on approach one. Of assuming you know that's the perspective. How do you respond to that? And mm -hmm. I think that would, that would be interesting. See, and I'm hoping but, that they also realize. I think that we are testing our our students so much. They get tested in elementary school and uh, high school and then college and then their teachers in college were teaching to another test. So they're just teaching them little pieces of information that when they get to a class like literature, they think there's one answer. And they're looking for that little piece of answer. And I'm just like, there is none. There are better interpretations and there are worse interpretations. And yes, I can say it's wrong if you tell me this is about space aliens, right? I'm like, yeah, no, no. But other, within that, though, you can say a lot of interpretations, and hopefully if you see three different approaches, you can see how you can see it differently, right? And it will make them think that, okay, so there's no right answer. They're just different answers. Right? Yeah, we have to struggle with it, and it's about judgment, right? Yeah, it's about, about judgment, yeah. That. And then would you frame that as a... And again, I'm not an expert on literature, but does that fall under like a, a tragedy, or is this a like a? You know, um, well, it is a tragedy on, on various levels, right? I mean, he kills a material, so that's a tragedy. He is lacking in human contact. Lope is lacking, right? Because his uncle wouldn't give him that an education. His uncle refused to give him that, so that's another tragedy. And at the end of the story, the people from the town are murmuring. And they are against, it ends like this, uh, all the old women in the town are saying, oh, how dare he kill his uncle, oh my gosh, he, he who took him in, and he gave him food, and he made him a man, and then Lope is just, you know, going towards the prison saying, yes, 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 mm -hmm. and we don't know what that yes means, we don't know what, yes, so we don't know what the yes means, but is he admitting guilt, I mean, he's admitting his guilt, everybody's from him. But is he also saying, or oh, is there something else in there? Right. So it's about the definition of sin, or you know, it's like a stasis model in a sense, right? Yeah. The stasis model is as as a stock issue model with an argumentation and a legal term, right? I mean, so what we know is he killed him, right? Mm -hmm. What we don't know was it murder. 
yes. right? Was it justified? Was it, you know, all this kind of stuff. So that those become more open questions to interpretation mm -hmm. and discussion in a sense. So we have about 15 minutes, and then we do it to end on time. <laughs> yeah, I, we have, I, a, I have air, a plane to catch. Um, <laughs> so the, let me jump ahead really briefly, and then we can go back and kind of talk more about the approaches, but just to kind of make sure I get to this. So so the last part, once you, the, 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 the developing potential approaches is kind of really the hardest step and the kind of a key step, right? Because once you have that, everything else is kind of fill in the blank in some ways, right? Uh, so I can send these to you. I think I... I don't know if I gave them to you on your PowerPoint, right? Uh, so with my students, I have two different worksheets that they do. This is like an internal worksheet. It's an approach development worksheet. It's very similar to one of the ones that's in the packet that I gave you that we had, you know, the elements of choices, this example for the healthcare, right? So this is more of an internal thing for, for students to kind of work through the issue. Uh, and then the placemat uh, with the assignment when they're writing out. That, so there's a public version that other people will use to make sense of it. This is kind of the internal version for, for the person developing to make sense of it, right? Uh, so you see this one has categories for it. So once you have the three approaches, you would write them up there. And okay, so how, from that approach, how do they define the problem, right? What's the broad remedy? What are they saying needs to change, right? What are some specific policy options? What are some specific actions um, from a broad range of stakeholders, right? So who's doing what, in a sense? Um, what are some facts that support the approach? So where's some actual really hard data in a sense that would support this? What are the key values? So for that approach, what are the values that are kind of on the top of the hierarchy? Uh, and then what are the cons? What are the kind of pushback and trade-offs, right? Uh, so they kind of work on that to kind of, you know, and sometimes as you start putting on the details, you have to make changes to the approaches, right? Or maybe two of the approaches was really easy to do that, and the third approach you're really struggling, so then you might need to kind of back up and kind of play with the approaches again to make sure that they're, they're, they're kind of, the, divided up equally, right? Then this becomes the place map, which is the public thing, right? Um, and you could do an assignment that all they have to do is come up with a place map. I literally, for the water stuff, I went into a water conflict class, it's a graduate class, met once a week for an hour, right? So they did a lot of conflict with the water law, and I came in for an hour, it's kind of what I did today, to train them about framing. And then the next week they had to bring a place map for water in northern Colorado, right? So we got 20 of those from the commute, from the, from this class, and me and the person that taught the class went through all the 20, we picked the one that we liked the most, and then we incorporated some aspects of the other one, and that was the first draft for our one for the community. And then we sent it to the, to the advocacy group for the river, and we sent it to the power company, and, you know, and then they kind of made some suggestions to refine it, but then that's what we did for the public. Right? You know, so this is an assignment that in, in an hour you kind of explain it and say, hey, you go home and complete one of these, right, for an issue that you've been studying already in some sense, right? Uh, so then this becomes a placemat, uh, I knew this on a legal side piece of paper. So they have a little bit of room here to explain the problem. Explain, you know, what should we do about X? So first you have to establish X is a problem we should all care about, child obesity or whatever. Then you have the three approaches. So you have the title of the approach, a brief explanation, so normally like two or three sentences here that say what that approach is, and what should be done, so a bullet list of some specific actions, the key advantages, the arguments for this position, and then the trade-offs in the bottom. Right? Um, and then the book itself just becomes this thing but each, each bullet point, instead of a bullet point, it's a paragraph, right? And it's saying, we should do this. We should, we should tax junk food, right? And then you have a little paragraph, and, you, uh, and the degree to which you want to make it a bigger assignment that they have to have sources and, you know, have to cite their sources and footnotes and all that kind of stuff depends on how much time you want to spend on it, right? So part of it could be just a brainstorming process to kind of come up with an issue they already understand, or it could be very much a research project that they have to, you know, in my class, it's a semester project, so, you know, they have to have 20 different sources to have government sources and you know, academic sources and public, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, so they comment form. You might just have that one page place mat. The four pager is you have one page for approach, so you have an introduction and four page. For, a lot of times we'll do the, uh, uh, the 11 by 17, so it folds, right? So they have a title page, and then you open up, and then you might have the three approaches across these pages, and then on on the back, you have some kind of discussion questions or reflection questions, right? So that's kind of one easy way for the students to work it. But that's if they have access to 11 by 17 paper. Or something like that. Um, the eight pager is, again, oh, you, know, you have the intro, and then once you open it up, you have two pages per approach, right? Uh, and a lot of times when we do this in the public, we want this to be a workbook for them. Right, so you might have some data, but some open space for people to kind of write comments and those type of things. Right? But the idea, the placement is they have it in front of them, they see everything. So while we're doing approach one, they see all the arguments of approach one, right? And they can turn the page on approach three. Right? Um, or the full book with a, with a summary, right? Uh, 
Uh, so I gave you these links if you want to go to them. But these are three uh, organizations that basically use the IF model. Like, here's a common problem. Uh, public agenda calls them discussion starters, right? Um, uh, Everyday Democracy actually has an issue guide exchange, a place where people have developed these can kind of send theirs in and share and things like that. Um, I, by the way, some of the NIF ones um, you have to pay for. Uh, I have PDFs of almost all of them. Right? So if you see something online that looks interesting, you can, Wendy does this all the time, right? Hey, do you have the alcohol one? And then I'll, I'll send you the PDF back, right? Um, so if you have an issue you're interested in, feel free to email me, and if I know there's an issue book somewhere, I'll, I'll get it to you. Uh, there's also, I did put the link here, if you Google reframing framing, Public Agenda has a nice little article for students. It's probably about 10, 12 pages long, and it talks about the, the need to you know, frame for deliberation versus framing for, for strategy. Right? Mm -hmm. As you go, right? Um, so that's it. So let me bounce back now to the, the let's try here in the last 10 minutes. If we were to try to come up with a framing on homelessness, right? We'll name it the easy way. What should we do about homelessness in downtown Houston, right? Um, what, what are some possible approaches? And, and one thing, not always, this one doesn't actually have it. Um, I tend to like the approaches to be action statements, right? Notice for a lot of these, the first word is a, is a verb. Create and implement, right? Uh, this one, not quite. Improve, right? Make it easier. Stop the bleeding. Break the cycle, right? Um, you know, so a lot of times it seems like each one kind of being a broad action step, right? Uh, but, but not always, right? You know, the, the ones, you know, this one in particular is, is more taking that framing of each approach is a different key actor in a way. Right? But I don't know if anyone's kind of thinking through um, if you were to say, here's, here's three broad approaches to take on homelessness, what, what might one be? Well, one of those, as you were describing things, the uh, significance of ultimately um, <clears throat> uh, creating a possibility for everyone to be uh, productive. Uh, oh. One conversation I had about disability, and the reality is, is just enough support to be able to. Just enough, so it's not so much framing someone as having disabled disability, but they need support to be able to take care of themselves or to be able to be more productive and hold down that job, you know, hold down their health care costs by having a way of managing it better. And so, and the extreme is letting things as they are, and the other extreme is manage with care, you know, and just be completely treated as you know, a social health problem versus a personal personal responsibility. Okay, so, so an approach might be something like strive for Strive to help everyone to be, become a productive member of society yeah. or something like that in a way. Yeah, well, when's, right. a, when's a second chance or, you know, no. what is a reasonable thing if someone's been proven they've never gotten sufficient health care or you're mental or you have a hard time to go to the meds and their families are not able to help them. Yeah. That's almost like that could also be the name of the book, right? Like how do we, yeah. how do we, well, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and that's sometimes the way I might start with a very broad frame, but then one approach really like, oh, this is such a rich approach. And yeah. sometimes it's happened that the approach becomes the whole topic. Yeah. And then we think about three ways of really kind of doing that approach. Right? And again, it goes back to what's your audience? Are you trying to, to the broadest possible audience? Or are you saying you know, that, that line between activism and, and deliberation, right? Um, sometimes you're saying, hey, let's, let's, sometimes I work with individual groups that already care about the issue, right? And they're just trying to figure out how do we act together. Right, so this model can still be very useful for a group of, you know, to, to, to work with just the choir, right? But for the choir to kind of help identify their actions. Arm the choir, as I call it. Uh, arm the choir. Yeah, arm the choir, yeah, kind, so of, kind have, of helping those task teams and those yeah. type of things. Right? Well, so we have natural policy <coughs> moving toward ending homelessness by providing them homes and support yeah. services. Yeah. Then you have communities who are criminalizing it, you know, right. including right. uses. Right. Yeah. So yeah. An and so, you know, if we continue, you know, so there are actually policies that are going against each other. Yeah. Criminalizing is, you know, more people get their mental health care in the county jail than they do the people in clinics. Right. Yeah. So that tells you about something about the population, the work is overcrowding, the first people getting their needs sufficiently is the best, most efficient way. You know, more reasons, financial line. Yeah. Okay. I, 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 I get, think of, I mean, I know like housing first, we talked about it yesterday, yeah. right? That might be an approach. One approach is like, hey, just put them in housing, you know, that, that idea of just giving them some sort of place to live. Uh, even if you're giving it to them, right, tends to be cheaper in the long run, right? So housing first has always been an option. Uh, with, with issues like this, a lot of times you might have an approach that really focuses on prevention, right? We really, we really need to put our energy in kind of, you know, those people that are almost homeless, 
right? Or, or those type of things, right? Put our energy there, uh, kind of more of a long-term strategy. Um, part of the approach might be more of like really look at the root causes, right? So you might say, you know what? Mental health is really the cause of, of a lot of this chronic illness, right? So, you know, focus on mental health kind of resources in some senses, right? Uh, or, you know, maybe you're saying the underlying cause is really about, about low wages, right? So say, you know what, to really fix homelessness, if we really deal with homelessness, we're dealing with a symptom. The true cause of all this is just kind of the inequality in society and kind of the balance between the cost of living and, and the cost of housing and the cost of housing and waging, wages. So that, that's what we need to figure out. So you start kind of figuring out, <clears throat> in some ways, like to what do we agree? Do we, do we incorporate the business person's kind of perspective or the kind of the, the criminalizing thing? Now, I think it'd be hard to make that an approach because people would just dump on that, right? Mm -hmm. So that would probably be something that as I'm designing it, that's a perspective that I think about how does that perspective respond to each approach? It, to what degree does this approach kind of uh, uh, work with those concerns in a way? To what degree does this approach get the homeless off the streets and kind of help beautify our county like that? So instead of making an approach saying, get rid of them so we can be pretty, you know, um, which uh, wouldn't be very rich, right? But I know, hey, if we want to engage those audiences, that their opinion has to be in there, right? Mm -hmm. So so some of that, so, so how do you kind of weave that? So some, some concerns you weave across the approaches, right? And then some concerns become the approach itself. Right? You're trying to get into it. Oh, uh, just the, uh, that before 1980, uh, government practices and business practices Something, uh, there were some changes there, so a lot of the people that we see in the homeless in the last 30 years, they managed, they were pretty invisible, or they, you know, so there was something about the business practices and, oh. that triggered, you know, uh, this population. And, uh, I'm looking at the courts, the legal, those yeah. kind of things that are part of that as well, the healthcare, yeah. the access to... Yeah, both with mental, you know, like I know in Fort Collins, we don't have a detox, right? right? Um, you know, so that so we don't, we don't have much treatment programs for substance abuse, and that kind of goes with that mental health kind of stuff, right? To what to, so what policy changes happen? You know, a lot of stuff happened during Ronald Reagan, right? <laughs> that that the, the, a lot of the funding to mental health kind of ended, so that's that will kind of trigger that initial homelessness. Right? So you start kind of you know, is it organized by those core causes in the background? Is it organized by you know? We could probably kind of play with framing it in terms of key players, right? But like really kind of. Uh, I know our, our, our religious, you know, our churches are involved somewhat, but, but there's a really big push in, in Denver, actually internationally now. Um, there's this notion that there's, there's more churches in the world than there is homeless people. So if every church took in one homeless person, there would be no homelessness, right? <laughs> so that's been a powerful statistic, uh, especially in the, in the United States. So Denver's been pushing that in particularly. Like if every single church just did what it takes to got, got, get one homeless person off the, fan, uh, off the streets, there would be no homes, right? And that was kind of been a big charge that a lot of the churches have taken seriously in a way, right? You know, so you could have an approach of really just kind of, you know, nonprofits really have to step up here. And a second approach of local government needs to kind of, you know, change policies in a way. And then, I don't know, what, what a third one might, kind of might be in that, right? Um, kind of absorbing, you know, just anticipating, yeah. you know, when people fall, it's just easy for them to get back up. Yeah. One thing that is really important in this is like uh, doing the homework and finding out, like for me, homeless, the first thing that comes to mind, who are they? Because I know there are families, but I don't know how many families. Right. I know some, they say veterans, well, how many are out there? Because I don't know, uh, mentally ill people who, you know, that I think it without doing the research to really build the background is really impossible almost yeah. to do this. And, and that's where you're back, bouncing back and forth, right? So that's what I was saying. You kind of start with the public, you kind of see how they're talking about it, but then you're checking with the experts. So like one thing we're actually, I think it was happening this weekend is Fort Collins is doing their, their count, right? This point in time study that they have about 40 volunteers that are going all over the community to try to talk to every single homeless person to see well, you know, they have a questionnaire with about 20 questions now. To what degree they're going to answer them truthfully or not, I'm not sure. It's obviously self-reporting data, but it's exactly that, right? Uh, and that's what that's part of that cycle in a sense, right? <clears throat> so we want to balance and we want to find the right balance. Not, not, not necessarily half and half, but balance the expert data and the public data because um, both can kind of inform each other in some ways, right? So once we're developing these, a lot of times, that's why if I develop a framework, kind of from the public concerns and, and public ideas, I might take it to the experts, right? So we take it to the Water Institute of, of CSU and say, hey, are we getting this right? Or often I'm working with the expert, right? Uh, 
uh, but it, it, oftentimes things are framed so much from the expert perspective that the public can't engage with it, right? Yeah. So a lot of the work I do, I, I tend to start with the public and then I have the expert help me refine it. And if I'm getting something wrong or the public gets something wrong, we deal with it then in some ways. Uh, but yeah, I agree with you. We do need to know those numbers, right? Um, we do know. need to know. I mean, how many poor, you know, I, I remember in the meeting last week, the park ranger got up because everyone was talking about how horrible there's there's families and these young children that are sleeping at night. That's just ridiculous. The park ranger got up and said, I'm dealing with homeless every day. It's like, I haven't seen a child, right? All, all, all the homeless I'm dealing with are, are older men. I, I've, I've never seen a family and I've never seen a child that's camping. What I've seen, you know, there, there's homeless families, but they're the ones that tend to use the shelters, and they tend to, you know, find some place to stay. That there's very, at least in Fort Collins, there's very few families that are actually going to be on the street, right? And that was, you know, the conversation for a while kind of started focusing on children, and there was this uproar of like, oh my goodness, there's a, there's an eight year old sleeping on the streets, and then finally the experts kind of said, no, actually that doesn't happen, right? We, we do have emergency you know, shelters that. Uh, so the, you, you do need that clarity to kind of think about. Yeah, yeah, one of the approaches might be, and a lot of the property stuff that I've done, is like, you know, let's make sure those that need help the most get the help, right? Whether that's disabled, whether that's children, whether that's family, right? Uh, but then part of that approach might be kind of the distinction of, you know, the, the, the ones that aren't asking for help, right? Maybe we don't spend our time on there, right? Um, that to what degree should you have an approach that really kind of is, tries to make that distinction between who's really deserving and, and who might not be as, as important to kind of focus on in some ways. But yeah, no, I completely agree that, that the data has to come into it, right? So this deliberative, now for a student assignment, again, it depends on how long you want the assignment to be, right? If it's a whole semester assignment, you're gonna require a lot of research, right? But if it's more of a, a, of a philosophical kind of assignment to kind of think through how you change the conversation, you know, it, it might not be as much expert kind of stuff. But. But a lot of my work, it goes back to that Venn diagram I had. We have decision makers, uh, the public, and experts, right? And we're in the middle. And I'm trying to design framings that do all three. Right? That incorporate the public values and the public assumptions and the public beliefs. Incorporates the good data, but it also incorporates the realities of, you know, if something's completely unfeasible, I don't want it to be part of it anyway, right? Um, and and, and you're, you're constantly back, bouncing back and forth between those three. Even we're, they, we're about done. When we create, did you want to do the evaluation? Have you passed it out yet? Or? I have not. Okay. Yeah, well, we pass it out so they can do that. Yeah. I know we need to head out pretty soon here. Yeah. Sorry. Right? No, I was saying also that access to yeah. services also okay. has to be known. Is there access in services or they are not? At what time? What services? Yeah. What services work? You know, a lot of this work becomes best practice analysis, right? What's working in other communities and how do we learn about those things, right? Um, you know, so, so it really is kind of a, a, again, a, a yin and a yang going back and forth, right? That we want creativity, we want kind of great, you know, but then we want to fill that in with actual research and bounce back and forth. Um, but we don't, we, we want, a lot of it is, it's called, uh, the, the public agenda in particular talks about it as choice work. Right? That we, we want choices, we want to lay out choices for people, right? And we want those choices supported by data. But we don't want that, the, the typical expert model is research it to not come up with choices or research called an answer. Right? And that doesn't work with the public. Like, here's the answer, you know, you can't hand the answer to the public. Um, you need to give them good choices 